hi good morning to all of you so let us start once again so till yesterday we had discussed before the civil disobedience movement and we had discussed that mahatma gandhi decided to launch his second mass movement in form of civil disobedience movement and this was started by mahatma gandhi by starting his march from sabarmati ashram at ahmedabad with 78 chosen followers on 12th of march 1930 and on 6th of april 1930 reached the coast of dandi picked up a handful of salt and decided to launch his first his second mass movement in form of civil disobedience movement this movement was started after the governor general lord irwin rejected the 11 mile demands of mahatma gandhi also known as 11 point ultimatum okay and with this the second mass movement started which is known as the civil disobedience movement okay so today we'll start with this movement that is the civil disobedience movement from 1932 1934 so coming to the second mass movement under the leadership of mahatma gandhi known as the civil disobedience movement from 1930 to 1934 coming to civil disobedience movement not just understand about this movement clear Civil disobedience movement is considered to be the most organized mass movement under the leadership of Mahatma Gandhi. During this mass movement, ma- mass movement, several developments took place all across India, and one of the most important development, which is in news also these days, is clear. This most important, one of the most important development during civil disobedience movement was a sat. satyagraha known as dharasana satyagraha clear so dharasana satyagraha was started during the civil disobedience movement what was this dharasana satyagraha which was started in the region of gujarat clear so dharasana satyagraha dharasana satyagraha was a protest against the british salt tax clear a salt tax and it was started in 1930 clear following the conclusion of the salt march or the dandi march on 6th of april mahatma gandhi decided to start a non violent raid on dharasana asana salt works in the region of gujarat okay so after launching the mass movement on 6th of april 1930 mahatma gandhi decided to conduct a non violent raid on dharasana salt works department or salt works in the region of gujarat okay but before mahatma gandhi could reach the dharasana salt work okay british authority arrested mahatma gandhi and after arrest of mahatma gandhi his successor in dharasana satyagraha is to continued the agitation and the successor of mahatma gandhi was mr abbas tayyab ji okay so mahatma gandhi appointed his successor in dharasana satyagraha and this successor of mahatma gandhi was mr abbas tayyab ji who was an ex judge of the ex justice of baroda claim so he was an ex justice of baroda who continued the dharasana satyagraha after the arrest of mahatma gandhi clear mahatma gandhi and he began to march towards dharasana salt depot a salt works depot clear but at the same time british even arrested ab mr abbas tayyab ji and thereafter dharasana satyagraha was carried forward by sarojini naidu clear so next leader that carried forward the dharasana satyagraha in gujarat was sarojini naidu. naidu and sarojini naidu proceeded toward dharasana salt work or dharasana salt depot along with another very prominent leader and that leader was 
Imam Sahib. Clear? So along with Imam Sahib, she proceeded towards Dharasana Salt War. Clear? And in this process, clear, at the same time, clear, when all these leaders were protesting towards Dharasana Salt War, clear, the Salt War, this agitation was also supported by the son of Mahatma Gandhi, Mani Lal, who is also associated with Dharasana Salt Satyagraha. So Mahatma Gandhi started this agitation, which was carried forward by Mr. Abbas Tayyabji, then Sarojni Naidu, then Imam Sahib, and the son of Mahatma Gandhi, that is Mani Lal. Clear? This continued in a very effective manner as they wanted to basically conduct raid, non-violent raid on Dharasana Salt Work Department, which was under British control. Clear? In course of time, finally, this movement was led by another great leader that is Maulana Abul Kalam Azad. Clear? So Maulana Abul Kalam Azad uh, uh, Kalam Azad finally led this movement and this movement proved to be one of the most important development in 1930 with launch of civil disobedience movement. Clear? So in this civil disobedience movement, very important development took place and Mahatma Gandhi and this movement was kept in Yeravada jail and at the same time the people continued with Dharasana, raid on Dharasana salt depot in the region of Gujarat which became one of the most important development of civil disobedience movement. Clear? So all these leaders were connected with civil disobedience movement, especially related to Dharasana Satyagraha, started after 6th of April 1930. Clear? Apart from this, Salt Satyagraha along the Coromandel coast in the Malabar region, in the Kolum in the Madras region, was launched by C. Raja Gopalachari. Okay? So C. Raja Gopalachari launched Salt Sat along the Coromandel coast in Madras province, which also became very powerful enough. Clear? Apart from this salt satyagraha, which was launched along the western coast of India, that is in Gujarat, along the eastern coast, along Coromandel coast, or the local coast, the civil disobedience movement also got reflected in far and wide corners of Indian territory. This movement got expressed in the extreme northwestern part of India under the leadership of a strong leader, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan. Okay? So Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan started a peaceful protest movement in the northwestern part of India, along with large number of religious followers. These religious followers were known as the Khudai Khidmatgars. Okay? So they were known as Khudai Khidmatgars and they are also known as red shirts. Okay? Because the colors of the shirts became red because of dust in the northwestern part of India. Clear? So, with Khudai Khidmat Gars or servants of God, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan started a peaceful protest movement and who is also known as Frontier Gandhi. Clear? And in order to suppress this movement, British deputed two regiments of Garwali soldiers from North India, but these soldiers refused to fire on the peaceful crowd, which indicated the maturity of national movement by this time. Okay? This movement that is civil disobedience this movement also got expressed effectively in the extreme northeastern corner of India. And in the extreme northeastern corner of northeastern corner of India, this movement was led by a 13-year-old girl, Rani Gadilu, okay, in the region of, in the present region of Nagaland. Okay. She originally belonged to Manipur, but was arrested in the present region of Nagaland. Nagaland was not at the time. Okay. And Rani Gadilu was arrested by the British at the young age of 13 years. Okay. She was released only after when India became an independent nation. And therefore, Jawaharlal Nehru gave a statement about her. The day will come when India will cherish her. India will rather 
appreciate her glory, appreciate her sacrifice for India. Clear? So, all these became very important developments. Moreover, during civil disobedience movement only, some regional movements got also began to take place that supported the mass movement and the Mahatma Gandhi. What were these regional movements? First of all, clear? In the provinces of Bengal and Bihar, anti chaukidari campaign was integrated with anti chaukidari campaign was integrated with civil disobedience movement in the western part in the southern part of india in karnataka the anti forest laws or anti forest campaign got integrated with the civil disobedience movement at the same time doing civil disobedience movement only clear temple entry movement began to take place in large amount clear in fact at this time only we need to understand that in this temple entry movement, movement and during civil disobedience movement a very important satyagraha was launched known as the guru vayur satyagraha in 1931 clear so guru vayur satyagraha was launched in 1931 in the region of kerala it was exactly started from the district of thrissur in kerala and it was led by leaders like k p k swamenan K. P. K. Swamenon and K. Kelappan. Clear? So, K. P. K. Swamenon and K. Kelappan started Guru Vayur Satyagraha for temple entry of the lower caste people or depressed classes to the temples in Malabar region. And that is why Kerala became the first state to allow temple entries for the people of depressed classes in India. Clear? Here only we need to understand Guru Vayur Satyagraha was followed by another satyagraha for temple entry in malabar only and this satyagraha was in form of vaikom satyagraha clear so vaikom satyagraha also took place in malabar region in 1924-25 again under the same leaders k p k swamenan and k kelappan in fact Vaikom Satyagraha is very important for this year's examination because we have completed 100 years of Vaikom Satyagraha in 2024, which was started way back in 1924 for temple entries of the untouchables and depressed classes in the region of Kerala or Malabar under KP Keswa Benan and K Kalappan. And during civil disobedience movement, it was started in form of Guru Vayur Satyagraha in 1931 in the region of Thrissur in Kerala, which became a part of civil disobedience movement as temple entry movement was largely supported by Mahatma Gandhi as well. Clear? So, it became a major development during civil disobedience movement. The most progressive aspect of civil disobedience movement was clear that this movement was made a mass movement by large scale participation of women clear women participated in large numbers and all these women who participated in civil disobedience movement they went for picketing of liquor shops clear so they went for picketing of liquor shops in india that disturbed the social fabric and domestic life and in fact huge participation of women made this movement a mass movement in india so like non-cooperation movement was made mass movement because of active participation of muslims clear civil disobedience movement was made mass movement by large scale participation of women clear so all these were distinctive features of civil disobedience obedience movement clear but this movement when it was at its peak clear was not terminated by mahatma gandhi rather at the peak of this movement this it was suspended by mahatma gandhi in 1931 who decided to proceed towards london to attend the second to attend the second session of round table conference clear now we'll come to round table conferences which was at which was convened in london at this time clear do understand first of all clear why these round table conferences 
conferences began to be convened in London. Clear? First of all, the round table conferences convened in London was reason was that when Lord Simon had come to India to review the scheme of Darkey, clear? After returning back from India, submitted his report to British authority to discuss the report of Lord Simon and to discuss about Indian affairs. Clear? British authority decided. British authority decided that they will clear British authority decided that they will discuss the report of Lord Simon and Indian affairs and for this purpose they convened the first session of roundtable conference in London in November 1930. Okay. However, leaders of Congress did not attend the first session of roundtable conference. Some leaders from other parties like Dr. B.R. Ambedkar attended the conference. Okay. And therefore, since no Congress members participated in this session, all deliberations of this session proved to be futile. Clear, and therefore, after the first session of roundtable conference, British decided to invite Mahatma Gandhi to attend second session of roundtable conference. Clear, and therefore, negotiation began between Lord Erwin and Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi again presented the second presented the same set of eleven demands that he gave to Lord Erwin before civil disobedience movement. And at this time, Lord Erwin accepted all the demands of Mahatma Gandhi, the 11 demands, and thereafter Mahatma Gandhi decided to suspend the civil disobedience movement to attend the second session of round table conference. Clear? This decision of Mahatma Gandhi was approved by Congress during annual session of Congress convened at Karachi in 1931 and this session was presided by Sardar Vallabhai Patel. Karachi sessions very important because during this session only Congress passed the resolution of fundamental rights and economic policy for common masses in India. And meanwhile, Karachi session under Sardar Vallabhai Patel authorized Mahatma Gandhi to suspend the movement and to go to London to attend second session of round table conference clear and in the second session to round table conference mahatma gandhi demanded dominion status for india clear and mahatma gandhi demanded this dominion status along with other leaders like sarojni naidu and Pandit Madan Mohan Malviya. Even this demand was rejected by the British, even though it was demanded after the passing of Pun Surat Resolution in 1929. When demand for dominion status was rejected by the British, Mahatma Gandhi returned back to India. Clear. And after returning back to India, he tried to resume the civil disobedience movement. Clear. But this time, masses did not respond altogether. And since since masses did not respond altogether to the call of Mahatma Gandhi, clear? At this time, Mahatma Gandhi was arrested by the British and meanwhile, he was released on health ground and thereafter, Mahatma Gandhi decided to withdraw the civil disobedience movement. The movement was withdrawn in 1934 and at the same time, Mahatma Gandhi resigned from Congress membership. Clear. All these developments took place from 1930 to 34. Meanwhile, British authority in London convened the third session of Roundtable Conference in November 1931. And after discussing in no November 1932, and after discussing about Indian affairs elaborately, based on all the recommendations given by Simon Commission report and all the deliberation that took place in third session of Roundtable Conferences, clear. British Parliament enacted the the most comprehensive legislation for India and this comprehensive legislation was known as Government of India Act 1935. Clear? So Government of India Act 1935 was enacted by the British Parliament to bring about the structural changes and at the same time to reconcile the leaders of India with paradigm shift in policy. This was the most comprehensive act legislation by legislated by British will come to Government of India Act 1935. So, three sessions of roundtable conferences, first in November 1930, second in September 1931, 
3rd in November 1930. Claim only second session was attended by Mahatma Gandhi along with Pandit Pandmanan Mohan Malviya and the second one known as Sarojini Naidu where he demanded dominion status but even this dominion status could not be granted by the British. Claim this development took place and meanwhile civil disobedience movement came to an end in 1934 and Mahatma Gandhi resigned from Congress membership. Clear. But while all these developments from 1930 to 34 were going on, clear, another development took place and that development was one Indian leader, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, representing the depressed classes, participated in all the three sessions of roundtable conference and he demanded proper measures for the upliftment of depressed classes and that led to serious debate between Mahatma Gandhi and Dr. B. R. Ambedkar will come to this development related to depressed classes that took place during the three sessions of roundtable conferences clear but first of all we'll talk about Dr. B. R. Ambedkar very important leader of depressed classes clear Dr. B. R. Ambedkar clear very prominent one clear coming to this great leader of international movement Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. He was born in 1891 and remained and, and was alive till 1956. Very prominent leader. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Clear. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar belonged to an untouchable community known as the Mahar community in Maharashtra region. Clear. And at the same time, clear, he was a very bright student. Clear. And he was basically, he went to Columbia University. He obtained MA in economics in 1915 from Columbia University. And he left for London School of Economics thereafter. Clear. At the same time, he joined the Baroda State Service in India in 1917. Clear. He he worked in Bombay High Court also, clear. And this person that is Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, he wanted basically to serve the interests of depressed classes in India, himself belonging to Mahar community of Maharaj and with such objective, clear. He first of all established an organization known as the Bahishkrit Hitkarni Sabha. Established an organization known as the Bahishkrit Hitkarni Sabha in 1924. Clear talked about the interest of ostracized society, bicycle society that is the scheduled caste in India. At the same time, clear, B. R. Ambedkar also started, uh, also started a Mahat Satyagra in 1927. He started the Satyagra known as the Mahad Satyagra in 1927. Clear? During this Mahad Satyagra, he fight for he fought for the right of the untouchable community to draw water from the main public tank, and this tank was known as Chavdar Tank. Clear? So he fought for the untouchable communities and he fought for the right to procure water by the untouchable community from Chavdar Tank, which was under municipal corporation region. Clear? So this for this he launched a satyagraha known as Mahat Satyagraha. Clear? Large number of people of untouchable community supported, supported Dr. Bhyar Ambedkar in, 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 in Mahat Satyagraha to procure water from a common tank. Claim at the same time, claim it led to political awareness among the untouchable community under Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Claim after this in 1930, Mahatma, uh, not B. R. Ambedkar launched Kalaram Temple Satyagraha. Claim she so also launched Kalaram Temple Satyagraha. Kalaram Temple. Satyagraha in 1930 to seek temple entry for untouchables in major temples of India. Clear. So, in 1930, he launched Kalaram Temple Satyagraha in the region of Nasik. Clear. 
clear so this movement or this or this movement was started in the region of nasik in maharashtra in maharashtra to assert the rights of the temp rights of temple entry for untouchable communities then at the same time dr b r ambedkar also started a peasant move a peasant movement against khoti system clear so he started a peasant movement against peasant movement against the khoti system clear peasant movement against the khoti system which was prevalent in the region of konkan clear so he started a peasant movement in the region of konkan against the khoti system clear the khots were the government revenue collectors mostly brahmins clear and the marathas and the muslims who exploited the farmers and tenants by collecting revenue four times the amount they remitted to the government clear so this movement was started in favor of peasantry class against the revenue collectors khots system is khots were basically the revenue collectors belonging to brahmin community the marathas the muslims who collected revenue four times the amount that they remitted to the central or government treasury clear so it was excessive amount collected by the khots clear and the system came to be known as the khoti system and he started to protest against the khoti system with support of peasant agitation in konkan region clear at the same time dr b r ambedkar also established samta sainik dal clear so dr b r ambedkar established samta sainik dal also known as ssd clear so established samta sainik dal in samta sainik dal in 1926 samta sainik dal in 1926 1926 to safeguard the human rights amongst the depressed classes clear so the purpose of samta sainik dal was to ensure proper human rights and fundamental rights of the untouchable community clear moreover he also established another political party known as independent labor party he established in independent labor party in 1937 clear so establish independent labor party in 19 1936 clear we founded this party in 1936 and this party contested for provincial elections in 1937 clear so or he this party talked about the interest of the press classes contested the provincial elections of 1937 clear moreover dr b r ambedkar ka wrote several works clear and among these works the two most important works written by dr b r ambedkar is annihilation of the caste annihilation annihilation of the caste he wrote this work annihilation of the caste and second work of dr b r ambedkar is who were who were the shudras who were the shudras two major works written by the written by dr v m bedkar and these two works are annihilation of the caste and who were the shudras clear all these major developments took place moreover dr v r m bedkar also established all india scheduled caste federation in 1942 clear so he also established the all india scheduled caste federation all india scheduled caste federation in 1942 clear and meanwhile just before his death along with large number of followers of mahar community he accepted buddhist religion at nagpur clear so he accepted buddhist religion just before his death at nagpur because he realized that within hinduism it is not possible to uplift the status of untouchable community clear so these are major works major contributions of dr b r 
Ambedkar. Apart from this, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar participated in all the three sessions of round table conference and while participating he talked about the interest of depressed classes in India. Under the influence of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar only, British Prime Minister Ramsey MacDonald, okay, British Prime Minister Ramsey MacDonald announced the Commonal Award announced the Commonal Award a Commonal Award Commonal Award in 1932 whereby members of depressed classes were to be provided reservation of seats in central and provincial legislature central and provincial legislature legislature on the basis of being treated as separate minority community clear so at this time it was made clear that separate the so depressed classes will not be considered as a part of hindu society rather they will be treated as minority communities and they would be given reservation in central and provincial legislature clear this was communal award clear Mahatma Gandhi opposed the communal award not because of reservation. Mahatma Gandhi opposed the communal award as it was an attempt to divide Hindu society. Clear? And thereafter, Mahatma Gandhi started his hunger strike and even began to coin a word, or even coined a word for depressed classes as Harijan. Clear? In fact, he began to express his ideas about depressed classes through a paper titled as Harijan from 1932. Clear? Due to hunger strike of Mahatma Gandhi, negotiations began between Mahatma Gandhi and Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, and this negotiation resulted into signing of Pune Pact. On 24th of September 1932, clear. And according to Pune Pact, it was made clear that 147 seats would be reserved for depressed classes in the Central Legislative Council, and 18% of the seats would be reserved in the other provincial councils, legislative councils for depressed classes. Clear. So Pune Pact was signed on 24th of September 1932, and in this in this reservation was guaranteed but the basis of this reservation was untouchability clear so this untouchability became the major provision of government or make big provision of the Pune pact signed between the mahatma gandhi and dr b r ambedkar clear all major works of dr b r ambedkar should be done very clearly starting with bahishkrit kardi sabha ending with his conversion to buddhist religion just before his death in 1956 so major contributions of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, always important for your examination. Clear? Now, after this, clear? as we had discussed, that British authority negotiated, discussed Indian affairs elaborately in the third session of Roundtable Conference, and based on the deliberations that took place in the third session, and also on the report of Simon Commission, clear? British authority enacted the most comprehensive legislation for India. This was enacted by British Parliament in form of the Government of India Act 1935. Okay? So, British authority enacted the most comprehensive legislation for India and this most comprehensive legislation of India was in form of the Government of was in form of the Government of India Act 1935 the most comprehensive one clear so very important for examination as well coming to government of india act india act 1935 clear so coming to these provinces first of all clear we'll discuss about these provisions clear the provisions of the government of india act 1935 had three major broad heads clear because the provisions are many so in order to understand the provisions of government of india act 1935 we can divide the provisions into under three broad heads these broad heads are number one first of all among them is all india federation clear so first major provision or principle of this act was establishment of 
All India Federation. What were the structural arrangements made to establish All India Federation? We'll come to that. Second was the major provision of provincial autonomy. Clear? So, Darki at provincial level was abolished and it was replaced by the principle of provincial autonomy. This is the second one. And third major development was related to miscellaneous provisions clear so some miscellaneous provisions were also included under government of india act 1935 clear now first of all we'll discuss about all india federation clear now what were the major things included under all india federation to be established under government of india act 1935 clear just understand about formation of all india federation clear first of all it was made clear that all india federation would be applicable to all the major parts of indian territory including princely states as well clear so it was made clear that even princely states will have to come under all india federation clear and first of all under the concept of all india federation the legislative subjects were divided into three major subjects clear these were divided into at central level federal federation level clear all legislative subjects first of all were divided into three major list clear these list will included the central list all legislative subjects were divided into three list the central list the provincial list the third one being known as central list provincial list and the concurrent list and the concurrent list and the last one was also residuary subjects residuary list clear so three was the prominent one but there was fourth one also and that fourth one was central list provincial list concurrent list and residuary list clear all the laws mentioned the central list were to be decided by central legislature all the sub laws subjects mentioned the province provincial list were to be decided by provincial legislature all the subjects mentioned concurrent list could be decided by both central and provincial legislature but in case of dispute the central law was supposed to prevail and any subject which is not mentioned the mentioned in the central provincial concurrent list were to be placed in the residuary list and laws on the residuary list could be made only by governor general and his executive council clear so residuary list contain all the subjects which were not mentioned either in central provincial and concurrent list and the laws on these subjects could be made only by governor general and his executive council clear this was one major development coming to this clear see we have question what was the role of dr b r ambedkar in the formation of rbi dr b r ambedkar suggested the idea of establishing a central bank that is rbi and he wrote a book also, book also known as the problem of rupee clear so he played an important role and rbi was also proposed under this act we'll come to this clear what is gopalachari formula we'll come to gopalachari formula not here much later at the time of transfer of power clear does the punjab wrong and khilafat wrong leads to civil disobedience movement no punjab wrong and khilafat wrong was not did not lead to civil disobedience movement why clear by this time the rollet act was abolished with respect to india so punjab wrong was rectified khilafat issue lost its relevance because just after first world war the ottoman empire declined and turkey became a secular country under mustafa kamal pasha so khilafat issue got diluted altogether so these were not the issues in civil disobedience movement gopalachari formula will come later on next question is good morning sir do khan abdul ghaffar khan was against partition but did he want to inter integrate north west of india or want independence no the khan Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan was completely against the partition of India, against the creation of Pakistan. In fact, he wanted NWP to be integrated with India. In fact, he said that all his efforts has been wasted when partition took place in India. Clear? So he had a huge resentment against the partition of India, as he never wanted NWP to be integrated with Pakistan. He wanted NWP to be integrated with India. He never supported the partition of this country. Clear? He said, "Here, Governor General and Executive Council implies vict Viceroy only, right? Yeah, Viceroy or Governor General. Again, as I told you earlier, also clear. Same officer was designated as Viceroy 
and governor general when he dealt any law according to a british crown he was designated as viceroy and when he looked after general administration was still designated as governor general so both viceroy and governor general are one and the same person in india clear okay only change in designation person was same clear so central list clear so this was major division first of all clear at the same time when this division was done clear central list clear also known as federal subjects clear so central list or central subjects were divided into also known as federal subjects this was further divided into two categories and these were known as reserved subjects reserved subjects and transferred subjects reserved subjects and transferred subjects clear the laws on the reserved subjects could be made by governor general governor general and his executive council clear and his executive council and the laws on the transfer subjects could be made by the popularly elected members how this was done all the laws on reserve subjects could be made by governor general and his executive council comprising of three members and all the laws on the transfer subjects could be made by governor general and by 10 members clear so this central list was divided into reserve subjects and transferred category meaning thereby darky which was introduced at provincial level was introduced in gov at central level by government of it the act 1935 clear 1935 meanwhile at the same time meanwhile princely states were also supposed to join this all india federation and what were the federal subjects clear the central subjects central list also reserve subjects also included federal subjects like defense federal subjects like defense communication defense communication finance and foreign affairs finance and foreign affairs clear so all these could be decided by governor general and member of three clear so this one but at the same time if these laws were supposed to prevail clear consent of at least half of the princely states was mandatory clear but consent of half of the princely states could not be obtained and therefore concept of all india federation could not be implemented at this time clear now at the same time what was basically all india federation included all india federation included basically two houses clear now apart from this all india federation included two major things apart from this all india federation included two major bodies clear one was the upper house one was the upper house upper house also known as the council of states upper house also known as the council of states at central level council of states at central level and second was lower house also known as federal assembly because of bicameralism also known as federal assembly clear no federal assembly no council of states or upper house clear it also included it included 156 members it included 156 members from british india 11 provinces 156 members from british india british india and 101 members from princely states 101 member from princely states clear lower house clear in the lower house in the lower house there were to be 250 members from british india 250 members from british india 
and 125 members from princely states. 125 members from princely states. Clear? So, by this time in the concept of All India Federation, members of princely states were to be also included. So, in the upper house, there were to be 156 members from British India, 101 from princely states. In the lower house, 250 members from British India, 125 from princely states. Clear? But for this consent of at least half of the princely states was mandatory. But none of the princely states in real sense gave their consent and therefore all India Federation could not be implemented at this time. Clear? Even though All India Federation could not be implemented, certain federal changes were introduced under the Government of India Act 1935 and those federal changes included, first of all, it included establishment of a federal court at Delhi to decide the dispute between the centre and the states clear, or provinces and this federal court was shifted from Calcutta to Delhi in form of the Supreme Court of India. So, Supreme Supreme Court was shifted from Calcutta to Delhi under Government of India Act 1935 to decide the cases related to the dispute between the centre and the provinces. Clear? But all these arrangements could not have much impact at this time because All India Federation could not be implemented as the rulers of princely states refused to join the federal system proposed by British and the Government of India Act. 1935. Clear? After All India Federation, the second principle which was introduced by the British under Government of India Act 1935, which was in form of provincial autonomy. Clear? So, Darki that failed at provincial level due to faulty division of subjects, this Darki was replaced by the principle of provincial autonomy clear now what was the major developments in provincial autonomy we'll discuss about this provincial autonomy as well clear first of all under the principle of provincial autonomy it was made clear that all the members of provincial executive council clear shall be elected by the people themselves and therefore the head of provincial executive council shall be the head of provincial administration to be designated as Prime Minister of Province. Clear? So, meaning thereby, even the head of provincial administration was to be the Prime Minister elected by the people themselves along with all the members of Provincial Executive Council. Clear? Even though the post of Governor was retained, but this post of Governor was made purely constitutional and decoratory in nature. Clear? So, British Governor could have been there at provinces, but real powers at provincial level was to be given to the people whereby people could elect the representatives to provincial executive council as well as the head of provincial executive council to be designated as prime minister. So, autonomy was guaranteed to the people at provincial level and the government of India Act 1935. Clear? Coming to legislative business, provincial at provincial level and the government of India Act 1935, by Cameralism was introduced. Clear? So, bicameralism, which was introduced at central level, was introduced at provincial level, whereby provincial legislative council was to be divided into two major groups or two major bodies known as the provincial legislative council and the provincial legislative assembly. And all the members of provincial legislative council and assembly were also to be elected by the people at provincial level. Clear? So, all provincial bodies were to be headed by Indian members only, clear? Out of 11 provinces, bicameralism was introduced in 6 out of 11 provinces at that time, clear? So, these were provisions related to provincial autonomy. Moreover, to ensure administrative autonomy at provincial level, provision was made to establish public service commissions at provincial level so that regular examination could be held to select the members of provincial administration clear so to ensure provincial autonomy it was made clear that all the members of provincial executive council were to be indians to be headed by indian leader known as 
prime minister clear the post that is presently known as chief minister at the same time bicameralism was introduced at provincial level whereby legislative based bodies were to be divided into two chambers and thirdly at this time clear at provincial level provincial public service commissions were to be established clear and provincial public service commissions were supposed to in act or supposed to supposed to recruit members for provincial administration clear so this was one major development that took place to ensure provincial autonomy clear apart from this some major provisions were made which are more of miscellaneous character what were the provisions made of a miscellaneous character coming to these provisions as well clear number one first of all clear under the miscellaneous provisions first major development was was that principle of separate electorates principle of separate electorate was introduced introduced for the scheduled caste or the depressed classes moreover it was also decided to establish the central banking institution like the reserve bank of india at the same time provinces of bihar and odisha were finally separated on linguistic ground as hindi speaking region was separated from the uriya speaking region and moreover clear at the same time burma was separated from india finally clear so burma was separated in india burma was separated from india in 1935 and a separate act was passed for burma known as government of burma act 1935 so after burma was segregated from india government of burma act was was passed in the year 1935 these were miscellaneous provisions which were made by british authority under government of india act 1935 clear so this resulted into major provisions clear and all india federation could not be implemented but to implement provincial autonomy british authority decided to conduct direct elections among the people of india in all 11 british ruled provinces clear so all india federation could not have much impact but provincial autonomy had much impact because british went on to conduct provincial elections in 1900 37 clear so major development in the government of india act 1935 with this we complete all the legislations and these legislations are very important we'll come to these legislations clear meanwhile clear we have some questions also sir so, how all attack and jalia wala bag connected to world war 1 obviously because roll attack was enacted due to the ongoing world war 1 because in world war 1 britain was fighting against germany and here britain never wanted to take any risk in india clear in fact during world war 1 only british enacted a law known as defense of india rules in 1915 to ensure the defense of india and in the name of ensuring the defense of india in world war 1 clear british authority wanted to prohibit any mass gathering any protest demonstration and to arrest any person on suspicion and for this they enacted roll act act and under the provisions of roll act only general or general directed and it resulted to massacre at jallianwala bag so roll act act and jallianwala bag are directly connected to world war 1 clear what was the reason behind the split of government of india act 1935 into two parts government of india act 1935 government of burma act 1935 we had discussed because burma was separated from india in 1935 so whether all india federation was only on paper or in real sense no all india federation at that time remained only on paper clear it was not implemented after 1935 clear did burma became independent or was it still under british rule it was also under british rule burma became independent just after india in 19 1948 so burma became an independent country in 1948 clear so these developments in the government of india act 1935 now we'll come to the implementation of the government of india act 1935 all india federation could not be implemented as prince sir refused to accept this federal principle but provincial autonomy came into being and to implement provincial autonomy british authority announced provincial elections to be held in 1937 will come to provincial elections separately clear meanwhile 
another development took place and that development was that at this time only a very prominent national leader began to arose on national platform and this national leader was subhash chandra bose clear he played a very important role in course of indian national movement coming to the contribution of subhash chandra bose here it's a clear so coming to the contribution of subhas chandra bose leadership of subhas chandra bose clear coming to them so subhas chandra bose was a very prominent one that is and he was born in 1897 23 of january that is being celebrated by government of india as prakram divas 27th of january 1897 till the year 1945 clear still we are not sure whether he died in 1945 or not but largely it is accepted that he died in a plane crash in 1945 clear now coming to so this person that is subhas chandra bose clear now subhas chandra bose was born in a wealthy and influential family in katak odisha clear which was in the bengal province clear after completing his college education subhas chandra bose went to england to prepare for indian civil services clear in 1920 passed the preliminary civil service examination but was reluctant to appear for the final exam after hearing of national movement in india clear in 1921 bose resigned from his candidacy and hurriedly came back to india and joined indian national congress big sacrifice done clear so subhas chandra bose went to london to prepare for civil services examination in 1920 he qualified the preliminary civil service examination but before appearing for final examination he decided to come back to india to join national movement in 1921 due to ongoing non cooperation movement of mahatma gandhi clear first of all bose subhas chandra bose took charge of bengal provincial congress committee and started a paper titled swaraj clear so after returning back to india in 1921 clear subhas chandra bose joined indian national movement and at the same time became a rather bit took charge of bengal provincial congress committee so he took the charge of bengal provincial congress committee took the charge of bengal provincial congress committee provincial congress committees had been established since 1921 20 1920 as we had discussed it was originally proposed by tilak and it was retreated by mahatma gandhi at nagpur session Pro bengal provincial congress committee and began to publish a paper which was titled as swaraj clear so he began to publish a paper titled as swaraj clear meanwhile at the same time clear the mentor of subhashan bose in bengal was c r das clear so c r das was the mentor of subhash chandra bose in the region of bengal clear and at the same time clear subhash chandra bose contributed towards development of national movement from here who was largely influenced by socialist ideology which became popular after russian revolution of 1917 clear so after russian revolution of 1917 he began to clear he began to promote the promote socialist ideology in indian national movement and at the the same time clear subhas chandra bose also wrote another major work to highlight his ideology towards india's emancipation and this work of subhas chandra bose is known as indian struggle this book was given by subhas chandra bose to global leaders including masolini of italy as well he wrote another work indian struggle clear now at the same time subhas chandra bose started to become highly popular in course of time and since he became highly popular in course of time he was elected as congress president at haripura session gujarat in 1938 so he became congress president at hari pura session in gujarat in 1938 and during this session he established the national planning committee 
establish the national planning committee to ensure economic planning for fair distribution of resources and the first chairman of national planning committee was his companion Jawaharlal Nehru. Okay. Moreover, he began to promote socialist ideology as Congress president. In the next year, he again wanted to become Congress president when annual session of the Congress was held at Tripuri in modern Madhya Pradesh near Jawalpur. Clear? However, the candidature of Subhash Chandra Bose was opposed by Mahatma Gandhi who wanted to prevent any radical trend in national movement and therefore in opposed to Subhash Chandra Bose, Mahatma Gandhi presented his own candidate at Tripuri session and this candidate presented by Mahatma Gandhi at Tripuri session, this candidate was Sita, was this candidate who was a peasant leader from Andhra presented by Mahatma Gandhi was Pattabhi Sitaramaya. And in the presidential election, Pattabhi Sitaramaya was defeated by Subhash Chandra Bose with a huge margin of vote. Clear? However, Mahatma Gandhi made it clear that it is not the defeat of Pattabhi Sitaramaya, it is the defeat of Mahatma Gandhi himself. Therefore, all Congress leaders requested Subhash Chandra Bose to step down from Congress presidentship and at Tripuri session finally Dr. Rajendra Prasad became the Congress president. Okay? So Dr. Rajendra Prasad became Congress president who was a close supporter of Mahatma Gandhi. Thereafter Subhash Chandra Bose resigned from Congress membership. After resigning from Congress membership he established his own political party and this political party was known as the Forward Bloc. Clear. So, this party was established by Subhash Chandra Bose as forward bloc in 1939. Clear. He began to give radical speeches against the British and in 1939 only, Second World War broke out. Clear. And during this time, British authority arrested Subhash Chandra Bose, but Subhash Chandra Bose managed to escape from India. He went to different countries of the world, even met with Hitler Clear. and ultimately landed up at Singapore in Southeast Asia to head a large cadre of Indian soldiers known as Indian National Army. Clear? We'll come to Indian National Army separately altogether. That played an important role to expedite the transfer of power to India. Clear? So Indian National Army played an important role and this Indian National Army was, of, was considered to be a very prominent force to liberate India. Clear? First of all, you should know that Indian National Army was a military guard established in Southeast Asia who were defeated by British or defeated by Japan in Second World War. Clear? Japan began to act as European powers in Southeast Asia like Britain and France and Indian forces fighting on behalf of Britain were defeated by Japan and all these forces were clapped together by two Indian officers, Captain Mohan Singh, Captain Mohan Singh and Niranjan Singh Gil. Captain Mohan Singh and Niranjan Singhal, both of them established Indian National Army in Southeast Asia. When Subhash Chandra Bose reached Southeast Asia at Singapore in 1943, Indian National Army was under the command of an Indian revolutionary and this Indian revolutionary was Rash Bihari Bose, clear. So he's different from Ghosh. He is Raj Bihari Bose, clear. And Raj Bihari Bose handed over the charge of Indian National Army to Subhash Chandra Bose, clear. So this was handed over to Subhash Chandra Bose. Subhash Chandra Bose reorganized Indian National Army and he decided to liberate India, clear. And at the same time, Subhash Chandra Bose renamed Indian National Army as Azad Hind Forge, clear. And in this Azad Hind Forge, he even established a women regiment known as Rani Lakshmi Bai Regiment, which was headed by 
Lakshmi Sehgal. Clear? Will come to one member of this Rani Lakshmi Regiment, which has been recommended by government of India presently as an unsung hero of international movement while celebrating Azadi ka Amrit Mahotsa. Will come to that member of Rani Lakshmi Bai Regiment headed by Lakshmi Sehgal at the desk. Clear? Meanwhile, Subhash Chand Bose, with support of Japanese troops, he decided to liberate India and started his march from the region of Andaman. Clear? And with the battle cry of Jai Hind and Dilli Chalo, Azad Hind Forge began to proceed towards the towards India. Clear? And the Azad Hind Forge entered up to northeastern part of India up to Imphal in Manipur. Clear? Meanwhile, when all these developments were taking place, one cadre of Indian National Army clear was led in the northwestern part of India, and this was led uh, in the northwestern part of India, along in northwestern part of India as well. That also started to create pressure on Britain. Clear? Meanwhile, at the same time, Indian National Army that proceeded from Southeast Asia towards Indo Burma border and reached up to Imphal, this was actually under the command of Captain Shah Nawaz Khan, who also played an important role as be on behalf of Azad Hind Foz. Clear? So it was under the command of Shah Nawaz Khan. Clear? This forces began to proceed. But meanwhile, clear when Japan or when forces were reaching from the northwestern part of northeastern part of India, United States in 1945 drop two atomic bombs on Japan and with this dropping of two atom bombs, Japanese aggression finally came to an end that even terminated the Second World War. Clear? And after the end of Second World War, even the fate of Azad Hind Forge came to an end. Clear? And after the death of Azad Hind Forge, after the end of Azad Hind Forge, nothing was left at this time. Clear? And therefore, it is accepted that after some time, even Subhash Chandra Bose died in a plane crash under mysterious circumstances. Clear? So, this Subhash Chandra Bose died in 1945 under mysterious circumstances, which is largely accepted. Clear? We'll come to this major development. Clear? Meanwhile, even though, clear, Indian National Army could not liberate India at this point of time. Clear? This, this Indian National Army also acted as catalyst to re-energize the masses. Clear? After end of Second World War, all political prisoners were released and British authorities started the trial of three INA members. Clear? At Red Fort in Delhi, these three INA members were Prem Sehgal, Gurdial Singh Dhillon, Prem Sehgal, Gurdial Singh Dhillon and Captain Shah Nawaz Khan and Captain Shah Nawaz Khan. And in order to defend the case of these INA prisoners, a team of Indian lawyers was constituted and this team of Indian lawyers was headed by lawyer from Gujarat, Bhula Bhai Desai. Clear? These three members were chosen from three religious communities deliberately to break the religious unity of India and to defend the case of these INA prisoners. Team of Indian lawyers was constituted under the leadership of Bhula Bhai Desai. Clear? So this was a big contribution of Subhash and Bose. Clear? Now meanwhile, when government of India launched our Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav to mark the 75 years of India's independence. Clear? They began to basically research and promote the unsung heroes of international movement. Clear? And at the same time, one major unsung hero of India's national movement was a member of INA. She was a member of Rani Lakshmi Bai Regiment and she was a lady from Patna in Bihar. And this lady was known as Lieutenant Bharti Asha Sahai Chaudhary. Clear? So it was basically Dr. Asha Sahai. This was Dr. Asha Sahai Chaudhary. Asha Sahai Chaudhary. Clear. Chaudhary. Clear. So she was also known as Lieutenant Bharti or Asha Sahai Chaudhary. And she was basically a member from Rani Jhansi Regiment. Clear. So she was a member of Rani Jhansi Regiment created by Subhash Chandra Bose, which was headed by Lakshmi Sahgal. Headed by 
Lakshmi Sahgal. Okay. So, Dr. Asha Sahai Chaudhary from Patna in Bihar, which is considered, she is considered to be a big prominent one. Clear, clear. And at the same time, clear. This Lieutenant Bharti, also known as Asha Sahai as Lieutenant. Bharti, also known as Lieutenant Bharti, clear. So she is considered to be a very prominent one. She was from Madhub, she was from Patna in Bihar. At the same time, clear, she is highly interested in Madhubani painting as well, clear. And at the same time, clear, she participated in the he participated in Azad Hind Forge, clear, and at the same time contributed towards development or rather moving towards India to liberate in this country, clear, the this the liberate country, clear, Sahai family or care, clear. This lady, along with Subhash Chandra Bose, she started to move towards India and India after joining. After joining the after joining the Indian National Army, clear, and she contributed towards great development in India. Clear. First of all, Rani's uh, rather Lieutenant Bharti was closely associated with associated with with Subhash Chandra Bose, clear. And at the same time, she was also supporting the idea of taking the support of Japan to liberate India, clear. And she joined Rani Lakshmi Bai Regiment, clear. L Rani Lakshmi Bai Regiment. After joining this Lakshmi Bai Regiment, clear, she was given or rather she was considered to be a big contributor to lead this force with the battle cry of Jai Hind, clear. At Jai Hind, clear. After she, after she was, after she contributed to this, she returned back to India when Azad Hind Forge came to an end in 1900, in 1946, clear. And just because of her heroic efforts, clear, in 2017, she was facilitated by Indian President Ram Nath Kovind, clear. So in 2017, she was it's so, awarded also by Ramnath Kovin for her contribution towards the international movement. Clear. Lieutenant Bharti or Asha Sahai Chaudhary has written her memoirs in the Second World War. And this book written by Asha, uh, this written by Asha, Lieutenant Asha is known as the War Diary of, this work written by Asha Sahai is known as the War Diary of, the War Diary of Asha. The War Diary of Asha San. Asha Shan, clear. So she is being promoted or highlighted by government of India, clear. And this is known, this is considered to be a very important development by Asha Chaudhary from Patna in Bihar. And she was a member of Rani Jhansi Regiment that was constituted by Subhash Chandra Bose, clear. So this major development, clear, after this, clear. Coming to another major development and that major development is in order to ensure provincial autonomy, government decided to announce general elections or provincial elections in 1937. Clear? And when this provincial elections were announced in 1930, to be held in 1937, differences of opinion again began to take place. Clear? And difference of opinion was among the Congress members. Why? Mahatma Gandhi never accepted the idea of office expenditure acceptance and he wanted all the members to continue with constructive program like promotion of Hindu Muslim unity, promotion of Charkha and Khadi, emancipation of women and abolition of untouchability. Clear? And some Congress leaders like Dr. Like Dr. Rajendra Prasad, Sardar Vallabhai Patel wanted to continue with constructive program of Mahatma Gandhi. Clear? But at the same time, clear, some leaders wanted to participate in provincial elections and among them the most important leader was none other then C. Raja Gopalachari. Clear? C. Raja Gopalachari originally was a no-changer, but by this time it turned to out to be a pro-changer and he wanted Congress to participate in provincial elections of 1937. But why? Clear? Why he wanted? Because he gave two logical arguments. Clear? C. Raja Gopalachari argued that ultimately we were fighting for the autonomy of Swaraj. And if it is guaranteed at provincial level, Congress must accept this responsibility to show that it is ready to take responsibility for 
free government in India and moreover, the political circumstances after non-cooperation was very different from the circumstances at this time because after the withdrawal of non-cooperation movement, there were no other political party except Congress. Even Muslim League was merged with Congress. But by this time, there were many political parties including All India Muslim League who were ready to contest the provincial election and under such circumstances, the Congress could have been easily marginalized if it abstained from provincial elections. Clear? These arguments proved to be convincing even for Mahatma Gandhi and therefore Mahatma Gandhi allowed the Congress members to participate in upcoming elections of 1937. Clear? And when this upcoming elections took place in 1937, the electoral verdict also had long-term impact on Indian national movement. Coming to provincial elections of 1937. Provincial elections of provincial elections of 1937. Provincial elections of 1937. Clear? Now, when this provincial elections took place in 1937 with approval of Mahatma Gandhi, what happened in this election? We'll come to this elections. Clear? First of all, clear? The first major development that took place in this election was clear that coming to this in this election, Congress party was able to win. When Azad Hind Fauj regime fall, was Bose also actively involved in it? Yeah, Bose was actively involved in uh, Azad Hind Fauj. So, Andaman and Nicobar Islands were captured by Japanese forces or Azad Hind. It was captured by Japanese forces. In fact, large number of members of Azad Hind Fauj were kept in the cellular jail, cellular jail in Andaman region. But at the same time, clear, all these forces were given under the command of Subhash Chand Bose when negotiation got materialized between Subhash Chand Bose and the Japanese forces. Clear? So please give some information about Neera Arya. She was also a prominent member of Azad Hind Forge. Clear? See, apart, there are many members who participated in Rani Lakshmi Bai Regiment and all of them contributed significantly towards National Movement India. Colonel Asha, Colonel Bharti is considered to be very prominent among them. And at the same time, apart from this, she was also awarded or felicitated by Government of India under Ram Nath Kovind as well. Clear? So this was also a very important development. Clear? Then, at the same time, clear, there were other persons also, clear, Neera Ari is also known as first women spy of Azad in Forge, clear. So, if you want to know about Neera Arya, Neera Arya was the first women spy, first women spy of Azad Hind Forge clear. So she was the first women spy of Azad Hind Forge clear who collected information clear. In fact, she has also been mentioned as unsung hero of international movement only clear. Azad Hind Forge clear. She was born in Khekra Nagar in Bhagpat, Uttar Pradesh. She was born in Khekra Nagar Bhagpat in Uttar Pradesh, Western Uttar Pradesh. Vakpat in Uttar Pradesh. Clear. She joined the Rani La Jhansi Regiment of Azad Hind Forge. Clear. And she also collected vital information about the movement of Japanese forces. Clear. And she was basically clear. She was lured that if she disclosed information about the leaders, especially Netaji, she would be granted bail. Clear. So when she was arrested, British forced her that if she provided information about Netaji, she would be released by the British authority. Clear. But neither had the guards and refused to give details about the leaders of freedom struggle despite all odds. Neera remained pious to the nation and went on to become the first women asset of Azad Hind Forge, a title and responsibility that was conferred upon her by Bose himself. Clear? So, Bose himself considered her to be the first women asset of Azad Hind Forge. Clear? And she died on 1998 in Osmania Hospital near Charminar in Hyderabad. Clear? So, she finally died in, nine, finally died in 1998 at Hyderabad by being treated at Osmania University. So, first women spy of 
Azad Hind Fauj, first women asset accepted by Bose and even though arrested by British, af British after, the, after the end of Azad Hind Fauj, she refused to give any detailed information about Subhash Chandra Bose, if Bose, even though she was basically lured by the British to be released if she provided all information. Okay? So, very important contributor to international movement that is Nira Ari also. Okay? Now, coming to provincial elections, okay? just about understand, okay? in this provincial elections, Congress party was able to secure absolute majority in 6 out of 11 provinces. These provinces were the central province, the United Province, Bombay, Madras, Bihar, and Odisha. So, in these provinces, Congress won absolute majority, no doubt clear. At the same time, Congress was able to form coalition governments in three other provinces, the Northwest Frontier Province, Assam, and even the region of Sindh. Clear? Now, Sindh is disputed. Why Sindh is disputed? Clear? Because in Sindh, the largest party in reserve seats was Sindh United Party, while in general constituencies, it was Sindh Hindu Mahasabha. Clear? So, it was Sindh Hindu Mahasabha or Sindh, or Sindh United Party that was there. But later on, all these parties kept together to form government and with Congress Party. Okay? Congress Party could not fare properly well in two provinces of India. And these two provinces were the provinces of Punjab and the provinces of Bengal, the sensitive one. Okay? In the province of Punjab, a regional political party known as the Unionist Party won landslide victory and on behalf of this party, Sikandar Hayat Khan became the Prime Minister. Okay? So, Punjab began to be headed by Sikandar Hayat Khan as Prime Minister and in province of Bengal, okay? in the province of Bengal, Krishak Praja Party became, came into power. Okay? So, in Bengal, All India Muslim League and Krishak Praja Party formed coalition government formed coalition government under the prime ministership of fazl ul haq under the prime ministership of fazl ul haq clear so big development took place and at this time elections made one thing clear Congress was the most representative party. Muslim League did not enjoy popularity in India. Muslim League could form one government only in Bengal. That too with a coalition partner known as the Krashak Praja Party. Clear? So all together Congress was able to form government in 9 out of 11 provinces except Punjab and Bengal where non-Congress ministries were formed. Clear? Now all these Congress ministries which were formed in 9 out of 11 provinces, all these Congress ministries gave they have important services to the people of India, clear? And all these Congress ministries remain in offices almost for 28 months, more than two years, from 1937 till 1939. What happened in these two years? In these two years, Congress members, clear? C. Rajagopalachari, for instance, was the Prime Minister of Madras province. The Sri Krishna Singh was the Prime Minister of Bihar province. And all these leaders, they gave complete freedom and discipline to the people. They saved every single penny and traveled in second class compartment to save the public revenue. And with this revenue, they provided provided better roads, bridges, transportation, medical facilities, schools and colleges, post offices. These were the vital requirements of the people and government came forward to provide all these services to the people. And therefore, people began to have a sense of real freedom in India. Clear? And therefore, this led to huge popularity of Congress ministries in 9 out of 11 provinces. Clear? But after 28 months in 1939, all these Congress ministers resigned collectively 
collectively. Clear? Why they resigned collectively? Because in 1939, British authority, or 1939 Second World War broke out and Britain declared India to be a party to Second World War without taking the consent of Indian leaders. In order to protest against this decision of the British and to start another round of active struggle, all Congress ministers resigned in 1939. That led to the further respect among the people in India and Congress ministries finally came to an end in 1939. Clear? At the same time when Congress ministries came to an end in 1939, all these provinces began to be administered through ordinary issued by governors. Clear? It was a big relief for Muhammad Ali Jinnah also and the day Congress ministers resigned, Muhammad Ali Jinnah declared this day as day of deliverance. So he, he celebrated the day as day of deliverance because Congress minister resigned in 9 out of 11 provinces. Clear? Meanwhile, when all these developments began to take place, Second World War started and what major developments took place during Second World War will come to the major developments in Second World War as well. Clear? So coming to the Second World War that started in 1939. Provincial elections. Clear? Now coming to the course of international movement during Second World War. During course of international movement from during Second World War. 1939 to 1945. What major developments took place in the Second World War? Clear? Now, coming to these major developments in Second World War. Clear? As soon as Second World War started, clear? All Congress ministers resigned at the same time and they asked Mahatma Gandhi to launch mass movement clear at the same time mahatma gandhi clear made it very clear that at this time that second world war is a fight between democratic countries and the fascist countries clear second world war was started by some fascist countries of the world and these fascist countries of the world included countries like germany italy and Japan. Clear? The three powers together also known as the Axis powers at global level. Clear? What do we mean by fascist countries? These countries believed in aggressive sense of nationalism or ultranationalism and they wanted to pursue ultranationalism to serve their own pride by attacking other countries. Clear? So fascism as an ideology was against global peace and security and Mahatma Gandhi believed that fascism is a more serious threat than imperialism and at this critical time these fascist countries fighting against countries like Britain Britain needed to be supported by Mahatma Gandhi. Clear? So Mahatma Gandhi showed sympathy towards democratic countries like Britain against the aggression of fascist countries. But Mahatma Gandhi also made it clear how an enslaved nation can support Britain at this time. Mahatma Gandhi demanded immediate grant of dominion status to India so that India can support Britain to fight against fascist countries during Second World War. Clear? In order to reconcile Indian leaders and to ensure their support, British authority announced an offer in 1940. This offer announced by British authority is popularly known as the August Offer of 1940. Clear? Why this August offer was announced in 1940? Just to ensure the support of Indian leaders to fight in Second World War against fascist countries. Clear? Now, what were the proposals given in the August offer? These are very important developments which are asked repeatedly in your prelims examination. You should have these proposals. Clear? First of all, this August offer guaranteed grant of dominion status to India grant of dominion status to India in near future without any time limit clear so grant of dominion status to India in the near future this was one offer given proposal given clear then expansion of viceroy's executive council including some Indian also expansion of viceroy's Executive Council 
expansion of viceroy's executive council clear then at the same time setting up of constituent assembly setting up of constituent assembly setting up of constituent assembly to draft the future constitution of india along with promotion features like all india services then economic social and cultural rights to the people of india then at the same time it was also made clear also made clear that to get clear that no future constitution no future constitution no future constitution can be adopted no future constitution can be adopted without the consent of minority communities without the consent of minority communities meaning that by veto power given to minority community especially muslim league clear so four major proposals given by given under august offer by the british to indian leaders clear at the same time since all these were dominion status not with a specified time limit and veto power given to minority committees congress party rejected the august offer immediately clear so this was rejected by british authority immediately in fact jawahar lal nehru gave a statement about this august offer and it was like dominion status he gave a statement jawahar lal nehru that dominion status dominion is a concept is dominion status concept because he wanted complete independence of pun swaraj dominion status concept is dead as a door nail dead as a door nail dead as a door nail because it was already a dead thing because now jawahar lal nehru was demanding pun swaraj or complete independence clear this was august offer of 1940 clear this was one thing at the same time clear since august offer was rejected by mahatma gandhi also in order to launch a symbolic protest against the british mahatma gandhi launched his individual satyagraha in 1940 that is satyagraha by one person at a time and the first person to offer satyagraha in the individual capacity was achar vinoba bhave the spiritual successor of mahatma gandhi followed by jawahar lal nehru clear so mahatma gandhi launched individual satyagraha in 1940 and this individual satyagraha was started by achar vinoba bhave the first satyagrahi followed by jawahar lal nehru clear meanwhile when all these developments were taking place japan began to attack india and japanese forces began to enter india from north eastern side clear this created a sense of insecurity both among the british members as well as indian leaders clear and under such circumstances british again tried to win the support of indians to fight against japan clear and at this time british authority deputed its officer member of british cabinet to india sir stafford cripps clear so sir stafford cripps came to india in 1941 sir stafford cripps negotiated with indian leaders and after negotiating and discussing with indian leaders sir stafford cripps announced his own proposals clear and these proposals were announced by sir stafford cripps in 1942 which are known as the cripps proposals clear so cripps proposals were announced by sir stafford cripps in 1942 clear now what were included in the cripps proposal now it was basically the first thing that the dominion status to india it a short dominion status to india after second world war after the war 
so after second world war here also no time limit but it was made clear after second world war dominion status would be given to india clear at the same time it was also made clear that the made clear that constitution of india would be drafted by elected body after the war clear so elected body elected body to draft to draft constitution to draft constitution after second world war this was third thing clear at the same time clear any province of india clear to have the right to reject the new constitution any province any province could reject the constitution could reject the constitution and could draft its own constitution clear a constitution fourth was the princely states to be represented in proportion to the population princely states to be represented to be represented according to proportion of population according to proportion of population clear proportion of population so this were the major provisions or proposals of such effort crabs clear even this was not acceptable because anyway provinces were given the right to reject the constitution and dominion status i was to be guaranteed after second world war no one knew when the war would come to an end and therefore mahatma gandhi gave a statement about this crab proposal that it was like a post dated check to which jawahar lal nehru added on a failing bank clear because britain was have suffering reverses from german aggression led by adolf hitler clear so it was basically considered to be a failing bank britain could not honor this check altogether and the anyway this check was a post dated check clear so this post dated check was granted at this time by british by british authority and this was rejected by congress leaders clear so very important development that took place clear meanwhile at the same time when japanese forces began to advance towards india panic was created among indian leaders also and under such circumstances mahatma gandhi convened the meeting of all india congress committee at bombay on 8th of august 1942 and during this meeting mahatma gandhi decided to launch his third mass movement and this third mass movement was named as the quit india movement in 1942 which was to be started from the next day 9th of august 1942 so this became the background for the third mass movement and the third mass movement was in form of the quit india movement clear so coming to the quit india movement of 1942 quit india movement of 1942 clear coming to this movement first of all clear clear what happened to hindu mahasabha independent labor party 1937 election hindu mahasabha could not win any major seat in the 1937 election not did the independent labor party clear the indian labor party been some elections result for schedule caste clear sir please also explain the gandhi irvin pact with rtc gandhi irvin pact was signed on 5th of march 1931 as i told you clear mahatma gandhi presented the same set of 11 demands before lord irvin lord irvin accepted all those 11 demands leading to Gandhi had been packed on 5th of March 1931 and according to Gandhi had been packed Mahatma Gandhi agreed to suspend the civil disobedience movement and to go to attend second session of round table conference clear meanwhile Mahatma Gandhi Lord Irwin accepted the demand or accepted 11 demands and at this time there was one controversy people of India demanded that death penalty awarded to Sardar Bhagat Singh and his comrades should be converted into life imprisonment clear but no discussion took place in fact clear 
Lord Irwin was not ready to have any discussion on these issues. Clear? And therefore, meanwhile, Mahatma Gandhi suspended the movement. Sardar Bhagat Singh, Sivrab Rajguru, Sukhdev Thapar were hanged on 23rd of March 1931. Clear? So, can we say that after World War One, British will give domain status without federation? It was not sure. They always were gaming, ensuring that they will be storing domain status after the war. But what could happen? It's a counterfactual thing. We cannot say exactly. So, what was the what was Raj Bihari Bose actions before INA control and after fleeing from India? Clear? Raj Bihari Bose after left India, he began to unite or he began to lead major agitation outside India and ultimately when INA was formed, he began to reorganize the Indian National Army and even began to lead this army till Subhash and Bose reached Singapore in 1943. Why Japan initially supported INA but later was hostile towards it? Clear? Japan was initially supported INA because Japan wanted to liberate India from British rule and have wanted to have its own indirect control. But later on when Japan realized INA and the Subhash and Bose wanted to relieve India and to rule independently, it was not acceptable to Japan and therefore Japan became hostile to International Army, including Subhash Chandra Bose. Clear? So, these developments took place and that is why Japan became hostile to International Army in later course of time. Clear? Now, coming to Quit India Movement of 1942. Just understand about this movement. Clear? When August offer was rejected by the Congress and at the same time they also rejected the proposals of Sir Stafford Krebs. Clear? Then after Mahatma Gandhi began convened the meeting of All India Congress Committee committee at Bombay and decided to launch Quit India Movement. Clear? Quit India Movement because he wanted British to quit India, to leave India so that India may not become a battleground between Britain and Japan that was already coming from northeastern side. Clear? In fact, while launching this movement, Mahatma Gandhi gave the slogan of do or die. That meant Indians will either liberate the motherland or will end their lives peacefully through hunger strike. Clear? So no violence was proposed by Mahatma Gandhi. He wanted Indians either to liberate this country or to die in this process peacefully just to create moral pressure on Britain. Clear? This movement was to start on 9th of August 1942 but on, in the early hours of 9th of August, British arrested all prominent Congress leaders including Mahatma Gandhi and therefore the movement was left directionless, the movement was left leaderless. That is why the first distinctive feature of this movement was this movement became violent and spontaneous in nature. Okay? So this movement became violent and spontaneous in nature because all prominent Congress leaders were arrested on 9th of August 1942. Clear? This was clear. Since it became violent and spontaneous in nature, it is also known as August Revolution. It's also known as August Kranti. Clear? So, popularity is known as August Kranti or August Revolution. Clear? So, very important development that took place at this time. Clear? And it was started with the slogan of do or die given by Mahatma Gandhi. Clear? Now, coming to this development, what were the major features? Clear? This movement was started. Clear? This movement was started in India is in India by a young girl. This young girl was Aruna Ganguly, later known as Aruna Asafali, who hoisted the tricolor flag of India on all important buildings. Later on, another woman, Usha Mehta, organized the secret service of All India Radio to coordinate with major leaders in different parts of India. Third major feature was during this movement, local leaders came to the forefront and local leaders established parallel governments in different parts of India. And parallel governments were established at places like Balia in eastern Uttar Pradesh. Balia in Eastern Uttar Pradesh, then Tamluk in Bengal, Tamluk in Bengal, Midnapur region, Bengal, Midnapur region. In Balia, the government was established by local leader Chitu Pandey. In Bengal, the government was known as Jatiya Sarkar. 
known as Jatiya Sarkar at Satara, which was the longest serving parallel government. This government, Satara Maharashtra, it was founded by Nani Patel and it was known as Prati Sarkar, representative government. So, parallel governments were established during Quit India movement. Clear? At the same time, during Quit India movement, the epicenter of this movement was Eastern Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, Eastern UP and Bihar, Eastern UP and Bihar, in which the leading role was played by students. Okay. So, students began to attack all the symbols of British imperialism and students began to attack all the symbols of British imperialism like the railway lines, the telegraph lines, just because they wanted more and more freedom and right. And students were filled with resentment also because of huge inflation during the during, during Second World War and complete lack of employment opportunities so grievances among the students began to get manifested and these grievances began to manifest by the violent actions against the british okay? and prominent students who participated student leader who participated during quit india movement these students in this route student leaders included jay prakash narayan jay prakash narayan leader from bihar then Ram Manohar Lohia, Ram Manohar Lohia, Ram Manohar Lohia. Okay. So Jay Prakash Narayan and Ram Manohar Lohia, they participated in uh, as a student leader. They were socialist leaders. Okay. And both these leaders later on escaped to Nepal. And in Nepal, they established another force known as Adas Azad Dasta to liberate India. Clear? Among his students who participated in Quit India movement, one of those students was known as Karpuri Thakur, who participated actively during Quit India movement, was arrested also by the British, and Karpuri Thakur later on became Chief Minister of Bihar twice. Clear? He was from Samastipur in Bihar region. Clear? So he belonged to Samastipur in Bihar. He was Bihar Chief Minister twice and at the same time recently in 2024, Government of India has decided to award him with highest civilian award and this highest civilian award is Bharat Ratna. Clear? So Bharat Ratna has been given to Karpuri Thakur who was from Bihar who participated in Quit India movement was arrested at the same time. Later on after India's independence became Chief Minister of Bihar twice and at the same time has been recently awarded with Bharat Ratna. Clear? At the same time during Quit India movement one major or unfortunate development was that communist leaders turned out to be pro-British. Clear? Why communist leaders turned out to be pro-British? The reason was clear that at this time in the course of Second World War, Hitler even attacked Soviet Union. And when Soviet Union was attacked by Hitler, all communist leaders faced a dilemma. And that dilemma was whether to support national movement or to show sympathy with Soviet Union. They chose to give preference to the ideology and they decided to show sympathy to Soviet Union. In order to show sympathy to Soviet Union, they decided to support British India because both Britain and Soviet Union were the common victims of Hitler's aggression. Clear? In order to show opposition to Hitler and to show sympathy to Soviet Union, all communist leaders decided to support British in India and just because of this only, they provided information about all these rebel leaders and this facilitated the British in suppressing the quit India movement within few months. Clear? So, Quit India movement was brutally suppress suppressed within few months, and this was largely because of communist leaders. Clear? And as a reward to the communist leaders, British declared Communist Party of India as a legal party. We had discussed this party became an illegal party in 1934. It was again declared to be a legal party in 1942. But Communist Party of India lost all popular support among the masses thereafter and it was a big setback for Communist Party and even National Movement. Clear? So this was third mass movement known 
known as the Quit India Movement of 1942. Clear? Now, meanwhile, at the same time, when all these developments were going on, Second World War came to an end in 1945, and after the death or end of Second World War, clear? Major developments began to take place towards transfer of power to India, as Britain could not retain colonies in Asia and Africa. Clear? So, coming to the next phase, and the next phase is. Post-war developments. Clear? Now, what were these post-war developments in India? Post-war developments. That is after 1945. Clear? First of all, the first major development was all Congress leaders were released in 1945. And at the same time, British started the trial of three INA members at Red Fort in Delhi, that is Prem Sehgal, Gurdial Singh Delon, and Captain Shanawas Khan. And to defend the case of these three INA prisoners, team of Indian lawyers was constituted under Bhula Bhai Desai. Claim the Red Fort trial acted as catalyst to energize masses once again, and masses began to gather once again for final showdown clear so it was basically a big development at the same time INA trial starting in delhi clear and at the same time clear in order to support the case of INA members clear INA day was observed by the congress on 12th of november and 5 from 5 to 11 november uh, 5 to 11 november clear it was decided to have INA week so INA day was observed on 12th of november 1945 clear and meanwhile all major lawyers came together to defend the case of INA lawyers led by Bula by the side and these lawyers included Tej Bahadur Sapru KN Kaju Jawaharlal Nehru and Asaf Ali, clear. So all of them came together to defend the case of INA prisoners, and these leaders became very important, especially Bula Bhai Desai, Jawaharlal Nehru, KN Kaju, and Tej Bahadur Sapro. Clear. This acted as catalyst to energize masses. So first major thing was Red Fort trial. So Red Fort trial started in the year. 1945 this was first major development after red fort trial the next major development was in 1946 and that was in form of royal indian navy mutiny royal indian navy or ren mutiny Royal Indian Navy Mutiny. Clear? Now, what was this mutiny all about? We'll just understand. Clear? The Royal Indian Navy Mutiny took place after the after Indian National Army trials. So as soon as INA trials came to an end, Royal Indian Navy Mutiny took place. Clear? The immediate cause of rain mutiny was dis dissatisfaction over the general conditions in the Navy. Clear? In the Navy, there were a large number of Indian officers. These officers were discriminated on racial ground. These officers were not given hygienic food and they were they were abused with boots by the European counterparts. Clear? So all this could not, not be tolerated by the royal officers or naval officers of royal indian navy and they decided to revolt against the british clear the revolt is started at two places clear the revolt started at karachi and bombay clear so the revolt took place at karachi and bombay by the officers of royal indian navy clear on february 18 on february 18 1946 clear 18 clear large number of royal indian navy officers belonging to a naval unit known as naval unit known as talwar revolted at bombay revolted at bombay and just after some time another unit known as hindustan revolted at karachi revolted at Karachi. Claim Karachi. Now, at the same time, the revolt at these two places were well coordinated by a naval officer. This naval officer was M. S. Khan. Clear. So, M. S. Khan coordinated the attack. Clear. This Royal Indian Navy mutiny was marked by ideological unity and religious unity as the leaders of this mutiny hoisted the flag of Congress, 
Muslim League and CPI together to show religious and ideological unity. Moreover, in course of time, Indian armed forces also joined the Rin mutiny and the very base on which British authorities sustained that base got eroded. eroded. Moreover, the revolt could not be suppressed by the British. At Bombay, the revolt came to an end on the request of Sadar Vallabh Bhai Patel and at Karachi, it came to an end on the request of Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Clear? So, at Bombay, it came to an end on the request of Patel and at Karachi, it came to an end on the request of Jinnah. Clear? And therefore, Rin Mutiny is considered to be the last nail in the coffin to end the British rule in India. Clear? So, this proved to be the last nail in the coffin to coffin of British rule in India. By this time, the fate of British rule got sealed away completely and British rule was about to come to an end. Clear? So, these two were major developments that expedited the grant of independence. It was read for trial and Royal Indian Navy Mutiny that started started in 1946 clear so ren mutiny took place clear meanwhile at the same time clear coming to all these developments side by side constitutional deliberations began to take place for transfer of powers all these developments convinced british they cannot hold on india's colony anymore they have to give constitutional rights to indian and to ensure transfer of power clear this result into constitutional deliberations and transfer of power clear so coming to constitutional deliberations constitutional deliberations and transfer of power constitutional deliberations and transfer of power coming to constitutional deliberations and transfer of power clear so let us let us discuss about constitutional developments and transfer of power clear now we have some questions. Why Japan? We have discussed. Sir Jinnah also rejected August of and Crips proposal. Yeah, it was basically Muslim League also who rejected Crips proposal and August of. Uh, clear, it was not acceptable to them also. Clear. Now coming to constitutional developments and transfer of powers. Clear. First of all, we need to understand what were the factors that led or that convinced United Kingdom of Britain to transfer of power to India. Clear. So factors leading to transfer of power. Clear. What were the factors? Then we'll come to elaborate them. What were the factors that led to transfer of power to Indian leaders? Clear. First was basically INA trials. Indian National Army trials cannot be denied. This acted as catalyst, no doubt. This acted as catalyst. INA trials, clear. After INA trials, there was a certain fact and clear that is Ren mutiny. Ren mutiny, 1946. Last nail in the coffin to end British rule in India. After Ren mutiny, we have pressure from United States and and USSR, clear. So pressure from United States and USSR, Soviet Union. Global pressure also played an important role. Then pressure from United Nations, especially Trusteeship Council, especially Trusteeship Council, body of United Nations, Trusteeship Council, clear, and at the same time, clear, British economy, British economy, it was not in the capacity of all colonies, British economy in shambles, in shambles, after Hitler's attack, after 
Hitler's attack. Aerial bombardment was done on Britain. So these were the factors that convinced British to transfer power. Iron at trials, the Rin mutiny, pressure from United States and USSR, pressure from United Nations, the Trusteeship Council, and British economy in shambles after Hitler's attack. And these were the major factors that led to transfer of power from the British to Indian hands clear and will this factors be proved to be very important clear apart from this now coming to the major developments that took place the towards transfer of power and constitutional developments clear the first major apart from factors clear coming to sequence of events after this clear first major sequence that convinced British and that United Indians, clear, this was basically marked by first major development known as Bengal Famine. We have discussed about this Famine earlier also. We have discussed all the Famines, clear. So, Bengal Famine of 1943, clear. Now, how come Bengal Famine became a major factor towards grant of independence to India? Because it was largely considered to be a man-made Famine, which, was, which almost took the form of Holocaust, clear. So, Bengal for mine of 1953 is known as the man-made for mine under British rule, which is also known as Holocaust in pre-independent era. Welcome to the Bengal for mine of 1943. It's clear. First of all, let us discuss about constitutional deliberations and transfer of power in this we had we started to discuss about bengal for mine why it is important that took place in 1943 claim bengal for mine took place in 1943 that claimed almost the lives of 3 million people in province of Bengal, clear, and this province or this catastrophe, this famine, clear, was largely man-made in nature. Why, clear? First of all, the primary region for this famine was the Japan's occupied Burma, clear. So, Japanese occupation of Burma, Japanese occupation of Burma stopped the supply of rice from Burma to India because Burma was a rice producing region. Large amount of rice exported from Burma got stopped and the rice got diverted towards Japan. This was one major factor that led to the major development then. At the same time, the production of rice also got affected because of Tidal waves that emerged in Bengal at this time. This was also one thing. Tidal waves clear. And at the same time, fungal disease also emerged in Bengal, which proved to be epidemic. Clear. So, fungal epidemic took place in Bengal. And moreover, whatever rice was there, British authority hoarded. Clear. So, British hoarded the rice, rice food grain. British hoarded rice which was diverted to feed the large warriors fighting in second world war clear so just because of all these developments it proved to be a largely a man-made factor and it resulted to be a man-made for mine that claimed lives of three million peoples in fact large number of experts began to claim that british prime minister winston churchill was largely responsible for this for mine because on the advice of Winston churchill the rise of the bengal region was was diverted to feed the large number of forces fighting in second world war and people were left at the mercy and therefore large number of people suffered casualty because of this famine of 1943 okay? so big development took place at this point of time and bengal famine that took place in 1943 created resentment all across the people in india and just because of this huge resentment that prevent, began to prevail among the people of india the people People started to revolt, started to organize together in order to protest against British authority and demanded immediate transfer of power to Indian hands as it was declared to be a man-made disaster. It was declared to be a man-made holocaust under the rule of British authority and it cannot be denied. Clear? Just after this Bengal, Bengal for mine only, several national leaders of India began to come forward and began to give their ideas and proposals to ensure transfer of power immediately as 
as people were showing resentment to tolerate British rule in India. Clear? And just after this Bengal for mine, clear? The next major development took place was that one prominent national leader came to forefront. He gave his ideas and proposals to ensure transfer of power immediately because huge resentment began to prevail among masses in India. Clear? And this leader was Sir Raja Gopalachari. So, C. Raja Gopalachari, Chakravarti Raja Gopalachari gave his formula in 1944 that is popularly known as C. Our formula clear so he began or national leaders came forward to give their own concepts and ideas to ensure transfer of power especially after bengal for mine of 1943 clear so should we stop the answer writing in these film months for prelims yeah i would okay i would all suggest that those who are taking prelims in 2024 they should focus more on prelims examination rather than writing practice this writing practice can be resumed after writing attempt to your prelims examination in may 2024 clear i have not understood provincial autonomy just keep it with you i'll explain provincial autonomy separately for you clear now first of all coming to this developments i'll just remind me at the end i'll discuss provincial autonomy clear so coming to c rajagopalachari ideas known as cr form of 1944 clear so C. Raja Gopalachari began to give his own formula what were the major developments in this formula clear first major thing advocated by C. Raja Gopalachari was that Muslim League must cooperate with the Congress to demand complete independence clear so first thing that was advised by C. Raja Gopalachari was Muslim League should cooperate muslim league should cooperate with the congress with the congress to ensure transfer of power to ensure transfer of power this was one thing advised by C. Raja Gopalachari in his formula. Second poja thing advised by him clear. Muslim League should cooperate. Muslim League should cooperate. Muslim League should cooperate with the Congress. Muslim League should cooperate with the Congress in forming provincial governments, in forming provincial interim government, in forming, in forming provincial interim, short term, provincial interim governments. This is second thing to be done. Third major proposal clear. After the end of Second World War, the population of Muslim majority areas, that is Northwest, Northeast, would decide by plebiscite whether or not to form a separate state. Clear. So after the end of war, after the war, after the war means Second World War. After the end of war or second world war, the population of Muslim majority areas, the population of the population of Muslim majority, the po population of Muslim majority areas, that is the northwest after the war the population of muslim majority areas that is the northwest and the northeast and the northeast including bengal clear okay? and the northeast would decide would decide by plebiscite oh 
or decide by plebiscite to form to form plebiscite to form a separate state to form a separate state this was another thing clear the great state clear now in case of partition fourth one fourth one was in case in case of partition in case of partition essential common services like essential essential common services essential common services like defense commerce and communication like defense commerce communication communication to be together to be run to be run together to be run together fifth formula clear to be run together okay the above formula the above formula to be applicable the above formula to be applicable only after the above formula to be applicable only after transfer of britain by transfer of power britain only after transfer of power by britain that is after india's independence power by Britain. Clear. Next is six one. What was the development? Jinnah rejected. Jinnah rejected the formula. CR formula. Jinnah rejected the CR formula. Basically on the issue of plebiscite. Clear. So Jinnah rejected the formula on the issue of plebiscite he wanted only muslim to participate in plebiscite on the issue of plebiscite on the issue of plebiscite clear hey, hindu leaders also hindu leaders also condemned the formula hindu leaders also condemned the formula also condemned the formula clear so cr formula clear so ultimately this cr formula could not be accepted by both muslim league and hindu leaders because hindu leaders accepted it is a tacit acceptance of pakistan or a separate nation state clear so these were major things under c rajagopalachari formula which was given by c rajagopalachari in 1944 clear after c rajagopalachari formula was not accepted or rather rejected by leaders of more muslim league like Muhammad Ali Jinnah and even condemned by Hindu leaders. Clear. Another constitutional negotiation took place, formula took place, and that was in form of third one known as Gandhi Jinnah talks. Again in 1944, Gandhi Jinnah talks. Clear. Now Gandhi Jinnah talks. What was the basis? The basis of Gandhi Jinnah talks was basis was. basis was cr formula 
on this basis only they began to discuss basis was c r formula basis of this over c r formula clear gandhi proposed for separate state only for those muslims from muslim majority provinces who wanted separation clear so gandhi proposed gandhi proposed proposed for separate state gandhi proposed for separate state gandhi proposed for separate state only for those muslims only for only for those muslims only for those muslims only for those muslims from muslim majority areas only for those muslims from muslim majority areas muslim majority areas who wanted separation not for all of them who wanted separation who wanted separation clear clear right he also advised clear mahatma all advised mahatma also advised advised common services for both advised to keep advised common services like defense and all common services for both states common services for both states clear clear okay now on the other hand jinnah what was the demand of jinnah here clear fourth one point of jinnah jinnah insisted jinnah insisted for having all the six jinnah insisted for having all six provinces from all six provinces from all six provinces from northwest and northeast all six provinces from northwest and northeast six provinces from northwest and northeast for the creation of pakistan for the creation of pakistan for the creation of pakistan clear so six provinces from northwest and northeast for the creation of pakistan not acceptable to mahatma gandhi clear mahatma gandhi gandhi only for those muslims who are in muslim majority areas they can decide they should they can have demand their separate state clear these talks also failed in 1944 between mahatma gandhi and muhammad ali jinnah Muhammad Ali Jinnah that affected the transfer of power. The next major development after Gandhi Jinnah talks clear. This form, this development was Desai Liaquat Pact. Desai Liaquat Pact. Clear. Desai Liaquat Pact of 1945. Desai Liaquat Pact. Clear. now in the proposed interim government both congress and the league to have given equal status clear this was decided by bula bai desai and liaquat ali khan bula bai desai from congress liaquat ali khan from the muslim league clear in the proposed in in the proposed interim government in the proposed in the proposed interim government both both the congress both the congress 
both the Congress and the League. Congress and the Muslim League and the Muslim League to have equal representation Muslim League Muslim League would be given would be given equal representation would be given equal representation would be given would be given equal equal representation clear minority representation would be 20 percent minority representation would be 20 percent clear both the congress and league rejected the proposal both the congress and the league and the league rejected the proposal rejected the proposal this i liaquat pact of 1945 clear this was second thing this also got rejected all these are important developments towards transfer of power transfer of power then fifth one the fifth major development was the wavel plan which was given in 1945 the wavel plan in 1945 given by Lord Webel, clear. Webel plan given by Lord Webel. It's also known as Shimla Conference, clear. Clear. Now, he convened, or rather, he, in order to discuss the proposal, he convened even Shimla Conference in June 1945, clear. After this, so Webel plan. What was the, what was included in Webel plan number one, clear. First of all, the Viceroy's Executive Council was to have all Indian members except the Viceroy and Commander-in-Chief, clear. So, the Viceroy's the Viceroy's Executive Council, the major decision making body, Executive Council was to have, was to have Indian members, no British member, was to have Indian members, was to have Indian members except was to have Indian members except the Viceroy himself, except the Viceroy and Commander-in-Chief, except Viceroy and Commander-in-Chief, and Commander-in-Chief. This was first major thing. Second was there would be equal representation of high caste Hindus and Muslims and other Indian communities. Clear? So equal representation, equal representation of Hindus, Muslims and other communities and other communities other communities clear the defense portfolio would be under british authority till power was transferred the defense portfolio under british defense under british defense under british
डिफेंस अंडर ब्रिटिश फोर्थ वन इज द वाइस रॉयस ऑफ गवर्नर जनरल स्टिल हैव टू पावर टू स्टिल हैव वीटो पावर बट इट्स यूज विल बी मिनिमल क्लियर सो वाइस रॉय वुड स्टिल हैव वीटो पावर वाइस रॉय वुड हैव वीटो पावर Viceroy would have veto power, and fifth one is if this proposal was accepted for central government, similar councils would be formed in provinces comprising of local leaders. Clear. So if it is accepted central level, it will be, it will be applied even at provincial level, even at. provincial level these were major proposals given by bevel plan and to discuss this plan only lord bevel convened a conference at shimla in 1945 known as shimla conference clear so discuss the bevel plan only shimla conference was convened by lord bevel clear so bevel plan then six when followed by shimla conference followed by shimla conference in 1945 clear and in shimla conference clear in shimla conference the muslim league leader mohammad ali jinnah rejected the bevel plan and bevel plan also could not be implemented clear so jinnah objected to inclusion of any non muslim league into executive council he claimed that the muslim league was the sole representative of all india muslim league congress wanted to nominate members of all caste religions including muslims clear league demanded veto power to be used in case of any constitutional proposal and at the same time bevel plan was thus dissolved due to difference between congress and the league clear so bevel plan was dissolved largely because Muslim League demanded that it is the Muslim League will only appoint all the members to the all the members to all the members in the Executive Council. Congress will not be allowed to appoint any Muslim members in Executive Council, and this led to failure of the Shimla Conference as well. After Shimla Conference, the next major development was basically in form of Cabinet Mission Plan. Cabinet Mission Plan. in 1946 clear what happened in cabinet mission plan in 1946 clear now first of all who were the members of cabinet mission plan the cabinet mission plan had three members and these members were sir pathik lawrence sir pathik Pethik Lawrence. He was the chairman of the cabinet mission. Clear. All the three members for British cabinet. Sir Pethik Lawrence. He was the secretary of state for India. He was the secretary of state for India. Sir Pethik Lawrence. Then Sir Stafford Cripps. Sir Stafford Cripps was president of board of trade. Clear. He was the president of board of trade. and then av alexander av alexander he was basically the first lord of admiralty clear so he was the first lord of admiralty naval force clear three member commission known as cabinet mission plan clear no cabinet mission plan made it clear the dominion of india would be granted independence without any partition clear so first of all it rejected the idea of partition of india so cabinet mission plan first of all clear cabinet mission plan rejected rejected the demand for pakistan rejected the demand for pakistan rejected the demand for pakistan clear pakistan now at the same time the union of india to deal only with foreign affairs defense and communication so federal subjects were federal subjects included defense communication defense communication a uh, communication and foreign affairs and foreign affairs clear this was second one 
third major thing clear the third way the provinces would be divided into three groups clear so compulsory grouping of provinces were divided into group a group b and group c clear and three groups were under group a six provinces of central province united province bombay madras bihar and odisha were included under group b they included punjab northwest frontier province and sind and group c they included bengal and assam clear so at the same time compulsory grouping of provinces were done and this grouping of provinces could not be interchanged clear and at the same time each province was left left free to form their own elected government clear arrangements were made for constitutional assembly for writing constitution for the country so this commission also cabinet mission plan recommended a constitutional assembly to draft the constitution for india and at the same time an interim government was to be established until a new government was formed on the basis of constitution written by the constitutional assembly clear so first of all this was made clear then at the same time it proposed the idea of constituent assembly idea of constituent assembly to start the draft of indian constitution and finally establishment of interim government establishment of until constitution is drafted and the new government is formed according to indian constitution clear this development took place clear and therefore election to constitution assembly was advocated clear so these were major developments that took place now coming to constituent assembly clear cabinet mission plan advised the idea of establishing a constituent assembly comprising a constituent assembly to draft the future provisions of indian constitution comprising of 389 members whereby 296 members were to be elected from british india and remaining 93 members from the princely states clear but princely states refused to participate even in constituent assembly so constituent assembly could not or rather the princely states were not included election to 296 members took place in which muslim league also participated and in this election Congress party was able to secure 208 seats Muslim League managed to win only 73 seats and independent candidates won 15 seats clear as soon as this electoral verdict took place Muslim League announced the day, direct action day and this direct action day was announced on 16th of August 1946 and with announcement of direct action day clear communal rights broke out throughout Indian territory and that was that further expedited the grant of independence because British never wanted to take responsibility for communal rights clear meanwhile british cabinet mission plan advised congress member to form interim government clear and ultimately interim government was formed under the leadership of jawahar lal nehru on 2nd of september 1946 clear so in order to support the members of constituent assembly to start the draft of indian constitution interim government was formed clear and this interim government was formed on 2nd of september 1946 clear so it was established on 2nd of september 1946 clear this interim government was headed by jawahar lal nehru so jawahar lal nehru was head of interim government clear and jawahar lal nehru became the head of head of executive council and he also took the portfolio of external affairs and commonwealth relations clear so he also became the minister of external affairs in the interim government external affairs and head of commonwealth organization commonwealth organization clear second major person in the interim government was sardar vallabhbhai patel sardar vallabhbhai patel who big, who took the charge of home affairs home ministry and information and broadcasting and information and broadcasting information and broadcasting clear third person was baldev singh baldev singh who took the department of defense 
बलदेव सिंह देन डॉक्टर राजेंद्र प्रसाद हु बिकेम एग्रीकल मिनिस्टर ऑफ एग्रीकल्चर एंड फूड सप्लाइज एग्रीकल्चर एंड फूड सप्लाइज डॉक्टर राजेंद्र प्रसाद क्लियर सो ऑल दिस आसफ अली बिकेम द हेड मिनिस्टर ऑफ रेलवे आसफ अली became the minister of railways clear minister of railways jagjivan ram became the minister of labor jagjivan ram minister of labor minister of labor clear meanwhile just understand initially Muslim League refused to participate even in interim government, but after some time, clear. Five leaders of Muslim League joined interim government, and these leaders joined interim government on 13th of October 1946. Clear. Now, when or when all the five leaders of Muslim League joined interim government, which were the four two portfolios given to them? We'll come to the portfolios given to the leaders of Muslim League in interim government. Clear. First among them was liaquat ali khan who was given department of portfolio of finance clear then we had abdul rab nishtar abdul rab nishtar who also joined interim government on behalf of muslim league and he was given the charge of communication charge of communication information broadcasting was with sardar patel communication third was i i chundrigar i i chundrigar i i chundrigar was given the ministry of commerce given ministry of commerce then we have gazan for ali khan Gazan for Ali Khan, who was given the portfolio of go portfolio of health, and finally Joginder Nath Mandal. He was member of depressed classes promoted by Muslim League on its behalf. So another person was Joginder Nath Mandal. Joginder Nath Mandal, who was given the Ministry of Law. Okay. So all these were important ministers along with the portfolios in interim government, which was formed. Clear. Meanwhile, with support of interim government, constituent assembly started its process, and constituent assembly convened its first meeting on 9th of December 1946 at New Delhi. This is very important. It has been asked several times. So first meeting of constituent assembly was convened on 9th of December 1946 at New Delhi and during this meeting only they elected the temporary president and the first temporary president of constituent assembly was Dr Sachidanand Sinha who was the eldest member among all the members of constituent assembly on 11th of December just after two days the members of constituent assembly elected the permanent president and the permanent president was Dr Rajender Prasad clear and on 13th of December Jawaharlal Nehru introduced his famous objective resolution in the constituent assembly which was passed which was passed on 22nd of January 1947 and that took the form of the preamble to the Indian constitution clear now what were the major committees of the constituent assembly clear so major committees also of the constituent assembly the drafted indian constitution so major committees played very important role so major committees of the constituent assembly major committees of the constituent assembly clear first was the drafting committee the most important one the drafted the major provisions of indian constitution so first was the drafting committee headed by dr b r ambedkar 
headed by Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Then we had Union Power Committee. Union Power Committee headed by Jawaharlal Nehru, Union Power Committee. Then we have Provincial Constitution Committee. Provincial Constitution Committee headed by Sardar Vallabhai Patel. Provincial Constitution Committee headed by Sardar Vallabhai Patel. And fourth was Union Constitution Committee. Union Constitution Committee headed by again Jawaharlal Nehru. So Union Constitution Committee headed by Nehru and Provincial Constitution Committee headed by Sadar Vallabh Patel. Union Power Committee headed by Nehru and Drafting Committee headed by Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Clear? Now what were the major accomplishments of Constitution Assembly? Clear? So major accomplishments. Clear? Constitution Assembly played a major role. So major accomplishments of Constitution Assembly. Major accomplishments of the Constituent Assembly. Major accomplishments of the Constituent Assembly. major accomplishments of the constituency first of all the most important thing it enacted it enacted the constitution the most important thing it enacted the constitution second was clear constitution then adopted the national flag adopted the national flag adopted the national flag on 22nd of July. On 22nd of July 1947, clear. 27 clear. Then accepted and approved India's membership. Accepted and approved accepted and approved India's membership approved India's membership membership of the British Commonwealth of the British of the British Commonwealth British Commonwealth in Commonwealth in May 1949 in May 1949 clear then elected Dr. Rajendra Prasad elected Dr. Rajendra Prasad Rajendra Prasad as the first president, as the first president, as the first president on 24th of January 1950. 24th of January 1915. Adopted national anthem, same day. Adopted national anthem adopted national anthem same day 24th of January 1950 6-1 is adopted national song adopted national song again on 24th of January 1950 clear so all these were the accomplishments of 
constituent assembly clear so this major development took place clear meanwhile clear what was the final step towards transfer of power we cannot clear clear we have we will come to this development clear so coming to the final transfer of power that took place and we'll come we'll move to britain to discuss about this meanwhile clear clear Fed, is federal assembly looks about yes sir i have never read spectrum because teacher neglected i have only read class notes so should i read spectrum or bipin chandra class notes see with this coverage i can bet i have been repeating this again again clear my class notes that is the in the batches that i have taken modern history ancient and medieval india those class notes supplemented with the notes of the class course would suffice clear that was because we had covered things comprehensively so two things clear the class notes the in which i have taken the classes the batches clear and at the same time the, the notes of this class course would suffice clear next sir why vidy sawak and shama prasad mukherjee of the hindu mahasabha and shinwa sastri of the national liberal trade against cr formula because it was considered to be giving equal rights to the leaders of muslim league since equality was ensured for muslim league and congress all the leaders of hindu mahasabha like shama prasad mukherjee and veer savarkar were opposed to cr formula and even punjab was also against it because punjab wanted to get separated not on religious ground punjab under sekandar hayat khan wanted to get separated on economic reason because punjab was the most flourishing state in india and punjab or sikandar hayat khan came to power under with unions party with this manifesto only that punjab will not remain a part of british india and the for the first person to advocate partition of india was not mohammad ali jinnah the first person to advocate partition of india was sikandar hayat khan after provincial elections of 1937 clear so major developments now coming to transfer of power major clear first of all in the beginning of 1947 general elections were announced in britain britain has always been marked by two party system that is the labor party and the conservative party labor party always supported the grant of independence to colonies in asia and africa but conservative party always wanted to have colonial colonial control over colonies of asia and africa clear therefore since labor party was very sensitive towards grant of independence to india and other colonies of asia and africa several national leaders of india went to britain in britain they convinced the british voters in favor of labor party and fortunately for india labor party emerged victorious and when labor party emerged victorious on behalf of labor party claimant actually became british prime minister clear so claimant actually became british prime minister on behalf of labor party and he made an important announcement on 20th of feb 1947 clear as per this announcement claimant actually wanted to fulfill the manifesto of labor party to grant independence to india and therefore in this announcement he made it clear british will vacate india latest by 30 8th of june 1948 so he fixed the deadline and this deadline was to be 30th of june 1948 clear so this was the deadline fixed by clement atley with his announcement on 20th of feb 1947 that british shall vacate india latest even before that also but latest by 30th of june 1948 and to expedite the grant of independence to india clement atley in british government appointed lord mountbatten as the governor general of india clear so lord bond batten became the next governor general of india he came to india in march 1947 began to negotiate with indian leaders and ultimately announced his proposal this proposal of lord bond batten is known as the 3rd june plan as it was announced on 3rd of june 1947 it is also known as mount batten's plan clear now what was mount batten plan announced on 3rd of june 1947 will come to this mount batten's plan clear that ensured the transfer of power finally clear coming to mount 
Batten plan, which was announced on 3rd of June 1947. Also, the 3rd June plan, also known as Mount Batten plan. Clear? So, coming to Mount Batten plan or 3rd June plan, clear? First of all, clear? A Mountbatten plan clear according to Mountbatten plan it was made clear that India would be given independence or independence but it would be divided into two dominions of India and Pakistan clear so first of all he announced the establishment or grant of independence to India and at the same time clear formation of two dominions formation of Two dominions, formation of two dominions, formation of two dominions, India and Pakistan. Formation of two dominions, India and Pakistan. Clear. Separate constituent assembly for India and Pakistan. Separate. Separate constituent assembly, separate constituent assembly for India and Pakistan. Separate constituent assembly for India and Pakistan. Clear now at the same time, partition of Bengal and Punjab on the basis of voting. Clear so, partition of Punjab and Bengal, partition of Punjab and Bengal on the basis of voting, on the basis of voting, on the basis of voting, clear, so voting into Hindu Muslim groups, clear, then referendum in fourth one. Then referendum in Northwest Frontier Province, referendum in Northwest Frontier Province and Silhet of Assam, and Silhet of Assam, referendum in Northwestern Province and Silhet in Assam, Silhet in Assam, Assam clear, along with Sindh. Along with Sin. So, referendum in Northwest Frontier Province, Silhet, Assam, and Sin. Clear? And Sin, given the choice, either to join India and Pakistan. Clear? So, referendum in Northwest Province, Silhet, Assam, and Sin. Choice to join either India or Pakistan. Clear? Then, appointment of Boundary Commission. Appointment of Boundary Commission to demarcate the political boundary. Appointment of Boundary Commission under the chairmanship of Sir, under the chairmanship of Cyril, under the chairmanship of Sir Cyril Ratcliffe, Ratcliffe, claim princely states, princely states, princely states. Princely states can join either India and Pakistan. Princely states can join, can join either India or Pakistan. Either India or Pakistan. Clear? Okay? Either India or Pakistan. India or Pakistan. Clear? Okay? This was development under the Mountbatten's plan. Clear? Okay? Mountbatten plan. Now, at the same time, clear Mountbatten plan based on Mountbatten plans and the recommendations of the Boundary Commission. Clear Lord Radcliffe demarcated Punjab 
and Bengal clear only with one criteria. That criteria was that wherever 60% or more concentration of Muslim population was there, it was demarcated into separate country of Pakistan. And in this way, two moth eaten Pakistan in form of East Pakistan and West Pakistan was created. East Pakistan was basically the Bengali dominated Pakistan and West Pakistan was Urdu dominating Pakistan. Clear? Based on recommendations of Boundary Commission, Mountbatten Plan, clear? British parliamentarians introduced Indian Independence Bill in British Parliament on 4th of July 1947. Clear? This Indian Independence Bill was passed on passed as Indian Independence Act on 18th of July 1947. Clear? So from British Parliament, India was given independence on 18th of July 1947. But this act was implemented by Indian leaders on 15th of August 1947 and what was the significance implication of Indian Independence Act which was passed on 18th of July 1947 and applied on India on 15th of August 1947. Clear? So coming to Indian Independence Act, Indian Independence Act. Indian Independence Act 1947. Indian Independence Act of 1947. Clear? First major implication of this act was that it marked the end of British rule and transfer of power to, to dominions. Clear? So it first of all indicated the end of British rule and transfer of power and transfer of power to power to two dominions power to two dominions this was one thing second was the partition of india into india and pakistan the partition of India, the partition of India into India and Pakistan. Third was Viceroy to be called as Governor General. Clear? So first, finally, the Viceroy's period came to an end and Viceroy to be known as Governor General of India. Because no representative of British Crown could be there in India. So, Vaisra came to be finally known as Governor General of India. Clear. Governor General of India. And the Office of Secretary of State was abolished. The Office of... The Office of... The Secretary of State was abolished. And replaced by... The office of Secretary of State was abolished and replaced by the Secretary of State, replaced by the Secretary of State for Commonwealth Affairs, replaced by the Secretary of State for Commonwealth Affairs. Clear? So this resulted into clear. The resulted into India, the significance of India's Independence Act, clear. And finally, even Congress accepted the partition of India, especially to prohibit the communal rights going on in India since 16th of August 1947, 1946. And at the same time, even though Congress accepted the partition of India, Congress outrightly rejected the theory of two nation states clear so theory of two nation states was outrightly rejected by the congress at this time and therefore it marked the end of indian communal rights to a large extent even though it continued for some time and meanwhile india finally became an independent nation clear so these were major developments that took place after india's independence from british rule clear now at the same time clear we need to understand that what major developments took place after india's independence clear now just understand first of all clear the first major political challenge 
Sir Jinnah was a patriot initially. Why did he opt for sectarian politics later on? It was an ego clash. Claim in 1928 when, the, when, when power to uh, when committee was formed to draft future constitution of India on the challenge of Lord Simon. The, the Jinnah wanted this right to be given to him, but since it was denied from there only, Jinnah moved away from Congress. He wrote an article known as Parting of the Ways, it took away Muslim League leaders and began to advocate communalism and even came forward to announce his 14 points. From here, Jinnah drifted to communal politics clear so at the same time he was basically ego clash because jinnah wanted the right to draft indian constitution to be given to him rather it was given to moti lal Nehru in 1928 clear so the development so coming to post independent era in post independent era the first major political challenge was integration of large number of princely states to the indian union because as we have seen in mountbatten plan princely states were given were allowed to either join india or pakistan clear therefore to create india as a strong union it became a very important responsibility to integrate contiguous princely states into indian union as there were 565 princely states in the indian, indian union clear it was decided to integrate all these princely states into indian union at least the contiguous one not beyond the province of Pakistan. Okay? So, first major challenge was okay, the in coming to post independent coming to post independent era or post colonial era. The first major challenge was integration of princely states. As they were given the right to join either India or Pakistan by Mountbatten plan, integration of the princely states. Integration of the princely state. This was the most important challenge, clear. And at the same time, in order to integrate the princely states of India, clear, major development took place in India, clear. And what were the major developments and what were the major facets and facets of in facet faces and facets of integration of princely states? Clear. So, first of all, what were the who were the major leaders associated? The first major person associated with integration of princely states was a leading bureaucrat. And this person was VP Menon. Clear? So, VP Menon was a person who started the process of integrating the princely states of India, who assisted the India's first Home Minister and Deputy Prime Minister, who also played an important role. And that person was Sardar Vallabhai Patel. Sardar Vallabhai Patel. And both of them drafted a strategy which is known as Persuasion Come pressure persuasion come pressure to integrate the princely states clear persuasion come pressure another person who played important role towards integration of princely states in india was of course lord mountbatten lord mountbatten also played important role in integration of princely states to indian union and next was jawaharlal nehru he also contributed towards integration of princely states into Indian Union. Clear? And therefore, these leaders contributed towards integration of princely states. Clear? Now, what were the major role of these princely states? Uh, princely states clear? So, first of all, all these persons, Sadar Patel, Lord Mountbatten, Jawaharlal Nehru, clear? The, uh, Nehru and VP Menon. What were the views? Clear. First of all, VP Menon. Clear. First of all, VP Menon was political advisor. He was the political advisor to the Home Ministry. Political advisor to the Home Ministry. Sadar Vale was a Home Minister. Very important one. Home Minister. Clear. Coming to Lord Mountbatten. Clear. Lord Mountbatten was the first Governor General of Dominion of India. Clear. First Governor General and asserted that British government would not grant dominion status to princely states. So, most important role was Mountbatten was that he asserted, asserted that dominion status would not be given to princely states. They have to integrate. That was a big thing. Clear. Asserted that dominion status. Asserted that dominion status 
status asserted that dominant status shall not be given to princely states very important one it shall not be given to the princely states princely states and jawaharlal nehru made it clear that princely states are not sovereign he made it clear princely states cannot claim itself to be sovereign clear so they were not sovereign all these makes it clear that they wanted to assimilate princely states into indian union clear so these resulted in choke clear and most of these princely states got integrated into indian union through instrument of accession clear so they were made to sign instrument of accession to join indian union and most of these states got integrated into indian union clear and some states that proved to be challenging towards integration of indian union these states included Jonagarh in western part of India under the leader known as Mahabat Khan and his prime minister Shah Nawaz Bhutto then Kashmir under the leadership of Maharaja Hari Singh and Hyderabad under Nizam Usman Ali Khan clear but all of them were made to join Indian Union and Jonagarh joined Indian Union through military action Kashmir joined in the Indian Union through instrument of accession through instrument of accession Hyderabad also signed instrument of accession became part of indian union and also a small state of manipur clear so all of them joined indian union the leading role played by these major players vp menon sardar vallabhbhai patel mohan batten and jawaharlal nehru vp menon was political advisor sardar patel was home minister lord mohan batten very important one asserted the dominant status shall not be given prince the cat dominant status should not be given to prince the states and jawaharlal nehru made it clear that prince the states are not sovereign in nature clear so this was major development clear now at the same time clear even though british rule came to an end more importantly from our examination point of view clear first of all what are the major positive legacies of british rule over india we need to discuss negative legacies we had discussed political or rather political subjugation economic exploitation especially economic exploitation through drain of wealth deindustrialization commercialization of agriculture and frequent for mines as well clear but there were some positive legacies which are very important clear so legacy of the british rule coming to the legacy of the british rule legacy of the british rule clear we'll come to the legacy of the british rule so coming to the legacy of the british rule that discuss first of all major legacy of british rule is on local self government it's a very important one clear so first positive legacy of british rule is promotion of lake local self government some positive legacies are important local self government clear so local self government was promoted in india clear and the local self government was largely promoted by lord rappan in india clear so first of all local self government was promoted by lord mayo in india who was the governor general of india lord mayo promoted promoted the local self government through resolution of 1870 clear so through resolution of 1870 promoted local self institutions in india clear and the father of local self government is lord rappan lord rappan is considered to be the father of local self government in india and he at the same time he promoted local self government by promoting the tax collection authority to the local bodies to look after their local administration in the year or rather he passed a resolution in 1882 and through this resolution he brought about several changes the changes were in rural areas district boards and local boards known as tehsil san taluk boards were set up the members were to be elected by by the rent payers clear the chairman of the committee was to be a non official member that is properly elected member the management of health 
education roads and communication were to remain under the control of local boards clear so all these powers were given to local authorities and this became a big development under lord rappan clear so lord rappan contributed towards local self government It started with lord mayo then lord rappan then at the same time royal commission on decentralization sixth major development was royal commission royal commission on decentralization royal commission on decentralization from 1907 to 1909 clear royal commission on decentralization clear this commission made three major recommendations special measures to be adopted for the revival and growth of village panchayats in india the control of government over local bodies should be reduced and local government bodies should have more sources of income very practical one so royal commission on decentralization recommended that there should be revival and growth of village panchayats in india the control of government over local bodies should be reduced and local bodies should have more revenue or more sources of income clear local self government was also promoted local self government was also promoted under government of india act 1919 that promoted the scheme of directly at provincial level where divided the pro subjects into reserved and transferred list clear local self government was also promoted under government of india act 1935 by ensuring provincial autonomy clear so these major developments took place clear so local self government promoted first of all through lord mayo by resolution of 1870 powers were to be given to local bodies lord ripon the father of local administration in india he gave major powers establishment of local boards local taluks and more power to local boards and taluks royal commission decentralization revival of panchayati raj more sources of income government controls over local bodies to be reduced local self government in india act 1919 local self government in india act 1900 35 clear this were major developments that took place clear so this were major developments another positive legacy of british rule over india is in form of civil services clear so civil services has always well been the steel frame of indian administration and civil services has been a pure legacy of british in india clear so coming to the coming to the promotion of civil services in india the steel frame of indian administration clear so first of all the father of indian civil services in india has been lord cornwallis Lord Cornwallis is regarded as the father of Indian civil services. He promoted civil services in a big way. First of all, he enhanced the salary of civil servants considerably to expect better services. He enhanced or he ensured that all higher posts of administration are insured only for Europeans and British. He wanted complete exclusion of Indians from civil services and uh, civil services. Clear? This marked the trend of Europeanization of civil services. Civil servants were relieved from judicial authorities under Cornwallis Code of 1793. So Lord Cornwallis played an important role. Clear? This was one thing. another person to contribute towards civil services was lord wellesley lord wellesley who established training institution for civil servants in india and that was fort william college at calcutta even the court of directors disapproved this measure and court of directors promoted their own institution known as hellybury college at london in 1806 claim lord william bentinck removed the ban on giving high jobs to the indians the charter act of 1833 gave legal effect to the decision clear so next major contributor was was sir was basically third was lord william bentinck who removed the ban on indians to be appointed in civil services which was placed by lord cornwallis clear lord cornwallis now at the same time government of india act 1858 government of india act 
1858 clear under government of india act 1858 it was made clear that it was made clear that or that the, all the civil services will not be nominated by court of directors rather it would be through competition had to be held in england clear and at the same time clear main object of a competition was to secure for indian services young men who had who had received the best and the most liberal and most finished education which england could afford clear the examination was to include most of the subjects of honors schools of universities of great britain and ireland clear then at the same time the indian civil services act was passed in 1861 the indian civil services act was passed in the year 1861 clear under the indian civil services act of 1861 government was supposed to appoint exceptional cases clear all major or pers talented persons into civil services the special reason for this was appointment to be given to secretary of state for india now secretary of state wanted to have some services or some nomination in civil services apart from Educ apart from competition, during this period there were two defects in competitive examination. First, the examination were to be held in England, and second, the maximum age limit was 22 in 1860. It was further laid lower to 21 in 1860 and 19 in 1878. Up to 1870, only one Indian has actually qualified the covenanted civil services. Okay, so major age limit under Civil Services Act of 1861. Okay, first of all, initially the age limit was. 22 years maximum age limit was 20 years till 1860 clear then it was lowered to 21 years 22 years then 21 years it was reduced to 21 years in 1866 and it was further reduced to 19 years in 1878 19 years in 1878 it became more and more tough gradual reduction in age limit 21 22 and 19 years in 1878 clear then another development related to civil services is a commission six one is a commission appointed for civil services known as atchison commission known as atchison commission for civil services attention commission clear Again, with the formation of Indian National Congress in 1885, demands for relaxing rules for exams were put forward. Lord Dufferin appointed a commission in 1886, and this commission 1886, just after formation of Congress, clear? Because Congress members demanded Indianization of civil services, clear? And it was appointed under Sir Charles Atchison, clear? And therefore, it is known as Atchison Commission, clear? At the same time, the number Atchison Commission. The reason given by it was that it would benefit only few classes. Clear. So again, simultaneous holding of civil service examination in India. Clear. So at the same time, it reported against the simultaneous holding of civil service examination in England and India. So this commission rejected that simultaneous examination cannot be held in England. and india clear at the same time the number of seats to be filled would be small and a large number of candidates would, would compete clear so obviously number of seats would be less and large number of candidates will have to contest against each other clear the rejected candidates would become the center of dissatisfaction in the country clear and it recommended the transfer of number of posts to lower services in each province to provide opportunity to indians as junior civilians clear the services should be classified into imperial provincial and subordinate and officers of the imperial and provincial service have to be held all important jobs clear so very important recommendations of atchison commission write this recommendations of atchison commission related to civil services clear first of all rejected it rejected simultaneous examination in england and india it rejected the idea that was demanded by congress leaders in england and india so it rejected the simultaneous examination to be held in india and england this was first major thing clear at the same time clear the number of seats should be small and a large number of candidates should be a number of candidates should be large clear so mismatch between 
it recommended that it would be mismatch between seats and candidates candidate mismatch between seats and aspirants seats and aspirants now what was the recommendation there after it clear seats and aspirants clear the rejected candidates would the rejected candidates the rejected candidates would have dissatisfaction the rejected candidates would have dissatisfaction against british dissatisfaction against british to avoid any major category clear it recommended it recommended it recommended the transfer of number of posts to lower services clear so transfer of posts to lower services transfer of post to lower services transfer of post to lower services so that more and more indians can join services at lower level lower services clear some lows to lower services and services should be classified services should be classified services should be classified should be classified into central provincial and subordinate services should be classified into three categories the central service the provincial service and the subordinate service clear this was very important recommendations of atchison commission on civil services clear this is the sixth one sixth major development coming to another commission on civil services another commission on civil services known as islington commission is known as Islington Commission on Civil Services is also known as Royal Commission on Public Services in India clear so it's known as Royal Commission on Public Services in India also known as Islington Commission and it was constituted in the year 1912 clear now in 19 another commission known as Islington Commission for bringing reforms in Indian civil service was set up the commission submitted support in 1915 and in 1970 lord montgo the secretary of state for india made the august declaration promising self government to indians by state it implied that indians would have to be given a share in the administration and report of his status was thus became outdated clear so obviously it's linked into commission submitted report 1915 clear and at the same time all the recommendations in the committee were accepted in august declaration which was given by lord montgo in secretary in british parliament under influence of home rule movement and lord montgo made it clear that ultimate aim is to establish self rule in india self government in india by associating more and more indians in the system of administration clear and therefore this was implemented entered second major development is august declaration august declaration of 1917 given by lord montgo and then government of india act government of india act 1919 leading to the establishment of central public service commission in 1924 commission in 1924 that began to conduct regular examinations within india to select indian civil services clear this was one thing clear going on india meanwhile at the same time clear before cpsc was established government of india act under the commission was formed known as the lee commission when all these developments were going on another commission for civil services was constituted in form of the lee commission in 1923 clear the lee commission 1923 recommended that the recruitment to indian civil services indian police services indian medical service indian forest service and india and indian service of engineer should be made by secretary of state for india all india services as of now largely other members of all india services should be recruited by indian government clear it also recommended the establishment of public service commission india clear so lee commission recommended lee commission recommended that 
recommended the indicate indicate recommended that indian civil service indian police service indian forest service indian medical service clear indian medical service and uh, indian medical service and indian service of engineers clear all to be recommended by secretary of state for india another civil service can be recommended by government of india this lee commission only recommended the establishment of central public service commission and based on this recommendation central public service was established in 1924 in india and this marked the beginning of indianization of civil services in this country clear okay? another major development related to civil services was the government of india act 1935 and this promoted the establishment of establishment of provincial public service commissions at provincial level so that at provincial level also regular examination could be conducted to elect or to rather to select the civil to select civil servants at provincial level clear so all these developments result into indianization of civil services starting with lord cornwallis then lord wellesley then lord william bentinck clear then important commissions also like atchison commission islington commission then the lee commission lee commission is very important atchison commission lee commissions are very important because atchison commission made some major de declaration lee commission because he wanted ics ips ifs to be selected or nominated through or rather appointed through secretary of state other civil servants by government of india it only recommended the establishment of cpsc central public service commission which came into being in 1924 government of india act 1985 that promoted provincial public service commissions clear so all these developments related to civil services in india these are very important developments related to civil services clear now at the same time after civil services the next progressive legacy of british rule in india was related to education clear now coming to education as well what major developments legacy of british rule is related to education related to education education clear now coming clear now early educational institution to be established in india clear the first major educational institution was calcutta madrasa established in 1781 by warren hastings clear this was calcutta madrasa second was asiatic society of bengal asiatic society of bengal in 1784 by william jones then we have sanskrit college college at banaras in 1791 then we have fort william college fort william college at calcutta in 1800 by lord wellesley clear these were very important development that resulted into resulted into promotion of education next major development promotion of education was the charter act of 1813 charter act of 1813 which granted some of rupees 1 lakh for the spread of education in india clear then at the same time we have macaulay's minute macaulay committee's recommendations macaulay's minute of 1835 that supported the idea of promoting english education in india and it also promoted downward filtration theory of education clear then at the same time next major development under crown rule this was under british india company's rule is ruled clear coming under crown rule what major development related to education took place the first commission was in form of the hunter commission form of hunter commission in 1882 that emphasized on primary education in india clear first of all before hunter commission write about woods dispatch also clear first was woods dispatch 
that led to establishment of three central universities at Calcutta, Bombay and Madras. Then we have Hunter Commission. Then we have Hunter Commission in 1882 that emphasized on primary education. Clear. Hunter Commission. Then at the same time, Hunter Commission emphasized on elementary education, education in vernacular languages and instruction and decentralization of management of education clear then at the same time we have ralic commission we have we have ralic commission appointed by lord Curzon in 1902 and based on the recommendations of ralic commission only indian university act was passed in 1904 Indian University Act was passed in the year 1904 that led to government control over universities in India. This was under all relic clear. Then we have government resolution on education in 1913. Government resolution on education in 1913 clear and it under this resolution it was made clear that primary and secondary school should be made more practical and useful in nature facilities for higher education should be provided in india so that indian students may not have to go abroad and instead of increasing the number of existing institutions the standard should be raised clear so very important resolution under government resolution of education 1913 was made clear that primary and secondary education school should be more practical and useful for higher education institutions should be established in India so that Indian students may not have to go abroad and thirdly instead of increasing more number of institutions focus should be given on quality education okay? then the third one is known as Sadler Commission on Education Sadler Commission on Education 1917 which was basically to deal with the functioning of Calcutta University. Clear. Now, Calcutta, it was headed by Lord Sadler, who was the who was the Vice Chancellor of University of Leeds. Clear. And this recommended basically intermediate to be a part of sec secondary school education, undergraduate to be of three years with the provision of honors courses, board of secondary and intermediate education should be established, universities to take the undergraduate and postgraduate education research degrees. Clear. The university should have departments of education with provision of teaching education at a subject at B level all these were promoted under Sadler Commission of 1917 clear so this was education in 1917 moreover in the year six major development was that that in the year 1921 Central Advisory Board of Education Central Advisory Board of Education, Central Advisory Board of Education was established in 1921, clear, which is also known as CAB, C A B E. Central Board of uh, Central Advisory Board of Education was established in 1921, basically to offer expert advice on important educational matters. Clear. So a body or rather a Central Advisory Board was established to offer expert advice towards promotion of education in India. Clear. This was sixth major development coming to the seventh one. Seventh one was established was Constitution of Hard Talk Commission on Education. Hartog Commission on Education in 1929. Clear? The immediate, this commission recommended that immediate need was to improve the quality rather than increase in number of institutions. The committee recommended the policy of consolidation and improvement in the quality of education at the same committee highlighted that the policy of expansion resulted in wasted and stagnation thus weakened the need for rapid expansion of primary education irrespective of quality so major focus of heart of committee was basically to emphasize more on quality of education rather than multiplication of educational institution next major development related to education was the abort the abort wood report the abort wood report 
of 1937. Clear? The absence of adequate and proper vocational education was being felt in India and the public was raising the demand for long. So, it was basically the demand for vocational education so that job opportunities could be created for Indian students. Clear? And therefore, the government of India invited in 1936 two British experts to come to India and prepare a plan for vocational education in the country. Clear? These two experts were A. Abbott. These two experts were A. Abbott. To emphasize on vocational education, A about an S H word. A about and S H word. Clear? And these two persons toward Punjab, Delhi, and UP and prepare a report on vocational education within four months. On the basis of this report, published in 1937, the 37, the Surgeon Report of 1944 were published, and the Surgeon Report presented a more detailed plan of vocational education as compared to the report. Clear? So, based on the report given by about would report to promote vocational education in India, an elaborate plan was prepared and this elaborate plan is known as Surgent Plan of Education in 1944. Clear? Surgent Plan of Education recommended vocational education should be organized according to the needs of various vocational areas. Vocational education should be considered as par with literary and science education in India so that people can get more and more jobs and skillful workers engaged in small industry should also be given proper vocational training and government should open vocational institutions in big cities and vocational centers. Clear? This was surgeon plan which was prepared. Clear? At the same time, apart from this, clear? Indian leaders also contributed towards education in India. Clear? And this education was promoted in different phases. We'll come to different phase of education as well. Clear? So apart from this efforts taken by the British, clear? national leaders also contributed towards promotion of education in India. Now, what were the contributions of national education movement? Clear? So, we have a separate movement known as national education movement national education movement we have a separate national educational movement clear national movement and that was basically started during indian national movement so national education movement starting from beginning of 20th century and it continued till even after the India's independence to some extent. Clear? First of all, the first phase. Clear? So, first phase of the national education movement. This first phase was from 1906 to 1911. Clear? So, first phase was from 1906 to 1911. And during this, clear, National Council of Education was prepared by Gokhale. Clear? So, National Council of Education was promoted by Gopal Krishna Gokhale. National Council of Education was promoted by Gopal Krishna Gokhale in 1911 for compulsory education. This was the first phase promoted by national leaders in India. Second phase, second phase started from 1911 to 1922. 1911 to 1922 and during this phase it resulted into establishment of Banaras Hindu University, it resulted into Aligarh Muslim University, it resulted into Jamia Melia Islamia, Jamia Melia Islamia, then we have Kashi Vidya Pete at Banaras. Kashi Vidya Peet at Banaras, followed by Bihar Vidya Peet and Gujarat Vidya Peet, clear. Then Bengal National University was established at this time, clear. So major institutions, Bengal, Bengal National Education University, National Education, Bengal National Education University, was established at this time. Leading role played by 
Mahatma Gandhi as well. Then at the same time, we have the third phase. We have third phase. That was from 1922 to 1938. 1922 to 1938. Clear? And this resulted into basic education scheme also known as Vardha Scheme of Education, Vardha Scheme of Education, advocated by Mahatma Gandhi, whereby formal education could continue with vocational training and the syllabus for Vardha Scheme of Education was prepared by Dr. Zakir Hussain, who termed this basic scheme of education as Nai Talim new form of education known as Naitalim. Clear? Then at the same time, fourth phase. Fourth phase. Fourth phase was from 1938 to 1948. Clear? The education began to be continued even at this time, clear? And at the same time, educational development began to take place. During this phase, Surgent Plan was supported by national leaders of India. And finally, in 1948, Radha Krishnan Commission was constituted on education. Radha Krishnan Commission was constituted on education that promoted or that that recommended establishment of institutions like the like the university grants commission to provide education or to provide fund to central universities in india to continue with education in this country all these became very important development related to education and UGC came into being in 1953 which was given statutory status by parliamentary act in 1956 this was growth and development of education clear so these are considered to be positive legacy of british rule over india so positive legacy took place in the form of education civil services and even local self government three are considered to be very important positive role played by british in india now, which act permitted Prince State to remain independent? Mountbatten plan. Mountbatten plan made it clear that they can remain independent. Even Indian Independence Act also was indirectly made it clear that Prince states can remain independent. But technically speaking, they had to get unified either with India or with Pakistan. So, was Afghanistan always a separate entity or it was liberated from there? No. Afghanistan was largely always an independent entity. British tried to establish control of Afghanistan several times, but they failed miserably. Naitalim was Appointed by Gandhi or Zakir Hussain. Nai Talim or Vardha scheme of education was given by Mahatma Gandhi. But the syllabus of this scheme was prepared by Dr. Zakir Hussain. And therefore, Zakir Hussain termed this scheme as Nai Talim, new form of education. But idea was of Mahatma Gandhi. Clear? So these were major developments related to national movement. Clear? Now, after this, just understand first. Clear? After this, I'll let you know, now we'll start with another cultural dimension of modern India in which we'll discuss about growth and development of growth and development of architecture, art forms, painting, music, dance, drama, martial arts. All these will be discussing in course of cultural development in modern India. We'll discuss, we'll, we'll start with those cultural dimensions tomorrow to be covered in the class. Darky and dual government. Dual government means two entities ruling over the same province simultaneously. It's known as dual government. Darky means separating something into two branches. Clear? So two branches meaning that by like the legislative subjects under 1919 the subjects were basically one it was divided into reserved list transferred list so that it could be bifurcated for different works clear but that is division of subjects dual government is two authorities ruling over the same province so dual government has to do more with 
political developments. Dark is largely to do with administrative necessities. Clear? And dark is dividing something into two sections. Dual government is not dividing anything. Clear? But having two entities from top superimposed on common province simultaneously. This is known as dual government. There was one question that I was understood provincial autonomy i'll explain provincial autonomy according to provincial autonomy people at provincial level were to be given freedom and autonomy to decide all the policies and administration that is why under government of india act 1935 the people at provincial level were allowed to elect their representatives to provincial executive council and even the head of provincial executive council to be indian leader prime minister clear For all members of provincial legislative council to be elected by indians only and Provincial public commissions, com public service commissions to be established to select civil services at provincial level. Meaning thereby all administration, all political activities at provincial level to be decided by the people themselves, not by the British. This is known as provincial autonomy, which came into being under Government of India Act 1935. It's clear. Now coming to the questions which has been given to you in the test yesterday, we'll discuss those questions as well. Clear. Coming to these questions. Okay, this was the question Gandhian movement. Okay, fine. Coming to these questions. Hmm. Coming to these questions. Okay. Gandhian movement. Consider the following system of different phases of Gandhian movement. The question is on phases clear during the moderate phase gandhi started a paper indian opinion to unite different sections of indian population clear yeah he started indian opinion moderate phase indian opinion was published by him in south africa in 1903 clear so indian opinion was written by him 1903 and he wrote another work hind swaraj in 1908 again south africa then he began to publish a paper harijan for depressed classes in 1932, these are important works. So 1903, end an opinion. During the passive phase, the statement is right. During the passive phase, he used the method of civil disobedience, which he termed as satyagraha. Yeah? Passive civil disobedience was passive resistance. That is, even if someone attacks, you act in self-defense without retaliating. That is known as passive resistance, which he termed as satyagraha. Truth and non-violence, complete non-violent. To remain completely as non-violent. So D is the answer, non, neither one nor two, because the both statements are incorrect. So none of them are incorrect. All both the statements are correct. Passive resistance. Mahatma Gandhi started his career as a moderate leader. Turned out to be extremist leader who believed in peaceful mass agitation. Marked by passive resistance. That is even if British attack. You only act as self-defense without retaliating. Just to create moral pressure on them. And that he termed as civil disobedience or satyagraha. So neither one nor two. Both the statements are right. Clear? Coming to the next question. Question number two. Clear? Coming to question number two. With reference to Gandhi's technique of Satyagraha, consider the following statements. He evolved this technique during his stay in South Africa. Yeah, he devolved Satyagraha while staying in South Africa during his struggle for racial equality. A Satyagraha upheld the truth, non-violence and fearless without rejecting perceived opinion. No. After rejecting perceived wrong this is wrong statement clear so he had evoked that people satyagraha should appeal truth non one's fearlessness and basically rejected try to reject his perceived wrongs clear no go not go for without without rejecting perceived wrongs a satyagraha must embrace suffering the fight against wrongdoing considering it an integral part of the commitment to truth yeah it was asked that satyagraha must embrace suffering the fight against wrongdoing even if it was supposed to be against wrongdoing he was not to be against wrongdoers so Mahatma Gandhi always advocated the person should be against wrongdoings, person should not be against any wrongdoers. That is, it is the consent of Vedanta philosophy, respecting, clear, he was following Vaishnavism. Mahatma Gandhi also believed in the concept of Vaishnavism or Vedanta philosophy whereby every human being, even the wrongdoer, had the soul of the same person that is the Brahm. The, every person should be respected. So wrong policies should be criticized, wrongdoers should not be criticized. Clear? So wrongdoing considering an integral part of the commitment to truth. This is right. So only two. Clear? Two statements are right. Second one is wrong. 
reject after rejecting perceived wrongs only clear this is second question number third question number third now with reference to arrival of mahatma arrival phase of mahatma gandhi consider the following statements the british government formed a committee nominated gandhi as a member to probe the champaran issue yeah this is right clear this is one thing this is a right statement he appointed they appointed a committee and nominated mahatma gandhi as a member anusuya behan south gandhi's intervention the conflict between mill owners and workers during ahmedabad bill strike yeah right she was the sister of ambalal sarabhai clear so anusuya behan was the sister of ambalal sarabhai childhood friend of mahatma gandhi ambalal sarabhai and mahatma gandhi and anusuya behan together started it started protest against all mill owners including ambalal sarabhai and mahatma gandhi for the first time sat on hunger strike as well then moreover mahatma gandhi established the first labor organization here only known as ahmedabad textile association in 1918 and even gave the principle of trusteeship and arbitration to maintain healthy relationship between workers and mill owners second is right gandhi ji served as the spiritual leader of the struggle during kheda satyagraha yeah? he was the spiritual leader during kheda satyagraha so three questions are related to champaran satyagraha then we have ahmedabad mill strike and then we have kheda satyagraha these all things has were from 1917 to 1919 so from 1917 to 1919 So all the three are right. How many of the same words incorrect? Could they have asked incorrect? None of them are incorrect. All of them are correct. So answer would be none. All of them are right statements. Coming to next question, question number four. Clear. Yeah. Now coming to the fourth one, consider the following statement in reference to Rowlatt Act. The bill resulted from the recommendation to the Imperial Legislative Council by the Rowlatt Commission. Clear? The bill resulted from the recommendations to the Imperial Legislative Council by the Rowlatt Commission. Clear? Okay, fine. This is right. it was recommended rollet act 1919 was an extension of defense law defense of india rules 1915 which was enacted during first world war so first of all they came came with defense of india rules 1951 15 during first world war and as an extension to this they came up with rollet act elected indian members in the imperial legislative council favored the bill no indian members opposed the bill clear obviously clear so elected indian members in the imperial legislative council favored the bill no this wrong statement the act permitted political activities to face trial without juries and allowed imprisonment without trial yeah that is why they arrested two leaders of punjab dr satpal and safuddin kesli okay so dr satpal and dr safuddin kesli were arrested because person could be accused without juries without any without trial clear and to protest against the arrest of these two leaders only large number of people gathered at jallianwala bag on 13th of april 1919 that led to the casualty after firing under orders of general da leading to jallianwala bag massacre so third statement is wrong 1 2 and 3 correct how many of the statements given are correct three statements are correct only three c would be the right answer Question number four. Then coming to question number five. Now coming to question number five. What was the initial approach adopted by Khilafat leaders to support the Khilafat cause? Yeah, they were basically peaceful in nature, and they adopted basically meetings. petitions and deportations this was the approach of khilafat leaders that is meetings petitions and deportations not basically any violent phase so initially they were meant to be very non violent very peaceful they fell followed only meetings petitions and deportations rather than any massive agitation answer would be b clear then coming to question number 6 with reference to masses during non cooperation movement questions on non cooperation with reference to the role with reference to with reference to the role of masses during 
non cooperation movement consider the following statements so considering the role of masses okay question the middle class did not take the call to resign from government service or surrender the titles clear the middle class did not take the call to resign from government service or surrender titles seriously no this is wrong statement clear okay. this is a wrong one all the indian business group supported the economic boycott due to national emphasis on swadeshi ya yeah, this is right women gave up pardha and offered their ornaments for tilak fund this is also right only two is right clear it cannot be the first one the middle middle class did not take the call to resign from government service or surrender the title seriously clear so all the indian business group supported the economic boycott due to national emphasis on swadeshi this is right women gave up pardha and offered their ornaments for the tilak fund two and three only two is right coming to the next one question number 7th clear okay. with reference to rampa rebellion 1922 aluri sitarama raju clear okay. with reference to rampa rebellion consider the following statements it was led by aluri sitarama raju who is served as maniam virudu in the andhra region yeah right it was in 1900 and 22 the rebellion highlighted the coexistence of militant protest with gandhi's non-violent satyagraha yeah this is also right both of them both and two here i'll let you know that the basically the rampa tribe the rampa people in the andhra coast they followed a system which is known as the podu system according to the podu system they annually they gave or some parts of the forest to be used for cultivation of food grains clear so according to podu system the forest inhabited by the tribes of tribes of rampa they segregated they left some regions annually 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 to be used for cultivation of food grains for survival but when british and other authorities began to interfere they wanted to use large amount of forest area for cultivation of food grains for their benefit which was affected the forest habitat state of the rampa people and under the leadership of aluri sitarama raju they revolted clear aluri sitarama raju is news also so be prepared about aluri sitarama raju in coming examination as well clear so most of the time he is a news rampa rebellion of 1922 that took place at this time and this was rampa region rampa region we followed the podu system where the parts of the forest areas were reserved for cultivation of rice and other crops annually but when british authority interfered they wanted to have large areas of forest regions which affected the forest habitat of the people and therefore under aluri sitarama raju they revolted against the british in 1922 both the statements are right that is both 1 and 2 then question number 7 then question number 8 question number 8 clear This consider the following statement: Despite limited advocacy for Pun Sora, Jawaharlal Nehru became the president of Lahore Congress Session mainly due to the backing of Moti Lal Nehru. Clear? Which of the statements are incorrect? Clear? This is incorrect statement. Clear? In fact, why? Clear? He became president not due to the backing of Moti Lal Nehru. No. Clear? It was not like that. In fact, Jawaharlal Nehru rejected the Nehru report prepared by Moti Lal Nehru. Clear? Jawaharlal Nehru became Congress president Lahore session because of his huge popularity. Because along with Subhash Chandra Bose, both of them had demanded Purna Swaraj, which was acceptable to large number of youth people. They first of all formed established Purna Swaraj or demanded Purna Swaraj during Madras session of the Congress. Madras session of INC in 1927, clear, which was presided by Mukhtar Ahmed Ansari, M A Ansari, clear. And therefore, since he demanded Pun Suraj in 1928, he established a pressure party, pressure group within Congress known as League for India's Independent League. Clear. So, League for India's Independence was established by Subhash Jawaharlal Nehru. That led to his huge popularity. And in 1928, he went on to reject Nehru report. That led to his further popularity. And in 1929, he became Congress president, not because due to the backing of his father, but because of his own popularity but nehru presided over lahore session after motilal nehru marked the beginning of marked the success of nehru family as son succeeded his father as the president of 
in the National Congress. So this statement is wrong. The independence pledge which was to be read on 26th of 19th was drafted by Rajan Prasad. No, it was not drafted by Rajan Prasad. This is wrong statement. Clear. It was not drafted by Rajan Prasad. Clear. It was not drafted by Rajan Prasad. Drafted by Mahatma Gandhi. Clear. So it was this pledge was supposed to have been drafted by Mahatma Gandhi. Clear. So the statement is incorrect. So first statement is incorrect. Second statement is incorrect. Clear. Mahatma Gandhi. Clear. It was drafted largely by, believed to be drafted by Gandhi ji. Which of the statements are incorrect? Clear. Independence pledge. Independence pledge is different from Poon Suraj. Make it clear. Poon Suraj was assumed passed by Jawaharlal Nehru. Independence pledge was drafted by Mahatma Gandhi. So which of the statements are incorrect? None of them are incorrect. Clear. Both of them are incorrect. Both are one and two. So one is also incorrect. Second is also incorrect. So both one and two. Clear. Coming to next question. Question number nine. Who gave the statement? Although everyone knew that within a few minutes he would be beaten down and perhaps killed, I could detect no signs of wavering or fear. The mass steadily with heads up. Webb Miller. And when he gave this statement, Webb Miller, Webb Miller gave to ring Dharsana Sol Satyagra. The statement given to ring Dharsana Sol Satyagra, which was in the year 1930. The statement was given by him. Clear? In fact, during this Dharsana Sol Satyagraha, even Sarojini Naidu gave a statement. Clear? That Mahatma Gandhi was arrested before reaching Dharsana. So she gave a statement that physically Mahatma Gandhi is there in the jail. But his soul is with you. And have this honor and defend his honor by not retaliating any way. Even if you are beaten, have the blows on your head without retaliation. Clear? This also was a very popular statement given by Sarojini Naidu during Dharsana Sol Satyagraha. It was given by Webb Miller, the British officer. A. Clear? Coming to the next question, question number 10. Question number 10. Consider the following statement. The round table conferences were held. So it's not conferences. Again, make it clear. It was sessions. Conference was only one. It were three sessions within one conference. Clear? The so round table conference was held in England from 1932 to 1932. This is right. Clear. First session in November 1930. Second in September 1931. Third in November 1932. Clear? Recommendations of the Simon Commission were inadequate. Yeah, this is right. Clear. So a statement because he could not review the scheme of diarchy in India because of anti-Simon protest demonstration. So he presented inadequate report to the British just to discuss the report of Simon Commission. They constituted the other that they began to convene sessions of roundtable conference. First session in November 1930, second in November, September 1931. 3rd in November 1932. So both the statements are right and statement second is the correct explanation of A. Clear? Since the report was inadequate that led to three sessions of roundtable conference in London from 1932 to 32. In ninth second session Mahatma Gandhi participated, demanded dominion status but dominion status was not accepted. Clear? So this is one thing. It's to be understood. Clear? So this was basically both the statements are correct. Answer would be 10 questions. Clear? Roundtable conference sessions we had discussed. Sir, in writing question number 6. Coming to question number 6. Question number 6. There. With reference role of masses doing non cooperation movement, consider the following statements. Answer B. What is, the first statement is correct. The middle class did not take the call to resign from government services or surrender them seriously. Yeah? How many of the other statements are correct? Clear? The middle class did not take the call to resign from government service or surrender the title seriously. You mean to say the first statement is correct? Did not take the call to resign from government service. No, no, this is not correct. This this is wrong. The middle class did not take the call to resign from government service or surrender titles. No, this is a wrong one. Clear? 
middle class to take it seriously they resigned their title services clear i'll check it out but this is right statement clear did not take did this a wrong statement the middle class did not take the question here is did not they took seriously all the indian business groups supported the economic boycott due to nationalist emphasis on them this is right women gave up pardan offer this is right this is wrong only two let us check this thing okay explanations given let us go with that also let us go with this also the party don't remember us from wide region side is not carry people from middle class that led the movement at beginning but later they showed us out of the yeah initially they participated that is why clear the economic boycott received from the indian core business group because they benefit from national emphasis on use of but a section of the big business man is clear but that's a general statement the subjectivity involved here just make it clear subjectivity involved here the middle class did not take the call to resign for no initially they took the call after some time they all of them may not have accepted this is a wrong statement this is a wrong statement the void is not here all the indian business supported economic boycott due to national scheme yeah this is right some of them later on clear they refused that is another thing but the statement is right and third one is right is a is a subjective consideration so first statement is obviously wrong second and third right and the answer would be two clear only two it is not here subjective consideration but this is the right one so these were the questions given to you in the test clear so coming to this okay now we'll continue with the major developments of the thematic topics cultural development especially in modern india architecture art forms we have to discuss about the architecture of ram mandir temple also we'll discuss about new temple to be inaugurated in abu dhabi or rather uae on 14th of february clear so all these are very important developments will come to architectural developments new parliament building new parliament building also we have to discuss architecture art forms music dance drama all this has to be done growth of language and literature all this has to be done related to, to modern india as well clear now coming to cultural developments in modern india first of all we'll take one important theme and that theme was basically paintings in modern india clear so let us start with this theme of paintings in modern india so coming to this theme of paintings in modern india clear now coming to the paintings in modern india just understand clear first of all modern india means basically india under the rule of british authority and under the rule of british authority paintings began to develop there are three major phases of paintings in modern india first of all the phase our phase which was under british influence clear and this kind of painting which was promoted by the brit under the influence of british this painting is known as the company paintings in india clear so first major theme of paintings in india was company paintings in india which was basically promoted during the rule of british east india company clear and in this company paintings which was promoted the most distinctive feature was not only domination of european themes clear even european styles of painting got mingled with or fusion with or got mixed with indian style of painting and this hybrid style of painting that developed this hybrid style of painting came to be known as company style of paintings or company paintings in india clear and in this company painting there was complete blending of european style and indian style so coming to the feature of this painting it was blend of it was blend of european it was blend of european and indian style of paintings it was blend of european and indian style of painting clear in this painting what were the other distinctive features of company style of painting clear in this paintings largely water colors were used so in this painting largely water colors were used for painting activities clear and at the same time in this painting depiction what were the major themes it was it depicted basically indian people fairs and festivals fairs and 
fairs and festivals clear fairs and festivals and landscapes and landscapes these were distinctive features of the company paintings clear at the same time it was basically miniature paintings naturalistic representation it was naturalistic representation and it was miniature painting obviously clear. so these were major development in paintings clear and these paintings was promoted by some british artists as well like tilly cattle tilly cattle was one of them that promoted the company style of painting after tilly cattle was john jaffney john zafney he was another artist of the company school john zafney then george chenery then another person was george george chenery he was another major painter of this school and then william hodge and then we have william hodge all these were considered to be very important artists of the company school so under the rule of british authority a new style of painting evolved which was basically company paintings and in this company painting the most distinctive feature was blend of european and indian style of paintings watercolors were used in this painting and the major depiction was of indian people fairs and festivals and landscapes it was naturalistic representation and major artists of this european paintings were tilly cattle john zafney george Henry and William Hodge clear in course of time clear another in course of time Indian style also began to be revived in India and that resulted into revival of Indian style of painting clear so it was basically revivalism of revival of Indian painting this was undone also in the british rule so revival of indian painting began to be done and in this concept of revival of indian painting the first major role was played by bengal was played by modern artist the first modern artist raja ravi verma he played the most important role very important for coming examination also raja ravi verma then bengal school of art Bengal School of Art. Bengal School of Art. Large number of painters were there. Bengal School. And then it also resulted into establishment of Progressive Artist Group or PAG. Clear. Progressive Artist Group was established by major persons like F. N. Sousa. F. N. Sousa. Sayyid Haider Raza. F. N. Sousa, Sayyid Haider Raza, clear M. F. Hussain, M. F. Hussain in post independent era, M. F. Hussain, clear after M. F. Hussain, we have K. H. Ara, K. H. Ara, K. H. Ara, and H. A. Garde, H. A. Garde, H. A. Garde, and then S. K. Baker, S. K. Baker. All of them promoted or established the progressive artist group in post-independent that worked in post-independent era also led to revival of Indian painting. So two parallel developments went on in modern India. One was company paintings, another was a revival of Indian paintings. It was first started by Raja Ravi Verma, who is considered a pioneer of modern painting in India, then followed by a large number of artists associated with Bengal school, and then formation of a body known as Progressive Artist Group, which was founded by major persons like F. N. Souza, S. H. Raza, M. F. Hussain, K. H. Ara, H. Gade, and S. K. Baker. Clear. Now coming to the most important artist which led to revival of Indian painting that is more important from examination perspective. We'll start about these Indian painters. Clear. The first major painter in this category is obviously Raja Ravi Verma. Clear. So Raja Ravi Verma played the most important role. He's written V A R M A also. Raja Ravi Verma is very important. Clear. He was born in 1848. Born in 1848 and died in the year 1906. 
all informations about Raja Ravi Verma are important. Do write, do understand this information. It's very important for coming examination. The reason being, we have celebrated 175th birth anniversary of Raja Ram Verma recently. Clear? So coming to this person. First of all, the major development about Raja Ravi Verma is he is the first modern Indian painter. So first modern Indian painter. All informations are important. He is the first modern Indian painter. First information clear. He basically combined Western style with Indian style, but largely focused on Indian style. Clear. So he combined Western and Eastern style, but largely focused on the Eastern style. He combined the Western and the Eastern style, clear, and Western and the Eastern style, clear, at the same time, clear. Another important thing is, clear, right now we have celebrated his 175th birth anniversary, celebrated his 175th birth anniversary in 2023, last year. 175th birth anniversary of Raja of Raja Ravi Verma. Clear. Another important thing about Raja Ravi Verma is clear that Raja Ravi Verma is known as father of modern Indian India. Clear. Is as at the same time clear he was born in Travancore, modern Kerala. Born in at Traven, born in Travancore. Clear. Moreover, he is known as proponent of lithography. Proponent of lithography. Proponent of lithography. Lithography means something art which is done on some flat stone or metal plate. Clear? So lithography is something, some art, some painting done on flat surface of stone or the copper plate or metal plate. Clear? This is known as lithography. Clear? At the same time, clear, he has written or his major famous works that include, clear, first of all his teachers, clear, he Learned the art of painting from his teachers. Clear. Who were these teachers of Raja Ravi Burma? Clear. First of all, the major teacher was Rama Swami Naidu. Rama Swami Naidu. Rama Swami Naidu. Clear. Who was known for water painting? Rama Swami Naidu, known for water painting. Rama Swami Naidu for water painting, clear. Then we have Theodore Jensen. Second one was Theodore Jensen. Theodore Jensen, clear. Who was a Dutch painter and known for oil painting. So he was known for oil painting, Theodore Jensen, clear. He was also awarded with, he was also awarded with Kasseri Hind gold medal. Kaiser Hind Gold Medal awarded with Kaiser Hind Gold Medal in 1904. Clear in 1904. Clear 1904. At the same time, his famous works include clear. So his famous works also. What were the famous works of Raja Ram Mohan Roy? His paintings include Shakuntala. Paintings include Shakuntala, then Damyanti Hansa Samvad, Damyanti Hansa, Damyanti Hansa Samvad, Damyanti Hansa Samvad, then we have Ram Kankar's Varun, Ram Kankar's Varun, this is another painting of Raja Ravi Verma, Ram Kankar's Varun, then Jatayu Wars with Ravan, Jatayu Wars with Ravan, 
this another painting of Raja Ravi Verma. Then ladies in moonlight. Ladies in moonlight. Ladies in moonlight. Clear. And then galaxy of musicians. Clear. Galaxy of musicians clear so all these are very important information about raja ravi verma very important for upcoming examination these information should be done thoroughly first modern indian painter combined western and eastern style largely focused on eastern styles 175th birth anniversary in 2023 travancore proponent of lithography teachers include rama swami naidu known for water painting theodore jensen dutch person who was known for oil painting kasari hand gold medal given in 1904 his major paintings being shakuntala damyanti hans damyanti hans samvad Damianti Hansambad, then Ram Kankar's Varun, Jatai Wars with Ravan, Ladies in Moonlight, Galaxy of Musicians. Clear? So these are very important formations about Raja Ravi Verma that needs to be done thoroughly because he is considered to be a very important personality of modern India. Apart from Raja Ravi Verma, who were the major painters who revived painting in India? In India clear? And these painters include next one being Abhanindranath Tagore. Abhanendra Nath Tagore. Okay. He belonged to Bengal School of Painting. Abhinath Tagore was born in 1871. 1871 and died in 1951. 1951. Clear? No. He basically abandoned Nai Tagore, contributed towards painting, towards painting during Swadeshi and the boycott movement in Bengal. And at the same time, it started Bengal School of Art Movement. Clear? So basically, he promoted nationalist theme in painting. He promoted nationalist theme in painting he discarded the european themes national theme in painting at the same time he started bengal school of art movement he started the bengal school of art movement Bengal School of Art Movement. Clear. At the same time, he incorporated Indian techniques techniques in painting. So largely applied Indian techniques in painting. Largely applied Indian techniques in painting. And the major paintings of Abhinath Tagore is Bharat Mata. Bharat Mata. Then we have Arabian Nights, Bharat Mata, Arabian Nights, clear, and Krishna Leela series, Krishna Leela series, clear. Krishna Leela series. These are all contributions of Abhinandanath Tagore. And these are major painters. Clear, clear. Could you please tell IVC people you know about horses because the evidence of Sir Kota other places? We'll come to these questions. Don't worry. Clear. I'll come. First of all, write about these painters. They are very important one. Clear. So Abhinand Nath Tagore. After Abhinand Tagore, the next major painter belonging to belonging to Bengal school was Nandalal Bose. Nandalal Bose. Also belonged to Bengal School of Art, clear. Born in 1882. Born in 1882. Died in 1966. Died in 1966. Nandal Bose, clear. So first of all, clear. One of the most prominent artists of modern India and follower of Abhinandan Tagore and Havel, clear. His unique style of paintings led light in synthesis, particularly of historic artist tradition and contemporary art, clear. Subject included painting of scenes from daily life, life mythologies, clear. And at the same time, he was, major information, he was the first recipient, first recipient of fellowship from 
orient from the oriental society of art from the oriental society of art in 1907 at bengal during swadeshi movement swadeshi movement clear he start promoted the concept of sketch painting he is known for sketch painting clear promoted the concept of sketch painting nanlal bose his famous paintings include clear include depiction of dandi march include depiction of dandi march of mahatma gandhi clear dandi march and mahatma gandhi dandi march and mahatma gandhi most famous painting clear dandi march and mahatma gandhi clear so these were very important developments clear another painter of bengal school was rabindranath tagore painter was rabindranath tagore he was a painter as well he was a polymath clear and rabindranath tagore 1861 to 1944 clear abin rabin natagore 1861 to 1994 clear 1994 sorry clear 1861 to 1994 clear rabin natagore 1944 clear now coming to rabin natago clear ramin natago promoted the concept of formal painting he promoted the concept of formal art in painting formal art in painting clear at the same time clear he always applied spontaneity to painting spontaneous painting clear spontaneous painting clear and his paintings include a wide range of subjects clear five or some like natural themes he emphasized on natural themes in paintings by rabindranath tagore clear now apart from this next major artist was jemini roy of modern india Germany Roy 1887 to 1972 1887 to 1972 Germany Roy clear renowned painter who in the 1920s ushered a new style incorporating the Kalighat style and style of village patu artist of Bengal clear so he basically blended he blended Kalighat will come to the style of painting he blended Kali Ghat style with Patua style of Bengal with Patua style of Bengal. So he blended the style of Kali Ghat painting and Patua style of painting in Bengal. Clear. His paintings involved use of exp use of inexpensive material by folk artists. Clear. So use of inexpensive material in painting use of in exp inexpensive material in painting painting clear and famous paintings include santhal dance include the santhal dance include the santhal dance clear mother and child mother and child mother and child clear and then gopini gopini and three ladies gopini and three ladies these are major works of germany roy clear germany roy. then we have ram kinkar baij another painter is ram kinkar baij Ram Kinkar Baij, 1906 to 1980. 1906 to 1980. Ram Kinkar Baij, clear. A famous painter and sculptor of Shanti Niketan school, clear. So he belonged to Shanti Niketan.
कीर्तन स्कूल वेलकम टू दिस स्कूल इलेबोरेटली ना शांति निकेतन स्कूल विच हैज बीन इंक्लूडेड इन द लिस्ट ऑफ वर्ल्ड हेरिटेज साइट सो बिलोंग टू शांति निकेतन स्कूल क्लियर एंड एट द सेम टाइम हिज पेंटिंग्स इंक्लूड इंक्लूड कॉन्टेक्चुअल मॉडर्निज्म कॉन्टेक्चुअल modernism ram kinkar baij clear then another painter very prominent in modern india is amrita shergil amrita shergil clear so amrita shergil very important painter of modern india coming to amrita shergil she was born in 1913 and died in 1941 at a young age only clear 1918 to 1941 amrita painting clear an early modernist painter educated in france clear so early modernist painter early modernist painter educated in france clear at the same time clear his fame her famous paintings include brahmacharis brahmacharis include brahmacharis bride's toilet boldness was highly important in this painting bride's toilet clear and then three girls three girls all these are paintings of amrita shergil clear then coming to another person that is f n sauza who was one of the founder of progressive artist group f n sauza clear to 1924 1924 to 2008 2008 f n sauza clear modern artist who was the founding member of progressive artist group so he was founding member of founding member of progressive artist group founding member of progressive artist group clear artist group his paintings are eclectic known for his inventive human forms clear now what are the major paintings clear his paintings include the mammon the mammon second painting is last supper last supper and christ on palm sunday and christ on palm sunday christ on palm sunday clear so these are paintings of f n saus a very important one clear another painter of progressive writers group is sayed haider raza sayed haider raza Sayed Haider Raza, clear. 1922 to 2016. These are all contemporary painters. Sayed Haider Raza, clear. He was also founding member of Progressive Artist Group. So, founding member of the Progressive Artist Group was known for his abstract painting. Clear. Was known for his abstract painting. Known for his abstract painting. known for his abstract painting clear at the same time inspired by indian philosophy his paintings are all around bindu or dot clear so his paintings revolved around bindu a dot clear so his paintings revolved around bindu or dot which symbolized source of energy clear his painting thus became thematic and abstract from expansion expressionist clear so his painting was abstract that started from zero that started by bindu that is shunya clear this was another he was another painter hayadarza said hayadarza then we have another painter maqbool fida husain mf husain 
Makbul Fida Hussain. He was also one of the founder of Progressive Actors Group, 1915 to 2011. All are contemporary artists. 2011, Makbul Fida Hussain, founding member of Progressive Artists Group at Bombay. Makbul Fida Hussain, clear. At the same time, he is also known as Picasso of India. He is also known as Picasso of India. He was given the title of Picasso of India, clear. His paintings are basically marked by Cubist style of painting. In fact, he promoted the cubist style of painting. What do we mean by cubist style? Clear. The existing painting is rather unfolded and then again it is rearranged and this style of painting is known as cubist style of paintings. Clear. So cubist style of painting is the painting is there and the message of the painting is unfolded, broken and it is rearranged in different orientation. This style of painting is known as cubist style of painting and the famous paintings of M.F. Hussain include. Clear. This famous painting includes horses, include horses, then Mother Teresa, horses, Mother Teresa, Battle of Ganga Jamna, Battle of Ganga Jamuna, Battle of Ganga Jamuna and Zameen. Battle of Ganga Jamna and Zameen. Clear? These are major painters. Clear? So, Makbul Fida Hussain. After Makbul Fida Hussain, we have Satish Gujral. We have Satish Gujral, brother of Indra Kumar Gujral. Satish Gujral, another contemporary artist. Clear? Satish Gujral. Clear? He was born in the year 1925. Clear. Still alive for some time. Clear. He was also one of the major founder of Progressive Artists Group, and at the same time, he still is largely marked by Indian ethos. His paintings include Indian ethos, and he's largely connected with Pahari school of painting. Largely connected with Pahari school of painting, like Kangra school and Basoli school. Clear. Then another painter is Tayyab Mehta. Next contemporary artist is Tayyab Mehta, 1929 to 2000 and to 2001. Also associated with Progressive Artist Group. Associated with the Progressive Artist Group. Clear. His more paintings marked by high sense of modernism. Marked by high sense of modernism. Clear. And his famous include Kali. First painting of Tayyab Mehta's nose Kali. Then Falling Bull. Then Falling Bull. Clear. Then Mahisha Sur. Mahisha Sur. Clear. Mahisha Sor. All these are works written by books of Tayyab Mehta. After Tayyab Mehta, another person is Vasudev S. Gaitonde. Vasudev S. Gaitonde. Vasudev S. Gaitonde, 1924 to 2001. 1924 2001. First modern Indian abstract painters. You also emphasize on abstract painters known as first modern abstract painter. First modern abstract painter clear abstract painter and at the same time clear his painting indicate I uh, indicate beams of light. His paintings indicate beams of light, indicate beams of light marked by meditative count, marked by, marked by meditative count, 
marked by meditative calm. Clear? Then at the same time, another is to painter is Ganesh. Painter is Ganesh Pine. Ganesh Pine. Clear. He's also so associated with Bengal School of Art. Associated with Bengal School of Art. Ganesh Pine. Clear. His style is characterized by realism and dark imagery. Clear. So, realism, dark imagery. Focus on folk culture of Bengal. Focus on folk culture of Bengal. Clear. And at the same time, clear. His paintings include watercolor. He largely does his painting in watercolor. That is Ganesh Pine. Clear. After Ganesh Pine, we have Manjit Baba. We have Manjit Baba. Clear. 1941 to 2008. 1941 to 2008. Manjit Bawa. Clear. He known for using vibrant colors in painting. Use of vibrant colors in painting. Clear. At the same time. Clear. His paintings include Krishna and the Bull. Krishna and the bull krishna and the bull clear then govardhan then govardhan then here govardhan here after 84 after 84 clear all these are very important one clear so these are very important painters major bonds of the painters clear so all these painters contributed towards painting in modern india these paintings are marked by clear-cut rules and regulations but apart from these paintings and the painters clear folk paintings also developed in india and folk paintings are marked by depiction of folk culture with focus on folk culture and folk paintings vary from region to region so we'll come to folk paintings promoted at this time clear so <coughs> coming to the painting coming to the paintings yeah gaganind gaganind tagore was also a major painter clear and gaganind tagore also painted major things we'll come to that clear the most important contribution of Ra ram kinkan bhai ji bhai ji is his famous painting of yaksha and yaksha in front of rbi building yeah our uh, yaksha and yaksha is in front of rbi building has been being painted by ram kinkan bhai ji, no doubt clear coming to the folk paintings clear we'll come to questions clear now coming to the folk paintings that also developed in modern India. Folk paintings that developed in modern India, which varies from region to region. We'll come to these folk paintings, which are very important from examination perspective, and we'll discuss about important features of these paintings as well. Clear? So, coming to the folk paintings, first of all, before we discuss folk paintings, I'll discuss some of your questions as well. Clear? Now, coming to the questions that has been asked today, clear? Question is, sir, terracotta figurines is different from seals? Yeah, terracotta figurines are different from seals, no doubt about it, clear. Now, again, terracotta figurines were made of mud, clear. Seals were not largely made of mud only. Seals were made from certain stones as well, clear. So, seals and terracotta figurines are very different, clear. So, seals and terracotta figurines are very different. It is not the same, clear. So, we need to understand, clear, that sira that terracotta seals and paintings are very different, clear, are very different, clear, are very different at the same time, clear. Why company school of painting is known as company kalam? Yeah, company kalam is also known as because it kalam was used for painting. Kalam, that is pen, was used for painting. So company school of painting is also known as known as 
known as company kalam painting so lord dempy and lord willis was a great patron of painting to his that time yeah they also gave support to painters that promoted company school of paintings in india leading to the blending of indian style and the european style hello sir good morning can you please tell if ibc people knew about horses clear see ibc people did not uh, they may be knowing about horses we don't have evidence but our horses were not breeded in this valley civilization clear so make it clear that ibc people may have known about no horses but horses were not breeded in indus valley civilization we don't find any evidence of horse clear there is one sporadic evidence from sur kotda whereby bones of horses has been found in a pot clear but that is only a stray evidence nothing more than that it is to be taken as exception because horses were not breeded so indus valley people may have known about horses but horses were not breeded in this valley civilization climatic conditions of india never promoted the quality breeding of horses so horses were not breeded in in this valley civilization make it clear but we have one pot found at surkotda in gujarat which contained the bones of horses may the maybe the bones of horses may have come from mesopotamia that is why we say people may have known about horses clear but horses were not breeded in indian conditions clear the most important kind of ram king ke baj we had discussed about this important kind of gagan and tagore fielding yeah painting is known as raza bindu again he also emphasized on some concept of philosophy clear so gagan and tagore painting to painting also started bindu sunne clear and that also basically story was woven around this bindu and therefore it was known highly influenced by philosophical trait known as raza bindu clear so gagan and not tagore gagan and tagore was also very prominent one but ha huh, major paintings were done by abandan and not tagore and rabindranath tagore we apart from gagan and tagore we have painters like gopal rao we have ss thakur singh we have angela menon we have dhirat choudhury we have jatin das we have jogen choudhury there are many one but these are the most prominent one that we had done related to paintings now coming to folk paintings in india now coming to these paintings they are very important for prelims examination questions has already been asked from this for, for folk paintings clear so folk paintings are very important especially paintings like kalamkari paintings and all it has been asked where the kalamkari paintings normally normally practiced they will ask you the state itself clear so coming to this paintings we'll discuss features also clear first folk painting is basically the warli paintings warli paintings which is basically a tribal painting performed in the region of maharashtra so this painting is practiced by the tribal communities in maharashtra region the warli paintings clear so it is practiced largely by a tribe known as warli tribe so this painting is practiced by the war tribe in the region of maharashtra clear paintings are usually done on home walls home walls on ceremonial occasions clear so these paintings are done on home walls on ceremonial occasions on certain ceremony so paintings were done on home walls on important ceremonies on important ceremonies the warli painting clear rice paste with red ochre powder is used in painting material so the color the painting on the material that is used is rice paste rice paste and ochre mud color ochre colored rice paste and ochre colored powder talc is used along with rice paste in the painting clear scenes of daily community life like dancing planting saplings hunting fishing festivals and rituals are depicted clear so scenes from daily community life scenes from daily community life is depicted like dancing music then at the same time hunting fishing all are de depicted and festivals also clear human figures have a typical representation using triangles and straight lines clear while the white color is predominant in red ochre background clear so human beings is depicted in triangular form clear so human beings are depicted in triangular form is depicted in triangular form and straight lines and 
straight lines triangular form and straight lines this is warli paintings clear so warli paintings was promoted in maharashtra region features can also be asked clear after warli paintings the next major folk painting that is followed in india is madhubani painting in the region of bihar northern part of bihar so madhubani painting in the region of bihar mithila region of bihar northern part of bihar clear also referred to as times mithila paintings the style of paintings to have originated when king of mithila that is king janak clear asked the painters to draw the marital ceremony of sita with lord ram clear so at the same time it this painting started in mithila region by the king by king janak of mithila to paint some themes to be given to the to be given to the groom's family for groom's family that is lord ram's family when they arrive for marriage with goddess sita clear these paintings are done on walls of houses medium like canvas cloth etc these paintings are particularly on occasions like birth marriage and festivals clear paintings depict scenes from ramayan marriage of ram and sita or return of ram from exile or krishna playing with gopis and other events from mythologies and religious motifs clear so paintings depict the scenes from ramayan the scenes from ramayan marriage of marriage of lord ram with goddess sita with goddess sita clear Lord God Ram with Goddess Sita, clear the God Goddess Sita, and at the same time Krishna playing with gopis, Krishna playing with gopis. Krishna playing with gopis. Clear. The paintings often contain images of fish. This is very important. Clear. Fish is a very conspicuous presence in these paintings. Clear. Fish considered to be auspicious. Clear. Fish and all those all the same time snakes. So fish and snakes are typical feature of Madhubani style of painting. Clear. And some famous painters of these paintings are Ganga Devi. Painters are Ganga Devi. then we have sitara devi ganga devi sita devi ganga devi sita devi satyanarayan satyanarayan etc clear so madhubani painting which is largely followed in the region of bihar clear started by king janak of mithila region ramayan is depicted marriage of lord ram with goddess sita krishna playing with gopis fish and snakes are conspicuous presence in this paintings ganga devi sita devi and satyanarayan are important artists associated with madhubani painting in mithila region of north bihar then we have kalighat painting in bengal we have kali ghat painting that is largely practiced by the people in region of bengal clear this style of painting originated in 19th century around kali ghat temple in the present day kolkata clear whose rural artists would prepare these paintings the paintings contain images of hindu gods and goddesses but later diversified diversified to scenes from rural life and crude images of birds animals snakes and fishes paintings are characterized by use of simplified figures and and bold colors clear later on kali ghat school of painting became a part of bengal school of art that was promoted by leaders like abandin natagor and nandalal bose kalighat painting then we have patta chitra then we have patta chitra painting which is largely followed in the state of urissa clear patta chitra because the paintings are done on patta that is a form of cloth refers to canvas clear so since the paintings are done on canvas or cloth known as patta the paintings known as patta chitra earlier paintings were done on palm leaves also clear so that was known as tal patta chitra clear the paint subjects of the paintings were religious in nature generally taken from imagery of lord jagannath clear so clearly so obviously in this paintings lord jagannath an avatar of lord vishnu 
is largely depicted in the paintings clear at the same time in this painting there are use of deep colors like red color black color and blue color in this paintings clear and these paintings are largely offerings to lord jagannath in the temples at puri in urissa clear so very important paintings that was promoted in urissa known as patta chitra clear then we have another art known as patua art fifth is patua art or patua painting that is again in the region of bengal so patua art in the region of bengal the folk art of west bengal captured scenes of paintings on long vertical scroll of paper the subjects of painting would be series form religious scenes clear so these are centuries old painting known as patua art in in bengal then we have kalamkari painting kalamkari painting in the region of andhra pradesh kalamkari painting in the region of andhra pradesh clear kalam or vratha pani painting clear it's basically kalam and fabric that is used to make painting kalam made of bamboo stick clear and kari means craftsmanship subjects included in this paintings are basically ramayana and mahabharat the distinct style is sri kala hasti and machhli patnam style clear so this kalamkari paintings further divide into two styles clear what are the two styles of kalamkari painting clear first style is known as sri kala hasti painting clear so first style is known as sri kala hasti painting sri kala hasti painting and second is known as machhli patnam painting machhli patnam painting so kalamkari paintings divide into sri kala hasti and machhli patnam temple clear then we have far painting we have far painting which is practiced in the region of rajasthan far painting for it is in the region of rajasthan it's a folk painting in which bamboo shafts are used for painting the scrolls clear the bhopas who are priest singers carry the farts with the serves as temple of the folk clear so these paintings are done largely by bhopas the monks who move across and go to temples with this paintings clear then we have another painting in rajasthan known as pichwai paintings pichwai painting it is largely practiced in the region of jodhpur in rajasthan pichwai paintings clear and this temple paintings are done in clothes in nath nath dwar temple clear so these temples so these paintings are done at nath dwar temple nath dwar temple clear and in this temple they depict lord shrinath ji and is of religious in character clear then at the same time coming to another painting is thanjavur painting or thanjavur painting thanjavur painting or also thanjavur painting it is largely promoted in state of Tamil Nadu Tanjore painting. This painting essentially is a company of painting uh, combination of painting that flourished in Tanjore and Maratha paintings. Clear. These paintings are largely religious in nature, in which they depict religious deities and religious figures. Tanjore painting. Then we have Manjusha art. Then we have Manjusha painting, which is practiced in the region of Bhagalpur. in bihar which is basically also known as snake painting clear this is follow this is known as snake painting and in this snake painting this is based on a folklore which is known as bihula bishahri clear so it's basically bihula bishahri that is taking away the poison of the snake known as bihula bishahri clear three colors are used in this painting pink green and yellow clear so pink green and yellow is used in manjusha painting clear then at the same time clear we have one another some paintings in the region of madhya pradesh in the region of madhya pradesh that is tribal painting coming to this painting next is known as gond painting 
gold painting it can be asked this time because we are celebrating 500 birth anniversary of rani durgavati we had discussed in medieval india that basically fought on behalf of gold against the mughal emperor akbar gold painting popular in the region of gold among the gold tribes in madhya pradesh region so gold painting became very important it largely indicate basically the basically the or basically the warriors on the hall walls of the houses then we have santhal painting santhal painting followed by the santhal tribe in the region of jharkhand santhal painting that depict the the bravery and courage of santhal tribes clear then we have paitkar painting these are all tribal arts paitkar painting clear this paitkar painting is also followed clear paitkar paintings are similar to patwa art that is followed in west bengal clear and paitkar painting is also popular in region of jharkhand clear so paitkar painting is followed in this region clear so these are all tribal art that is followed in the different parts of india so paitkar painting is followed clear is paitkar painting is followed similar to patwa art and it is followed in jharkhand and bengal region so all these are major paintings or folk paintings which were promoted in modern india and these paintings became important feature of cultural development in modern times clear so major paintings done next coming to the next question clear so is it unicorn in ivc yeah unicorn is there single horned the bull is found in the indus valley civilization with respect to madhubani painting painting of sashikala devi in the exam japan an important japanese patron of this art is hasengawa yeah because madhubani painting of late has been promoted and endorsed by japan largely because bihar's connection with buddhist religion especially in alanda and both gaya so japanese has started to organize exhibition for all the madhubani artists like sitara devi and therefore it has resulted into popularity of madhubani painting of late clear large number of madhubani paintings has been purchased by indian railways and that are used to rather beautify the coaches of railways and even the inner interior of the coaches of indian railways so it has become highly commercially viable to promote the paintings largely performed by women in mithila region of north bihar what is the different mysore painting and tanjore painting in mysore painting normally the depiction is not of religious deities it is basically depiction of warriors and all and basically it is largely oil painting in tanjore painting apart from oil painting there's a large focus on religious deities figures and the and and gods and goddesses there's a major difference between mysore painting and the tanjore painting god painting god ti gi tag is meant yeah geographical indication also will come to this concept also recently god painting also got gi tag geographical indication tag whereby to emphasize that this painting is largely confined to one specific geographical region of india in order to promote this art gi tag has been given recently that to god painting so god paintings are important especially also because of rani durgavati and who was basically fought on behalf of god against the mughal forces and we had discussed they also promote chandelas of undel khan or they also promoted large number of temples at khajuraho we we'll discuss all the temples distinctive features as well the most important feature being depiction of eroticism taken from kam sutra of vatsayan clear so this was major development so paintings became a major concept that started to be promoted in modern india clear now apart from painting the next major development that is related to culture in modern india is about music in modern india clear so let us move to another dimension that is music in modern india music in modern india so music in modern india clear the first of all i'll let you know clear the broad categories of music in india are hindustani classical music that largely developed in northern part of india as a blend of persian and arabic music then at the same time we have carnatic music largely indigenous and in southern part of india then we have light classical music like thumri and dadra then we have devotional music like bhajan kirtan and shabad then folk music then film and other popular music 
and then western music clear so these are very important components of music first major component is music we have hindustani classical music then we have carnatic music clear and then at the same time we have large number of folk music in india as well clear so we'll come to this music we had discussed about hindustani classical music in medieval india also swar rag and tal as well we had discussed about carnatic music also important personalities like tyagraj muthu swami dikshit r shama sastri we had discussed in medieval india along with major gharanas of indian music as well clear so music is largely divided into hindustani classical music carnatic music that developed during mughal phase only then we have light classical music like thumri also devotional music we had discussed bhajan and kirtan and shabad clear bhajan kirtan followed largely to propose largely to worship lord krishna different part of india in modern india the most important development was that music developed from region to region and that resulted into growth and development of folk music in india clear so first important thing in modern india during british rule was that people began to develop music from region to region and that marked the beginning of folk musics in india clear now these folk musics are very important no do note about these folk musics that is followed in different parts of india clear so coming to first of all folk music hindustani music we had discussed classical music we had discussed in medieval india along with gharanas also clear coming to the folk music that largely developed in modern india clear now coming to these folk music the first major folk music is vanavan clear so vanavan is a folk music this folk music is largely followed in the folk practice in the region of kashmir clear so vanavan is a folk music followed in kashmir region and it's performed on the occasion of marriage clear so it is performed largely on the occasion of marriage known as vanavan music in kashmir then we have another music known as chakri chakri this music is also performed in the region of jammu and kashmir region so it is also performed in jammu and kashmir region and it is presently placed with instruments like rabab and sarangi clear after this the next major folk music is tappa by camel drivers of punjab region so tappa is a folk music in the region of punjab clear then at the same time three musics are in uttarakhand clear these three musics of uttarakhand are number one first is bajuband bajuband music bajuband is a music that is performed to show love and sacrifice then we have another music known as basanti folk music of basanti basanti is a song of spring and then we have chopati we have chopati chopati is a folk music which is performed in tehri and garhwal region and all the three musics are performed in the state of uttarakhand so they are all folk musics of one single state of uttarakhand clear so in uttarakhand these folk musics are performed clear apart from uttarakhand clear coming to the folk music clear next major folk music is basically rajasthani folk music and among rajasthani folk musics are mand mand is a folk music then we have pankhira we have pankhira mand pankhira lotia panihor lotia and panihor all performed all music performed in the region of rajasthan clear okay? so the folk musics of rajasthan clear okay? and all most of them are performed by the women some of them are performed by peasants and at the same time panhor songs are around the what around water and wells clear okay? this song is very important because this is performed around water and wells water and wells panhor music clear okay? but clear okay? derived from the word pani clear okay? so panhor because rajasthan being semi arid region water is highly scarce the songs performed near wells water and wells known as panhor music clear okay? this is from rajasthan coming to folk musics from uttar pradesh clear okay? we have rasya geet we have rasya geet in uttar pradesh then we have hori and sohar hori 
and so on. Holi is performed largely during the death festival of Holi, clear? Holi in Braj region, clear? And at the same time, Sohar is a song performed on the occasion of childbirth in Allahabad region, clear? So all these are folk musics of Uttar Pradesh, clear? So these are folk musics of Uttar Pradesh, clear? Coming to another folk music, no. Another folk music coming from West Bengal. In the region of West Bengal, we have a folk music known as Baul. Baul is a folk music in Bengal. West Bengal is a religious music. Yeah. Then we have Rabindra Sangeet. Rabindra Sangeet. It's Rabindra Sangeet. And Rabindra Sangeet is basically musical tradition developed by Rabindra Nath Go. Clear? And this is a basically influenced by Hindustani and Carnatic music both. Clear? And both these songs or folk musics are performed in the state of West Bengal. Clear? So this was in West Bengal. Then coming to another other folk music. One is Pandavani. One is Pandavani which is performed in the region of Maharashtra. Okay. Pandavani is performed in Maharashtra. Then Bihu. Bihu is performed in Assam. Bihu is performed in Assam. Another folk music, Bihu. Then Lai Harauba. Lai Harauba is performed in the state of Manipur. Lai Haroba is a folk music of Manipur, clear, Manipuri festival. Then we have Alha. Alha is performed in Madhya Pradesh as a folk music. Then we have Lawani. Lawani performed in the state of Maharashtra. Lawani is performed in the state of Maharashtra, clear. Then we have Lawani, then we have Pawada. Puwada is also performed in the state of Maharashtra. Then we have Burra Katha. Burra Katha is Andhra Pradesh. Burra Katha in Andhra Pradesh. Burra Katha in Andhra Pradesh. And then Mando. Mando in Goa. Mando music in Goa. All these are folk musics performed in different parts of India. Clear. So all these are very important ones. These folk musics you should know. They can give you to match directly. These folk musics are very important. Clear. Then at the same time, music in India began to be promoted largely by in contemporary times by some classical musicals in India. So we need to know about musical vocalists in India, eminent vocalists in India. And then we need to know about eminent instrumentalists as well. Clear? So coming to eminent vocalist in India, at least those who have been awarded. Clear? So eminent vocalist in India. First is Bhim Sen Joshi. Bhim Sen Joshi. Bhim Sen Joshi. Clear? He is associated with Khayal music. Hindustani music associated with Khyal music, Bhimsan Joshi, associated with Thumri and Bhajan also, light classical music, Thumri and Bhajan, devotional music also. So Khyal, Thumri and Bhajan, etc. Bhimsan Joshi and he is also Bharat Ratna Awardee. So Bharat Ratna Awardee. Bhimsan Joshi. Bharat Ratna Wadi, clear. Second person, very prominent one, vocalist is, vocalist M. S. Subalakshmi. M. S. Subalakshmi. Carnatic music, clear. M. S. Subalakshmi is associated with Carnatic vocalist. Carnatic vocalist. And she is also Bharat Ratna Wadi. Only women musician who has been awarded with this award. So she is also Bharat Ratna 
awardee clear so very important musician clear so these are very important uh, vocalists clear coming to some instrumentalists you should know clear among the instruments you should know bismillah khan instrumentalist also at least those who have been awarded instrumentalist also first among them is bismillah khan associated with the musical instrument that is shahnai bismillah khan shahnai he is also bharat ratna awardee bharat ratna awardee bismillah khan another award is ravi shankar pandit ravi shankar Pandit Ravi Shankar associated with sitar, musical instrument sitar, Hindustani music, and she is also Bharat Ratna Wadi. Clear. He is also Bharat Ratna Wadi. Why this award is in news? So you should know about eminent vocalist and instrumentalist who has been given Bharat Ratna. Four among them. Two are vocalist Bhimsen Joshi, Bharat Ratna Khyal Thumri and Bhajan, M S Subalakshmi. Only women to be given Bharat Ratna Award. Female musician. Clear. Carnatic vocalist. Then we have Bismillah Khan, Chennai, Ravi Shankar Sitar, instrumentalist who has given who has been Bharat Ratna. Clear. So these are very prominent one who have been given Bharat Ratna. You should know about Bharat Ratna. This is a news. Even Indian government has announced Bharat Ratna for Kalpuri Thakur, and even decided to award Bharat Ratna to Lal Krishnadwani recently. Clear? Okay? So, in, musicians awarded with Bharat Ratna, four of them, and these four of them are Im Sen Joshi. Then we have M S Subalakshmi, then Bismillah Khan, and then we have Ravi Shankar. Clear? Okay? This one thing. No, apart from this. Indian music and associated institutions or organization. So Indian music and institutions. You should know about institutions as well. First major institution is Gandharva Mahavidyalaya. First is Gandharva Mahavidyalaya. Gandhar Mahavidyalaya clear. This institution was established by Vishnu Digambar Palushkar. It was established by a great musician, Vishnu Digambar Palushkar. Palushkar in the early 20th century in Lahore. Originally it was established at Lahore. Later shifted to Bombay. Later shifted to Mumbai after partition of India. So it was established in, in Mumbai after after it after established. Clear? The current institution is established at New Delhi in 1939. Clear? So since 1939, later on shifted to Mumbai and then finally it was shifted to New Delhi as well. So presently, Kandar Mahavidyalaya is located in New Delhi. Located in New Delhi. This was the first musical institution established in India by Vishnu Digamba Palushkar. The second institution related to music is Sangeet Natak Academy. Sangeet Natak. Sandi Natan Academy. Sangeet Natak Academy. It was established in 1952 by government of India. So established in 1952 by the government of India. It is the apex institution of performing arts in India and aims to preserve and promote various arts including music, dance and drama. So it is the apex institution to promote music, art, dance and drama. And therefore this institution is considered to be the most prominent one presently to promote music, dance and drama in India established in 1952 after independence. Clear? Next major institution to promote music is known as Speak Makkai. Clear? Very prominent one in contemporary times. Speak Makkai stands for Society for the Promotion of 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 Indian Classical Music Promotion of Indian Classical Music Indian Classical 
Indian classical music, Indian classical music and culture amongst youth. And culture amongst youth. And culture amongst youth. Youth speak Makai clear. It is a non governmental organization NGO and it was established to promote, preserve, and promote Indian classical music and culture among the younger generation. It has been successfully hosting a number of lecture demonstrations and performance of eminent artists of music before lakhs of students in colleges, schools, and education institutions. It was established in 1977 by Kiran Said clear. So it was established in 1977 by Kiran Said. And the purpose of the institution was to organize musical programs, eminent of artists in leading campus of educational institutions like colleges and schools and universities to promote interest of younger generation in music and other activities. Clear? So, these are three major institutions related to music. Gandhar Mahavidyalaya, Sangeet Natak Academy and Speak Makai. Clear? So, very important developments related to music that developed in modern India. Clear? So, this were developments related to music. Clear? After music, the next major development that took place in modern India that is related to dances in modern India. Clear? So, we'll come to next major development that is dances in modern India. Clear. So, dances in modern India. Coming to dances, clear. Now, dances are also broadly divided into two forms classical and folk dances, clear. The dances, clear. The majority of dance in India originated from a work, and this work is known as Natya Shastra, written by Bharat Muni. So, origin of dances in India can be traced to can be traced to a work Natya Shastra written by an expert Bharat Muni. Written by expert Bharat Muni. Clear? The dances are broadly classified into classical dances and folk dances. Clear? So, all the dances in modern India can be classified into classical dances and folk dances clear classical dances are those dances which are marked by strict adherence to rules and regulations folk dances does not adhere to rules and regulation and can vary from region to region clear so difference between classical dances and folk dances are that classical dances are marked by salient features and adherence to rules and regulations and most of them are basically devotional in nature folk dances may not be devotional in nature it does not follow strict rules and regulations and it can change from region to region clear so this is the basic different classical dances and folk dances now there are eight classical dances in india so classical dances in india are eight in number clear coming to these classical dances of india so classical dances are eight in number the first classical dance of india is the dance made or the first major classical dance can be Kathak. Clear? Kathak is the only classical dance from northern part of India. The word Kathak has been derived from the word Katha. Katha means a story. Clear? So basically, Kathak is a classical dance, and this classical dance is marked by storytelling activities. Clear? So first major dance is known as Kathak and is largely popular in Uttar Pradesh. So Kathak is a classical dance largely popular in the state of Uttar Pradesh, clear? And it has three distinct gharanas associated with this. These distinct gharanas are the Lucknow gharana, the Lucknow gharana, first is Lucknow gharana, then Jaipur and Banaras gharana, then Jaipur and Banaras gharana. Clear? So, Kathak is largely followed in UP and it is promoted by three gharanas. These three gharanas are the Lucknow gharana, the Jaipur gharana and the Banaras gharana and the most prominent exponents of this school or this Kathak dance is Sambhu Maharaj, Sitara Devi, 
Pandit Birju Maharaj, Shovna Narayan, and Prerna Shrimali. Clear? So, all these persons are related to major drama, dramas. Clear? And in this drama, Gunguru plays a very important role. And there's a complete synergy between or complete synchronization between the performer and the tabla player. And this synchronization is known as Jugal Bandi in Katha. Clear? And this is largely performed by Sambhu Maharaj, Sitara Devi, and at the same time, Shovna Narayan. Birju Maharaj, clear. So, classical dance Kathak in the region of UP, clear. Coming to another classical dance, eight of them are there, clear. The next classical dance is basically Odissi, which is performed in the state of Odisha, clear. Odissi classical dance, clear. And this dance was initially performed by Maharis or Dev Dasis. Odissi is a pure temple dance. Odissi and Bharatanaryam are two temple dancers. And Odissi was performed by Dev Dasis in the region of Jagannath Temple in Puri, clear. And at the same time, this is a dance of love and passion, clear. And this dance is marked by Trabhang gesture, clear. So, like Kathak, the most distinctive feature of Kathak is clear. Coming to folk dances later on, clear. The most distinctive feature of Kathak is Jugal Bandi and Ghungru, use of Ghungru. Jugal Bandi and the use of cloth, typical cloth and lavish use of Ghungru, clear. In Odissi, the most typical feature is Trabhang. Bending the body at thrice places, clear. UDC, it's a pure temple dance, clear. So, UDC is a pure temple dance performed by Devdasi, is clear. Trivang is a pure feminine gesture that is performed, clear. And at the same time, clear, in this music, clear, the most important instrument played is Pakhwaj, clear. So, Pakhwaj is the most dominant musical instrument which is played in Odissi dance, clear. And this dance is largely performed by Kelucharan Mohapatra, Sanjukta Panigrahi and Sonal Mansing, clear. So, this dance is largely performed by performers like Kelucharan Mahapatra, Kelucharan Mahapatra, Mahapatra, Sonal Mansing, Sonal Man Singh and Sanjukta Panigrahi and Sanjukta Panigrahi. UDC dance, clear? After UDC, the next major classical dance is Manipuri dance performed in the state of Manipur, clear? Manipur. This dance, Manipur dance, it has a huge Vaishnavite influence, clear? And this Manipur, this dance is largely performed during Manipuri festival of Lai Haroba. So, Lai Har, it, this is largely performed during the Manipuri festival of Lai Haroba. Manipuri festival of Lai Haroba and this music is largely basically based on love of Radha and Krishna depicting Ras Leela. So, this dance depicts Ras Leela, there is love between Lord Krishna and Lord Radha. This tins or this distinctive feature of this dance is that this dance indicate the martial art, clear? It indicate the martial art known as Thangta. So, this also indicate the martial art of Sri Manipur known as Thangta, clear? Very important one, clear? And this dance is largely promoted by Javeri sisters. Javeri sisters include Ranjana, four sisters known as Javeri sisters, Ranjana, Darshana, Ranjana, Darshana, Naina, and Suvarna. These are four Javari sisters promoting this dance known as the dance of Manipuri. Clear? After Manipuri dance, the next classical dance after Manipuri is Bharatnatyam, the oldest classical dance. Bharatnatyam is the oldest classical dance in the state of Tamil Nadu. Like Odissi, it is also a temple dance. Clear? Bharatnatyam, it's also known as 
fire dance clear and it was also performed like we see by the devdasis originally performed by women and it was a, it is a solo dance performed by women in praise of brihadeshwara or lord shiv clear and at the same time this dance bharatanatyam was performed by devdasis and this became a most important dance in the state of tamil nadu clear so bharatanatyam being a very prominent dance and the most prominent promoter of this dance is rukmini devi clear so rukmini devi is considered to be the big supporter of bharatanatyam dance then we have mallika sarabhai we have mallika sarabhai also associated with the bharatanatyam dance clear they are very prominent one sonal mansing associated with this dance clear so sonal mansing is with odissi also sonal mansing based bharatanatyam as well clear so do remember what sonal mansing associated bharatanatyam also odissi and similarities bharatanatyam odissi are temple dance clear so these two are very similar dances that is bharatanatyam and odissi both are temple dances performed largely by women devdasis and sonal mansing associated with bharatanatyam also sonal mansing associated with odissi as well clear after this we have next classical dance and this classical dance is known as kuchipudi so next classical dance is known as kuchipudi clear this classical dance of kuchipudi is performed in andhra pradesh performed in andhra pradesh and after bifurcation even in telangana also on the pradesh and telangana that is kuchipudi dance clear and this is also a dance marked by vaishnavite influence like manipuri dance clear so manipuri and kuchipudi are similar because they, ind they indicate vaishnavite influence clear and at the same time this dance was largely started by sidhendra yogi clear so this dance was started by Siddhendra Yogi. So Siddhendra Yogi promoted this dance of Kuchipudi in Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. Clear. At the same time, Kuchipudi is also been promoted by two husband and wife, Raja and Radha Reddy. Raja and Radha Reddy. Husband and wife promoting Kuchipudi dance. Clear. Then the next dance is Kathakali. Next is Kathakali performed in the state of Kerala. Kathakali performed in the state of Kerala. Kathakali, clear. And this Kathakali is a dance drama that is performed in Kerala, clear. And it was it was revived. It was it has been largely revived in modern times by Malayali poet V. N. Menon, clear. So Malayali poet V. N. Menon has largely revived this dance in modern times, clear. And this dance, clear. This this dance form also draws from many other local dance forms like. Kudiyattam. Kudiyattam is a very important dance included in the list of intangible category as well. Clear? And as of now, this dance is largely promoted by Kala Mandalam. This dance is largely promoted by Kala Mandalam. Promoted by Kala Mandalam dance and also by K.C. Panikkar. K.C. Panikkar. Kathakali dance in Kerala. Then we have another dance that is Mohiniyattam. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6, 7 and 8. Clear? So 7th classical dance is Mohiniyattam. 7th one is Mohiniyattam. Again in the state of Kerala. Mohiniyattam again in the state of Kerala. It's a classical dance from the state of Kerala. Again, V and Menon is associated with this dance also, like Kathakali. So V and Menon is associated to revive the dance. Mohiniyattam also like Kathakali in Kerala, clear. And at the same time, clear. This is basically this dance of Mohini is the inspiration of this art. Clear. Mohini in Hindu mythology is an incarnation of Lord Vishnu, a celestial enchantress who emerges during the distribution of nectar between Asura and Devs and after churning of the ocean. Clear. So basically, Mohini is referred to in Hindu mythology as incarnation of Lord Vishnu. Clear. So Mohini. 
this dance was performed by Mohini and Mohini is worshipped as an incarnation of Lord Vishnu who had consumed basically the nectar when it was distributed between Asura and Devs. Clear? This is a feminine, feminine last dance and it is marked by graceful movement of body movement, body. Clear? So, this is Mohini Attam dance performed in Kerala and as of now, this dance is largely promoted by Dr. Kanak Rele. Dr. Kanak really is a performer of Mohini Attam in contemporary times, clear, along with Sunanda Nair, clear. So, Sunanda Nair, Nair, Mohini Attam, clear. And then the last classical dance side one is the Kshatriya dance in the region of Assam. Again influenced by Vaishnavite influence, clear? So, three dancers are influenced by Vaishnavite influence. In fact, this dance was, again I'll let you know, clear? Vaishnavite influence. Kuchipuri is highly influenced by Vaishnavite influence, clear? And at the same time, Manipuri is influenced by Vaishnavite influence. And the third dance influenced by Vaishnavite influence is Kshatriya dance. It was started by Bhakti Sant Shankar Dev in Assam during 15th century and began to be performed by his followers known as Bhokkots, clear? The difference between Kshatriya dance and Manipuri dances, both Vaishnavite, clear? In Manipuri dances, Ras Leela, between, between Lord Krishna and Radha, clear? But in Kshatriya dance, it's basically a Ras Leela between Lord Krishna and Gopis. Lord Krishna and Gopis, clear? So, not Radha, here it is Gopis, clear? So, Lord Krishna and Gopis, clear? So, this is a very important one. Like in contemporary time, the Kshatriya dance is being promoted by Anvesha Mahant, clear? So, Anvesha Mahant is promoting the dance of Kshatriya at global level also, Anvesha Mahant. And then we have Ghanakanta Bora. Ghanakanta Bora Barua. Clear? Ghanakanta Bora Barua. Clear? U A H. Barua. Clear? These are our prominent artists or performance related to classical dances. Clear? So, classical dances are 18 number. Features you should know, major performers you should know, the stage you should know. All these are classical dances. Apart from classical dances, now we have some folk dances as well that shift or rather that changes from place to place. They are not purely devotional nature. Some of them are highly inter for entertainment as well. We'll come to folk and tribal dances in India. Okay? So, we have folk and tribal dances in India. So, folk and tribal dances in India, that is from region to region, clear? Now, coming to folk and tribal dances in India, first of all, we'll take the state of Jammu and Kashmir, clear? First, we'll take the state of Jammu and Kashmir. In Jammu and Kashmir, there are two classical dances, very prominent one. One is Dumhal. One is is classical dance is known as Dumhal. Dumhal is basically performed by long colorful robes, clear? And at the same time, this colorful robes are performed by multiple performers. So, six and seven ladies together, they basically, they tie each other, each other and they play a long, long cloth and they perform this dance known as Dumhal. Second dance is known as Rauf. R-O-U-F, clear? Rauf dance is usually performed by men of Rauf tribe, clear? So, Dumal is largely performed by women, especially, clear? And Rauf is performed by male performers, clear? Rauf dance is popular dance of Kashmir region performed by girls and women facing each other, clear? So, Rauf can largely performed by women, men, but it can also be performed by women, clear? So, Dumal is largely performed by women, Rauf by both male and female. These are two major Local dances or folk dances of Jammu and Kashmir, clear? After Jammu and Kashmir, the next major state is Himachal Pradesh. Known for classical dances, we have the state of Himachal Pradesh. Himachal Pradesh, clear? And Himachal Pradesh, the first classical dance known as Kullu Nati. First is Kullu 
नाटी डांस क्लियर कुल्लू नाटी डांस इज बेसिकली परफॉर्मड इन कुल्लू रीजन ऑफ हिमाचल प्रदेश देन वी हैव छाम C H H A M. This is another folk dance of Himachal Pradesh, which is performed by Buddhist monks and monasteries. So do remember this dance. Okay? It is performed by Buddhist monks in monasteries, like Dhamshala, Himachal Pradesh. Buddhist monks in monasteries, the Cham dance, and then we have Rakshasa dance. We have. Rakshasha dance in Himachal Pradesh, which is performed in Kinnor region. Clear? So, is it performed in Kinnor region of Himachal Pradesh? Known for apple cultivation. Kullu is performed in Kullu region of Himachal Pradesh. Performed in Kinnor region of Andhra Pradesh. Clear? Uh, of Himachal Pradesh. Clear? And it is basically dance performed by wearing demon mask. Clear? So, this is a dance basically performed by wearing demon mask to ward off evil forces clear so it is largely based on superstitious beliefs known as the rakshasha dance for protection against evil forces and it's performed with demon mask wearing demon mask these are major three class folk dances of himachal pradesh clear now after himachal pradesh will come to the state of punjab very important for your coming examination one major dance of punjab which is a news clear the two classical dances of punjab is basically uh, to punjab is not punjab is not punjab basically from gujarat one dance is very important that is the dance of garba clear so garba is a very important dance will come to this of gujarat but coming to punjab we have bhangra one classical dance known as bhangra Another classical dance of Punjab is known as Gidda. Bhangra and Gidda. Clear? Bhangra and Gidda. The two dances of Bhangra and Gidda are performed in Punjab on occasion of harvest festivals of Lori Baisakhi. Clear? So these two dances are performed in the harvest festivals like Lori and Baisakhi. In Punjab, Lori and Baisakhi in Punjab. Clear? Bhangra is performed by men to the fast beats of drums. Clear? It is an energetic dance performed visually with arms raised with the formation of circle. And Gidda is performed by women wearing clothes of wide variety of colors. Clear? So Bhangra is performed by men. It's energetic dance. And Gidda is performed by women in Punjab. Clear? So these are two major dance clear of Punjab. Then after Punjab, we have Rajasthan. We have Rajasthan. The most popular class of folk dance is Ghumar in Rajasthan. Ghumar is a very prominent one performed by women wearing colorful dresses, clear. And at the same time, Ghagras. Second major dance in Rajasthan is Kalbelia dance, a snake dance. Kalbelia dance. Kalbelia is a snake dance, clear. And at the same time, this snake dance is performed by Sapera community in the region of Rajasthan, western part of Rajasthan, clear. So Kalbelia is a snake dance performed by Sapera community of Rajasthan. So Ghumar and Kalbelia are prominent classical dances from the state of Rajasthan, clear. After Rajasthan, we have the state of Jharkhand, clear. So from the state of Jharkhand also. We have a folk dance, and this folk dance of Jharkhand is known as Jhumar. So it's Ghumar, is here, it's Jhumar. Jhumar is a folk dance of Jharkhand, clear. It's a harvest dance performed by tribal communities. So Jhumar is a harvest festival, harvest dance performed by tribal communities in the region of Jharkhand. This is also popular in the state of Odisha as well, clear. This is one other the dance. So the next major dance in Jharkhand is known as Known the second major dance in Jharkhand is known as Chau dance. Known as Chau dance, another tribal dance. Clear. Chau dance is popular in Jharkhand, West Bengal, and Odisha. Clear. And in this dance, basically, it is performed by wearing a mask using vigorous movements and martial art features. Clear. So obviously, it is basically again performed by wearing a mask and performing vigorous movements clear this dance form is also performed by santhal tribe in jharkhand and west bengal region clear so these are very important dances that were performed in the region clear so in this region we have the dance that is jhumar and 
chau clear now after jharkhand we'll discuss about the state of bihar also clear so in bihar what are the major folk dances the first major folk dance of bihar is jat jatan jat jatan dance clear jat jatan dance is a folk dance of north bihar in the mithila region it is performed by a men and a women so jat jatan is a dance performed in north bihar region of mithila performed by men and a women clear then we have jhijia dance second is jhijia dance in bihar jhijia dance is performed to invoke god indra and the god of thunder for good rains clear so it is performed to ensure rain and it is it is done to worship lord indra then we have jhumeri next folk dance of bihar is known as the jhumeri dance jhumeri is performed basically clear basically by married women clear and gachri dance another form dance form of bihar clear and this similar dance of the jhumeri is kajri also clear so jhumeri and kajri are performed by women in the region of bihar clear so these are major dances in the state of bihar after bihar we have west bengal what are folk dances of west bengal Clear. First folk dance of West Bengal is Gambhira. Is Gambhira? Gambhira is performed in the Malda district of West Bengal and is performed by popular in Muslim community and they perform by performing they use they perform by using wooden mask. Clear. Then at the same time we have Alkap. Second dance of West Bengal is known as. Alkap, clear. It's a mix of dance with music and theater performed in Bengal, and at the same time, clear. This is performed in rural areas of West Bengal, clear. Then at the same time, coming to Assam, clear. Assam also we have one folk dance, and the most popular folk dance in Assam is known as Bihu. Again, Bihu is also performed as a harvest dance, clear. And this harvest dance is performed by both men and women in the, on the beating of drums, clear. Other important dance in Assam is basically Bodo dance, clear. So second also is known as the Bodo dance performed in Assam, performed on festivals and rituals, clear. This is Bodo dance. Coming after Assam, we have Manipur. we have manipur and in manipur first of all is khamba thoibi this dance is known as khamba thoibi first folk dance is known as khamba thoibi it is specifically to indicate the love between khamba and thoibi khamba and thoibi are folk creators folk creatures in manipur and therefore they depict the love between khamba and thoibi then the most popular one is thangta it's a martial dance in manipur known as thangta clear and this thangta is uh, this thangta dance is performed by large number of large number of thangta men means to, in order to show techniques of fighting with sword and spur this is known as thangta dance clear then at the same time after all these states we have odisha will come to odisha clear and in odisha the major dance is ghumura dance is ghumura dance which is a folk dance in odisha the ghumura dance and ghumura dance is basically performed is the most sought after dance in the sun temple at konark we had discussed about some temple and it's sun temple at konark this dam of ghumura dance is performed clear other folk dances of odisha include paika dance paika is a martial dance by paika tribal community in odisha we have paika dance then we have also changu and karma dance Jango and Karma dance in the region of Odisha. Clear? Odisha. Then coming to Andhra Pradesh. Andhra Pradesh. The folk dances of Andhra Pradesh are Bura Katha. Bura Katha. This is a folk dance of Andhra Pradesh, Bura Katha. It's basically dancing and singing together. And along with this Bura Katha, other folk dance of this region are Gobi, Bathukamma. Gobi and Bathukamma, which is very popular in both Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. 
clear bathu kamma basically it's dance performed by siddhis clear so this are bora gobi and bathu kamma clear then at the same time coming to tamil nadu tamil nadu in tamil nadu was one dance is karakattam karakattam clear karakattam is a dance which is performed by balance of water pot on their head clear so karakattam is a dance to balance water pot on the head in the state of tamil nadu then is maili pat then second one is maila maila mailattam mailattam in tamil nadu mailattam is basically performed by female dancers who are dressed as a peacock clear so mailattam is a dance that is performed by women who are dressed like a peacock and is also known as peacock dance in the region of tamil nadu clear then at the same time in maharashtra coming to maharashtra the folk dance of maharashtra is known as lavani is known as lavani it's basically a rhythmic dance that is performed with dhola clear this is known as lavdi dance then in goa in the state of goa we have one classical local dance known as dekhni local dance is known as dekhni which is basically a dance in a mix of different cultural traditions and is performed by christian girls dekhni dance then we have tarang mel clear then second dance is known as tarangamel tarangamel clear and tarangamel is basically an energetic and youthful dance performed with colorful dresses flags etc on the occasion of dashara and holi so tarangamel is an energetic dance performed in goa in the festivals of dashara and holi clear then after goa we have karnataka we have karnataka and the folk dance of karnataka is kunitha dances is kunitha dances kunitha are ritual dances of karnataka and it is performed by beating of drums and singing clear and it is largely performed in the region of mysore clear so kunitha dances largely performed in the region of mysore in karnataka then we have kerala we have kerala and in kerala we have thiyam very important dance we have thiyam it's a ritual dance clear so thiyam is basically a ritual dance that is performed sacred ritual dance performed to before goddess kali in the region of kerala then we have padayani second is padayani in kerala padayani is a martial art dance performed with mask in kerala this is all together different from kalari payuttu clear kalari payuttu is the martial art of kerala in fact kerala is the originator of martial art kalari payuttu but this is also martial dance padayani but it's very different from kalari payuttu clear so these are basically dances performed in different parts of india clear apart from this clear now we'll to to now we'll take other states also coming to madhya pradesh after this. Yes. Clear. So coming to Madhya Pradesh, known for tribal population. In Madhya Pradesh, we have a dance known as Matki dance. Folk dance is Matki dance, having pot on the desk. Clear. Matki is a community of Malwa region performed by women. Clear. So Matki dance is a performed by community of women. in the malwa region having large number of pots or pots are having pots on their heads clear then we have jowar dance we have jowar dance another folk dance of madhya pradesh jowar dance is associated with agriculture harvest clear and in this have the harvest the latter or rather the performer balance the basket full of jowar on their head clear so they perform or they balance the basket full of jowar in jowar dance clear these are very prominent dance performed in another major festival of dance is gangor Gangor is another dance of Madhya Pradesh, and Gangor dance is celebrated to mark festival of Gangor. Clear. Then after Madhya Pradesh, we have the state of Chhattisgarh, and in the state of Chhattisgarh, the first is Rautnach. 
Roth Nach is a folk dance in Chhattisgarh. Roth Nach is performed by community of Yadavs. Clear? And basically, this, this, this dance is performed to show Krishna Leela. So, Yadav community of Chhattisgarh performed this dance known as Roth Nach. Clear? Then we have Gaur Maria. We have Gaur Maria. This is another folk dance of Chhattisgarh. Rock Gaur Maria is performed by Bison Horn Maria tribe of Bastar district. So, Maria tribe of Bastar district performed this dance known as the Gaur dance. Clear? There's one thing now coming to Gujarat. Very prominent coming to Gujarat. Clear? And in Gujarat, the first, the major dance or the local dance is known as Dandia. First folk dance is known as the folk dance of Dandia. And Dandia is performed basically by leaping and twirling the patterns and is performed in the festival of Navratri. So, Dandia dance is performed on the occasion of Navratri in the region of Gujarat. Next major dance in Gujarat is known as Garba. Known as Garba. Now, we will discuss about this dance. Elaborately, this dance is also performed on the occasion of Navratri. Clear? In order to worship Goddess Durga. Clear? So, we will come to Garba dance. These are all folk dances from different states of India. We have discussed about all the folk dances of India. Starting with the region of Jammu and Kashmir. Then, we had Himachal Pradesh, Punjab. Ah, folk dances. First of all, we'll discuss about Punjab, Bhangra, and Gidda. Then at the same time, Jammu and Kashmir also. We had discussed Dhumal and Rauf, Himachal Pradesh, Kulu Nat, Cham and Rakshasha. Then Punjab, then Rajasthan. We had discussed Ghumar and Kalbelia. Then after this, we had Rajasthan, we had Jharkhand, Jhumar and Jhau, clear. Jhumar and Jhau dance, clear. At in the region of Jharkhand. Then Bihar, we have to get Jat Jatin, Jijira dance. Jijiya dance, Jumeri, Kajiria. Then in Manipur, Khamba, Tobi and Thangta. Thangta is a martial dance. West Bengal, Gambira and Alkap, Assam, Bihu and Bodo dance. Clear. Bihu and Bodo dance. Then at this, after this, we had discussed about Udisa, Gumra dance, Paika, Changu, Karma, Andhra Pradesh, Barukatha, Gobi, Batukamma, Tamil Nadu, Karakatam, Malayalatam, Maharas, Lavni, Goa, Dekhni and Tarangmel, Karnataka, Kunitha, Kerala, Thiyam and Padayani. Then after this, we discussed about Madhya Pradesh, Matki dance, Jawar, Gangor, Chhattisgarh, Rotnach, Gaur Maria, Gujarat, Dandia and Garba. Both performed during the festival of Navratri. Clear? Now, after this, we'll come to Garba dance. Why Garba dance is very important these days? We'll come to Garba dance to understand. Clear? Now, Garba of Gujarat, Garba dance. Clear? So, it is basically performed in the festival of Navratri. Garba dance of Gujarat, very much in news these days, clear. Now, Garba dance of Gujarat has been inscribed in the inscribed in the representative list of intangible cultural heritage, clear, of humanity by United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. UNESCO identifies even tangible world heritage site, intangible world heritage site. Tangible are something which are physically perceptible. And in this tangible category, we had discussed that 42 sites of India has been identified into tangible category. 43 has been recommended by government of India, has been accepted also, clear, that is Maratha military lands Escape, dual forts constructed by the Marathas in western part of India. Intangible sites are those sites which cannot be physically perceptible but which are marked by oral traditions and expressions, performing arts and at the same time social practices, then knowledge and practice concerning and traditional craftsmanship. All these are comes under intangible category of world heritage site. Clear? So first of all we need to discuss that Guj Garba dance of Gujarat has been inscribed, by rep inscribed in the representative list of inscribed in the representative representative list of representative list of intangible tangible and intangible representative list of intangible cultural heritage intangible cultural heritage intangible cultural heritage also known as ICH clear cultural heritage of humanity 
intangible cultural heritage of humanity by humanity by UNESCO. United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. Clear? So, Garba has been included in the representative list of intangible intangible cultural heritage of humanity by unesco clear now coming to this dance more on the news clear what was the basic thing clear so garba of gujarat was added in the ich list under the provisions of 2003 convention for the safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage clear so it was added garba has been added in the list of intangible cultural heritage stars under the provisions of under the provisions of 2003 under the provision of convention under the provision of convention for the safeguarding of convention for the safeguarding of convention on the safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage 2003 Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage 2003 during the 18th meeting. 2003 during the 18th meeting. During the 18th meeting of Intergovernmental Committee. During the meeting of 18th intergovernmental committee intergovernmental committee igc clear intergovernmental committee which was held intergovernmental committee which was held at which was held at kasan in botswana held at Kisan in Botswana recently, clear? And at the same time, Garba is, Garba is the 15th, 1, 5, 14 has already been included. Garba is the 15th intangible cultural heritage, intangible cultural heritage, a cultural heritage from India, from India, Garba is the 15th in, in, intangible cultural heritage from India to join this list. Clear? So, obviously, out of intangible cultural heritage, clear? So, 42 from India for under tangible category, 15 from India in intangible category. So, this is the 51. We'll come to 14 also that are included from India in the intangible cultural heritage side. Clear? That's one thing. Now, coming to about Garba. Clear? Garba is a ritualistic and devotional folk dance that is performed in during the festival of Navratri in order to worship the feminine energy or Shakti. Clear? So, this is one important information. You should have this thing. Coming to another information about Garba. Very important then. That is a news these days. Clear? Garba from Gujarat. Clear? So, it is basically features of this dance. It is ritualistic and devotional dance ritualistic and devotional dance devotional dance performed during the festival of navratri for feminine energy for feminine energy also known as Shakti, feminine energy or Shakti, clear? This dance, clear? The word Garba has, the word Garba has originated from Garb, has originated from Garb, which means womb, Garb or womb. This another major feature again. What were the key features of this dance? This is performed. This is performed. This is performed around earthenware pot. Earthenware pot. 
this dance is performed this dance is performed with earthenware pot clear at the earthenware pot having with oil lamp earthenware pot or oil lamp clear and this oil lamp is basically to worship the womb clear and this worship womb or image of mother goddess amba so this is basically to worship mother goddess mother womb or mother goddess amba so it is basically to worship the mother goddess amba mother goddess amba okay okay so and it is basically a dance that is to show symbol of respect towards women this dance is basically to show respect towards women symbol of respect towards women respect towards women garba respect towards women clear so this was been included in the list of intangible world heritage cultural heritage site or cultural heritage from india clear now at the same time now what are the criteria what are the criteria what are the criteria criteria to be included in intangible cultural heritage site clear what are the criteria number 1 clear the criteria are that these are to be manifested through oral traditions and expressions any custom to be promoted through oral tradition oral tradition and expressions clear oral traditions and expression oral tradition and expression with this criteria will go with all major in, intangible culture heritage site oral traditional expression performing arts performing arts this is another major criteria performing art then it should indicate social practices social practices rituals social practices rituals and festive events and festive events and festive events clear this is one thing another thing is knowledge and practices concerning nature knowledge and practices concerning nature practices concerning nature and the universe nature and the universe nature and the universe and the last criteria is traditional craftsmanship traditional craftsmanship traditional craftsmanship clear so this is one important thing clear now at the same time clear these are the criteria now what are the list of intangible cultural heritage included from india till this time garba being the 51 which are the 14 ones clear so coming to list of intangible cultural heritage from india list of intangible cultural heritage from india list of intangible culture heritage from india till now clear 15 of 15 intangible culture heritage has been there in india from india coming to this clear what is first major that can be included is kudiyattam from kerala kudiyattam from kerala kudiyattam from kerala which is sanskrit dance which is sanskrit theater kudiyattam from kerala which is sanskrit theater will come to the list clear so kudiyattam that is sanskrit theater will come to 14 of them clear so all these are very important one that needs to be understood clear manjusha painting is sir bihula bishari's old mythology and bishari's name of goddess bishari is a name of goddess basically goddess who took away the poison the poison of the snake clear this is no, this 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 mythology is associated behind manjusha paintings clear 
So we'll come to all the 14 sites or in, can, intangible cultural heritage from India till now. The 15th and the latest one being the Garba dance from Gujarat. Clear? We'll come to all those 15. We'll take a break for half an hour. We'll continue with this list and then we'll discuss about the major Offices promoting the sites from India into intangible category, the Sangeet Natak Academy and National List of Intangible Culture Heritage in India. Clear? And certain schemes also that has been launched by Government of India for this. Clear? So we'll continue from here. We'll discuss about all the major intangible cultural heritage from India. 15 of them. The first is Kudiyattam from Kerala, which is a Sanskrit theater. Clear? It's clear. Do remember the criteria because on this criteria only 15 sites have been included. Old traditions and expressions, performing arts, social practices, rituals also, knowledge and practices concerning nature, traditional craftsmanship. Clear? Now with this we'll move on to list of intangible cultural heritage. Clear? So first is Kudiyattam that is a Sanskrit theatre that is from Kerala. Second is Ram Leela. Ram Leela, largely practiced in the state of Uttar Pradesh. Clear. So Ram Leela is another very important traditional performance of Ramayan. Then we have tradition of Vedic chanting. Tradition of Vedic chanting. Tradition of Vedic chanting included in the intangible category. Then we have Raman. Clear. Uttarakhand, Garhwal region. Raman. Clear? Raman is basically a religious festival and ritual theater of Garhwal Himalayas. Clear? So Raman is in Uttarakhand region, Garhwal region. It's ritualistic festival performed by the people on Garhwal region. Then we have Chow dance. We had discussed about this dance. It's a folk dance. Chow dance. Then sixth one after Chow is Kalbelia. A snake dance, Sapera community in Rajasthan. Kal Belia. Six one. Seventh one after Kal Belia dances. Mudiettu, Kerala. Local theatre. Mudiettu, Kerala. Clear. It's a local dance drama from Kerala. Then Buddhist chanting of Ladakh. Eighth one is Buddhist chanting of Ladakh. Buddhist chanting of Ladakh. Clear? Then we have Sankirtan from Manipur. Then we have Sankirtan from Manipur. Clear? Sankirtan from Manipur. Sankirtan included ritual singing, drumming and dancing of Manipur. Then we have tra traditional brass and copper craft. Traditional Traditional brass and copper craft. Traditional brass and copper craft. Traditional brass and copper craft. Clear. Largely of Punjab region. So traditional brass and copper craft of Punjab. Brass of Punjab. Eleventh one is basically Noro's Persian New Year. Noros, Noros Persian festival, then we have Yog. Then 13th one is Kumbh Mela. Kumbh Mela. Organized at four different places in India. Haridwar, Ujjain, clear. Haridwar, Ujjain, Allahabad, Allahabad, it is known as Mahakumbh. Then 14th one, 2022 was Durga Puja in West Bengal. Durga Puja of West Bengal and the 15th one, latest one is Garba from Gujarat. So these are 15 one, the latest one. So Kudiyattam Sanskrit Theatre, then Ramlila, Vedic Chanting, Raman, Chau, Kalvelia, Budiyattu, Buddhist Chanting of Ladakh, Sankirtan, Traditional Brass and Copper Craft of Punjab, 
नौरोज योग कुंभ मेला दुर्गा पूजा एंड गरबा क्लियर सो दीज आर वेरी प्रोमिनेंट वन दैट इज देयर एंड द इंस्टीट्यूशन दैट प्रमोट दिस दिस प्लेसेस दीज इंस्टीट्यूशंस आर संगीत नाटक एकेडमी व्हिच इज अ नोडल ऑफिस फॉर मैटर्स रिलेटेड टू आईसीएच क्लियर सो इन इंडिया द नोडल ऑफिस दैट इज रिलेटेड टू द मैटर्स ऑफ आईसीएच इंटेंजिबल कल्चरल हेरिटेज हेरिटेज साइट इन इंडिया इज द संगीत नाटक एकेडमी स्टैब्लिश्ड इन 1952 बाय गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया देन एट द सेम टाइम क्लियर schemes like global engagement schemes are have been launched by government of india ministry of culture and global engagement schemes promote the names of some sites or some major activities to be included in intangible cultural heritage so two major institutions one is sangeet natak academy which is the nodal office for recognizing and promoting ich sites ich in india and second is some schemes like global engagement schemes by ministry of culture government of india 15 of them in the list of ich we had discussed the criteria also and we had discussed about the conventions also do remember about these conventions as well clear so these are very important developments so folk dances we had discussed and among the folk dances we had discussed about major dances from different states and at the same time the garba from gujarat and these include this is the 15th one included in the represent, represented in list of intangible cultural heritage site from india clear now after the dance forms now we'll come to clear so we had discussed about music we have discussed about dances now we'll discuss about theater clear so indian theater and cinema that is another part major development of culture in modern india clear so coming to indian theater and cinema so indian theater and cinema coming to indian theater and cinema so let us come to indian theater and cinema first of all clear the theater the tradition of theater stage performances dramas clear the tradition of theater in india has a history of thousands of years the earliest reference to sanskrit drama is found in the works of panini in 4th and 5th century bc and then at the same time later in mahabhash of patanjali clear so panini wrote ashtadhyayi patanjali wrote mahabhash which mentions about the development on dance and drama along with this clear the drama dance and drama is elaborately mentioned in natya shastra by bharat muni clear so at the same time it resulted into beginning of dance and drama clear so the tradition of indian theater and drama dates back to thousands of years it starts with first of all panini in ancient india during 4th and 5th century bc and panini wrote a work mahabhashya panini wrote a work mahabhashya then second one was patanjali patanjali wrote work ashtadhyayi clear so sorry panini wrote ashtadhyayi patanjali wrote mahabhashya clear you have to check clear so panini wrote ashtadhyayi panini wrote ashtadhyayi and patanjali wrote mahabhashya and patanjali wrote mahabhash then the third was basically natya shastra natya shastra written by bharat muni natya shastra written by bharat muni in second century bc and this marked the beginning of dance and drama right from ancient india now classical it resulted into beginning of classical sanskrit theater in india and classical sanskrit theater was started by leaders like ashwagosh kalidas bhash sudrak and bhavabhuti clear so coming to important sanskrit plays and the playwrights clear so apart from this will come to sanskrit plays and the playwrights clear so it start the beginning of it mark the beginning of sanskrit plays and playwrights sanskrit plays and playwrights coming to sanskrit plays and playwrights clear the major persons as well as the works clear first major one sanskrit play or playwright was ashwaghosh 
in ancient India, Ashwagosh. And Ashwagosh basically is the concept to be first Sanskrit dramatist. He is considered to be the first Sanskrit dramatist. First Sanskrit dramatist. He wrote a work known as Sari Putra Prakarna. He wrote a work Sari Putra Prakarna. It the work play Sari Putra Prakarna, clear? Sari Putra Prakarna, nine acts, clear? clear? And at the same time, he also wrote Buddha Charitra. Buddha Charitra, biography of Gautam Buddha, clear? In fact, he was the deputy of Vishwamitra who presided over the fourth Buddhist council convened under Kanishka at Kundal Gram in Kashmir. Clear? So, Ashwagosh was considered to be first Sanskrit dramatist, wrote Sari Putra Prakarna and Buddha Charit, which is the biographical account of, which is biographical account of, 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 of account of Gautam Bodh. There's a question, clear? How we learn there are too much information. See, I am giving you the most important one. At least this much you have to learn. This much you have to revise. Clear? So, what should I prefer? Bipin Chandra, class notes or spectrum? I have never read spectrum because the teacher denied. So, please resolve my confusion. See, again, I will repeat. I have said yesterday also. Clear? If you are attempting for prelims in 2024, make one thing very clear. Clear? You cannot afford to read books at this point of time because one single book will not have all the topics all the information required for prelims clear so there's no point of referring to one single book night no this is not the time clear that is why yesterday also i recommended i'll re I'll, I'll i'll just reinforce even now Take the class notes of mine in the batches that I have taken along with the notes of the Capriti Cash course. Both the things combined together will suffice. Clear? So it is not that only class notes will suffice. It is not only that crash course will suffice. It is basically in the short form we are giving you tabulated information. Clear? But the information given in the crash course along with the classes that I have taken in regular batches, both the materials of both needs to be clubbed together and that would suffice for upcoming prelims examination okay yeah? so right now this is the most practical thing that you can do don't go by any single book or work that will not contain such informations which is required to crack prelims examination it requires extensive coverage of the matter to get the questions right clear yeah? and the information that i am giving you at least this should be done for your examination without these informations it would not won't be easy to solve all the questions there clear so at least this much should be done this is the main bare minimum thing that i am giving you but sufficient enough to get through in prelims examination related to history art and culture clear so coming to this ashwagosh clear so ashwagosh was basically a very prominent one in the first century ad and he wrote clear he was basically in the first century ad first century ad Ashwagosh, clear? Second person that work is translated to Sanskrit play and writer is Bhash. Another Sanskrit playwright was Bhash, 2nd century BC to 2nd century AD. He is basically, Bhash is credited for writing 13 plays, clear? And for the century discovered later, which were being used in Kudiyattam performances, clear? Bhash is considered to be a very prominent one, clear? And Bhash wrote several other works, clear? Bhash composed a work known as Swapna Vasvadatta. Swapna Vasvadatta. It's a Sanskrit play. Swapta Vasvatta Vasvadatta written by Bhash. Okay? It's a romantic drama, romantic drama of King Udayan and Vasavadatta, the ruler of Avanti. Okay? So it's a romantic love story between, between the person, between the drama of Vas King Udayan and Vasavadatta, who was the daughter of the king of Avanti. Okay? This is one other one. Okay? Uh, another one, even Bhash is referred to by Kalidas and Raj Shekhar, the famous poet of 9th century AD. Next major person was Shudrak. He wrote Mirch Katika. 
Shudra Krot, Mitch Katika during Gupta period. It's also a Sanskrit drama, clear. So he wrote Mitch Katika, Little Clay Cart, clear. And it is basically about Charu Dutta, an impoverished Brahmin who falls in love with a coach son, Vasanta Sena, clear. So it mentions about a poor Brahmin who fell into love with a coach son, that is Charu Dutta. It's known as Mitch Katika, clear. Next major dramatist was obviously Kalidas, the greatest dramatist of ancient time. Kalidas, he wrote several dramas, clear, and, and dramas, and the most important one is Abhigyan Shakuntalam. It's also known as Abhij Nana Shakuntalam, King Dushyant and Shakuntala, Abhigyan Shakuntalam. There's one drama. Second drama after Abhigyan Shakuntalam is basically, basically Malvikagni Mitram, or Malvikagni Mitra. Malvikagni Mitra, Kalidas claim. Mal is about Agni Mitra and Malvika. Then we have Vikram Urvashi. Vikram Urvashi. Vikram Urvashi. Clear. Vikram Urvashi. Clear. This mentioned by Vikram Urvashi. Then Kumar Sambhav, Raghuvamsh. Raghuvamsh. Raghu Vamsh. Then we have Kumar Sambhav. We have Kumar Sambhav. Clear. All these are major epics or major dramas written by Kalidas. Clear. So these are Kalidas, the greatest dramatists of ancient India. Fourth one coming to the fifth one. Fifth one is Bhav Bhuti. Bhabhuti clear and Bhabhati wrote Mahavir Charitra. Wrote Mahavir Charitra. He wrote Mahavir Charitra, early life of Lord Ram. Then Uttar Ram Charitra. Uttar Ram Charitra. Uttar Ramchari, then we have Malti Madhav. We have Malti Madhav. We have Malti Madhav. Clear. So all these work written by Bhabhuti, who was the king, who was in the king of court of Yeshuvarman of Kannauj, 8th century AD. Then we have Vishakhadat. Vishakhadat, who wrote. First of all, who wrote uh, a work, two dramas. He wrote two major dramas. These two dramas are Mudra Rakshas. Mudra Rakshas. That mentions about the coming of power to, of Chandragupta Maurya. And second drama is known as Devi Chandraguptam. Devi Chandraguptam related to Gupta period. This was Vishakhadat. Then Harshwardhan also wrote three Sanskrit dramas. Harshwardhan wrote three Sanskrit dramas. And these dramas are Ratnavali, Priyadarshika, Ratnavali, Priyadarshika, and Naganan. Ratnavali, Priyadarshika, and Naganan. Then Raj Shekhar. Then Raj Shekhar. And Raj Shekhar wrote a work, Karpura Manjari. Karpura Manjari. Karpura Manjare. Clear? So these were Sanskrit dramas that began to be composed in ancient India. Very prominent ones. All these works are important. Devi Chandragupta has been asked also. Clear? So look into these dramas, especially of Kalidas, Ashwaghosh. So these are Sanskrit plays and Sanskrit writers. Clear? In course of time, folk theatre also began to develop in India. We'll come to folk theatre as well, apart from Sanskrit theatre. We'll come to folk theatre.
will come to folk theater clear now at the same time large number of folk theaters began to develop in india these folk theaters also important some of these has been included in the list of intangible cultural heritage also coming to the first folk theater is ram leela ram leela there is a folk theater folk theater performed in uttar pradesh bihar and madhya pradesh it is in uttar pradesh bihar madhya pradesh that depicts ram the epic of ramayan and it has been in recognized as intangible cultural heritage site cultural heritage site we had discussed the intangible cultural heritage also so ram leela is included in that we'll come to this so ram leela clear so ram leela has been included in the list of intangible cultural heritage site this is one thing clear ram leela up bihar and mp it's basically a folk theater then we have nautanki again in uttar pradesh nautanki also in uttar pradesh clear it's largely performed in uttar pradesh and that indicate local heroes and local performances then we have jatra jatra is in west bengal clear jatra it indicate basically a procession and procession is sold then we have bhand pather fourth is bhand pather in jammu and kashmir bhand pather in jammu and kashmir is a folk theater of jammu and kashmir then we have swang swang is largely in haryana and even some parts of western uttar pradesh swang clear haryana western uttar pradesh then we have march we have march march is performed in the region of madhya pradesh local theater 7th after march is bhavna largely performed in assam bhavna is performed in assam bengal and odisha even in bengal and odisha eighth one after bhavna is yakshagan very important one yakshagan is a local theater and drama performed in the state of karnataka yakshagan is performed in karnataka then tamasha tamasha is performed in the state of maharashtra performed in the state of maharashtra clear then after this 10th one after matamasha is therukothu theru kothu clear theru kothu is performed in tamil nadu is performed in the state of tamil nadu tamil it's basically to perform a worship goddess for good rainfall and rich harvest is known as theru kothu then kudiyattam 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 it's performed in kerala also included in the list of wild heritage site so we have kudiyattam also included in this look into kudiyattam also we have kudiyattam yeah kudiyattam in the beginning itself sanskrit drama sanskrit theater included from kerala so kudiyattam both this thing ramleela also and kudiyattam as well clear so kudiyattam from kerala then we have krishnattam 12th is krishnattam and krishnattam is also from kerala clear it's also in kerala clear so these are very important one now apart from this other classical folk theaters not these are the most popular one, popular ones among them apart from this the other ones also there is ankiya nat 
Ankia Nat. Ankia Nat is a dance from Assam. Ankia Nat from Assam. Then we have Modi Yettu from Kerala. Modi Yettu from Kerala. It's also included in the list of intangible cultural heritage site. Moody at two. Yeah, Moody at two is here from Kerala. Also included in ICH site, clear. So three of them. Moody at two from Kerala. Then we have Bhavai from Gujarat. Bhavai from Gujarat. Bhava is another classical dance. Then we have Akhyana from Kerala. Akhyana, Kerala is very important for this. Folk theatres, Akhyana from Kerala. Akhyana, after this we have Dash Avtar from Maharashtra and Goa. Dash Avtar from Maharashtra and Goa. Dash Avtar. Then Karelia from Himachal Pradesh. Karelia from Himachal Pradesh. Clear. Himachal Pradesh. Karelia from Himachal Pradesh. Then Bayalata from Karnataka. Bayalata from Karnataka. Clear. These are very important folk dances. Clear. Nukkar, Natak, and Nautangi are same or different. I'll let you know. Clear. This is clear. So, this is one important thing to be known. So, all these are very important things. Again, clear. Nautangi and Nukkar, Natak are a bit different. Nautangi is basically something related to myth. Clear. Nukkar, Natak is also known as street play. We'll come to street play also. Modern theater. Clear. Nukkar, Natak is basically street play. And in street play, the social issues and other issues are hard highlighted in the in a display clear performances on streets clear just to create awareness among the people so nukkar nataka are basically street plays the most important person in india of all our latest state play is basically known as sabdar hashmi and uh, habib tanveer will come to some contribution of sabdar hashmi who was assassinated by performing a street play known as halla bowl clear so we'll come to that but meanwhile clear these were major developments related to folk theater so nukkar nataka and Nautanki are different clear sir this one thing apart from this clear coming to all these folk theater after this folk theater Clear. Now we'll come to um we'll come to another major dimension in modern times, and that major dimension is related to puppetry. Puppetry also comes under the theater only, stage shows only, because largely puppetry are performed through stage shows. Clear. Now coming to the concept of puppetry in India. Concept of puppetry in India. puppetry in india clear no coming to this clear see if you really want to have proper and comprehensive coverage i'll emphasize once again to have enough confidence clear to appear for paper history paper these notes along with class notes of mine would suffice but have those things collectively and have an integrated approach for both of them to complete the section of history and culture clear now coming to puppets clear puppetry has been a prominent form of entertainment theater for centuries so puppetries are considered to be a part of theater only it is taken as entertainment theater for centuries the earliest reference to puppetry comes from the tamil classic or tamil epic sila patigram that was written in first century ad by ilango vadigal clear so puppetry is considered to be entertainment theater considered to be an entertainment considered to be an entertainment theater for centuries theater in centuries it is first mentioned in sila patikram tamil epic which was written by elango vadigal 
Slap Patti Gram was followed by Mani Mekalai, written by Satanar. So, Tamil language has two epics, Sila Patti Gram and Mani Mekalai. Sila Patti Gram mentions about puppetry for the first time. Clear? And therefore, the puppets have a history of more than 2000 years in India. In the past, puppetry has been mostly on the stories of epics and legends, but later it also diversified into local folklore. Clear? Puppetry has different traditions and forms in different parts of the country, and this is based on styles of puppetry painting, sculpture and presentation craft. Clear? Broadly, puppets in India are categorized as following. Clear? So, there are different categories of puppetries in India. We'll come to these types of puppetry and regional variations as well. Clear? So, coming to styles of puppetry, we'll let look into that. Clear? First style of puppetry is known as string puppetry. The most popular one. Clear? So, the most dominant style of puppetry in India is the string puppetry whereby the human or the puppets are tied with strings and the movement is regulated behind the scenes by picking up the string. So it is known as a string puppetry. A string puppetry is the most popular one, clear, and also referred to also it is considered to be size of a doll. So human beings are in the form of doll and they are picked up with strings, clear. The limbs of the puppets are controlled by strings and these allow greater flexibility of movement and are the most versatile of all puppetry forms, clear. So String puppetry are the most prominent one and in the string puppetry, what are the major folk theatre, what are the major regional variations, clear? The most important string puppetry is performed in Rajasthan known as Katputli. So, Katputli is the most prominent string puppetry which is followed in the state of Rajasthan, clear? The string puppets are carved from single piece of wood and are size of dolls, clear? And the performance, the arched eyebrows are all moved through strings movement clear this known as Kaiputli in Rajasthan clear then in at the same time this is also string puppetry is also performed in Urisa known as Kandhi Nach so in Urisa it is known as Kandhi Nach so in Odisha, it is performed, performed as Kandai Nach it is a form of string puppetry then it is known as Gombayata in Karnataka Gombayata in Karnataka, Gombeata in Karnataka. After Gombeata, we have Bomba Latam in Tamil Nadu. Bomba Latam in Tamil Nadu. Bomba Latam in Tamil Nadu. This is all variants of string puppetry, Katputli, Kandhai Nach, Gombeata and Bomba Latam. Clear? And these are the states in which the string puppetry is performed whereby the movement is managed through strings. Clear? After string puppetry, the next puppet form of puppetry in India is known as rod puppetry or rod puppets. Clear? So next major feature is rod puppets. Rod puppets. What is the popular mostly in West Bengal and Risa? Rod puppets are much larger and supported as well as manipulated by rods from below. So it's not strings. Here rod is used whereby the movement is manipulated to rod. And this rod puppetry is largely promoted in West Bengal and Odisha. Clear? And at the same time, what are the variants of rod puppetry? In rod puppet, the most popular rod puppetry is performed in Bengal known as Putul Nach. Putul Nach is in West Bengal, Pusublant is in West Bengal. Then we have Yampuri in Bihar. Yampuri in Bihar is a rod puppetry. Yampuri in Bihar. Clear. Next variant form of puppetry is known puppet is known as glove puppets. Glove puppets known as glove puppets. In this form of puppetry, the puppets are small and are worn on the hand. Clear? These are also called hand, palm or sleep puppets. Clear? The manipulations of the puppets and by movement of fingers and palm. Clear? So it is basically with the movement of fingers and palms with gloves on it. It's the movement is shown and therefore this is known as palm puppetry. This is also known as glove puppetry. Clear? And among the glove puppetry, the most popular puppet is Pawa Kuthu. It's Pawa Kuthu, which is performed in the state of Kerala. 
So glove puppetry is followed in Kerala known as Pawa Kuthu. Clear? Pawa Kuthu is performed in, in the state of Odisha largely, but it is also to some extent performed in Uttar Pradesh, Odisha and West Bengal also. Clear? Next form of puppetry is known as shadow puppetry or shadow puppets. Also known as the shadow puppets clear now in shadow puppetry involves casting of shadow of cut out fingers on screens and conveying the story or the message through movement of these shadows clear so there's a movement of shadows of fingers and therefore light is thrown and this finger is shown on the other screen and with movement of shadow on the screen it is a certain amount of basically some basically messages given and the story is narrated this is known as shadow, shadow puppetry and it is known as to Galu Gombayata. It is known as Togalu Gombayata. Ta Togalu Gombayata in Karnataka. Togalu Gombayata in Karnataka. Tholu Bomalata. Tholu Tholu Bomalata. Telu Bombalata. Telu Bombalata in Andhra Pradesh. Tholu Bombalata in Andhra Pradesh. And then Ravan Chai. Ravan Chai. Chaya. Chaya means shadow. Ravan Chai in Odisha. Raman Chai in Odisha. Okay. These are entertainment theatres known as puppetries in India. So the variant of puppetries in India, clear. Puppetry in India is starting with Silla Patigram, String Puppetry, Katputli, Kandey Nach, Gombata, Bombalatam, clear. Then we have Rod Puppets, Putul Nach in West Bengali, Jampuri, Glove Puppets, Pavokuthu in Kerala, Shadow Puppets, Togalu Gombata in Karnataka, Tholu Bombalata in Andhra Pradesh and Ravan Chai in Udisa, clear. This was major theater, clear. So, major entertainment theater. So, during the Putul Nash performance, a musical group of three to four musicians use harmonium, symbols, and labels. Yeah, it is correct, clear. Large number of performers are there in Putul Nash and they use harmonium also, symbols, and tabla as well. This is absolutely right, clear. Now, coming to modern theater, clear. We'll start with modern theater. This was from ancient India. Then the coming to medieval times and modern times, coming to modern theater. Clear? Coming to modern theater. Clear? And in this modern theater, we'll discuss region wise. The first and the oldest theater among modern theater is Bengali theater. Coming to Bengali theatre. Clear? So, or, the origin of Bengali theatre can be traced to Calcutta theatre established way back in 1779, which had Warren Hastings as its pattern. Clear? So, at the same time, the Calcutta Bengali theatre started with, the, start, started with Calcutta theatre, started with Calcutta theatre, in 1779, supported by the first Governor General of Bengal, Warren Hastings. Clear? First Governor of Bengal, Warren Hastings. Clear? Among the early plays and stores, there were those no, the, the, that included Golak, Goloknath Das, Prasanna Kumar Thakur. Clear? All these began to perform. Clear? So, among the early plays staged were those of Goloknath Das. Clear? So, first was Goloknath Das. Clear? This was first one, Goloknath Das. The Prasanna Kumar Thakur. Prasan Kumar Thakur. Prasan Kumar Thakur promoted Rang Manch. In 1831, he promoted the establishment of Rang Manch. In 1831, Rang Manch in 1831. The Nabin Chandra Basu. The Nabin. Chandra 
बासु नबीन चंद्र बासु क्लियर दैट इन क्लियर जोरो सांको थिएटर जोरो सांको थिएटर established the joro sanko theater jo sanko theater clear so all these are clear and then we had michael madhusudan datta michael madhusudan datta michael madhusudan datta clear he wrote meghnath bad kavya wrote Meghnath, he wrote Meghnath Vadh Kavya, Meghnath Vadh Kavya, Michael Madhusudan Dath, clear, then after this, clear, the next person who took the charge of Bengali theatre was Rabindranath Tagore. Rabindranath Tagore. Rabindranath Tagore, clear. And Rabindranath Tagore, he included large number of plays. First is Valmiki Pratibha. Is Valmiki. Valmiki Pratibha is first one. After Valmiki is Daghar Visarjan. Daghar then second one is Visarjan, Dark Ghar, Visarjan, Chandalika, Rakta Karabi, Chandalika, Chandalika, Rakta Karabi, Chandalika, Rakta Karabi, clear, Rakta Karabi, then Chitrangada, then Chitrangada, Chitrangada, then Raja and Shyam, Raja and Shyam, Raja and Shyam, okay. Then all these dramas which began to be written by Rabin Nathago came to be known as Rabindra Nitya Nath, okay. This all came to be known as Rabindra Nritya Natya Nabindra Nritya Nat. Clear? So Nabindra Nritya Nat began to be established by Bengali theater. After this Bengali theater, clear? Bengali theater began to promote national awakening in India to a large extent, clear? And therefore it created sense of insecurity among the British also in order to check the performance of theater in Bengali language, clear? Punjabi language, British authority enacted a, enacted a reactionary legislation and this reactionary legislation was known as Dramatic Performance Control Act of 1876. So in order to check all these developments, clear? Because all these began to promote national awakening in India. British wanted to check this national awakening to local theatres in India, Bengali theatre in India, and therefore British authority enacted dramatic performance. British authority enacted dramatic performance, enacted dramatic performance control act. Dramatic performance. Control Act in 1876. Governor General was Lord Lytton. Lord Lytton was known for his reactionary policies. Clear. He established Dramatic Performance Control Act. Clear. However, awareness through the theatre began to to take place in India, and this resulted into establishment of a very important institution known as Indian People Theatre Association. Indian People Theatre Association or IPTA in 1943. Very important one. Clear? Indian People Theatre Association IPTA in 1943. In fact, it acted as a cultural wing of Communist Party of India. Clear? So most of the members were communist members who promoted IPTA and IPTA acted as the cultural wing of Communist Party of India. Clear? And at this time, in this IPTA, large number of theatre personalities began to be associated in course of time, which included Balrat Sahani, 
which included Balraj Sahani, Prithvi Raj Kapoor, Balraj Sahani, Prithvi Raj Kapoor, clear. Utpal Dutt, Ritvik Ghatak, Utpal Dutt, Ritvik Ghatak, they are very important personalities. Ruth, Utpal Dutt, Ritvik Ghatak, Utpal Dutt, Ritvik Ghatak, Bijon Chakraborty, Bijon. Bijan Chakraborty, Bijan Chakraborty, clear. Chakraborty, these are very important. Salil Chaudhary, Salil Chaudhary, Salil Chaudhary. All these were very prominent ones, clear. Then at the same time, clear. Bengali language and the Bengali theatre continued to promote in post-independent era also. And in post-independent era, the two most important personalities who promoted Bengali theatre in India was Badal Sarkar. Badal Sarkar and Bijan Chakrabarti. Badal Sarkar and Bijan Chakrabarti. Clear. Badal Sarkar wrote very important plays like Basi Khabar. Badal Sarkar wrote works like plays like Basi Khabar, Staple News, Basi Khabar. Then he wrote Sari, Sari Rath. Sari Rath. Then he also wrote a play Pratap. Sari Rath, Pratap, clear. And also Julus. He wrote the work Julus. Then Bijan Chakrabarti wrote very important like Nabanna, Dharti Ke Lal. Nabanna, Dharti Ke Lal. All these are works of Bijan Chakrabarti. Clear? So all these promoted the Bengali literature. So Bengali theatre right from beginning of British rule till contemporary times. Most important being Dramatic Performances Control Act 1876. And Indian leaders established Indian People Theatre Association in 1943 as a cultural wing of Communist Party of India. And it began to promote major film personalities like Baldas Sahni, Prithvi Raj Kapoor, Utpal Dutt, Ritvik Ghatak, Bijan Chakrabarti and Salil Chaudhary. In post India Independent era Bengali theatre was largely promoted by Badal Sarkar and Bijan Chakrabarti. The buzzing works in major works in Gung, Basi Khabar, Sari Rath, Pratap, and Julus. And Bijan Chakrabarti wrote Nabanna and Dharti Ke Lal. Clear? This became very important development related to Bengali theatre in India. Clear? Clear. The first indigenous performance with native actors happened in 1790 when a Russian violinist by the name of Harasim Stap Stapnovich left off stage a Hindi and Bengali mixed language version of a short play Paul Jordan. Yeah, it is right. It was, was started in 1795, but at the same time, from 1799 only, developments began to take place and it resulted into establishment of Bengali literature in which the pattern was none other than Warren Hastings, the first Governor General himself. Clear. Apart from this, clear. Apart from this, another major work in major theatre work took place in Marathi theatre. Marathi theatre also developed in modern times. Coming to Marathi theatre. Coming to Marathi theatre. Clear? Now, as far as Marathi theatre is concerned, the Marathi theatre started in the middle of the 19th century with the great playwrights being associated with like Vishnu Das Bhave, very important one, and then Anna Sahib Kar Loskar. Clear? So, at the same time, clear, the Marathi theatre started in the middle of the 19th century, the most important being Vishnu Das Bhave. Clear? So, first was basically Vishnu Das Bhave. He was the first person associated with Marathi theatre in 19th century. Vishnu Das Bhave wrote Swamvar. He wrote a work. Swamvar. Clear? After Vishnu Das Bhave, the next major personality was Anna Sahib Kriloskar. Anna Sahib 
क्लॉसकर अन्ना साहेब के लॉस कर स्टार्टेड अभिज्ञान शकुंतम थिएटर स्टार्टेड इन इंग्लिश वी राइट अभिजनाना अभिज्ञान शकुंतलम थिएटर वॉज स्टार्टेड बाय अन्ना साहेब के लॉस कर अभिज्ञान शकुंतलम थिएटर वॉज स्टार्टेड बाय अन्ना साहेब के लॉस कर द लेटे मेस ऑफ मराठी मराठी थिएटर सो कन्वर्जेंस ऑफ मेनी थिएटर पर्सनैलिटीज लाइक के प्रभाकर एंड बाल गंधर क्लियर बट एट द सेम टाइम क्लियर एट द सेम टाइम एट दीना नाथ मंगेशकर सिंगर एक्टर एंड फादर ऑफ लता मंगेशकर एंड हाशा भोसले क्लियर सो इन द लेटर फेस ऑफ मराठी थिएटर मराठी थिएटर वॉज लाजी प्रमोटेड बाय दीना नाथ मंगेशर मंगेशकर दीना नाथ promoted by dina nath mangeshkar dina nath mangeshkar so marathi literary theater was largely promoted by dina nath mangeshkar who is the father of lata mangeshkar and asha bhosle clear at the same time in post independent era marathi theater was largely promoted by vijay tendulkar largely promoted by विजय तेंदुलकर हिज मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट वर्क बींग खासी राम कोतवाल खासी राम कोतवाल मेजर वर्क घासी राम कोतवाल शांता शांता देन कोट शातीराम घोषवाल शांता देन कोट चालू आहे कोट चालू आहे कोट चालू आहे क्लियर एंड सखाराम बिंदर एंड शखाराम बिंदर दीज वर वर्क्स ऑफ विजय तेंदुलकर एसोसिएट विद मराठी थिएटर देन वी हैड विजय मेहता विजय मेहता who basically was the founder of mumbai based theater group rangayan clear so rangayan was founded by vijay mehta mumbai based theater group rangayan was established by vijay mehta clear and then we have shriram lagu clear so shriram lagu all of them contributed towards marathi theater clear in course of time after marathi theater in fact hindi theater began to be promoted largely and hindi theater also became highly popular in india clear so after bengali theater marathi theater will come to hindi theater highly popular in indian society coming to hindi theater clear now the down of modern hindi theater can be traced to the traced to a person known as bhartendu harishchandra who in 19th century who wrote a very important work the most popular work of bhartendu harishchandra being andher nagri clear it was basically a sarcastic thing on british rule then bharat durdasha then satya harishchandra and neel devi all these were written by bhartendu harishchandra and that marked the beginning of hindi playwright and hindi theater in india clear hindi theater started in 19th century started in the 19th century and the most important person the pioneer of hindi theater in india was bhartendu harishchandra Bhartendu Harishchandra clear Harishchandra who wrote several works the most important being Andher Nagri written by him as Andher Nagri on British policies then we have Bharat Durdasha we have Bharat Bharat Durdasha clear Bharat Durdasha durdasha and then satya harishchandra satya satya harishchandra satya harishchandra and neel devi and 
नील देवी क्लियर एंड नील देवी क्लियर आफ्टर भात एंड टू द हिंदी प्ले राइट वॉज लाज यू प्रमोटेड बाय जयशंकर प्रसाद नेक्स्ट मेजर पर्सनैलिटी वॉज जय शंकर प्रसाद जय शंकर प्रसाद क्लियर एंड जय शंकर प्रसाद बी कैन लोट स्कंद गोप्त चंद्र गोप्त हिज वर्क आर पॉपुलर नोन एज स्कंद गोप्त देन चंद्र गोप्त स्कंद गोप्त चंद्र गोप्त क्लियर एंड देन ध्रुव स्वामिनी we have dhrup swamini dhrup swamini clear so in course of time clear now emergence of ipta we had discussed ipta in 1943 emergence of ipta gave a philip to hindi theater support to hindi theater to a large extent and therefore large number of people got associated with ipta to promote hindi lit theater as well and those persons were prithvi raj kapoor balraj sahani durga khote dina patak kafi azmi and krishan chandra clear so large number of personalities associated hindi associated with hindi theater got associated with ipta india's indian people theater association and they began to promote hindi theater the personalities include prithvi raj kapoor balraj sahani durga khote and even kafi azmi clear in post independent era hindi theater largely began to be promoted by sangeet natak academy clear so hindi theater was first promoted by ipta established in 1943 ipta was followed by sangeet natak academy sangeet natak academy academy established in 1952 then we have national school of drama we have national school of drama nsd national school of drama or nsd which was established in 1959 nsd established in 1959 clear all these became very important institution to promote hindi theater clear and at the same time nsd national school of drama heralded a new phase of creativity to the theater movement with trainers like ibrahim alkazi and veteran actors like om puri nasruddin shah shiv puri vijay mehta all of them promoted the concept of and the concept of drama through nsd so in nsd om puri and nasruddin shah played important role and that led to the promotion motion of hindi liter hindi theater in india clear and at the same time many eminent directors emerged from nsd and among those major important directors that emerged from nsd these major personalities were very important one that emerged from nsd national school of drama so personalities emerging from nsd in fact the first person to play important role in nsd was ibrahim alkazi Ibrahim Alkazi, followed by actors like Nasruddin Shah and Om Puri, and at the same time, several directors emerged from NSD like Grish Karnad, very important one. Grish Karnad, his most important drama work is titled as Tughlaq. Most important work is titled as Tughlaq. Clear? Then we have Dharam Bir Bharti, Dharam. वीर भारती ही रोड अंधा युग धर्म वे भारती रोड अंधा युग क्लियर देन वी हैव मोहन राकेश मोहन राकेश हिज वर्क इज आसार का एक दिन आसार का एक दिन Mohan Rakesh, Asar ka ek din, clear. These are very important one, clear. And at the same time, clear. Hindi and Urdu theatre also began to be began to be promoted in form of Nukkar Natak's, also known as street plays, clear. And in this street play, clear, coming to Nukkar Natak or street play, Hindi theatre also began to be promoted through Hindi or street plays. and in street plays the most important role was played by safdar hashmi 
हाशमी हुस्टैब्लिश जन्य नाट्य मंच विच इन शॉर्ट इज नोन एज जनम then large number of mob lynched him he was died because of mob lynching and mob lynching in ghaziabad near delhi only when he was performing his play which is known as halla bol halla bol clear to highlight the ex highlight the excesses performed during national emergency clear safdar hashmi clear and at the same time he was also associated with ipta after safdar hashmi the next person was habib tanveer habib tanveer also contributed to a street plays he was also associated with ipta clear habib tanvi played major important role clear and his most important thing is charandas chor his most important state play is known as charandas chor charandas chor his other works include mere kaam dekh ki apna kaam dekh ka apna basant ritu ka sapna agra bazaar but most important thing is charandas chor written by this person clear so all this resulted into large number of development in the field of theater in india clear so theater or hindi theater is very important apart from this clear certain major awards are also associated to promote theater in india clear and these two among the two among the two awards the most among these awards the two most prominent are sangeet natak academy puraskar sangeet natak academy puraskar sangeet natak academy puraskar clear this award is conferred sangeet natak academy class for clear no sangeet natak academy has recognized only eight classical dance will go with sangeet natak academy not the not not the chhau dance only satriya dance clear so we have eight classical dance in india only always go with eight classical dance not the ninth one still ninth has not been given recognition clear no sangeet natak pro our puraskar sangeet natak academy puraskar is conferred by the sangeet natak academy of india for significant contribution in the field of music dance theater and other traditional arts and puppetry it is the highest award Award given to artists, given to practicing artists in this fields of art, and comprises of citation, a brass plaque, and a cash award. The award has been given since 1952 for various crafts associated with theatre, acting, directing, playwriting. The award for acting is conferred for different regional theatres, including Assamese, Bengali, Hindi. Okay, so it is the highest award. It is the highest award. it is the highest award given to practicing artist clear highest award given given to practicing artist highest award given to practicing artist in the field of music dance drama this award is given by sangeet natak academy it comprises of a citation a brass plaque and a brass plaque and a cash award clear this is one major award given to personalities associated with theater second is kalidas samman so kali das samman this is the second award given to theater personalities kali das samman is instituted by the government of madhya pradesh so this award has been instituted by the government of madhya pradesh since 1980 clear so this award has been started by government of madhya pradesh since 1980 and it's given to major personalities associated with classical dance classical music theater and even plastic arts also clear so two awards that has been instituted for theater personality is sangeet natak academy puraskar which is the highest award given to practicing artists and second is kalidas samman award started by madhya pradesh government since 1980 clear so this are major awards clear now at the same time apart from this theater now we'll go to cinema in india clear largely the hindi cinema which is for popular in india coming to cinema in india 
cinema in India. Clear? Now, art of filmmaking is only 120 years old in India, but at the same time considered to be highly popular art in India. It is one of the most popular and profound social medium of artistic expressions in India, and it is popular all across the country. Clear? And in this field, clear, the most important thing is about Hindi cinema in India. Clear? So, cinema is largely associated with Hindi cinema in India. In about 100 years, last century, Indian cinema is emerged to be the largest film industry in the world. Clear? So, in terms of movie production and volume, clear, Indian cinema is the largest cinema all across the world, largest film industry in the world in terms of movie production volume. Clear? And it has performed large number of movies. Clear? While the Mumbai-based Mumbai Hindi film industry, clear, also known as Bollywood, is the biggest, many regional film industries such as Tamil, Malayalam, Kannada and Telugu and Marathi, Bengali and Bhojpuri are also large and popular. Clear? So, major lion's share of film industry is taken by Hindi film industry based in Mumbai, also known colloquially as Bollywood. Clear? But at the same time, we have regional movies also, or regional film industry also largely related to Tamil, Malayalam, Kannad, even Marathi, Bengali and Bhojpuri as well. Now, coming to history of Indian cinema, clear? First of all, clear? The first exhibition of motion pictures, moving picture in India took place in 1898 and this was done by Lumeri brothers, the inventors of cinematograph, clear? The first depiction exhibition of history of Indian cinema, clear? Coming to history of Indian cinema, very important one, clear. The first exhibition of motion pictures, clear. So, first exhibition of motion pictures, first exhibition of motion pictures, clear. In motion pictures in India. First exhibition of motion pictures in India took place in 1898. Took place in 1898, 98 by Lumeri Brothers. By Lumeri Brothers. By Lumeri Brothers, who are credited for inventing cinematograph. So they are credited with invention of cinematograph or cinematography clear so first exhibition of motion pictures india 1898 by lumaire brothers who invented cinematograph clear and at the same time clear the first silent feature film of india initially we began to produce silent feature film the first silent feature film of india was pundalik so pundalik was the first silent Feature film of India. Pundalik was the first silent feature film of India, which was made by N. J. Chitre. Which was made by N. G. Chitre. N. G. Chitre and R. G. Torni. And R. G. Torni. In nineteen hundred and twelve. So first. Silent feature film of India was in 1912, Pundalik, made by N.G. Chitre and B.R.G. Torne. Clear? However, it was not a complete Indian movie. Clear? So, it was not a complete Indian movie, but it was the first movie to be made in India. Clear? The first eminent filmmaker, Dada Sahib Falke. Clear? So, first eminent filmmaker, Dada Sahib Falke, produced Raja Harishchand in 1913, which is the first Indian feature film of Silent Era. Clear? So, in the year 1913, the first Indian feature film was Raja Harishchandra. The first complete silent feature film was Raja Harish Chandra, made in 1913 by the filmmaker, by the filmmaker, the filmmaker was Dada Saheb Falke. Dada Saheb Falke. Dada Saheb Falke, clear, in 1910. 18, 19, and 19, 10, and 13, clear? The first talkie film, clear? The first talkie film in India was Alam Ara. It was the first talkie film, not silent movie. First talkie film 
in India was Alamara, which was made in 1931 by Ardashir Irani. 1931 by Ardashir Irani. By Ardashir Irani. Okay. First talk, talk, talk film. Okay. It was Ardashir Irani. Okay. So it was basically the first important one. Kalidas was the second movie after second, second movie after Alamara made in southern part of India, but after Alamara. Okay. Now at the same time, okay, in course of time, movies began to be promoted in India. In pre-independent eras, the movies were largely promoted by B. Shantaram, Sohrab Modi, P.C. Barwa, Bimal Roy and Mahboob Khan. Okay. At the same time in 1930s and 40s, large number of movies began to be made by Ashok Kumar, Durga Khote, Devi Karani and Prithvi Raj Kapoor. Okay. In post-independent era, coming to post-independent era with respect to movies. Okay. So in pre-independent era, movies were largely made by Different persons like Balraj Sahani, Prithviraj Kapoor, Clear, Balraj Sahani, Prithviraj Kapoor, Ashok, uh, Ashok Kumar, Ashok Kumar, Durga Khote, Clear. In post-independent era, the development was that India began, or movies began to make huge progress and government basically started or established Central Board of Film Certification, Clear. So, government of India established the Central Board of film certification central board of film certification central board of film certification to regulate the content of the movies clear and therefore at the same time technical movies began to be made the first technical movie in india was after this only the first technical movies began to be made the first Technicolor movie of India. The first Technicolor movie of India was Jhansi Kirani. Was Jhansi Kirani by Sohrab Modi. By Sohrab Modi. Clear? Now, at the same time, international recognitions also began to be given to Indian movies. And therefore, in France, Cannes Film Festival began to be organized. And in Cannes Film Festival, large number of Indian movies began to be screened and sold to the international audiences. Clear? Another eminent filmmaker, Satyajit Ray, was awarded at the Cannes Film Festival in 1956 for the film Pathir Panchali. Clear? So, Indian movies began to be recognized at Cannes Film Festival France, clear. And in the year 1956, Satyajit Ray was awarded at Cannes Film Festival for his movie, and this movie was Pathir Panchali. Clear. At the same time, another landmark movie of the of the of the genre was of this genre was Mother India, which was directed by Mahboob Khan, and it was given Oscar nomination in 1958. Clear. So Satyajit Ray was awarded at Cannes Film Festival for his movie Pathir Panchali, and Mahboob Khan was Mahboob Khan's movie known as Mother India was nominated for Oscar in 1958. Clear. And at the same time, clear, the golden age of Indian cinema was in the decade of 1960s. Clear? Now, why the decade of 1916 is regarded as the golden age of cinema in India? Clear? So, the decade of 1960s known as golden age of Indian cinema golden age of Indian cinema is the decade of 1960s. The reason is clear. The period of 1960 has been termed as golden age of Indian cinema. It was also an era of transition in Indian cinema. The films of 60s started to depart from the concept of social realism and rural fixation to exotic foreign locales. Clear. So foreign localities began to be shown from the decades of 1960s. They depicted Plush lifestyles, urban settings, and were known for their melodious songs. Clear. Thus, focus was in, a focus on entertainment of the masses was a key feature of the movies. Clear. So, from in the golden age, the first distinctive feature was foreign locations began to be chosen by the film producers. Melodious songs began to be used for the movies. Melodious songs, clear. Then movies began to be emphasized more on entertainment. 
rather than social issues highlighted earlier largely focus on entertainment clear in the decade of 1960s only another development was establishment of film and television institute of india it led to the establishment of film and television institute of india also known as ftii Film and Television Institute of India (FTI), which was established at Pune, is still working at Pune. Film and Television Institute of India at Pune. Clear. It was an autonomous body conducting various certificate courses pertaining to various faculties of film and television production. Clear. The Government of India also instituted Dada Sai Phalke Award. In this decade only, Government of India instituted Dada Saheb Phalke Award. the the sai fall ke award in 1969 dada sai fall ke to commemorate the contribution of dada sai fall ke often regarded as father of indian cinema clear so dada sai fall ke award was started in 1969 to commemorate the contribution of dada sai fall ke is known as father of indian cinema clear so at the same time the decade of 1916 was the golden age of indian cinema because of various factors clear so all these became very important development related to indian cinema clear and at the same time indian cinema became very important development clear and in order to promote indian cinema film awards also began to be given will come to these film awards as well clear so coming to the film awards coming to the film awards clear the first is national film awards the first is national film known as national film awards national film awards clear now instituted by government of india instituted by government of india in 1954 so national film awards has been instituted by government of india in 1954 the national film awards are the most important awards given for film production and different art and crafts associated with it the awards conferred in three categories feature films non feature films and best writing on cinema clear so this film award national film awards is given on basis of or on the given on three categories clear so what are the three categories of film of national film awards three categories what are these categories number 1 the first category is feature films feature films then we have non feature films then we have non feature films non feature films and third is best writing on cinema best writing on cinema best writing on cinema clear so this is the swarn kamal the golden lotus award is given for best feature film best director best popular film whole set and best children film best film and director and best invent the rajat kamal is given to categories for best actor best actress best direction clear best and the award are conferred by the president of india on the occasion of national film festival and include a medallion cash prize and certificate of merit clear so this awards include basically the awards that is include rajat kamal and swarn kamal clear so these awards are in form of swarn kamal and rajat kamal and rajat kamal and these are awards are given by the president of india given by the president of india national awards clear it's given by the president of india this is one award that is national film awards given clear apart from national film awards we have another award that is known as dada sai phalke award next award is known as dada sai phalke award it started in 1969 dada saheb phalke award 
this another film award dada sai falke award is given since 1969 along with national film awards the award is conferred to the eminent film personality for outstanding contribution to the growth and development of indian cinema divika raini was the first recipient of this award clear this award was first given to devika rani first recipient of dada sai falke award clear now film television film and television institute of india we have discussed film and television institute of india was established in 1960 in the autonomous institution under the ministry of information and broadcasting government of india the institute was set up in pune at the premises of prabhat film company it has been running a number of post graduation courses in film production acting art directing editing and cinematography okay it has played an important role over the years in imparting trained personnel and artists needed for various faculties of film production it is a premier institution of the country in the field so we had discussed about film and television institute of india india pune 1960 it's a premier institution to promote film and film artists and producers in india which is a very important development related to film industry so all these major developments related to cinemas in india clear so okay. for tangible list who recommends the sites from india is asi or ministry of culture both in collaboration asi also and ministry of culture but formally speaking it is recommended by ministry of culture how many sites can be recommended per year it's only one or more it can be recommended for more than one also clear but normally it is one or two sites clear but as of now it is only one site that has been recommended it can be recommended more than one also clear so this was basic development related to related to all major developments that is painting music dance drama theater now after this the next major domain to be covered in modern india is growth and development of modern indian architecture clear so now we'll come to architecture as well okay so architecture in modern india coming to architecture in modern india so coming to architecture in modern india clear now coming to architecture clear now first of all we had discussed about architecture in ancient and medieval india now we'll come to architecture in modern india modern india means architecture from the 18th century when india came under the rule of colonial powers especially britain but apart from british other colonial powers who came to india like the dutch like the portuguese like the french they also contributed towards architecture in india danes could not contribute because danes had established only at shrampur in bengal and at trincobar in tamil nadu and then after they sold their arrangements in india or establishment here to britain and went back clear but dutch portuguese and british they contributed towards architecture in india and the architecture growth and development that took place under such imperial power this is known as colonial architecture clear so colonial architecture began to be promoted in modern india from 18th century by colonial powers like dutch portuguese french and the british largely the british clear so from 18th century the architecture that developed in india this architecture is known as the colonial architecture this colonial architecture was promoted by european powers in india clear although the british authority wested over the largest part of the indian territory the portuguese the french the dutch and even the danish to some extent clear had smaller regions of stronghold clear that's the period of almost 250 to 300 years clear so varied influence on indian architecture in different parts of the country this could be neoclassical uh, architecture they are known as victorian architecture they also known as gothic architecture they also known as iberian architecture by the portuguese clear so obviously we'll come to all these art architecture clear so all these architecture that began to be promoted large contribution was given by the british british followed their own style of architecture in india this architecture a style of british known as neoclassical style is also known as neo classical style it's also known as gothic style of architecture it's also known as sarsanic style of architecture 
it's also known as Victorian style of architecture. Different terms are used for British architecture, neoclassical style, Gothic style, Sarsnik style and Victorian style of architecture. Then at the same time, we had Portuguese in India, the first one to come to India. Portuguese style, they followed their own style of architecture, which is known as Iberian style of architecture because they came from Iberian Peninsula where Portuguese and Portuguese along with Portuguese along with other countries are established. So Portuguese, Portuguese at the as well as Spain are located on one island known as known known as the Iberian Peninsula and therefore the architecture is known as Iberian architecture. Portuguese clear. Arben. There's also known as Baroque architecture. It's also known as Baroque architecture, Portuguese. Then third world, basically the French who were also there in India. French followed their own style of architecture, clear. And that is known as Cartesian grid architecture. Cartesian grid, Cartesian grid plan architecture. Grid plan architecture. Cartesian grid plan architecture. Clear. So these are major Portuguese architectural features. British, Portuguese, and the French who constructed some monuments in India. Dense could not construct large monuments in the Dutch. We had discussed left India after some time. They went to islands of Java and Sumatra in Southeast Asia to procure spices produced in this region. So three European powers contributed towards architecture in India. That is the British, the Portuguese, and the French. Clear. Now coming to the architecture type in India, the region or city in which they constructed monument and salient features as well clear so coming to the architecture styles clear so first of all we'll discuss about french architecture we'll discuss about french architecture french architecture in india French architecture in India. French architecture in India. Clear. It was largely promoted in the city of Pondicherry. Largely promoted in the city of Pondicherry, which is presently known as Puducherry. And Puducherry or Pondicherry included the regions of Pondicherry, Yanam, and Karaikal on the eastern coast of India and Mahe on the western coast of India. Clear? The entire city of Pondicherry was based on a definite plan which is known as Cartesian Grid Plan. So it was based on, the whole city of Pondicherry is based on Cartesian Grid Plan. Cartesian grid plan. Clear? So urban settlements based on classical grid plan and at the same time this grid plan is also known as classical style of architecture or classical plan. It's also known as classical plan of architecture. Architecture prominent examples include the church of sacred heart of Jesus. Clear? Prominent monuments include the include the Church of Sacred Heart, the Church of Sacred Heart, the Church of Sacred Heart of Jesus, the Church of Sacred Heart of Jesus, clear? Then at the same time, another is English D. E G L I S E Iglis D Notre Dame D Iglis D Notre Dame D Angus D Angus this another monument and then this Iglis D Notre Dame D English D Notre Dame D, Notre Dame D, Lords, L-O-U-R-D-E-S, Lords. 
clear. So these were monuments constructed by the French, largely in the city of Pondicherry. It's largely based on Cartesian grid plan, also known as classical grid plan structure. The Church of Sacred Heart of Jesus. Iglis did not attempt the Angels. Iglis did not attempt the Lords. Clear. Three monuments constructed by French in India in the city of Pondicherry. Clear. Coming to the Portuguese. Clear. Portuguese architecture. The Portuguese architecture in India. Portuguese architecture in India. Portuguese architecture in India largely promoted in two cities. These two cities are Goa and Kochi. Kochi in Kerala. Go and Kochi. Clear? Now, the Portuguese arrived in India as merchants in 1498 with Dasco Digama. Portuguese architecture is seen in churches and houses of Goa, which are of Iberian style. Clear? So, basically, Portuguese constructed large number of churches and houses in Goa. And the style of architecture followed by them is known as Iberian style of architecture. Iberian style of architecture. Clear? I bring the not complete. They have constructed churches. Clear? So churches were constructed by them. They constructed large number of churches. And churches are largely constructed in Baroque architecture. Constructed in Baroque style. Constructed in Baroque style. Clear? Renaissance architecture of Rome. Clear? Baroque style. Clear? The mon most important monument constructed in this style is known as Basilica of Bon Jesus. Clear? So one is Basilica. This is known as Basilica of Basilica of Bon, bon Jesus. Basilica of Bon Jesus, Jesus constructed in Old Goa, Basilica of Bon Jesus constructed in Old Goa in 1606, in 1606, which holds mortal remains of St. Francis Xavier, the, in, is the best example of the style, clear, it contains the mortal remains, it contains the mortal remains it contains the mortal remains of mortal remains of Saint Francis mortal remains of Saint Francis Xavier Saint Francis Xavier claim other prominent structure includes C Cathedral Church is next month this is one one second structure is known as known as C Cathedral C Cathedral, C Cathedral, then we have Church of St. Francis of Assisi, Church of St. Francis of, Church of St. Francis of Assisi, then Our Lady Immaculate Conception Church, then we have Our Lady, Our Lady of Immaculate Conception, Our Lady of Immaculate Conception, Our Lady of Immaculate Conception, Immaculate Conception Church, Conception Church, Next monument constructed by Portuguese in India. Clear? Rees Magos 14 Goa. R-E-I-S. Rees Magos Fort. Rees Magos Fort. In Goa. Rees Magos Fort in Goa. Some fort also constructed by them. St. Francis Church of Kochi. St. Francis Church of Kochi, Kerala, of 
Kochi. Okay. So these were major architectural contributions of the Portuguese in India. Goa and Kochi, Iberian style, churches, Baroque style, Basilica of Bomb Jesus, Gold Goa, 1606, mortal remains of St. Francis Xavier, Sea Cathedral, Church of St. Francis of Assisi, Our Lady of Immaculate Conception of Church, Reese Magosport, Goa, St. Francis Church, Kochi. Clear. After Portuguese, clear. Next was the Dutch architectural style. So Dutch architecture in India. Dutch architecture in India. Dutch architecture in India. Surat Ahmedabad and Kochi. Surat Ahmedabad and Kochi. They were the major areas of Dutch. Surat, Ahmedabad and Kochi. Clear? Now, the, the Dutch started trading in India in the early 17th century and remained in India for nearly 200 years. They colonized areas in Ahmedabad, Surat, Baroch and Kochi, which they took over from the Portuguese. Clear? The Dutch architecture is visible in a variety of surviving structures, which include Dutch factory. Clear? So, Dutch factory was constructed by them. Clear? So, they constructed Dutch factory at Kochi. He, they constructed Dutch factory at Kochi. The, sorry, Dutch factory at Baroch. Dutch factory at Baroch, Goa. Baroch in Gujarat. Dutch factory at Baroch in 1630. Dutch factory at Baroch in 1630. Clear. Then symmetry in Ahmedabad. Then they constructed first is symmetry in Ahmedabad. Symmetry in Ahmedabad. They constructed Matin Cherry Palace in Kochi. Clear? Matin Cherry Palace. In Kochi, Martin Cherry Palace in Kochi, originally built by Portuguese, they were reconstructed by the Dutch in India, Martin Cherry Palace at Kochi, then David Hall, then David Hall, David Hall, clear, David Hall, former residence of Dutch commanders in Kochi, clear, David Hall at Kochi, David Hall at at Kochi and fort at Kochi beach. They also constructed a fort at Kochi beach. Fort at Kochi beach. Clear? This was about Dutch architecture in India. Now we'll come to the British architecture, architecture in India because British constructed several monuments in India, especially in Calcutta, New Delhi and even Madras. Clear? So we'll come to British architecture in India. They constructed some monuments in India. We'll come to po in British architecture and then architecture in post-independent era and then we'll discuss about some important monuments in recent times including the Ram Temple at Ayodhya and even the new temple constructed in UAE which is to be inaugurated by Prime Minister on 14th of February 2024. Clear? So what is great Cartesian grid plan? It's basically Cartesian grid plan basically means Mughal, what is Mughal Gothic style? Mughals also began to follow British style to some extent Gothic style whereby Gothic means whereby the dome-like structures constructed to surmount the monument. That is, dome was constructed by Mughals, especially in religious monuments, but stifled the neck began to be constructed with broad designs, clear? And this came to be known as Gothic, Mughal Gothic, clear? At the same time, Cartesian plan is basically a plan that where, whereby there is a broad division into fraud phases, and in this Cartesian plan, they began to construct churches, clear? So, Cartesian plan is basically a plan in which the cities are largely used, clear? Urban design of certain 
settlements. Grid patterns created. Clear? Grid pattern is created basically in square and rectangular form. So, grid or rather the blocks are created and this is created on Cartesian plan. Cartesian means drawing the lines straight forward. This is known as Cartesian grid plan. Clear? Grid plan that was for Indus Valley civilization also. It is Cartesian means more well planned urban settlements in the regions of India. Clear? Cartesian plan. So, maximum three Bharatnas could be given one particular year. Then, how PM announced it for five people in 2024 itself. Clear? See, again, I'll let you know. Clear? It all depends on decisions, but normally it is said that three Bharatnas can be given in one particular year. Till now, it has been announced in 2024 by Karpuri Thapur and LK Advani. Clear? He can go on announcing, but it depends. Clear? But normally, the Trend has been, the norm has been for three. It can be more than three also. But normally the norm is three only for this. What is broke style? Broke style means facade has to be created on a larger form. Facade means outer appearance. Front appearance has to be given a larger form. It's known as broke style. Clear? We had discussed about broke style. The features also of broke style. Clear? Broke style is basilica of bomb Jesus. Clear? Basilica of bomb Jesus is basically, it's the facade is triangular in shape. Broke style, I'll let you know. Clear? If we look into broke style, it's basically suppose this is this is the front entrance. It is always constructed in this way, and then the back entrance is created. This facade is known in the form of outer appearance, and this facade in triangular form is known as the Baroque style. Clear? And then assembly halls are created in churches. Clear? This is known as Baroque style. Facade is always on triangular and projected form that is known as the baroque style of architecture clear basilica of bomb jesus in goa is example of baroque style now we'll come to british architectural style and the major monuments considered at calcutta now kolkata new delhi and madras now known as chennai we'll come to british architecture and then we'll produce post independent architecture and the recent architectural developments in india it's clear all major architectural styles will come to British style tomorrow, clear. So, tomorrow we'll start with British architectural influence in India. We'll discuss about that architectural influences in India. Meanwhile, clear. Let us look into the questions which has been given to you last time. Is indo sasnic style and Mughal Gothic are same or different? Clear. Indo normally same. indo sasnic and Mughal Gothic style are almost similar in nature. In this, basically, the dome is the most high, most important highlight and the neck of the dome is highly decorated that is known as gothic style supreme court building if you look into that clear it's a gothic style or it's known as indo sarsnik style clear now coming to the questions major streams of national movement okay now questions for the test that has been given to you major streams of national movement this was the test given to all of you tomorrow given to yesterday let us discuss about them Coming to the very first question, consider the following statement with reference to the rise of left-wing extremism. Okay. Jawaharlal Nehru and Sardar Patel had a left-wing faction with Congress embracing socialist ideologies. No, this is wrong. Clear? Jawaharlal Nehru is right, but not Sardar Patel. Clear? It was Subhash Chandra Bose. Clear? So, this is wrong. So, this statement would be wrong because of Sardar Patel. The Communist Party of India was formed in 1920 in Calcutta by M. N. Roy. Clear? No. Clear? It is not. It is wrong. We had discussed. Communist Party of India in 1920 was formed by M. N. Roy, not in Calcutta. It was found at Tashkent in Central Asia. It was formed in India at Kanpur in 1925. This is wrong. Place is wrong. In 1929, communists and led leaders were tried in Merit conspiracy case. Yeah, this is right statement. We discussed about three conspiracy cases against communists. One was the Peshawar conspiracy case. Peshawar conspiracy case 1922-23. Then we had Kanpur Bolshevik conspiracy case 1925. And then we have Merit conspiracy case 1929. In this merit conspiracy case, three British nationals were also convicted. So, third statement is right. How many of the statements are correct? Only one. Third one. One and two are wrong. Reasons we have discussed, Sadar Patel will not be here. It is Subhash and Bose. It is not Calcutta, Tashkent. Clear twin. Third statement is right. This is first question. Coming to the second one. 
consider for instance with reference to AITUC, All India Trade Union Congress, established in 1920 by Lala Rajputra. It was founded in 1922. No, the date is wrong. 1920. The date is 1920. And let trade union movement. This is wrong. First of all, the first president of was Lala Rajputra, and the first general secretary was M. N. Roy. Yeah, this is also wrong. First secretary was not M. N. Roy. The first secretary of AITUC was Diwan Chamanlal. The first secretary was Dewan Chamanlal. First president was Lala Lajpat Rai. This is wrong. In 1923, the first May Day was celebrated in India in Madras. Yeah, this is right. First May Day Labor Day was organized in Madras. So, how many of the statements are incorrect? Two statements are incorrect. Clear? So, only two. Two statements are incorrect. First one is not 1922 20, and the first president was Lala Lajpat Rai, but the first general secretary was Dewan Chaman Lal, not M. N. Roy. So one, one and two are wrong, three is correct. How many statements are incorrect? Only two. Fine. Coming to the next question, question number three. With reference to indigo revolt, consider the following statements. The peasants has said to grow indigo under duress, under the leadership of Digambar Biswas and Vishnu Chand Biswas. Yeah, this is right. Digambar Biswas and Vishnu Biswas brothers. This is a right statement. The government formed an indigo commission to invest into ind the government formed an indigo commission to investigate the issue of indigo cultivation. Yeah, government formed this indigo commission. This revolt took place in 1859. Indigo commission was formed in 1860 and then Indigo Act was passed in 1861. That led to the enactment of Indigo Act in 1861. Due to government intervention, indigo cultivation flourished in Bengal. No, that's wrong. Indigo cultivation declined in Bengal due to government intervention. Clear? So this is wrong statement. How many of the statements are incorrect? Only one. Third is only incorrect. Incorrect has been asked. So only three is only one, three. Third one is incorrect. So only one is incorrect. Clear? So one is also right. Second is also right. Third is wrong. Question number four. With reference to the Sadler Commission, we had discussed yesterday only all in education related commission, 1719 largely related to Calcutta University. The primary focus was the commission was to review and report on the issues specific to Calcutta University. This is right. Clear. The primary focus of the commission was to report and report review and report on specific issues. Specific, but huh? Primary focus is there. So primary focus was not clear. It was to review and report on other universities also, but ha, huh, largely the focus was on Calcutta University. So this statement would be wrong. Clear. It was not only with Calcutta University. The question's primary focus of the commission was to review and report on the issues specific to Calcutta. No, it was related to other universities like Bombay and Madras also. This would be wrong. But it was largely pertaining to the Calcutta University, but not primarily focus on Calcutta University, that would be wrong. The commission recommended that students should enter university after completing matriculation for a three-year degree. No, not matriculation. Secondary education. The commission recommended that students should enter university after completing secondary education, 12th standard, after completing secondary education for a three-year degree course. So, in order to ensure for three-year degree course, they must complete secondary education, not matriculation. This is also wrong. Which of the words statement given words are correct? Neither one nor two. Both of them are wrong. Clear? It's not matriculation, secondary education, not primarily Calcutta University, other universities, but largely on Calcutta University. One and two. Clear? And for this, I'll let you know. In Sadly University, there were two Indian members also resigned some after some time. These two Indian leaders were Sir Ziauddin Ahmed, he was a leading mathematician. Sir Ziauddin Ahmed and second Indian was Ashutosh Mukherjee. Second Indian was Ashutosh Mukherjee. Both of them resigned and Lord Sadler was basically Vice Chancellor of University of Leeds. So he was the Vice Chancellor of University of Leeds. Clear? So this statement. All information should be understood. So, neither one nor two. Question number five. Coming to question number five. With reference to Wood's Dispatch. Consider the following statements. Wood's Dispatch advocated the continuation of downward filtration theory for the education of masses in India. No. 
Rather, Woods dispatch theory did not talk about continuation but repudiation. End of downward filtration theory. And downward filtration theory was given by Lord Macaulay. Macaulay's Minute of Education. So it basically repudiated the downward filtration theory. This wrong statement. The dispatch proposed a hierarchical educational system in India, starting with vernacular primary schools at village level. This is right. Okay? This would just propose a hierarchical educational system in India, starting with vernacular education at primary level, that is at village level. So, second statement is right too. First statement is quite obviously wrong. wrong. It was did not, never advocated continuation, but repudiation of downward filtration theory. So, only two. Coming to the next one, question number six. Consider the following statement. Surinder Nath Sen became the first Indian journalist to be imprisoned. No. Clear? It was not Surinder Nath Sen. It was Surinder Nath Banerjee. It was Surinder Nath Banerjee, not Sen. This is a wrong statement. Bipin Chandra Pal is primarily known for a significant movement in national struggle advocating freedom of press. No. Clear? It's about freedom of press. The most important person to talk about freedom of press was, was Tej Bahadur Sapru. Remember about his contribution. Tej Bahadur Sapru. He talked about freedom of press. Very important leader. Tej Bahadur Sapru. Clear? It's not Bipin Chandra Pal. Clear? This is wrong. Second one. On the recommendations of the press committee led by Sadar Patel. Clear? Sadar Patel. The Press Act of 1908-19 were revoked. No. Recommend is not press committee led by Sadar Patel. Here also, it's Tej Bahadur Sapru. It's Tej Bahadur Sapru. And here we need to understand two things. Clear? Press Acts of 1908 and 1908. Nine. These acts you should know. Clear? These acts were known as newspapers. Known as newspapers too. Newspapers incitement to write about these acts. Newspapers incitement to offenses act. Newspaper incitement to offenses act 1908. And second was known as Indian Press Act. Indian Press Act 1910. So, there were two acts, but first was known as Newspapers Incitement to Offenses Act 1908. Second was known as Indian Press Act of 1910. And both these were basically abolished or revoked on the recommendations of a press committee headed by Tej Bahadur Sapru. Very important leader for to talk about freedom of press. Clear? So, obviously, the third statement is also wrong. Which of the above statements are correct? Clear? None of them are correct. Clear? So, first statement is not Suryanna Sain. It's Suryanna Banerjee. Second statement, not Bipin Chandra Pal, Tej Bahadur Sapri, even Gopal Krish Gokhale also. Clear? On the recommendation of press committee led by Sardar Patel, not Tej Bahadur Sapru. The press acts of 1908-1910 were revoked. Clear? It was 1908, Newspaper Incitement to Offenses Act, 1910, Indian Press Act. So, all of them are wrong. Clear? Coming to the next one, question number seven coming to question number seven with reference to the role of working class movement role of working class movement consider the following statement early nationalists were indifferent to labor's cause clear yeah Early nationalists never focused on labor cause. Early nationalists means moderates. Moderates always began to write petitions and applications. Most of the time, they were basically bookish in approach and therefore they did not address, they were remained to be indifferent to labor's cause. This is right. Clear? Post civil disobedience movement, there was a decline in working class movement. Yeah. Post civil disobedience movement, there was decline in working class movement because working class movement got divided. Clear? In fact, the most, most important working Labor class body was All India Trade Union Congress. All India Trade Union Congress got divided into All India Trade Union Federation under N. M. Joshi. N. M. Joshi. N. M. Joshi. After this, clear the Red Trade Union Congress was formed under Communist leader M. N. Roy. Then a committee or commission was formed by British also. This committee was known as Wetley Commission on Labor. Wetley Commission on Labor, 
Vetley Commission on Labour, which was supported by some members of AITUC and opposed by several other leaders, and these leaders included V. V. Giri. Venkat Varahagri, who later on became the president of India as well. He was a labor leader in pre-independent era. Just was cause of these divisions only. Post-civil disobedience movement, there was a decline in working class movement. Because all of this declined because they got divided. divided. All of them again got reunited with AI2C due to the efforts of Sardar Vallabhai Patel. So Sardar Vallabhai Patel worked towards unity of all these bodies back to the parent organization AITUC. So this is right. From August 1945 to 40s, workers didn't play an active role in post-war national struggle. Absurd. No, this is wrong. Workers played an active role in post-war national upsurge. Clear? In fact, workers began to highlight the plight of Indian masses. Clear? So this statement is wrong. Which of the above statement correct? One and two. Workers played important role in post-war national struggle upsurge. So one is right, second is right, third is wrong. One and two would be the right answer. Because you have to highlight, mark the correct one. Question number seven. Then coming to question number eight. Consider the following statements. Durga Devi, also known as Agni of India, will come to her. Some personalities has to be discussed separately. I'll be discussing tomorrow. Clear? Durga Devi is one of them because we are celebrating her birth anniversary this year, 2023. Clear? So Durga Devi, also known as Durga Bhabi. Clear? Durga Devi is also known as Durga Bhabi. Very important one. She was the wife of another revolutionary, Bhagwati Charan Bohra. Bhagwati Charan Bohra, who wrote a very important work on revolution, is known as the philosophy of the bomb. Clear? Durga Babi also Nagni of India was associated with Merit conspiracy case. No. Clear? She was not associated with Merit conspiracy case. This is wrong. Clear? But why Durga Devi is important as of now? Durga Devi was the person who facilitated Sardar Bhagat Singh to leave. Clear? Clear? To facilitate Durga Bhagat Singh to leave the city of Lahore after the murder of J. Saunders. And Sadar Bhagat Singh left his, uh, left, his, left his traditional attire, adopted European dress code and managed to leave the city of Lahore and went to Calcutta to, uh, to continue with revolutionary activities. So Durga Devi is important in this sense, who is also, is also known as Agni of India, Fire of India. This is right. Clear, and this is also known as Durga Bhabi. She was the wife of Bhagwati Chan Bora, but she was not associated with Merat conspiracy case. Clear, so she was not associated with this. So this statement would be wrong. Clear, Matangini Hazra, affectionately called Gandhi Buri, that the old lady was an active participant in non cooperation movement. Yeah, true. Matangini Hazra in the northeastern part of India contributed significantly towards non cooperation movement of Mahatma Gandhi, also known as Old Gandhi, Gandhi Buri. This is right. Jawaharlal Nehru bestowed the title of Rani on Queen Gadilu, a Metis leader. Yeah. Jawaharlal Nehru gave this title to Rani Gadilu, who participated in civil disobedience movement in the region of Manipur. And then she was arrested in the region of present Nagaland. She spent all her bright careers behind bars to be released only by government of Free India. And the title of Rani was given to Gadilu by Jawaharlal Nehru. In fact, he gave a statement also to Gadilu. A day will come when India will cherish her. Clear? That was about Rani Gadilu. So second and third is right. Correct statement you have to mark. That is second and third. Third is wrong. Durga Devi. But very important. We'll come to her. We'll discuss about all those personalities that of the personalities who has completed 100 years of anniversary, 125 years, 150 years, 200 years. We'll discuss about them separately because 2023 and 24 has marked several anniversaries like 125, 100, 150, 175, 200. We'll discuss about all of them separately also tomorrow. Clear? So Durga Devi is important for coming examination, but she is not associated with Merat conspiracy case. So second and third is right, first is wrong. Question number eight, coming to question number nine. Consider the following persons, E.V. Ramaswamy Naika, Jyoti Bapule, Subramaniam Tirumambu, T.K. Madhavan, B.R. Ambedkar. How many of them belong to non brahmin movement? All of them, clear? Piriya Ramaswamy Naika. Is associated with self, the depressed class movement, non movement, brahmin movement, established, established self-respect movement, Self-respect movement in 1924. He also published a paper, Kudi Arasu. 
he was also the head of justice party he is popularly known as periyar or pure soul very important varama swami jyotiba phule he is also associated he established satya shodhak samaj satya shodhak samaj in 1875 and also began to publish a paper gulam giri subramanian tirumambu was a basically non person who advocated temple entry movement in south india for untouchables supported temple entry tk madhavan supported he was a very important leader of vaikom satyagraha in malabar satyagraha vaikom satyagraha also completed 100 years we'll come to vaikom satyagraha separately b r ambedkar obviously we had discussed all of all thing about b r ambedkar bahishkrit kadi sabha major works that he has written about basically the work that is annihilation of the caste clear all these works who were the shudras very important one so all of them are related to non brahmin movement clear so all the five d clear coming to the next one question number 10 three purush tulna clear ya tara bhai shinde it was written by there's a right match early history of deccan rg bhandarka bhandarka was basically a historian clear and bhandarka wrote very important work so rg bhandarka was an historian who wrote a several who wrote work on sept related to history satyat prakash written by swami dhyanand saraswati clear that's right clear truth seeking swami dhyanand saraswati is very important we have even though we had discussed about swami dhyanand saraswati earlier we'll be discussing about him together because this year we mark 200 birth 200th birth anniversary of swami dhyanand saraswati very important for examination then desher katha by sakharam ganesh devska just remember them clear it's very important clear so all the four are correctly matched you have to write about correctly matched clear so you have to write about this all the four are correctly matched so question number 10 clear so this were the questions to be discussed clear so it's very simple question straight forward questions anyone can you can easily answer these questions clear does non brahmin movement exclusive to madras province or throughout india throughout india non brahmin movement but non brahmin movement largely confined to southern and western part of india non brahmin movement did not take place largely in central and northern part of india clear non brahmin movement is also known as dalit movement it's also known as depressed class movement clear so madras was the hotbed of non brahmin movement but it was all across beyond madras also major region of malabar also andhra region also even the region of maharashtra also all these were marked by non brahmin movement largely in southern and western part of india so let us start with architecture growth and development during british period clear so british architecture in modern india so coming to british architecture british architecture in india so british architecture in india coming to british architecture the styles of architecture followed by them is known as the gothic style of architecture it is also known as victorian style of architecture it is also known as sarsanic style of architecture it is also known as architectural renasa in modern india clear so all these are considered to be very important styles of architecture in india clear and british authority mixed the architectural style with indian style and sometimes it is also known as indo gothic style sometimes it is known as indo sarsanic style clear so we can also use the word indo gothic style we can use the word indo sarsanic style because indian styles were also followed in the monuments constructed by british india clear now what are the features of this architecture clear features includes it has pointed arches features clear what are the features of these style of architecture first feature is pointed arches are there 
so the features include the pointed arches this is one feature second is large windows and thinner walls large windows third is thinner walls large windows thinner walls clear large windows thin and domed roofs clear so they have domed roofs so these are the features of indo gothic style or indo indo sarsanic style known as domed roofs clear these are very important one at the same time clear in this monument they use iron and steel they use bricks with stones and even concrete materials clear so they use materials like first of all they used is iron and steel so materials used were basically materials use included number 1 iron and steel they used iron and steel clear second is bricks along with stones bricks stones and concrete that is pebbles bricks stones and concrete these are the materials used in the construction of indo gothic architecture or monuments clear that in these distinctive features what were the monuments constructed by the british in india will come to these monuments constructed by them clear so coming to the monuments constructed by british in india monuments constructed by british india these monuments are very important to be known clear so coming to the monuments constructed by british india coming to the five most prominent monuments marked by indo gothic style first is the bombay high court the building of bombay high court this is very important monument constructed by the british india the bombay high court after bombay high court is saint paul's cathedral kolkata saint paul's cathedral saint paul's cathedral kolkata another important monument third monument basically is chhatrapati shivaji terminus also known as victoria terminus clear so third is victoria terminus which is presently known as chhatrapati shivaji terminus chhatrapati shivaji terminus bombay cst which has also been included in the list of world heritage site tangible world heritage site clear this is the third one fourth major monument constructed by british india was philomena's cathedral saint philomena's cathedral saint philomena's cathedral at mysore at mysore this is the fourth one fifth major monument constructed by british india is the bmc building that is brihan mumbai brihan mumbai municipal corporation Bihar, Mumbai, Municipal Corporation in Mumbai, clear, which is basically opposite to Chhatrapati Shivaji Terminus, clear. So this were the five monuments. Apart from this, clear. Next is Victoria Memorial. Sixth one is Victoria Memorial, Calcutta. Victoria Memorial, Kolkata. It was administrative building constructed by Lord Curzon. Victoria Memorial, Calcutta. Seventh is Fort William and Raj Bhavan in Calcutta. Fort William College. Fort William and Raj Bhavan. Fort William and Raj Bhavan 
in Kolkata. Fort William and Raj Bhavan in Kolkata. In Kolkata. Okay. Then Gateway of India in Mumbai. Gateway of India. Mumbai. Eighth one. Ninth one is Gateway of India, Mumbai. Then Secretariat Complex, Delhi. Secretariat Complex, Delhi. Secretariat Complex, Delhi. Tenth one. Clear. After Secretariat Complex, complex is clear. Complex in Delhi. All Saints Cathedral in Allahabad. All Saints Cathedral in Allahabad. Saints Cathedral, Allahabad, 10th, 11th one is clear. Saint Michael's Cathedral in Shimla. Saint Michael's Cathedral in Shimla method complex in Shimla. Clear? So, this was very important developments constructed by the British in India. These are very important monuments, large number of monuments constructed by them. Now, coming to some monuments, major monuments in Delhi. Clear? Delhi became, just understand after this, clear. New Delhi became the capital of modern India and the British in 1912 with an announcement then by King George V at Delhi Darbar, whereby the capital was shifted from Calcutta to Delhi. And Delhi, when it was established as capital of modern India, it was established by combining seven cities of medieval India and therefore Delhi became the capital of modern India. Clear? But in this Delhi, new cities began to be constructed. First of all, coming to seven cities. Clear? So Delhi became. New Delhi became, or rather, you like Delhi became the capital of modern India. Became the capital of modern India in 1912 by combining seven cities of medieval times. Clear, and this is also known as seven sister cities. Clear, so seven sister cities combined together led to the establishment of Delhi as capital of modern India by the British. These seven cities are number one. First was the city of Siri, established by Alauddin Khalji. First was the city of Siri, established by Alauddin Khalji. Second was the city of Tughlaqabad. City of Tughlaqabad, constructed by Gyas Uddin Tughlaq. Gyasuddin Tughlaq. Then we have city of Jahapana. Constructed by Muhammad bin Tughlaq. Then we have the city of Firozabad in Delhi. Constructed by Firosha Tughlaq. Firosha Tughlaq. Then fifth is the city of Deenpana, constructed by Mughal Emperor Humayu. The sixth city was Shergar, found and established by Afghan ruler Sher Shah Suri. And the seventh and the last city was the city of Shah Jahanabad. City of Shah Jahanabad, established by Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan. Clear? Now, just understand here. Clear? Point of discussing is this city of Shah Jahanabad is very important in contemporary times. The reason is clear. Recently, a very important cultural program is organized in Delhi. This cultural program is known as Mir ki Dilli. Clear? Mir Taki Mir was a very prominent, prominent Urdu writer. It is known as Mir ki Delhi. Shah Jahanabad, Mir ki Delhi, Shah Jahanabad. 
Okay. So very important culture program is being organized in Delhi known as Meer Ki Delhi, Shah Jahanabad because Shah Jahanabad is the old Delhi which was the home of many Urdu writers, Mirza Ghalib also at the same time Meer Taki Meer and Meer Taki Meer, this program is known as Meer Ki Delhi, Shah Jahanabad which was a city established by Shah Jahan and which is one of the seven sister cities that led to establishment of Delhi as capital of modern India. Clear? And at the, when they established Delhi as capital of modern India, Apart from these seven cities, they also established a new city, modern city altogether. And this new modern city established by British in India came to be known as the city of New Delhi. Clear. City of New Delhi. Delhi clear and in the new society of New Delhi they constructed several monuments clear in fact clear in the city of New Delhi they began to follow the concept of neo Roman architecture clear so in city they constructed monuments in neo Roman architecture constructed monuments in neo-roman architecture clear and this neo-roman architecture was largely followed by a very important architect edwin lutyens followed by important architect edwin lutyens clear who was responsible for overall layout and also for architecture of Viceroy's house clear so he, he basically promoted or rather he was highly responsible for Planning the Viceroy's house, Viceroy's house, and even India Gate. Viceroy's house and India Gate. Viceroy's house, even at presently, is known as the known as the President House, clear, or House of the President of India, clear. So this was basically the purpose. The Edwin Lutyens who established Viceroy's House or the President House in India, clear. This new city cake was known as Neo Roman or Neo Classical Architecture, clear. Apart from this, clear. Now another prominent architect was Herbert Baker, clear. So another prominent British architect was. Herbert Baker, very important one. He is known as Gandhi of Indian architecture because he stayed in India even after independence. Clear? And Herbert Baker planned very important mon class of monuments known as known as, no, known as the North Block and the South Block. The North and the South Blocks, the administrative headquarter in Delhi, North and the South Blocks, adjoining the Viceroy's House. Viceroy's House is known as Rashtrapati Bhavan or President House. Clear. At the same time, clear. There was another person known as Robert Tor Russell. Robert Tor. Robert Tor Russell. Robert Rod Russell who planned. The who planned a marketing complex known as the Connaught Place in Delhi, known as the Connaught Place in Delhi. Clear? So these were major monuments constructed in New Delhi. New Roman architecture, Edmund Lutyens planned the Viceroy's House, known as Rashtrapati Bhavan, India Gate, Herbert Baker, North and South Blocks, and Robert Torhat Russell, Russell known as the Plot Plan, the city of cannot place clear now after british rule came to an end architecture continued to be promoted in post independent era and in post independent era monuments began to be constructed clear and at the same time the most important contributor was herbert baker in post independent era he constructed several monuments in kerala and all these are low cost monuments clear he used basically the locally available materials just because the huge investments could not be done in construction of monuments and therefore large number of monuments at low cost began to be constructed by herbert baker in kerala and other places and therefore he came to be known as the gandhi of indian architecture clear at the same time clear in post independent era Jawaharlal Nehru authorized a very important architect, French architect, and this French architect was Lee Corbusier. Lee Corbusier, who planned and established the city of Chandigarh. Clear? And in course of time, Chandigarh emerged to be the most planned city of India and the capital complex of Chandigarh was even included into the list of tangible world heritage sites in 
2016. Clear? So, Lee Corbusier contributed to establishment of the most planned city, Chandigarh, and this became a part of world tangible world heritage site of UNESCO. Clear? Another great contributor towards towards architecture was Laurie Baker in post independent era. Laurie Baker in post independent area. We also constructed large number of monuments at low cost materials and the, largely in the region of Kerala. He is also regarded as Gandhi of Indian architecture. And along with Laurie Baker, there was another Indian architect, and this Indian architect was Charles Correa. Charles Correa, who planned several monuments. He planned the Legislative Assembly building in Legislative assembly building of Madhya Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, then he planned basically several monuments at Jaipur, including the coffee house, Jaipur coffee house has been planned by Charles Correa and important he planned the Jeevan Bharti building at Connaught Place in Delhi. Jeevan Bharti building at Connaught Place in Delhi. All these monuments were planned by Charles Correa. Clear. He was also a great architect in post-independent era. Clear. So these monuments had been constructed in post-independent era and has proved to be a very important contribution in contemporary times, till contemporary times. Clear. Now, since we are discussing about architecture, here only we'll need to discuss about architecture of one important monument which has become very important in contemporary times and this monument has also been included in the list of world heritage site and that is Shanti Niketan. Clear? So we will come to this structure this Shanti Niketan separately which has been included in the list of World Heritage Site as the 41st site of India. So, 41st is Santiniketan. 42nd is the temples in region of Halibad. Clear? There is three major temples we had discussed. Chinna Kesava Temple, Kesava Temple and other temples and Hoysala Ishwara Temple at Halibad in Karnataka. This is the 42nd one, the latest one. 41st site is Santiniketan from West Bengal. Clear? Now, coming to the architecture of Santiniketan. Clear? 41st UNESCO's World Heritage Site. Clear? 41st World, 41st UNESCO World Heritage Site. Shantiniketan. Clear? Now, fight Shantiniketan. Clear? It has been included in the cultural criteria. Clear? Now, Shantiniketan is considered to be a very important one. In fact, it is the third site from West Bengal to be included in tangible category after Sundarban National Bark Park and Darjeeling Mountain Railways. Clear? Now, this university, that is Shantiniketan, it was this university of Shantiniketan was established by Rabindranath. Tagore. Clear? So, Rabindranath Tagore established Shanti Niketan as a very prominent institution and Shanti Niketan was established in the district of Birbhum in West Bengal. Clear? So, it is presently located in the district of Birbhum in West Bengal. Clear? Birbhum in West Bengal. Clear? Now, coming to architectural features of this monument. Clear? Now, first of all, this is the first architectural structure which is a part of glass temple. Clear? So, this is the first architecture, first architectural, first architectural monument planned in glass complex. Planned in glass complex complex planned in glass complex clear a glass complex glass complex is also known as glass temple is also a glass temple also known as popularly as mandir that's one thing at the same time clear another very important thing is it consists of three main areas so santi niketan comprises of three main areas these three main areas are number one ashram hermitage first is ashram second main area is basically uttrayan uttrayan 
Uttarayan clear. Uttarayan basically residential quarters clear. And then we have Kala Bhavan and Sangeet Bhavan. Third is Kala Bhavan and Sangeet Bhavan. Kala Bhavan and Sangeet Bhavan. Kala Bhavan and Sangeet Bhavan. Clear? At the same time, clear, it is for largely, it largely follows basically indigenous architectural style, architecture whereby buildings has been constructed in indigenous form, taking the support of nature, crafts, and at the same time, common things. Clear? At the same time, clear, it, this, building, this structure has been constructed with traditional materials like mud and thatch, and even with reinforced concrete materials. Clear? So, this are considered to be very important one. This is structure, Santi Niketan is also known for decoration of murals and frescoes, clear. And this murals and frescoes has been taken from Bharat, Mahabalipura, Mohenjo-Daro, Egypt and Egyptian motifs, clear. So, this structure of Santi Niketan has been decorated with murals and frescoes. We had discussed about murals and frescoes. These are all mural paintings decorated murals and frescoes and these murals and frescoes are largely inspired by Bharat, ancient India, Mahabalipuram, Mahabalipuram, then Mohenjo-Daro and even Egyptian murals and even Egyptian murals, clear? So, this was very important architectural merit of this structure, which is considered to be very important one, clear? First of all, clear? This how this structure began to get established, clear? Shanti Niketan, clear? Rabindranath Tagore started his journey in Shanti Niketan by establishing Brahmacharya Ashram, clear? So, first of all, he termed it as Brahmacharya Ashram in the year 1901. So, foundation of Shanti Niketan was left in form of Brahmacharya Ashram in 1901. It was inspired by ancient Vedic traditions or traditions and Gurukul system. Clear? So, initially it was basically to have open air classrooms behind or beneath the, beneath the trees and it was marked by Gurukul system, Vedic tradition and it was known as Brahmacharya Ashram in 1901. Clear? He established ashrams in Santinikation due to its environment. It was a peaceful abode, clear? And in course of time, clear, this got converted into Vishwa Bharti University. This got converted into Vishwa Bharati University in 1921 during the non-cooperation movement. So, it got converted into Vishwa Bharati University in 1921, clear? And at the same time, in 1951, Vishwa Bharati University translated into Central University, clear? It was transformed into Central University in 1951 with Rabindranath Tagore as the first Vice Chancellor, with Rabindranath Tagore as the first Vice Chancellor, first Vice Chancellor, clear? At the same time, major departments of this university, Central University are, what are the major departments? major departments. Number one, the first major department is Vidya Bhavan. The first major department is Vidya Bhavan for regular course studies, clear. And it is basically for research and development studies. It is basically for research and development studies or higher studies, Vidya Bhavan. Then we have Siksha Bhavan. Then Siksha Bhavan, undergraduate courses, undergraduate studies, that is Siksha Bhavan, clear. A collegiate education up to graduation, then we have Sri Niketan. Sri Niketan, which is for rural reconstruction. This is for rural reconstruction. 
rural reconstruction clear so these are very important developments related to shanti niketan architecture also sculpture inspired by bharat mohanjodaro mesopotamia at the same time mahabalipuram then it was established originally as brahmacharya ashram in 1901 converted into vishwabharati university in 1921 then given the status of central university in 1951 then major developed departments being vidya bhavan shiksha bhavan and shri niketan clear so very important development related to shanti niketan which needs to be covered thoroughly clear so these are very important developments related to shanti niketan clear coming to architecture in contemporary times clear so uh, in contemporary times several monuments has been constructed coming to the most important monument which has been constructed recently and this important monument is the new parliament building which has been constructed by the present government this new parliament building has replaced the parliament building constructed by the british india and it has been we had discussed earlier the earlier parliament building was inspired by a temple known as chausat yogini temple that is located in madhya pradesh we had discussed earlier chausat yogini temple having 64 chambers in which the main chamber was a larger chamber and this larger chamber was basically went for the main deity clear and then the main deity in chausat yogini temple was lord shiv clear so older parliament building was based on chausat yogini temple in madhya pradesh we had already discussed about the architecture of chausat yogini temple but this old parliament building has been replaced by a new parliament building which has some major architectural merit we'll come to that architectural merits of new parliament building as well clear so coming to the new parliament building so new parliament building very important architecture in contemporary times coming to the new parliament building the new parliament building architecture the most important feature of new parliament building is that new parliament building has six entrances each signifying signifying a different role okay so new parliament building has six entrances the most distinctive feature are entrances okay so new parliament building has six entrances each signifying 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 a different role clear so coming to these entrances clear first of all coming to this as entrances clear out of these three are designed as ceremonial entrances to welcome the special guests and to mark special events clear so out of the six entrances out of the six enter entrances three are discussed as ceremonial entrances three entrances as ceremonial three entrances as ceremonial that is only for high dignitaries and foreign dignitaries to come to mark special event ceremonial entrances clear ceremonial entrances has also been named as gyan clear and these ceremonial entrances has been named as gyan second is known as shakti and karm clear gyan shakti and karm gyan shakti and karm clear representing in the knowledge system then patriotism and then at the same time artistic traditions clear so ceremonial entrances are known as gyan dwar shakti dwar and karm dwar clear so they are known as gyan dwar shakti dwar and karm dwar ceremonial entrances clear so ceremonial entrances and their guardians clear now coming to ceremonial entrances and their guardians clear now these ceremonial entrances or the guardians are clear three of them so first of all coming to these entrances clear now coming to the north gate clear these ceremonial entrances three ceremonial entrances entrances three entrances now coming to them number one by one clear first is known as the north gate known as the north gate 
गेट नॉर्थ गेट इज आल्सो नोन एज गज द्वार नॉर्थ गेट इज आल्सो नोन एज द गज द्वार गज द्वार एंड दिस गज द्वार इज इंफ्लुएंस लार्जली इंस्पायर्ड बाय मधुकेश्वर टेंपल एट बानाबसी इट इज लार्जली इंस्पायर्ड बाय मधुकेश्वरा टेंपल Madhukeshwara Temple at Banabasi. It was the capital of Kadamba Dynasty. Madhukeshwara Temple at Banabasi in Karnataka. Banabasi in Karnataka. This is North Gate. Clear. Coming to another one, and this after North Gate, the second ceremonial entrance is known as Garud Dwar. Gurdwar is basically eastern gate. So northern north gate, then we have eastern gate. Eastern gate is known as Gurudwar, known as Gurudwar, and this indicate basically what is the what it it is inspired by. Basically, it is inspired by the Kumbha Konam Temple of Tamil Nadu. it was inspired it is inspired by kumbha konam kumbha konam temple of tamil nadu kumbha konam the third ceremonial entrance ceremonial entrance is known as ashwadwar known as this direction first of all we will write the direction is basically southern gate southern gate which is known as ashwadwar known as ashwadwar and it is inspired by sun temple at konark it is inspired by sun temple at konark that is odisha so three ceremonial entrances clear and the guardians also so three entrances are known as gyan dwar shakti dwar and karma dwar clear and these entrances and the guardians are clear these entrances are also known as north gate eastern gate and southern gate north gate is also known as gaj dwar eastern gate known as garud dwar southern gate known as ashwa dwar and north gate that is gaj dwar is inspired by madhukeshwara temple at banabasi karnataka gaj garud dwar is inspired by kumbha konam temple in tamil nadu and ashwadwar is inspired by sun temple at konark these are three ceremonial entrances clear very prominent one three ceremonial entrances need to be know so we had done with north gate east gate and the southern gate clear now apart from this clear we need to understand that apart from ceremonial entrances there are three entrances for common public for public entrances clear now coming to out of six entrances another thing is three public entrances three public entrances three public entrances which are these three public entrances clear first is known as the western gate look into the direction the remaining section first is the western gate western gate is also known as western shardul dwar also known as shardul dwar and this shardul dwar is inspired by this shardul dwar is inspired by shiv temple in morena madhya pradesh shiv temple at morena shiv temple at morena madhya pradesh this is one public entrance second is northeast second is the north east and northeast is also known as known as hans dwar hansa dwar is also known as hans dwar or hansa dwar and it is inspired by vijay vithala temple vijay vit 
विठल टेम्पल विठल स्वामी टेम्पल इनफैक्ट विजय विठल टेम्पल एट हम्पी विजय विंट टेम्पल एट हम्पी दट इज कर्नाटका हम्पी दट इज कर्नाटका कंस्ट्रक्टेड बाय कृष्णदेव राय थर्ड पब्लिक एंट्रेंस इज नोन एज नोन एज मकर द्वार क्लियर तो थर्ड इंपिट इज नोन एज मकर द्वार मकर द्वार क्लियर सो इट वॉज नॉर्थ देन वी हैव साउथ देन वी हैव ईस्ट देन वी हैव वेस्ट देन वी हैव नॉर्थ एस्ट नॉर्थ ईस्ट एंड वी हैव नॉर्थ वेस्ट क्लियर एंड दिस नॉर्थ वेस्ट इज नोन एज मकर द्वार क्लियर नॉर्थ वेस्ट मकर द्वार इज इंस्पायर्ड बाय इंस्पायर्ड बाय होयसालेश्वरा टेम्पल होयसालेश्वरा टेम्पल एट हेलिबेड अगेन कर्नाटका At Halibut, that has also been included in the list of tangible World Heritage Site. Clear? So six entrances are there. Clear? These entrances are clear. Ceremonial entrances we had discussed: North Gate, Eastern Gate, and Southern Gate. And entrances for public, public common, public is Western Gate, North East, and North West. By Western Gate is known as Shardul Dwar. North East is known as Hansa Dwar. Makar and North West is known as Hoysal, known as the known as the Makar Dwar. And these are influenced by leading temples of India. Even these temples can be asked clear. All these temples are considered to be very important one. And these are six entrances of New Parliament Building. You should know about six entrances from where they are inspired. What are the normal terms used by them? So three are ceremonial entrances, not for indicating six special events, and three are public entrances. And all the three are six are inspired by certain temples in India, and they are known by different names. Clear? So you should know about all these six entrances of New Parliament Building in India. Clear? Now there are some questions. The or the area was called Bhubadang was named something called by Devan Nath Tagore due to its conducing way. Yeah, it was Bhubadang, but was named by Devan Nath Tagore, who was the father of Rabin Nath Tagore, and from here only Rabin Nath Tagore established Brahmachar Ashram in 1901. Yeah, the space was first taken by Devan Nath Tagore, who was father of Rabin Nath Tagore. So Prime Minister inaugurated the Parliament and placed Sangol, the symbol of power, transferred to India from Britain. What is this? We had discussed about Sangol. Okay, earlier only when we were discussing about Cholas, we had elaborate discussion. About Sengol. Sengol indicate transfer of power, which was given to first Prime Minister of India on 14th of August 1947. Clear? And it was recently placed by our Prime Minister in the new Parliament building or Sansad Bhavan, Sengol. We had discussed about importance of Sengol also. It's basically a form of a rod. Clear? And at the same time, on top we have Nandi. We had discussed about Sengol elaborately. Go to the back notes and the Cholas. We had discussed about Sengol elaborately. Clear? The Lok Sabha Hall is based on peacock theme, India's national bird. The Rajya Sabha is based on the lotus theme, India's national flower. Yeah, that is right. It's based on peacock theme, and the La and the Rajya Sabha is based on lotus theme. A platinum-rated green building, the new Sansad Bhavan will embody India's commitment towards environment sustainability. Obviously, this also what it's a platinum-rated green building, and this building building they indicate consciousness towards environmental considerations. Clear? So six entrances they can give you to match. Also, they are very important. North gate inspired by Madhukeshwar Temple, East gate by by East gate by Kumbha. Konam Temple, South Gate by Sun Temple, Konak, Western Gate by the Sun Temple, a Shiv Temple at Morena, North East by Vithal Swami Temple at Hampi, and Makar Jawa or the North West by Hoysaleshwar Temple at Halibut. Clear? Now, since we had discussed about the here only, clear? I just want to make it clear for your examination, coming examination. Clear? In recent times, there has been is the erection of statues in different parts of India. These statues has also become very important these days. Last year we got a question on statue of a uh, statue of Ramanuj, clear? Which was inaugurated by Prime Minister in Hyderabad. Clear? That became very important. The question was also framed on this. Clear? Last time we'll come to clear. Why new Parliament building had replaced old Parliament building? Obviously, it is largely claimed that new old Parliament building constructed by British was a symbol of slavery and bondage towards British rule. And new Parliament building will indicate self-assertion by India as a nation. Clear? Now, coming to the major statues, also clear. These statues are very important. Last year only we had a question on statues. Coming to statues. 
constructed in made in in contemporary time statues clear the most important they are let you know very important the latest let us let us start with the latest one clear we have large number of statues related to dr b r ambedkar in our country clear but the most important thing is clear that there are several statues of lord dr b r ambedkar in different parts of india but recently in january 2024 on the pradesh chief minister y s jagan reddy clear unveiled the tallest statue of dr b r ambedkar in vijayawada clear it was inaugurated on january 19 2024 and this was basically 206 feet tall statue located in swaraj maidan in vijayawada clear so first of all clear this statue which was constructed clear what is the name of this statue first of all the name of this statue is statue of social justice clear so first is statue of social justice let us start with the latest one a statue of social justice it is a statue of dr b r ambedkar it is the tallest statue of dr b we have a statue of dr b r ambedkar in hyderabad also different place also but it is the latest one and the tallest one it is 206 feet high clear tallest at dr b r ambedkar at vijayawada in Andhra Pradesh. Clear. So, statue of social justice indicating Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, 206 feet high. Clear. And it was inaugurated on January 19, 2024, by the Chief Minister of Andhra Pradesh, and it is located in Vijayawada. Clear. The next contemporary statue that has been erected in contemporary times is a statue of oneness. A statue of oneness. and this statue of oneness was is basically a 108 feet tall statue of adi shankaracharya a statue of adi shankaracharya a statue of adi shankaracharya which is also known jagat guru also known as founder of advait vedant clear or advait vad known as non dualism non dualism clear this statue has been have been constructed at omkareshwar clear this statue at omkareshwar in madhya pradesh omkareshwar in madhya pradesh statue of oneness clear then the third statue after statue of oneness is a statue of unity you must be knowing that a statue of unity this is a statue of sardar vallabh bhai patel sardar vallabh bhai patel located in the region of kevadiya on the banks of narmada in gujarat clear third one very popular one then coming to the fourth one a statue of equality a statue of equality a statue of equality this statue of equality is of is of ramanuj is of ramanuj it is located in hyderabad this was inaugurated by prime minister last to last year a statue of last to last year hyderabad in telangana see in hyderabad we have another statue of dr b r ambedkar that statue is also known as statue of equality this statue is also known as statue of equality of ramanuj char or ramanuj who was a 11th century saint who advocated vishistha advaitwat located in hyderabad telangana then we have a statue of peace a statue of peace clear this statue of peace is of jain monk acharya shri jain monk acharya shri jain monk acharya shri vijay vallab acharya shri vijay acharya shri vijay vallab surishwar vijay vallab 
Sureshwar and this statue is located in Rajasthan. Located in Rajasthan. Clear? This is another statue. Now coming to the next statue, sixth one. Sixth one is a statue of prosperity. A statue of prosperity. This statue is of Nad Prabhu. Nad Prabhu. Statue of Nath Prabhu, Nath Prabhu, came pe Gorda. Nath Prabhu, came pe Gorda in the city of Bangalore, in the state of Karnataka. The statue should also know. Clear? So all these statues are important because last year we got a question on one statue. So be prepared about statue. Latest one being the tallest statue of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar at Vijayawada, 206 feet high, inaugurated by our Chief Minister of Andhra Pradesh, which is known as a statue of another. Which this statue is known as statue of social justice. Then the another latest one is statue of oneness, and this statue of Adi Shankarachar at Omkareshwar, MP, inaugurated by the Chief Minister of Madhya Pradesh, the former. Sivra Singh Chauhan. Okay? So major statues as well, which are also very important with respect to with respect to contemporary developments, developments related to architecture and sculpture. Okay? So these were major developments related to architecture and sculpture. Now finally, we'll come to another growth and development of architecture. And this growth and development of architecture is related to a new construction that has taken place in our country, which is very popular these days. And that structure is the Ram Mandir, which was inaugurated at Ayodhya. Okay? Now, what is the structural style of Ram Mandir, which was inaugurated and consecrated recently in January 2024? Okay? So, style of architecture of Ram Mandir at Ayodhya. Okay? Coming to the recently inaugurated Ram Mandir at Ayodhya. Ram Mandir at Ayodhya. Clear? Coming to the architecture of Ram Mandir at Ayodhya. Clear? Now, Ram Mandir at Ayodhya has been constructed in Nagar style of architecture. So, first major thing to be known is it has been constructed in the Nagar style of architecture whereby Shikhar has been constructed on Garbhagriya and the Mandap. Clear? So it has been constructed first of all in Nagar style of architecture. Nagar style is basically characterized by symmetrical form, radial design, towering spires or Shikhars. Clear? So Nagar style is characterized by, what are the characteristics? features? Nagar style is characterized by first of all the Nagar style is comprised in the Nagar style clear is characterized by symmetrical form characterized by symmetrical form characterized by symmetrical form clear radial design radial design Radial design, clear. Then after radial design, we have towering spires. Towering spires, also known as shikhars. Towering spires, also known as shikhars, clear. So shikhars are curvilinear in shape and shape and represent the mythical Mount Meru, clear. So shikhars basically are curvilinear in shape and represent the mythical Mount Meru. It basically depict Mount Meru, clear. 
माउंट मेरो विच इज अबोर्ड ऑफ गॉड्स क्लियर सो इंडिकेट माउंट मेरो और अबोर्ड ऑफ गॉड्स नगर स्टाइल डिस्टिंगटिव फीचर्स क्लियर सो वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट नगर स्टाइल द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट टेम्पल विच हेज बिन बेस्ड ऑन दिस स्टाइल इज सन टेम्पल एट कोनाक एंड इवन एट द सेम टाइम जगदीश टेम्पल एंड उदयपुर क्लियर सो इज द वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट वन क्लियर नो दिस आर द मेजर फीचर्स अपार्ट फ्रॉम दिस क्लियर राम मंदिर और दिस राम मंदिर it has been supervised by shri krishna shri ram janmabhoomi tirth trust clear so this has been monitored largely by shri ram janmabhoomi second thing to be known is shri ram janmabhoomi shri ram janmabhoomi tirth kshetra trust tirth क्षेत्र ट्रस्ट क्षेत्र क्षेत्र तीर्थ क्षेत्र ट्रस्ट क्लियर एंड एट द सेम टाइम इट हैज बीन डिजाइंड बाय चंद्रकांत सोमपुरा ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ दिस 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 टेंपल हैज बीन डिजाइंड बाय दिस टेंपल हैज बीन डिजाइंड बाय डिजाइंड बाय चंद्रकांत सोमपुरा आर्किटेक्ट इज चंद्र कांत सोमपुरा एंड हिस सन एंड हिस सन चंद्रकांत सोमपुरा एंड हिस सन आशीष सोमपुरा एंड हिस सन आशीष सोमपुरा सन आशीष सोमपुरा क्लियर द टेम्पल क्लियर दट कमिंग टू द डायमेंशन ऑफ दिस टेम्पल दे आर द आर्किटेक्ट चंद्रकांत सोमपुरा एंड आशीष सोमपुरा कमिंग टू द डायमेंशन पार्ट डायमेंशन पार्ट क्लियर दिस टेम्पल क्लियर हैव अ लेंथ ऑफ दिस टेम्पल हैव अ लेंथ ऑफ थ्री सिक्सटी मीटर्स Length of three sorry three sixty feet. Length of three sixty feet. Length of three sixty feet. Width of two thirty five feet. Clear. Width is two thirty five feet. Width is two thirty five feet. Height is one sixty one feet. Height is one sixty one feet. height is 165 feet and it will have three shikhar clear so it will have fifth one is it will have three shikhar it will have three it will have three shikhar clear three three shikhar clear three shikhar. with main shikhar would be main shikhar three shikhar in which main shikhar will be main shikhar will be 128 feet tall 128 feet tall and remaining two shikhars clear and the remaining two shikhars will be 76 remaining and remaining two shikhars and remaining two shikhars will be 76 feet tall 76 feet tall 76 feet tall clear so this is clear now at the same time clear the this is the these are the dimensions these are the major architect chandrakant sompura and his son ashish sompura clear so at the same time clear this temple will have five mandap and this five mandaps are also important clear so this temple will have five mandap this temple will have five mandaps clear five mandaps these mandaps are kudu mandap kudu mandap first is kudu mandap second is the rang mandap the nritya mandap rang mandap nritya mandap nirt mandap the prarthana mandap and garbhagriha the prarthana mandap and fifth one being garbhagriha 
गर्भ गृह फाइव मंडप इन दिस टेम्पल एंड दिस टेम्पल क्लियर दिस टेम्पल विल बी बिल्ड विथ पिंक सैंड स्टोन क्लियर नो बेजम मटेरियल मटेरियल इज इंपॉर्टेंट क्लियर दिस टेम्पल वुड बी कंस्ट्रक्टेड इन पिंक रेड सैंड स्टोन पिंक रेड सैंड स्टोन कंस्ट्रक्टेड इन कंस्ट्रक्ट दिस टेम्पल विल दिस टेम्पल विल बी कंस्ट्रक्टेड इन पिंक सैंड स्टोन फ्रॉम राजस्थान पिंक सैंड पिंक सैंड स्टोन फ्रॉम राजस्थान प्रिंसिपल बिल्डिंग मटीरियल पिंक सैंड स्टोन फ्रॉम राजस्थान क्लियर सो पिंक सैंड स्टोन फ्रॉम राजस्थान राजस्थान एंड विल हैव अ कैपेसिटी ऑफ फोर्टी थाउजेंड डिवोटीज एंड इट विल हैव कैपेसिटी ऑफ फोर्टी थाउजेंड डिवोटीज कैपेसिटी ऑफ फोर्टी थाउजेंड devotees clear now temple complex will also have a museum a library and yoga shala and vedic pat shala clear so this temple this with this temple will have even library a museum yoga shala and vedic pat shala and this temple is expected to be completed by 2025 clear so this temple is expected to be completed by 2000 25 clear so very important development related to the temples do do understand iron rods are not used in the temple iron still has not been used in this temple it's only constructed of pink sandstone from rajasthan this normal confusion no iron and steel has been used in the construction of ram mandir at ayodhya clear no so it's a genuine request Starting from 1773, regulating act till India's independence, you can throw light only on the administrative structure changes that took place and different between non-official, official, nominated elected members and the composition changes in executive council and legislative council. But we had discussed all the legislations from 1773 till 1947. We had discussed about the administrative structure changes also, composition of non-official and official members also. Okay, I'll discuss briefly. Don't worry. Clear. Clear. Sir, can we consider that if World War II not happened, then India would not be independent? It's a counterfactual thing, difficult to say. But ha, Second World War expedited the grant of independence to India. So Ram Temple. Apart from this, another important thing to be known in contemporary times is recently there's one temple which is being inaugurated, which is being inaugurated at global level, and that temple has also become very important these days, which is to be inaugurated on 14th of February 1900 and 14th of February 2024. Clear? Now coming to this, clear. First of all, we need to understand that temple is being constructed at Dubai, Abu Dhabi. Clear? And this temple is very important one, which will be inaugurated on 14th of February 1941. Clear? Now coming to this temple, or oh, first of all, clear. This temple is known as the B A P S Temple. B A P S Temple, which is to be inaugurated in West Asia, Abu Dhabi. Clear. B A P S is Bochas, Bochas, Bochasan Wasi, Bochasan Wasi, Bochasan Wasi, Akshar Purushottam, Akshar Purushottam. अक्षर पुरुषोत्तम स्वामी नारायण संस्थान स्वामी नारायण संस्थान क्लियर सो बीएपी स्टैंड फॉर बोचस बोचसन वासी अक्षर पुरुषोत्तम स्वामी नारायण संस्थान क्लियर एंड दिस टेंपल और दैट दे आर बेसिकली इट्स अ गुजराती ओरिजिन कंसेप्ट इन व्हिच लॉर्ड विष्णु इज वर्शिप्ड एज स्वामी नारायण क्लियर सो लॉर्ड विष्णु इज एज वर्शिप्ड एज स्वामी नारायण एंड दिस टेंपल इज डेडिकेटेड टू लॉर्ड विष्णु एंड दिस टेंपल इज बीइंग कंस्ट्रक्टेड क्लियर कंस्ट्रक्टेड एट इन अबु धाबी क्लियर नो इट इज बेसिकली अ सोशियो cultural social cultural social cultural movement which was started from which was started in 19th century and it was started by bhagwan swami narayan clear so this structure or rather this movement was started by bhagwan swami narayan 
Bhagwan Swami Narayan, Swami Narayan, who was from 1781 to 1830. 1781 to 1830. Clear? This social cultural legend of Bhagwan Swami Narayan was carried forward or established and carried forward by Shastri Ji Maharaj. Carried forward and established by Shastri Ji Maharaj. Shastri Ji Maharaj in 1907. So it was established formally in 1907 known as Shastri Ji Maharaj, which is a pure sect related to worship of Lord Vishnu. Clear? This temple is basically being constructed and this coming to architecture of this temple. Clear? This temple is constructed at Abu Dhabi, has been constructed at Abu Dhabi and it is the largest temple in West, largest temple in West Asia. So this temple constructed Abu Dhabi is the largest temple, largest temple in West Asia, largest temple in West Asia, clear, at West Asia, clear, at the same time, clear, these temple, other architecture features is these temple, now features, architectural features of this temple, they have two domes, these temple, this temple has two domes of Ghumats, clear, two domes are there, then it has seven shikhars, two domes, Seven shikhars. Clear? Why seven shikhars has been used? Clear? Just to indicate seven emirates in UAE. Clear? So seven in seven shikhars indicate seven emirates in UAE. United Arab Emirate. Seven emirates in UAE. Clear? Clear? This is seven em shikhars at this time. Clear? And at the same time, it is it has got 402 pillars, 402 pillars, 402 pillars, clear, it contains marble carvings against a sandstone building backdrop, clear, so marble carvings, marble carvings in the backdrop of sandstone structure. So, sandstone has been used in the construction of this, this temple. Clear? This, within each shikhar, there are carvings of stories from Ramayan, Shiv Puran, Bhagavatism, Mahabharat, Swami Narayan, Venkateshwara and Ayappa. Clear? Carvings and portraits, the stories of Jagannath, Swami Narayan, Venkateshwara and Ayappa, all are basically forms of Lord Vishnu. Clear? The, at the same time, clear? The Dome of Harmony, one of the dome is known as the Dome of Harmony, which indicate five natural elements like earth, water, air, fire and space. Clear? So, all these has got distinctive features of this temple. Two domes, seven shikars, 402 pillars. The temple has to be inaugurated on 14th of February 2024, just after four days and this is considered to be a largest temple in West Asia at Abu Dhabi and this temple has been largely promoted by Bochasan Vasi Akshar Pushottam Swami Narayan. This social culture movement was started by Bhagwan Swami Narayan in 18th and 19th century. It was formally established by Shastri Ji Maharaj in 20th century in 1907. Okay. So, very important architecture, the latest one. Okay. So, these are very important development related to architecture in modern India till contemporary times. Sir, why marble is not just a site of worship, but the beacon of India's culture of NASA, beaconing the world the witness glory of Indian heritage? Because marble is considered to be something which is highly expensive in nature, that indicate not only the culture of NASA, but prosperity of India. So, this is basically used as worship to show beacon of India's culture of NASA, Renasa marked by economic and social cultural prosperity. Okay? So, these were something related to development of architecture in modern India. After architecture and the current developments also, clear. Okay? now we'll move on to another major development that is language and literature of modern India. Clear. Okay? So, apart from discussing architecture, now we'll move on to another dimension of modern Indian culture that is language and literature. So, coming to language and 
literature in modern India. Language and literature in modern India. Language and literature in modern India. Clear? First of all, I'll let you know, languages, India is known for large and diverse languages in our country. In fact, clear, India is known for its multilingual character all across the world. Clear? In fact, the diversity of Indian languages can be easily reflected or is easily reflected in the fact that there are classification of languages in two forms. Clear? First of all, the diversity of Indian languages can be known through its classification in two format first classification clear so classification of indian languages clear what is the first major classification of indian languages first classification is that first classification is regarding their recognition clear there are 22 First of all, there are 22 languages recognized. There are 22 recognized languages. There are 22. There are 22 recognized languages mentioned in the eighth schedule. Mentioned in the eighth schedule mentioned in the eighth schedule of Indian constitution 22 languages clear initially when constitution came into force there were 14 languages after 14 languages the another language that was added was Sindhi language by 21st amendment of the constitution then Konkani, Manipuri and Nepali by 71st amendment and then Bordo, Dogri, Mathli and Santhali in the by 92nd amendment so all together we have 22 recognized languages mentioned in eight schedule to Indian constitution then at the same time we have 122 major languages then we have 122 major languages spoken by large number of communities in India 122 major languages in our country and apart from this we have 1599 one five nine nine minor languages and dialects minor languages and dialects in our country and dialects in our country spoken in different parts of India. So one way of classification is in this form whereby 22 are languages are recognized languages mentioned the 8th schedule to Indian constitution. Originally we had 14 languages recognized in the 8th schedule. Later on we added 8 more constitution. The whole cons These languages were Sindhi first of all. After Sindhi it was followed by Konkani, Manipuri and Nepali and recently being Bordo, Dogri, Mathili and Santhali. All of them are included in H schedule to Indian constitution. Then we have 122 major languages spoken by large communities in India and 1,599 minor languages in India. Clear? This is one way of classification or classifying the languages. Clear? Apart from classifying the languages in this way, clear? There's another method of classifying the languages. And another method of classifying the languages include clear. What are the major develop major criteria? Classification of languages can also be done on the basis of on the basis of origin. Clear. First group of languages known as Indo-Aryan group of languages. Indo-Aryan group of languages. There's one. Two. Second is known as Dravidian group of languages. Second is known as the Dravidian group of languages. Third is known as known as Sino-Tibetan group of languages. Sino-Tibetan group of languages. And fourth is known as Austric, known as Austric or Austroasiatic group. Austric or 
ऑस्ट्रो एशियाटिक ग्रोप ऑस्ट्रो एशियाटिक ग्रोप ऑस्ट्रो एशियाटिक ग्रुप ऑफ लैंग्वेजेस क्लियर सो दीज आर ऑल्सो वे ऑफ क्लासिफाइंग द लैंग्वेजेस वॉट आर द लैंग्वेजेस इंक्लूडेड इंडो आर्यन ग्रुप क्लियर इंडो आर्यन ग्रुप विच इज बेसिकली स्पोकन बाय सेवेंटी फाइव परसेंट ऑफ द टोटल पॉपुलेशन इन इंडिया इट स्पोकन बाय सेवेंटी फाइव परसेंट ऑफ द टोटल पॉपुलेशन इन इंडिया एंड अमंग दिस लैंग्वेजेस द ओल्डेस्ट लैंग्वेज इज संस्कृत Sanskrit is the oldest language among the Indo-Aryan language. This Sanskrit was originally known as Vedic Sanskrit, which was converted into classical Sanskrit by Panini. Clear? Panini converted. He was a great grammarian who converted this language into the into classical language by grammatical rules in fifth century BC. Another very important Indo-Aryan language is Hindi language. Almost spoken by 40% of the total population in India. Hindi is another language. Clear. Hindi is fall based on Devanagari script, and Indo-Aryan language is also considered to be much from Indo-Iranian language or Indo-Iranian family. Clear. Dravidian group include languages. First of all, Tamil, the oldest one. Then we have Kannad. Then we have Telugu. we have telugu and finally we have malayalam telugu and malayalam then coming to sino tibetan languages and all these four are included into classical languages and sanskrit as well five of them clear apart from this coming to sino indian languages clear the sino indian languages are languages spoken largely in the region of himalayas in ladakh and himachal and arunachal pradesh clear so sino indian languages are spoken along himalayas sino indian languages are spoken around himalayas around the region of himalayas himalayas ladakh ladakh even himachal pradesh ladakh himachal pradesh himachal pradesh himachal pradesh and arunachal pradesh arunachal pradesh अरुणाचल प्रदेश मेघालय नागालैंड मेघालय नागालैंड एंड त्रिपुरा एंड त्रिपुरा so north eastern part of india himalayas and ladakh himachal pradesh sino indian language is spoken coming to austric or austro asiatic languages and austric language include in language spoken by mundas and kols clear these languages are spoken by the mundas and the kols in the chota nagpur plateau and these are very popular among the tribal communities austric or austro asiatic languages clear so these are another classification of languages to be known indo aryan group dravidian group sino tibetan languages and austric or austro asiatic languages clear this is one thing to be known clear now another important thing to be known is as we had discussed that that eighth in the eighth schedule to indian constitution we have 22 languages included and apart from this we should also know that as far as official language of india is concerned of as per india's official language act of 1963 hindi in devanagari script is india's official language and at the same time clear english has been given the status of subsidiary official language of the union clear so both hindi and english continue to remain as official language of india hindi being the official language of india according to official language act in 1963 and english being subsidiary official language of india clear now coming to classical language status clear now there are some classical languages as well clear now the government of india decided in 2004 to select some languages as classical languages which fulfill certain required criteria clear so criteria for classical languages criteria for classical languages criteria for classical languages criteria for classical languages this started this initiative started by 
गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया इन 2004 clear what are the criterias for classical languages first is antiquity of the text first criteria is antiquity of the text first criteria is antiquity of the text that the second is clear valuable ancient literature clear so second criteria is valuable literature valuable literature available third criteria is originality of literary tradition originality of literary tradition originality of literary tradition and second is distinctiveness clear uniqueness second is distinctiveness distinctiveness clear so antiquity of the text valuable valuable literature originality of literary tradition and distinctiveness clear these are very important criteria clear now as of now by this time the six languages in india identified on these criteria as classical languages of india these languages are number one first language to be recognized under classical list was tamil in 2004 itself tamil was followed by sanskrit in 2005 and then telugu then kannada then malayalam and then finally uriya clear so six languages are included in the list of classical languages clear the first among them was tamil tamil was recognized that to be the first classical language in 2004 itself then second is sanskrit in 2005 sanskrit in 2005 then followed by telugu 2008 telugu in 2008 clear then fourth one after telugu is the telugu 2008 then kannad 2008 kannad in 2008 then fifth one is malayalam 2013 malayalam in 2013 and sixth one is uriya in uriya 2013 then uriya in the year 2014 uriya in the year 2014 they can give to arrange also clear uriya in 2014 so uriya is one of the classical languages of india now coming to uriya the contemporary developments clear there's a news just some times back only clear we'll discuss about uriya separately clear first world odia conference has been organized in bhubaneswar from 3rd to 5th of february 2024 to promote odia as a distinct language clear so even though odia is included in the list of classical languages of india clear the first very important information clear the first the first world odia language first world odia language the first world odia language conference the first world odia language conference has been organized from 3rd to 5th of february 2024 3rd to 5th of february 2024 at bhuvaneswar at bhuvaneswar at bhubaneswar by in our bhubaneswar by chief minister navin patnaik clear so first world odia language conference from 3rd to 5th of february 2024 at bhubaneswar to promote odia as a very prominent language in fact a separate department of odia literature language and literature has been established in jawaharlal nehru university recently so odia language is very much in news clear so first world odia language conference from 3rd to 5th of february 2024 just some few days back only at bhubaneswar inaugurated by chief minister navin patnaik clear very important development related to odia language clear now apart from this language is one thing that 
you should know is clear recently three other languages has been given recognition in national education policy to be promoted these three languages are pali prakrit and persian or farsi clear and there are advocacy to include these three languages also in the list of classical languages if these three languages are added the list should become nine languages clear so pali prakrit and farsi or persian has been recognized and promoted under new education policy of 2020 and recently it has been proposed to include these three languages also in the list of classical languages if pali prakrit and farsi are added it will become or the list would become six classical languages in india which are very important development and if it is done clear it will lead to promotion of pali prakrit and farsi language as well clear now at the same time what are the benefits given to languages recognized as classical languages in india first of all two major annual awards to scholars of eminence of these languages two major national awards are to be given annually to the scholars of these languages establishment of center of excellence for studies in them clear so center of excellence is established to promote these languages and at the same time these lang request to university grants of commission to start certain number of professional chairs in these languages at least in central universities that is why uriya the central or other professional chair has been established in jawaharlal Nehru university to promote uriya language and literature which was recognized as classical languages 2014 clear so very important one development related to language and literature clear so language and literature has largely been promoted by promoted in india and we have nine classical languages if pali prakrit and farsi are also included clear now coming to these classical languages very important one these languages are very important to be understood we'll discuss about these classical languages as well and the major languages spoken in our country in order to understand about growth and development clear now coming to the languages major languages of india clear first of all let us discuss about assamese language let us discuss about assamese language and literature so starting with assamese language and literature clear the earliest literary works of assamese literature include charya pads which were buddhist songs written from 8th to 12th century AD clear so these the earliest literary works of Assamese literature are basically Charyapad Charyapad or Charyapadas which are basically Buddhist songs composed from 8th to 12th century AD clear and the first prominent work in Assamese language literature this work is Pralhad Charitra clear so first work of Assamese literary language is Pralad Charitra, Pralad Charitra, written in 14th century by Hem Saraswati. Written in 14th century by Hem Saraswati. Clear? 14th century AD. Clear? In medieval times, Assamese language and literature began to be promoted by Vaishnavites and Shankar Dev. We had discussed about Shankar Dev. Shankar Dev promoted this language in medieval times. He was devotee of Lord Krishna, Shankar Dev. He promoted Assamese language and he wrote very important work, like most important being Kirtna Ghosh. He wrote a work in Assamese language known as Kirtna Ghosh. Clear? Kirtana Ghosh is an important work of Shankar Dev. Clear? He wrote this work. Clear? Apart from this, clear? in modern times, Assamese language and literature has been promoted by several writers like Hem Chandra Barua, Lakshmi Nath Bez Barua, and Hem Chandra Goswami. Clear? These are very important writers of of this language and at the same time clear we have Sayyid Abdul Malik related to Assamese language who has been awarded with Sahit Academy Award and Padma Bhushan Award clear along with Navakanta Barua clear so Sayyid in modern times we have Sayyid we have Sayyid Abdul Malik Sayyid Abdul Malik, who has been awarded with Sahit Academy Award and Padma Bhushan Award and Nawakanta Barua. 
एंड नवकांता बरुआ Navakanta Barua, who has been awarded with Sahit Academy and Padma Bhushan Awardee. Clear? So, both of them are Sahit Academy. Will come to this institution. Sahit Academy Awardee and Padma Bhushan Awardee. Will come to the award also. And Padma Bhushan Awardee. Both of them. Sayyid Abdul Malik and Navakanta Barua. Clear? Very important one. Clear? This was Assamese literature. Assamese literature has become very important these days. All these are considered to be very important development. Clear. Apart from this, when we come to Bengali literature, we had discussed about the work coming to Bengali literature. Bengali language and literature. Clear. Bengali language start with it started in early medieval phase, largely clear. And the most major work was. Jaidev wrote Geet Govinda. It's a book on music. Clear. So it was basically started with Jaidev. Jaidev wrote a work, Geet Govinda, in the early medieval phase, which marked even the beginning of music, along with Sangeet Ratnakar by Sarang Dev. Clear. Two major works. Clear. Then Bengali language was promoted by Vaishnavite Saint Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And at the same time in modern India, Bengali language was largely promoted by Rabindranath Tagore. Clear. So Bengali language in modern India was promoted by Rabindranath Tagore. Great writer Rabindna Tagore, clear. And Rabindna Tagore also received Nobel Prize for Literature in 1913, and he received this Nobel Prize for Literature for his most famous work, Gitanjali. Clear. So he wrote, he got the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1913 for his work, Gitanjali. But he also wrote other works like Kabuliwala, Kabuliwala, and even another work known as Gora. Clear. So, Gitanjali, Kabuliwala, and Gora, all written by Rabindranath Tagore. Clear. At the same time, Bengali language in modern times was promoted by Sarat Chandra Bose. Clear. And Sarat Chandra Bose wrote major work. And among this, Michael Madhusudan Dutt and Kazi Nazrul Islam. Clear. Now, coming to this writer, Kazi Nazrul Islam. This is very important these days. Kazi Nazrul Islam. Clear? Very important Bengali writer Kazi Nazrul Islam, who is considered to be important one. We'll come to Kazi Nazrul Islam. Why is important? Just discuss about Kazi Nazrul Islam as well. Clear? Coming to Kazi Nazrul Islam. First of all, clear? Why Kazi Nazrul Islam is very important? Clear? Kazi Nazrul Islam is important because of widespread criticism in Bangladesh in recent times. Clear. Kazi Nazrul Stam wrote a Brit wrote anti-British anthem in 1922. Clear. Now this person needs to be discussed elaborately. Kazi Nazrul Islam very much in news these days, largely in criticism in in Bangladesh. Clear. Kazi Nazrul Islam wrote a very important poem, a very important anthem in 1922, which was against the British. And this anthem is known as, this anthem of Kazi Nazrul Islam is known as Karar Oi Lahu, Karar Oi Lahu Kopat, Karar Oi Lahu Kopat. Clear? Which in English means iron bars of a jail. Clear? And at the same time, it resulted into depiction in a movie also that led to criticism in Bangladesh. Clear? Now, forming to what was the major contribution? Clear? First of all, Kazi Nazrul Islam was already known as Vidrohi Kobi. Clear? So, in Bengal, in pre independent era, he was always known as Vidrohi Kobi or rebel poet. Clear? Bedrohi Kobi was, he was the given the title, Bedrohi Kobi. He wrote and composed more than 2,000 songs. So, he wrote and composed more than 2,000 songs in Bengali language and this is known as Nazrul Geet. All of them are collectively known as Nazrul Geet, Kazi Nazrul Islam. Clear? Clear? At the same time, clear? He 
in 1919 published his first piece of the autobiography of a delinquent or saugat while serving in the army clear so he wrote his autobiography known as saugat autobiography known as saugat clear uh, so saugat clear at the same time qazi nazrul islam clear Qazi Nasrul Islam. He was also considered. He was. Uh, he was a large person who participated against the British, and at the same time, even wrote writings on Swadeshi and Khilafat movement. Clear. He was also for. He also organized Shramik Praja Swaraj Dal, which was Workers and Peasant Party. Clear. So he organized a party also known as Shramik, known as Shramik Praja Swaraj Dal. Shramik. Praja Swaraj Dal, political party no Samik Praja Swaraj Dal or Workers and Peasants Party, clear. And at the same time, clear, he worked within Indian National Congress, clear. He became the critic of Khilafat struggle and the INC for not bargaining political independence from the British Empire. So he wanted complete independence to be demanded by the British authority. He was a great advocate of Hindu-Muslim unity, clear. He called for Hindu-Muslim unity and criticized attempt perpetuated by some individuals from both communities to construct their respective identities, clear. In 1960, was awarded by Padma Bhushan and one of the highest civilian honors of Republic of India. He was also conferred the title of National Poet and awarded Ekushe Padak by Bangladesh. Clear. So he was also he was also given the title of National Poet by Bangladesh. National Poet by Bangladesh and Government of Bangladesh gave Ekushe Padak. Ekushe Padak to Kazi Nasrul Islam. Ekushe Padak and Ekushe Padak is the second highest civilian award of Bangladesh. So Ekushe Padak is the second highest civilian award of Bangladesh given to Kazi Nasrul Islam, who is also regarded even now as national poet of Bangladesh. Clear. At the same time, his works played important role in fostering patriotism and a sense of cultural belonging among the youth of the country. So Kazi Nasrul Islam is very much in news. Clear. Be prepared about Kazi Nasrul Islam at any point of time. Very important development clear so bengali language was promoted by all these writers in contemporary times including kazi nazul islam clear so bengali language important one clear this language apart from this will come to gujarati language we'll discuss about gujarati language and literature Gujarati language also started, clear, it started in the 15th century, again by a very important bhakti poet that is Narsim Mehta, who is known as Adi Kavi in Gujarati language. Narsim Mehta promoted this language and wrote very important works, clear. So Narsim Mehta is considered to be the real founder of Gujarati language. He was the Vaishnavite saint of 15th century. Narsin Mehta wrote very important work like Surata Sangram. He wrote works like Surata. Important works like Surata Sangram. Clear. Surata Sangram. Shringar Mal, Mala. Shringar Mala. Shringar Mala, clear. Shringar Mala and Sudama Charit. Sudama Charit. Sudama Charit and Govind and Govind Gaman. And Govind Gaman. And Govind Gaman, clear. This was very important one, clear. And at the same time, clear, Mahatma Gandhi was also a very prominent Gujarati writer. Mahatma Gandhi, we need to discuss. Mahatma Gandhi wrote his My Experimental Truth originally in Bengal, Gujarati language. And about in modern times, this language promoted by Mahatma Gandhi, who wrote his autobiography originally in Gujarati language and this autobiography in Gujarati language was titled as Satyayan Satyayana Satyayana Prayog Prayo Satyayana Prayogur 
Satyana Prayogur, which is titled in English as My Experiments with Truth. Clear? His constitute very important one. In contemporary times, we have another writer, Uma Shankar Joshi. Uma Shankar Joshi. And Uma Shankar Joshi is Sahit Academy Awardee and Gyan Pit Awardee. Clear? So, his Sahit Academy Awardee as well as Gyan Pit Awardee. We will come to these awards also. Clear? So, he has been awarded with Sahit Academy Award also and Gyan Pit Award as well. Clear? This was related to Gujarati language, very important language. Clear? That was that has been promoted in contemporary times. Clear? Apart from this, clear? then we will come to Kannad language and literature. Kannad language and literature largely promoted again clear? in 8th century AD. The first Kannad language was, the first Kannad writer was Kaviraj Mark and it, this work Kaviraj Mark on Kannad poetics was written by Amog Vash. We had discussed earlier as well. Kannad language was largely promoted by Basav through his short couplets known as Vachans in which he advocated his ideas about Kalyan Raj and Sarvodaya. We had discussed Pampa Ponna Ranna were three jewels of Kannad language and literature. So, Kannad language and literature has largely been promoted, promoting contemporary times and in contemporary times, Kannad language and literature is being largely promoted by S. L. Bhairappa. S. L. Bhairappa and at the same time, Grish Karnad. Grish Karnad and S. L. Bhairappa are contemporary writers of Kannad language in southern part of India. Okay? So, these are very important one. Coming to Kashmiri language. Coming to Kashmiri language. Clear? In Kashmiri language, the most important thing is Kashmiri language in real sense started with Kashmiri literature and the first major Kashmiri literature is Kalhans Rashtarangini. Kalhans Raj Tarangini, which is also considered to be the first work of historiography in India. Clear. Kalans Raj Tarangini led to very important one. In medieval times, the Kashmiri language and literature was promoted by Habba Khatun. Promoted by Habba Khatun. She was a very prominent poet of Kashmiri language. And in modern times, this language is largely promoted by Rahman Rahi. Kashmiri language, Rahman Rahi. He has also been awarded with Sahit Academy and Gyan Pit Award, Rahman Rahi, clear. And at the same time, he has been awarded with Padma Shri also, clear. So, Rahman Rahi is awarded with Sahit Academy Award, Gyan Pit Award, and even Padma Shri Award, clear, in modern times. These are very prominent writers of Kannad language, Kashmiri language in the northern part of India. So, these are very prominent one languages that began to be promoted. So, these languages you need to know. Clear? Uriya language we had discussed. That is a very important one. Clear? So, all these are language and literature to be known in contemporary times. Clear? At the same time, Urdu language has become important because of Mirta ki Mir. We had discussed, we are celebrating a festival, Mir ki Delhi Shah Jahanawad. Okay? Now, at the same time, apart from this, we'll come to the awards given with related to language and literature. In fact, we'll discuss about these awards as well. First award is given by, given, known in form of Sahit Academy Award. Sahit Academy Award. Also, Sahit Academy Award. The first award related to language and literature is given form of Sahit Academy Award. Clear? Now, coming to Sahit Academy Award, clear? It was started in 1954. These awards are given annually by the Sahit Academy of India for the most outstanding books of literary merit published by in published by any of the major Indian languages. The Sahit Academy confers these awards for 24 languages, including 22 of those in H Schedule of Indian Constitution as well as English and Rajasthani. Do understand, clear? Sahit Academy start award was started in 1954 it is given annually clear this award is given for major work related to 24 languages of india among these 24 languages 22 are of the languages including a schedule apart from two other languages and these two languages are english and rajasthani so awards can be given for two other languages 
English and Rajasthani. Apart from 22 languages included in 8th Schedule 2 Indian Constitution. Clear? This award consists of a cash prize of rupees 1 lakh and a citation plaque. Clear? Is the foremost literary honor in the respective language. So, it is the foremost literary honor in the country. So, it is the foremost literary honor in India. Foremost literary honor in India. Clear. It covers a cash prize. Cash prize of rupees 1 lakh. And a citation. That is plaque. Sanad. And a citation. Clear. And a citation. Clear. The Sahit Academy also awards Bhasa Samman for the significant literary contribution to languages other than 24 languages and a prize and a prize for translation. Clear. So apart from this award, Sahit Academy Award, there's another award given by Sahit given given in literary field, and this award is known as Bhasha Samman. Clear. This award is known as Bhasha Samman. And this award is given to lit, given for literary contribution to languages other than 24 languages. Clear? So other than these 24 languages which are included Sahit Academy Award, other languages beyond 24 are recognized through Bhasa Samman Award given by Government of India. Then we have also Bal Sahit Purashkar. Then we have Bal Sahit Purashkar. Bal Sahit Puraskar, clear. Bal Sahit Puraskar Award for Children Book, clear. And Yuva Puraskar for Indian Authors, clear. And then we also have Yuva Puraskar for Youths or Youth Writers, clear. So, three major awards, four major awards. Sahit Academy Award is the largest or foremost literary honor in a country. Crash prize of rupees 1 lakh given annually and along with citation for 24 languages. Then we have Bhasa Samman Award for those writers who are beyond 24 languages. Then we have Bal Sahit Puraskar and Yuva Puraskar, clear. These are literary awards. Apart from this, clear, next major award, literary award is Gyan Pit Award, clear. Another award is known as Gyan Peet Award, known as Gyan Peet Award, clear? And this Gyan Peet Award is another prestigious award conferred by Bharatiya Gyan Peet since 1965 for outstanding contribution towards literature. So, this award has been given since 1965 for outstanding contribution to language and literature. Clear? Every year, only one Gyan Pit Award comprising cash prize of rupees 11 like a citation, citation plaque and a statue of Goddess Saraswati is awarded to Indian writer for writing in any of the Indian languages including in, included in 8th schedule of the Indian constitution and in English. Clear? So, this award is basically given, given only to one person in a year. Clear? So, only one person annually, only one person annually, only one person annually, cash price 11 lakh and citation, Sanad. Citation plaque is given and Sanad is given, clear. Citation plaque is given, citation plaque is given and statue of Goddess Saraswati. A statue of Goddess Saraswati. God, statue of Goddess Saraswati is given, clear. And this award is given for all the 22 languages. All the 22 languages, all the 22 languages in 8th schedule of the Indian Constitution and English, even English also, altogether 23 languages. 
and in English. Okay. The Bharti Gyan Pit Award is a research and culture institute founded in 1944 by Sahu Shanti Prasad Jain, an industrialist. Okay. So, Bharti Gyan Pit as an organization was founded in 1944 by an industrialist known as Sahu Shanti Prasad Jain. Okay. This is another award given for literary personalities. Next award is known as Murti Devi Award. Next is Murti Devi Award. Murti Devi Award. Clear? This award is granted by Bharatiya Gyanpeet for a work which emphasizes on Indian culture and philosophy. So this award is given to those workers, those writers who emphasize on Indian culture and philosophy. Next is Saraswati Saman. Next is Saraswati Saman. Given to literary personalities, Saraswati Samman is, is another prestigious award for contribution to prose or poetry in any of the 22 languages of 8th schedule of the Indian constitution. So, this is also given to the contribution towards the scheduled languages of India, that is 22 languages and it was instituted in 1991. This award was instituted in 1991 by K.K. Berla Foundation. This award was instituted, instituted in 1991 by K.K. Virla Foundation and it covers a cash prize, cash prize of rupees 10 lakhs, cash prize of rupees 10 lakhs, a citation, clear, along with a citation also, Sanad also. Clear? This is Saraswati Samman. So, four awards are there. Sahit Academy Award, the foremost one. Then we have Gyanpit Award. Then we have Murti Devi Award. And then at the, have, at the end, we have Saraswati Samman Award. Clear? So, these are growth and development related to language and literature that you should know before coming examination. Clear? Sir Kazi Nusul Sam was born in India and died in Bangladesh. So, why he was called the national poet of Bangladesh, not India? Because at the same time, clear, his composition became large acceptable he was in eastern part of Bengal that became part of East Pakistan so obviously in pre-independent era he was considered to be Indian poet in po after partition Bangladesh declared him to be national poet of India because most of his composition were written in pure Bengali language and all these compositions became popular in eastern part of Bengal presently known as Bangladesh clear so these are major developments related to language and literature clear so very important one that is language and literature clear now before at the same time clear we need to discuss about something which has been basically marked by 100 years 125 years to understand about them they are very important one clear first of all coming to the, the centenary celebration clear do remember for coming examination clear first is first of all starting with 100 years clear Vaikom Satyagra. Vaikom Satyagra has completed a centenary, 100 years. Completed centenary in 2024. Vaikom Satyagraha was started in 1924, clear, and it was started in Kerala and Tamil Nadu, basically for temple entry for untouchables, clear. Vaikom Satyagraha is very important, and just to mark the completion of 100 years, clear, Vaikom Award would be presented on E.V. Ramaswamy Naikar's birth anniversary, and this birth anniversary is on September 17, 2023. So, to mark the centenary of Vakom Satyagraha, an award has been instituted which would be presented on the birth anniversary of a great leader of Vakom Satyagraha, E. V. Ramaswamy Naikar. Okay. So, E. V. Ramaswamy Naikar's, also known as PR, birth anniversary will be celebrated every year 17th of September an award has been instituted since 2023 clear at the same time clear the Bakom Satyagraha was started in 1924 in the present region of Kerala and it was started by leaders like TK Madhavan it was started by TK leaders like 
टी के माधवन टी के माधवन के पी के स्वामेनन के पी के स्वामेनन एंड के केलापन एंड के केलापन क्लियर के केलापन दिस अस बेक इंपोर्टेंट क्लियर एंड एट द सेम टाइम क्लियर अल्टीमेटली in 9 ultimately it became a successful movement in 1923 at the behest of tk madhavan only who was the leader clear at the kaki nada session of indian national congress congress anti untouchability was raised as a major issue clear so in the year 1923 kaki nada session was convened in which they declared about major development to promote the interest of the untouchables clear so for at the forefront vacuum satyagraha he was ev ramaswami naikar played important role and we all know ep ramaswami naikar also started self respect movement we had discussed earlier in 1924 and also began to publish a paper kudi arasu to highlight the condition of untouchables and he is also known as periyar pure soul so 100 years of vaikom satyagraha very important one in contemporary times clear and just after few years in 1931 guru vayur satyagraha was held and in guru vayur satyagraha also the leaders were same tk madhavan menon kp keswa menon and k kalappan very important developments in kerala centenary of vaikom satyagraha clear so came into temple entry movement and in fact you should know kerala became the first state to grant temple entry for temple entry for depressed classes or untouchables clear very important one that you should remember it's a very important development clear at the same time another major development is related to sir sayed ahmed khan clear sir sayed ahmed khan Sir Syed Ahmed Khan, clear. Sir Syed Ahmed Khan, very important one, clear. And two in two thousand twenty-three. In two thousand twenty-three, we marked the one twenty-fifth death anniversary of Sir Syed Ahmed Khan. One twenty-fifth death anniversary of Sir Syed Ahmed Khan. Be prepared about this. Especially related to Aligarh Muslim University also, because the reason is Aligarh Muslim University and the minority status is being declared at this time. Clear. And Sir Syed Ahmed Khan played a very important role in order to promote the interest of education among Muslim masses in India. He began to establish Mohammedan literary, scientific literary society. He also established Mohammedan Anglo Oriental College that got converted into Aligarh Muslim University in 1920. He also began to publish a work, Tehzibul Akhlaq. All these we had already. Done, but for your remembrance, to reinforce the thing, he we are celebrating 125th death anniversary of Sir Syed Ahmed Khan. Clear? Then Rani Durgaavati we had discussed. We have celebrated 500th birth anniversary of Rani Durgaavati, known as Virangana Rani Durgaavati. Clear? Then at the same time, coming to another great personality, Sri Aurobindo Ghosh. Sri Aurobindo Ghosh. We have discussed about all these personalities. I am reinforcing because of their importance. Clear? Sri Aurobindo Ghosh. Clear? In fact, Sri Aurobindo Ghosh. Clear? He was. We have celebrated year-long celebration for 150th birth anniversary of Sri Aurobindo Ghosh. Year-long celebration was organized. Clear? Birth anniversary of. Sri Aurobindo Ghosh. We have discussed about this personality. Clear, Aurobindo Ghosh. Very important one. Clear, and he established ashram at Pondicherry. Clear, this person considered to be very important. He was established Anushilan Samiti in 1902. He was participated in Swad Swadeshi movement during after partition of Bengal. He was also involved in Alipur conspiracy case in 1908. Clear, he also wrote a work New Lamps for the Old. All these are considered to be very important. And one, and this is very considered to be clear. He founded ashram, Sri Aurobindo Ashram, in 1926 with Mira Alfasa. Clear. In fact, Mira Alfasa founded Oroville, that is the city of Down. Clear. So Sri Aurobindo Ghosh established his ashram, Sri Aurobindo Ashram, in 1926 at Pondicherry, in which he was supported by Mira Alfasa. He was supported by Mira. 
अल्फासा क्लियर मीरा अल्फासा हु ऑल्सो फाउंडेड और मीरा अल्फासा फाउंडेड और दैट इज द सिटी ऑफ डाउन क्लियर सो वन फिफ्टी एथ बर्थ एनिवर्सरी ऑफ श्री अरबिंदो घोष क्लियर बी पेपेड अबाउट दिस अमिंग टू अनदर पर्सनैलिटी स्वामी दयानंद सरस्वती स्वामी दयानंद सरस्वती ऑल्सो नोन एज मूल शंकर वाई इज इंपॉर्टेंट इन न्यूज वी आर सेलिब्रेटिंग टू हंड्रेड बर्थ एनिवर्सरी टू हंड्रेड बर्थ एनिवर्सरी ऑफ स्वामी दयानंद सरस्वती सो बी प्रिपेयर अबाउट दिस क्लियर ही वॉज बॉर्न ऑन एटीन ट्वेंटी फोर सो टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी फोर मार्क्स मार्क्स टू हंड्रेड बर्थ एनिवर्सरी हु रोड सत्यार्थ प्रकाश वी हेड डिस्कस दिस क्वेश्चन वॉज ऑल्सो गिवन टू यस टडे ही ऑल्सो स्टैब इज आर समाज ही गेव द स्लोगन ऑफ गो बैक टू द वेदास ही स्टैब इज द सुधि मूवमेंट वी हेड डिस्कस एवरीथिंग जस्ट टू री इनफोर्स वी आर सेलिब्रेटिंग टू हंड्रेड बर्थ एनिवर्सरी ऑफ स्वामी दयानंद सरस्वती क्लियर सॉरी सरस्वती दीज आर वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट वन दैट नीड्स टू understood all these concept of important then we have basically all these persons that contributed towards independence and socio cultural upliftment of indian society clear so 200th birth anniversary 150th birth anniversary 125th death anniversary 100th or centenary celebration by kom satyagra be prepared about them any related question can be asked in prelims examination we had already done with this topics clear so these were major developments now after this clear now we'll discuss about some other major developments related to culture we'll discuss about major cultural institutions and their works and at the same time clear cultural institutions and the works are very important and then we'll go to discuss about gi tax also these are very important developments so coming to the major cultural institutions institution of cultural instead clear so cultural institutions and their salient aspect of the work clear so coming to cultural institutions the founding year and description so coming to all major institutions okay so first is cultural institutions then we have founding year then we have year of establishment and then description and then we have will have description clear so year of foundation and then cultural institutions coming to cultural institutions the year of establishment and its description we'll discuss about all these cultural institutions then we'll move on to discuss about cultural awards also starting with bharat ratna very important one as you all know recent this year we have announced five bharat ratna for different personalities clear so all these then we'll come to cultural policies also corporate social responsibility also all major developments so first of all cultural institutions year and description clear cultural institutions year of establishment and the description about those institutions they are very important from our examination perspective any institution can be asked so we look into all major prominent cultural institutions along with the year of establishment and description clear the starting number 1 first is the asiatic society of bengal asiatic society of bengal it was established in 1784 okay so asiatic society of bengal was established in 1784 and this institution was established to promote indological studies okay it was founded by sir william jones who was an officer of british east india company and the purpose was to organize organize promote and collect ancient manuscripts and studies related to ancient india and at the same time to promote indological studies okay next major institution was indian museum indian museum at calcutta or present kolkata 
so indian museum at calcutta established in 1814 1814 and the purpose was basically to establish by asiatic society of bengal only clear but now a self governing institution under ministry of culture so it comes under ministry of culture and it basically preserves conserves and publishes various works clear related to cultural sections like archaeology geology zoology economic botany art and anthropology clear so it comes under ministry of culture ministries are asked so it comes under ministry of culture and it basically pro pro protect and collect all major information related to ancient and related to art crafts anthropology economics botany and zoology clear next major institution is archaeological survey of india archaeological survey of india it was established in 1861 archaeological survey of india and it was established by general alexander cunningham clear so person who established archaeological survey of india was alexander cunningham and it also comes under ministry of culture in india so it also comes under ministry of culture in india and it is basically related to promotion related to archaeological research and foundation in order to know about the past traditions of india based on archaeological evidences next major is anthropological survey of india fourth is anthropological anthropological survey of india anthropological survey of india it was established in 1945 just before india's independence it also comes under ministry of culture and it is basically to collect preserve and maintain document related to artistic crafts tribes and human skeletons clear so it also comes under ministry of culture so it is also placed in the ministry of culture coming to the fifth organization fifth organization is national museum of india new delhi national museum of india national museum of india new delhi so indian museum is at kolkata national museum is at new delhi so national museum in new delhi 1949 1949 it also comes under ministry of culture and national museum is basically it has more than 2.6 lakh art objects dating back to prehistoric era the dancing girl the priest of harappan civilization included the national museum of history art conservation museology established 1989 is located in these premises okay so obviously national museum of india in new delhi is a very prominent institution and this institution also has national museum of history art conservation and museology established in 1989 so it also has national it comes under ministry of culture it also has national it also has national museum of history art national museum of history national museum of history art conservation and museology conservation and museology conservation and museology established in 1989 this comes under the premises of national museum of india at new delhi clear so these are very prominent institution year of establishment the function the ministry also after fifth one coming to the sixth one coming to the sixth one clear sixth major institution is national gallery of modern art new delhi national gallery of modern art national gallery of modern art at new delhi 
National Gallery of Modern, of Modern Art New Delhi established in 1954. Established in 1954. It is also under Ministry of Culture. It is also it also comes under Ministry of Culture and it con contains collection of artists like Thomas Daniel, Abhinandanath Tagore, Raja Ravi Verma, Amrita Shergill and Rabindranath Tagore. We had discussed about the works of all these painters of modern India as well as the medieval times and they all the works have been preserved at National Gallery of Modern Art which was established in 1954. Then we have got Indira Gandhi National. Indra Gandhi National Indra Gandhi National Center for the Arts Indra Gandhi National Center for the Arts Indra Gandhi National Center for the Arts established in 1985 established in 1985 it is an autonomous institution and it is research conserve and display disseminate arts to major research center organizes national seminars also it is an autonomous institution it is an autonomous institution coming to the eighth one clear then we have the all india radio all India Radio. It is also known as Akashwani. All India Radio Akashwani. Established in 1930. Established in 1930. Now, under the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, it comes under Ministry of Information. and broadcasting it comes under information of ministry ministry of information and broadcasting broadcasting clear and at the same time clear came the comes it is basically it demographically reaches to 99.19 percent of population with programming in about 23 languages has three sections drama FM and national services. Clear? So, All India Radio. In fact, found in 1930, the Prasar Bharti Act of 1990 amended it for greater autonomy. So, greater autonomy has been given with, give, given to it by Prasar Bharti Act 1990. Clear? So, this is regulatory body known as Prasar Bharti Act. Prasar Bharti Act of 1990. Clear? All India Radio. Then we have Nehru Memorial. Ninth one is Nehru Memorial, Nehru Memorial, Museum and Library, Nehru Memorial, Museum and Library, Museum and Library, established in 1930. Established in 1930, 1930, and it comes under Ministry of Culture. It comes under Ministry of Culture, Ministry of Culture, built as part of Lutian's design or for the imperial capital. The building was called Teen Murti House. Clear? This building was also called as Teen Murti House. Also called as Teen Murti House. Clear? Teen Murti, Murti House. Clear? The digitization process of Nehru Memorial Museum started in. 2010. Clear? Okay? This is very important one. This is ninth one. Coming to the tenth one. Okay? Coming to the tenth institution. The tenth institution is Center for Cultural Resources and Training. Center for Cultural Resources Center for Cultural Resources and Training. Center for Cultural Resources and Training, CCRT, established in 1979. It established in the year 1979. 
1979 it is largely it comes under a ministry of culture same it comes under ministry of culture and it is basically headquartered in delhi with regional libraries are guwahati udaipur and hyderabad clear headquarters delhi is delhi but it has regional centers at guwahati regional centers at guwahati udaipur regional centers at guwahati udaipur and hyderabad regional centers at guwahati udaipur and hyderabad the main center and delhi clear ccrt then we have national archives of india 11th is the national archives of india national archives of india it was established in 1891 clear it established in 1891 but opened for the public in 1939 so it was opened for the public in 1939 was established in 1891 clear that is it was created by british to keep administrative records clear so initially established by british to keep administrative records so it was not open for public it was made open to public in 1939 a conservation conservation research laboratory was added in 1940 acquisition of public records and private collections were added headquartered in delhi regional centers at bhubneswar jaipur and puducherry okay so it has regional centers at regional centers at puducherry regional centers headquartered in delhi but regional centers at puducherry jaipur and bhubneswar puducherry jaipur and bhubneswar and bhubneswar clear bhubneswar clear national museum clear this is a very important one clear in fact to establish the national mission for manuscripts with a database of millions of scripts this also under the ministry of culture and tourism digitization of archival process is under way clear then at the same time we have 12th one 12th one is to a kalakshetra foundation kalak kshetra foundation kalakshetra foundation which was established in 1936 kalakshetra foundation 1936 clear established by rukmini devi arundel very important one established by rukmini devi arundel established by rukmini devi arundel clear and at the same time clear it is basically a center for bharatnatyam noted for straight angular and ballet like nastya clear so important for kalakshetra artist activities like bharatnatyam rukmini devi largely promoted this classical dance of bharatnatyam kalakshetra foundation foundation then we have indian council for cultural relations 13 is indian council for cultural relations indian council for cultural relations or iccr clear it was established in 1950 established in 1950 indian council for cultural relations it also comes under ministry of culture comes under the ministry of culture it was basically established by maulana abul kalam azad to promote cultural relationship between india and other countries of the world clear and it promotes major functions like the functions like jazz festival in new delhi and northeast music festival as well clear then after this we have indian council for historical research we have indian council for historical research indian council for historical research or ichr indian council for historical research was established in 
established in 1972. It's an autonomous organization that draws funds from University Grants Commission. So it's basically draws funds from University Grants Commission. Clear. Comes to it promote and preserves Indian history, organizes seminars, conferences, journal publications. Clear. In order to support scholars related to historical research. Clear. So it's an autonomous body that takes funds from University Grants Commission. Indian Council for Historical Research. 14. Clear. Coming to the 15th one. Clear. Coming to The 15th one, clear. After ICGR, clear. We have Directorate of Film Festival, Directorate of, of Film Festival, Directorate of Film Festival established in 1973. Established 1973 under Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, under Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, Information of Ministry of Information and Broadcasting to promote cultural exchange through medium of film, organize national and international film festivals, clear, and at the same time, clear, including Dada Sai Falke Award, screenings and maintenance of large archive clear this is directorate of film festival film festival 16th one is the crafts council of india crafts council crafts council of india crafts council of india 1976 Crafts Council of India, non-profit affiliated with World Crafts Council. It's a non-profit organization. It's a non-profit organization affiliated to World Crafts Council to preserve and develop handicraft industry. Establish a series of shops that displays arts and crafts named Kamla after the founder of Kamla Chattopadhyay. So this was founded by Kamla Chattopadhyay. Founded by Kamla Chattopadhyay, founded by Kamla Chattopadhyay. Then we have Indian National Trust. Then we have Indian National Trust. We have Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage, for Art and cultural heritage art and cultural heritage clear it's known as intac indian national trust for art and cultural heritage established in nine established in 1984 established in 1984 it's a non-profit ngo it's a non-profit NGO, non-governmental organization to spare awareness related to heritage, especially those moment, mom, monuments outside ASI purview. Clear? Support heritage walk, reconciling tourism with conservation. Clear? Then at the same time, we have Sahit Academy. 18th one is Sahit Academy. Clear? Sahit Academy. This Sahit Academy is also known as the National Academy of Letters. It is also known as National Academy of Letters. National Academy of Letters. 1954. We had discussed this earlier also. 1954. It is an autonomous organization. It is an autonomous organization to promote literary culture and activities in 24 languages, 22 from scheduled languages and two other languages being English and Rajasthani and to give awards also related to great contributions in the field of literary activities in these 24 languages. We had already done. Then we have Sangeet Natak Academy, 18th, the 19th. 
then ninth in this sangeet natak academy sangeet natak academy sangeet natak academy established in 1952 established in 1952 clear now this is the first national academy set up for arts music dance and drama by government of india to promote research established centers with theaters promote literature folk traditions and cultural activities national school of drama was set up in 1959 by the academy clear so this academy only established the national school of drama in 1959 so national school of drama yesterday only we discussed that promote leaders like om puri nasruddin sa they played very important role so national school of drama was established by Na Sangeet Natak Academy in 1959. Okay, 1959. In 1970, it became an independent entity under Ministry of Culture. So after some years, in 1975, NSD became independent. So in 1975, NSD became independent under Ministry of Culture. Okay. Then at the same time, 20th, we have Lalit Kala Academy. We have Lalit Kala. we have lalit kala academy or national academy of art 1954 lalit kala academy or national academy of 1954 clear autonomous body funded by ministry of culture so it's autonomous body funded by ministry of culture founded by ministry of culture to promote understanding and practices of fine arts in india organizes national exhibitions of arts international organizing seminars and at the same time promote national artists these are prominent institutions apart from this we have national mission for manuscripts 21 we have national mission for manuscripts national mission for manuscripts established in 2003 established in 2003 through the it is established under ministry of culture ministry of culture and it is basically to unearth and preserve the wealth of manuscripts of india locating documenting preserving and enabling access to the documents national mission for manuscripts then we have national book trust national book trust established in 1957 National Book Trust established in 1957 as an autonomous organization to promote. It is also autonomous organization. Autonomous organization. National Book Trust to promote to to promote production of good books and literature for availability at a low cost and wider dissemination. Okay, so it is largely to promote publishing and publishing and writing of major works related to literary learning and that too at low cost in order to promote dissemination of knowledge and information. That is NBT or National Book Trust. Okay, so these are prominent institutions to be known. Clear okay? all the. These are very prominent one, and these institutions should know along with years and description as well, and affiliating body also UGC or its Ministry of Information Broadcasting or it is Ministry of Culture. Clear? So all this, all this information should also be known. Clear? These are about institutions. Now after institutions, we'll look into the we'll we'll look into some fairs and festivals also before we go to discuss about. Cultural awards, clear. Now coming to fairs and festival, sir. Please provide contact number. I'll give you contact number. Remind me at the end of the session, clear. Now coming to coming to major fairs and festivals, clear. See, uh, we won't be discussing about the fair festivals like Diwali, the Shahera, Eid, and other festivals that which are common, clear. Questions may not be asked from common festivals, but the festivals which are very important culturally for us, clear, will be. I have selected some of those festivals. We'll be discussing about those festivals which are very important one, and some of them are going as of now also in in present times. We'll come to these festivals first of all, major cultural festivals. fairs and festivals fairs and 
festivals which are very important for examination coming to fairs and festivals first of all we need to discuss about a festival which is known as full walo ki sher full walo ki sher full walo ki sher which is also known as sher e gul firoshta this festival is also known as sher e gul sher e gul farosha sher e gul farosha it's a very important festival it is celebrated is known as festival of flowers which is celebrated in old delhi region is festival of flowers celebrated in old delhi region and it is basically to emphasize on communal harmony the basic theme of this festival is to promote communal harmony full walo ki sair sair e gul farosha clear then we have beating of retreat another important festival celebrated recently beating of retreat also known as beating retreat clear beating of retreat it is beating retreat that is military ceremony this is a military ceremony this is a military ceremony which is held on 29th of january every year after four years of republic day festivals the bands of all the three wings of armed forces perform this day there is armed forces naval forces and air force clear so it's beating retreat ceremony organized on 29th of january every year do just conclude the festivities of republic day are which is celebrated every year on 26th of january clear another festival which is very important culturally this festival is known as batkama or bathukamma batkama also known as bathukamma also known as bathukamma also known as bathu kamma this is a this is a floral festival which is celebrated by hindu women floral festival celebrated by hindu women in telangana is celebrated in, by hindu women in telangana state of telangana region clear then we have dessert festival we have dessert festival dessert festival which is celebrated in jaisalmer every year it is celebrated in jaisalmer every year every year in february and it is basically a mix of cultural events camel races and various competitions clear so dessert festival celebrated every year in february in the region of jaisalmer by camel drivers clear this festival then we have kumbh mela fifth is kumbh mela which is also included in the list of intangible world heritage site we had discussed yesterday 15 sites 15 intangible world heritage world heritage we had discussed yesterday For all of them 15 the latest entry being garba from gujarat all 15 we had the list one among them is the kumbh mela kumbh mela is celebrated it's a hindu pilgrimage pilgrimage festival and it is celebrated on the banks of sacred river the four kumbh melas haridwar kumbh prayag kumbh then we have nasing kumbh and then ujjain clear so these are four locations where kumbh mela is organized these kumbh melas are organized at haridwar on the banks of river ganges then prayag on the banks of or on the confluence of ganga yamuna and saraswati yes saraswati is dried up it is known as mahakumbh then we have ujjain on the banks of river shipra and then we have after ujjain we have another this another place at nasik on the banks of river godavari so four locations where this festival is celebrated that is haridwar on banks of river ganga prayag on the confluence of ganga and yamuna ujjain on the banks of shipra nashik on the banks of godavari and these four kumbh melas are held in rotation usually after three years and once in 12 years in a place clear then we have ganga sagar mela then we have ganga sagar mela 
Ganga Sagar Mela. It is this this fair is held in on Ganga Sagar Island on the 10th of day of Makar Sakranti, that is 14th of January. On this day, a large number of Hindu pilgrims gather on this island to take a holy dip on the confluence of River Ganga with the Bay of Bengal. Yeah. So on the confluence of River Ganga with Bay of Bengal, this festival is celebrated in the region of in the region of West Bengal. It's known as Ganga Sagar Mela, which is organized on Makar Sakranti, 14th of January every year. Then we have Pushkar Mela. We have seventh one is Pushkar Mela. Pushkar Mela, which is organized. Pushkar Mela is organized in Rajasthan. It's a fair of camels and other livestock. Clear? So Pushkar Mela in Rajasthan. It is a fair of for camels and other livestock population. The event is held annually for a period of five days in the month of Kartik. That is October and November. Hindu devotees and take a holy dip in the Pushkar Lake and pay obeisance to Lord Brahma, the creator of universe. Because we have only one temple devoted to Lord Brahma and that temple is located at Pushkar in Rajasthan. Okay. In fact, there are some festivals or some activities which are very popular in Pushkar Mela and that is known as Matka 4. Matka 4 is a very prominent thing in Pushkar Fair which is organized. Then at the stretching of mustaches also with mustache they think or they rather they carry heavy metals also. All these are activities performed at Pushkar Fair organized in Rajasthan. Okay. Then we have Sonpur Mela. Then we have Sonpur Mela. This Sonpur Mela is organized. Okay. Sonpur Mela is the largest cattle fair of Asia, which is organized in Bihar. So, this Sonpur Mela is organized in Bihar. It is the largest cattle fair. Is It is the largest cattle fair. Largest cattle fair of Asia, clear. Cattle fair of Asia. It is also organized in the month of Karthik in November for nearly a month, clear. So Pushkar Mela is for camels and livestock. Sonpur is basically largely for cattle. Largest cattle fair in Asia is Sonpur Mela. Then we have Rajas. Then we have Nagar Mela. After this we have ninth one is Nagar Mela. Nagar Mela. It's also organized in Nagar in Rajasthan. This is also a fair of cattle and other elements, other animals. Clear? So it is organized in Rajasthan and it is also a cattle fair. Also a cattle fair. Clear? Nagar Mela. After this Nagar Mela, clear? We have another Mela that is going on in these days. This Mela is known as the Suraj Kund International Craft Mela. Suraj Kund International Suraj Kund International Craft Mela Suraj Kund is a very prominent one. Clear? Suraj Kund International Craft Mela the 37th edition of this Mela is being organized these days. Suraj Kunt International Craft Mela. It is organized in Faridabad, Haryana. It is organized in Faridabad, Haryana. This year, 37th edition of this Mela is being organized at Suraj Kunt in modern Haryana. Clear. It is going on since 2nd of February. It will continue till 18th of February. Clear. Theme is state of this fair this time. The theme is state is Gujarat. This is very important. Theme is state of 37 Suraj Kud Mela is the state of Gujarat. This one thing. Another information to be known is that partner nation is there is a partner nation to this Mela because it is an international craft Mela. Partner nation is Tanzania, Republic of Tanzania. Partner nation this time is Tanzania. Clear? So it is going on since 2nd of February. It will continue till 18th of February 2024. It's a 37th edition. Theme state is Gujarat. Partner nation is Tanzania. Clear? This very important one. Clear? More than 50 countries are participating. So this also should be noted that more than 50 countries are participating this year in the Suraj Kund International.
craft mela clear another mela that is basically going on and that started today itself clear in delhi and that festival is known as adi mahotsav that is known as adi mahotsav clear this adi mahotsav is basically celebration of tribal entrepreneurship 10th of february today only start it had started at delhi clear it has been inaugurated by sripati Srimati Draupadi Murmu, the President of India. It's basically a festival of tribal, festival of tribal entrepreneurship. Festival to celebrate tribal entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, crafts, culture, and cuisine. Crafts, culture. cuisine crafts culture cuisine and even commerce crafts culture cuisine and commerce and commerce clear it has been inaugurated today by president of india president of india in the dhyan chand national stadium near india gate clear so very important one clear this is also known as adi mahotsav tribal entrepreneurship crafts culture cuisine and commerce major festivals that are important from our examination perspective clear so these major things to be known clear apart from this clear one shika so please explain the meaning of autonomous organized non pro autonomous means they are free they can take their own decisions clear even though they can take fund from organizations but at the same time they are free without interference of any ministry or government they can take their own decision internal autonomy is given to them non profit means the purpose is not to earn profit by any activity the purpose is basically to serve and to spread the message related to cultural awareness clear so not for any commercial activities but for promoting the cultural awareness among the people clear now apart from this clear now we'll discuss about uh, discuss about some major calendars also calendars in india now what are the major calendars followed in india clear coming to some calendars also so calendars in india followed in india calendars in india the first or the most popular calendar that is followed is in india is the gregorian calendar the gregorian calendar the gregorian calendar which has 365 days and 12 months clear with months having 30 and 31 days except february clear so this is known as gregorian calendar this gregorian calendar was introduced in 1582 by Pope Gregory 813 who made modification to the then existing Julian calendar clear so Julian calendar was followed in then it was exposed or rather it was followed followed by Gregorian calendar so Gregorian calendar has 365 days 12 months each month with 30 31 days except February it was introduced in 1582 by Pope Gregory 1582 by Pope Gregory 13th. Pope Gregory 13th. It was in Pope Gregory 13th that replaced the existing Julian calendar. So Julian calendar was replaced by the Gregorian calendar. There's one thing, the Gregorian calendar. Second calendar that is followed in there is the Shuk calendar. The Shuk calendar, clear, which was started from 78 AD by ruler of ancient India, Akhnanesh, clear, the Shuk calendar. Shuk calendar just starts 78 AD. It's basically lunar solar calendar. It's basically lunar solar calendar. lunar solar calendar that also comprises of 2365-2012 months starting with 22nd of March after equinox clear then at the same time we have Vikram Sambhat calendar third is Vikram Sambhat calendar 
Vikram Samvat calendar that started around 57 BC. Started around 57 by Vikram, who also took the title of Vikram Aditya. Clear. This year is of 354 days. In this calendar, the year is of 354 days. Clear. 352 days, while 12 months are lunar. Clear. So these are 12 months. This is a lunar calendar, pure, not lunar and solar. Lunar calendar comprising of 354 days in a year, year along with 12 days clear the deficit of 11 days is made by adding up an extra month called adhika mass clear so difference of 11 days because there are 65 days so difference of 11 days leads to another month and this month is known as adhika mass adha mass this is managed by a separate month known as Adhika mass, Adha mass, half month, clear. This is known as Vikram Sambhat, comprising of 354 days, clear. There's one thing at the same time. Another calendar is known as Hijri calendar, largely followed by Islamic people. Hijri calendar, Hijri calendar that started in 622 AD. Clear. That is a lunar calendar. Lunar calendar. It also has 365 days, but at the same time, the month is either 29 or 30 days. It's not 31 days in this lunar calendar. Then fifth one is known as Nanak Sahi calendar. Nanak Shahi calendar followed largely by Sikh community. This calendar also has 365 days. Clear? But at the same and 12 months, but at the same time, it is basically 11 months that is counted as 30 months. So initially, initially, this is 11 months, that is 7 months are counted as with 30 days. Clear. And remaining 5 months are counted as 31 days in Nanak Sahi calendar. So these are different calendars also that you should know the Gregorian calendar, the Shaka calendar, Vikram Sambhat, Hijri calendar and Nanak Sahi calendar. Different calendars as well. Clear? This one thing, very important one. So all these calendars should be known. These are very important developments clear, apart, related to calendars. Clear? So calendaring is also important and these calendarings must be known to everyone because they are very important developments related to the major religions also. Clear? The major religious fair also clear. This one thing clear. It's clear. All the calendars. Now coming to. Hemis Gompa Mela. Please elaborate sir. Hemis Gompa Fair or Hemis Gompa Festival is celebrated annually on the 10th day of C2 month. Clear. So Hemis Gompa. Hemis Gompa Fair or festival is celebrated on the 10th day. Is celebrated on the 10th day of C2 month. 10th day of C2 month. Clear? C2 month. Clear? Which is the lunar month of Tibetan calendar. Which is a lunar month. of Tibetan calendar clear lunar month of Tibetan calendar clear it is celebrated for two days and marks the birth anniversary of Guru Padma Sambhava clear celebrated for two days and it is marks the it marks the birth anniversary of Guru Padma Sambhava it marks the birth ceremony of a birth anniversary of Guru Padma Sambhava, who is considered to be the founder of Tibetan Buddhism. Guru Padma Sambhava. Clear? So this is known as this is known as known as Guru Hemis Gompa. Clear? This is known as Hemis Gompa festival, and it is largely celebrated in the region of obviously Ladakh. 
Ladakh is the major region where this festival is celebrated, known as Hemis Gopha by the Buddhist. Clear? This is Hemis Gopha calendar. Such so, Ishaka calendar gives you a similar structure, almost similar to calendar. Clear? But it is not as same. The similarities, but it is not same because most of, in both the calendar, 365 days are counted as the day of the month. Clear? This is one thing clear. Any other question? Bhaskara Vada Bhaskara Bhaskarab calendar. Bhaskarab calendar is a basically calendar that is lunar solar calendar largely announced followed in the region of Assam. Clear? So Assam has announced Bhaskara Bada calendar as official calendar. Clear? So Bhaskara Bada calendar. Bhaskara Bad calendar. Bhaskara Bad calendar. Bhaskara Bad calendar. Bhaskara Bad calendar is basically recently Assam government. It is largely followed in Assam. Assam government has declared it to be its official calendar. Official calendar and it is lunar solar calendar. Both it is lunar solar calendar clear it is was established by or rather it is based on a 7th century local ruler bhaskar varman clear so 7th century ruler bhaskar varman who was contemporary of harshwardhan clear so bhaskar varman sashank of bengal and harshwardhan were contemporary bhaskar varman started this calendar based on moon lunar and solar movements it is known as bhaskar calendar based on bhaskar varman clear and the gap between bhaskar and giruvan calendar is of 593 years clear so it's a gap of 593 years because it was started in 7th century AD. Clear? So this is known as Bhaskara calendar, which is followed in Assam. Recently, Assam government decided to declare this calendar as official calendar of Assam. It's clear. So these major developments related to calendaring also, which is a part of Indian culture. Now after calendaring, now we'll come to cultural awards also. Clear? Let us discuss about cultural awards. cultural awards clear now coming to cultural awards the most important or the highest civilian award which is given to indian which is given to people by government of india is obviously bharat ratna very much is news these days bharat ratna ratna this award was started in the year 1900 and 54 Bharat Ratna and this award is given for given in term given for recognition for exceptional service or performance of highest order the highest civilian award clear so Bharat Ratna is the highest civilian award Bharat Ratna is the highest civilian award there's one thing it is given for exceptional service exceptional service given for exceptional service or performance of highest order or performance of or performance of highest order performance of highest order this is the criteria clear award is given maximum to three nominees in a year so it can be given only to three nominees in a year clear so acting act, according to maximum of three nominees three persons can be nominated and at the same time there can be no, these three nominees can be awarded in a single year medal is given in the form of people leave which is given and people leave is given and there's no monetary grant given do remember no monetary grant a monetary prize is given into Bharat Ratna Awardi. It is only given a P a given as a given a award in form of a people leave on which superimposition of the state emblem is done. Clear. The first individual to reward to receive this award posthumously. This award was given to given to Lal Bahadur Shastri. In fact, if it is asked who was the first awardee of Bharat Ratna, clear. Then first awardee of Bharat Ratna was C V Raman. Clear. C V Raman was given the first award. Clear in the initial year itself. 
clear. But at the same time, the first person to be awarded posthumously was Lal Bahadur Shastri. The youngest person to be awarded was Sachin Tendulkar, the player, clear, the player. And at the same time, there was some non-Indians also has been given to the award, including two of them. And these two persons were Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan from Pakistan and Nelson Mandela from South Africa. Even though, clear, e even though another awardee was born in Albania, but this person, Mother Teresa, took the citizenship by naturalization in India and she belonged to the state of West Bengal. Clear. So, Bharat Ratna, clear. And in 2024, five persons has been nominated for Bharat Ratna by government of India. It started with Karpuri Thakur from Bihar, who was the 49th one, and the 50th person to be nominated for Bhatra is Lal Krishnadwani, and three other persons. These three persons are Chaudhary Charan Singh, P. V. Narsimha Rao, and M. S. Swaminathan. Claim. So, at the same time, this award has been given to 53 persons by this time. Claim. So, 53 persons has been given this award. The 50th one is Lal Krishnadwani, the 49th is Karpuri Thakur, and and three others being P. V. Narasimha Rao, M. S. Swaminathan, and P. V. Narasimha Rao, M. S. Swaminathan, M. S. Swaminathan, and Chaudhary Charan Singh, a former leader. Claim. Bharatan Award was originally limited to achievements in arts and literature. Yeah, it was amended. It was amended 2011, and then the criteria of exceptional service or performance of highest order has been allowed. Claim. So Bharat Ratan, this time it is five person nominated, which is the highest in a single year. Clear. And that has been announced by government of India recently. Clear. After Bharat Ratan, the next major award is Padma Awards. Clear. Now coming to Padma Awards. Padma Awards. Padma Awards were started again in 1954. Padma Awards were also started in 1954, announced on Republic Day every year for a work of distinction in a given field. So, these awards are announced, uh, announced on Republic Day every year for a work of distinction in any in given field. The President of India confers the award in a ceremony in Rashtrapati Bhavan and these awards coming to this. Clear? What are the major awards? First major is Padma Bibhushan. The first among them is Padma Bibhushan. Padma Bibhushan. It is the second highest civilian award after Bharat Ratna. It is the second highest civilian award after Bharat Ratna. Padma Bibhushan. Then we have Padma Bhushan. Then we have Padma Bhushan. Padma Bhushan, which is the third highest civilian award. Third highest civilian award, Padma Bhushan, and then we have Padma Shri. Then we have Padma Shri. Padma Shri is the fourth highest civilian honor, the fourth highest civilian order. Clear? This is basically work of distinction given by the President of India at Rashtrapati Bhavan, and this awards are announced on Republic Day. Clear? So. First highest civilian award is Bharat Ratna, then we have Padma Bhushan, then Padma Bhushan, then Padma Shri. Second, third and fourth highest civilian award are given by President of India. Even Bharat Ratna is given by President of India. Clear? Then we have National Film Awards. We have discussed this yesterday also, but do write here as well. National Film Awards. National Film Awards. This was started again in 1954. National Film Awards. Clear. Now coming to National Film Award. The President of India confers these awards in three sections under Swarn Kamal. Clear. So under Swarn Kamal, the award. The President of India gives this award. Uh, three awards are placed under Swarn Kamal. We had discussed this as Swarn Kamal and Rajat Kamal. Under Swarn Kamal, there are three awards. These three awards are for feature film, non-feature film for feature film then second is non feature film third is non feature film third is third is best writing on cinema clear best writing on cinema. These are all given Swarn Kamal then third award next award is remaining categories come under Rajat Kamal silver Lotus clear. Rest of the word comes under Rajat Kamal. 
सो टू मेजर फॉर्मेट ऑफ दिस अवार्ड स्वर्ण कमल एंड रजत कमल एंड दीज अवार्ड आर गिवेन कंप्राइज ऑफ अ सर्टिफिकेट ऑफ मेरिट अ मेडल एंड अ कैश प्राइज क्लियर डायरेक्टरेट ऑफ फिल्म फेस्टिवल हैज बीन मैनेजिंग द अवार्ड सेंस 1973 दीज अवार्ड्स आर मैनेज्ड बाय डायरेक्टरेट ऑफ फिल्म फेस्टिवल वी हैव डिस्कस्ड दैट ऑर्गेनाइजेशन डायरेक्टरेट ऑफ फिल्म फेस्टिवल स्टार्टेड इज इन 1973 क्लियर सो दीज अवार्ड्स clear so th that is national film film awards clear after this now we'll come to dada sahib phalke award fourth one dada sahib phalke award dada sahib phalke award started in 1969 and this award is the highest cinema award a lifetime achievement award given to film personality the director of film festival has been managing the awards clear so it's the highest cinema award it is the highest cinema award we had discussed the, this was first given to devika rani devika rani highest cinema award lifetime achievement award life time achievement award lifetime achievement award dada saheb phalke award then coming to the fifth one is sahitya academy award we had discussed about that sahitya academy award we had discussed about sahitya academy award elaborately clear this award is given for literary personalities and this award is given for 24 languages 22 from scheduled languages and two that is english and rajasthani languages clear recipients gives a cash prize of 1 lakh citation play clear and at the same time sahitya academy award also give bhasha samman award bhasha samman is followed by bal sahitya puraskar and then at the same time your yuva puraskar we had discuss all those awards clear so bhasha samman also then at the same time after bhasha samman we have yuva puraskar bal sahitya puraskar the sahitya academy is the highest award for literary activities we had discuss this award that was started again in 1954 clear sahitya academy award then we have gyan peet award we has we discuss about this also gyan peet award this gyan peet award started in 1965 we had discussed about this award as well which is also a literary award literary achievement given to the all the languages including the eighth schedule of the constitution along with english clear every year one gyan peet award is given and therefore recipient receives 1 lakh rupees not 11 lakh just make that correction we had written 11 lakh make it clear it's 1 lakh clear so 1 lakh of cash prize is given to gyan peet award 11 lakh clear it's not it's 1 lakh clear then we have saraswati samman then we had discuss about saraswati samman as well sir to saraswati samman was started in 1991 1991 and it is given by KK Birla Foundation. We have discussed that KK Birla Foundation. 22 languages of the Schedule to Constitution. Recipients get a cash prize of 10 lakhs and a citation and a play. Clear that is Sarsuti Amman. That Amman award. Then we have Vyas Amman. Then we have Vyas Amman. Vyas Amman was started in 1980. Vyas Samman was started in 1980. Vyas Samman is also instituted by KK Birla Foundation. This is a prestigious award for contribution to prose and poetry in Hindi language. Clear? So also by KK Birla Foundation, like Sarsuti Samman, KK Birla Foundation, and it is given for contribution to Hindi literature. Contribution towards Hindi language and literature. Then we have Kalidas Samman. Ninth is Kali Das Samman. Clear. Kali Das Samman was started in 2011. Kali Das Samman Award awarded to the field of classical dance, theatre, music, and art. And we have discussed earlier. This is related to dancers. This award is given by Government of Madhya Pradesh. Clear. Then we have Tagore Award. Then we have Tagore Award. Clear. Tagore Award is given. Our award is started in 2011. Clear, yeah? and this is given towards fostering harmony and universalism. First to be awarded was Pandit Ravi Shankar. Clear, yeah? this award was first given to Pandit 
Ravi Shankar, musician. Clear? We had discussed about he is also recipient of Bharat Ratna also. Pandit Ravi Shankar. We have discussed four musicians that has been given Pandit Rat, M. S. Subalakshmi, Bismillah Khan, Pandit Ravi Shankar. All these are also Bharat Ratna awardees. Clear? So these are some awards that has been given. Clear? So these awards should be known. Foundation given, who give the award, what are the cash prizes, who are basically, what are the criteria. Now, at the same time, clear? these awards are conferred within India, but at the same time, there are some awards that are given to Indians outside India also. Among them, the most important is the Raman Maxese Award. And Raman Maxese Award has been given to many persons from India, including Mahashweta Devi, Satyajit Ray, and TM Krishna. Clear? But these awards are given in India, they are more popular. Raman Maxese Award is given outside India clear so these are very important developments related to awards clear now after awards clear now we'll move on to discuss about the uh, and discuss about the GI tax as well clear so we need to discuss about the GI tax also what exactly do we mean by GI tax just understand about GI tax as well clear speak Mackey we had discussed about speak Mackey yesterday clear Speak Mackey was established or promoted as a non as an NGO non-profit organization NGO by Kiran Seth in 1977. Speak Mackey stands for Society for Promotion of Indian Classical Music and Culture Amongst Youth. Clear? This is the abbreviation. The acronym stands for Society for Promotion of Indian Classical Music and Culture Amongst Youth, established in 1977 by Queen Said, and that has been popularizing classical music, Hindustani music, among the youth of the country by performing musical programs in schools, colleges, universities, and other educational institutions. So, Speak Makay is a very important medium. Every day you will find in paper, and the performers are performing the role in leading universities, campuses, colleges to promote awareness about music among the youth of this country and therefore it stands for society for promotion of indian classical music and culture amongst youth in india clear now we'll come to another concept known as concept of geographical indicator or gi clear coming to the concept of geographical indicator or GI, also known as GI tag, geographical indicator or GI tag. Okay? Now, a geographical indicator tag is a sign used on products that have a specific geographical origin and possesses origin based qualities of the region. Clear? Okay? So, GI tag is a sign, GI tag is a sign. GI tag is a sign on products, not on services. Do remember, GI tag is a sign on products. GI tag is not given to services. It's also given to products. Clear? So, GI tag is a sign on products that have a specific geographical origin. A specific geographical origin. A specific geographical origin clear and at the same time possess origin based qualities clear and possess origin based qualities possesses origin based qualities of the region origin based qualities of the region origin with qualities of the region clear so it is both a certification and protection clear so it is an act of certification also and protection also so it is an act of certification and protection it is an act of certification and protection it can be given only to goods not to services make it clear clear only for goods and not for services do remember on not for services clear this is one thing clear at the same time clear this uh, the gi tags are given as per geographical indication of goods it is given as per 
all these regions points should you should know clear now it is given clear g i tag is given to the goods to the goods as per geographical indication as per geographical indication as for geographical indication of goods geographical indication of goods registration and protection registration and protection registration and protection act protection act 1999 so gi tags are given according to geographical indication of goods registration protection act 1919 that came into force that came into force in 2003 Came into force in 2003. Clear? And this is a part of this is a part of World Trade Organization Agreement on Intellectual Property. Clear? This is a part of World Trade Organization Agreement on Intellectual Property. Intellectual Property. Clear? intellectual property clear and at the same time gi tags are issued by geographical indication registry under the department of industry promotion and internal trade by ministry of commerce and industry clear so this is done in india by ministry of ministry of commerce and industry ministry of commerce and industry clear industry clear and the first thing that was given gi tag in india in 2004-5 was darjeeling tea clear so the first product that was given gi tag was jar darjeeling tea so darjeeling tea was the first product first product given gi tag given gi tag in 2004 and 5 clear it was darjeeling tea clear at the same time clear the gi tag enables the right holders to use the indication to prevent its use by third party whose product does not belong to the particular region and does not have required quality standards clear this can and this can be renewed after every 10 years so gi tag or certification can be renewed after 10 years clear this is the benefit of gi tags it can be renewed after 10 years maximum gi registered food items are from west bengal clear maximum maximum gi tag from west bengal when we go clear west bengal and at the same time large number of products are still being given gi tag clear so every state has one or the other gi tag clear jammu and kashmir has kashmir has basically kashmir pashmina kashmiri saffron himachal pradesh has kullu shawl kangra tea even kangra paintings also then delhi punjab and hanya we have phoolkari uttar pradesh we have banaras brockets and sarees lucknow chicken craft all these comes under the they have a long list related to gi tag but all these factors points you should know related to gi indicator clear but there is one thing that has been news in recent time related to controversy between between two states related to gi tag and these two states are basically west bengal and odisha and what is that product for leading to controversy will come to that product clear first is basically there has west bengal and odisha have been engaged in a bitter legal battle over the origin of the syrupy sweet known as rasgulla since 2015 clear both states managed to get gi tag west bengal for bengal rasgulla and in 2017 odisha for odisha rasgulla clear so there is one commodity which is in controversy between two states of west bengal and odisha 
West Bengal and Odisha bought Rasogulla. Clear? Both wanted their product to be given GI tag. Ultimately, the Bengal Rasogulla was given GI tag in 2015. 2015, Bengal Rasogulla got the GI tag. Clear? So Bengal Rasogulla, sorry, 2017. And in Odisha, Odisha Rasogulla got GI tag in 2000. 20 clear now first first of all we need to understand what is the difference between bangalore rasgulla and Urisa rasgulla basis of differentiation clear so this is a very important factor it's still controversy going on even though gi tag has been given to bengal rasgulla also Urisa rasgulla as well west bengal in 2017 Urisa rasgulla in 2020 coming to the conflict clear what are the major differences first is basis of differentiation what is the basis of differentiation? Basis of differentiation. There's one thing coming to Bengal Rasgulla. Bengal Rasgulla. And second is Second is Odisha Rasogulla. Odisha Rasogulla. Here in Bengal is Rasogulla and Odisha is Rasogulla. Clear? Now, what is the historical background? The first thing is historical background. Historical background. Bengal Rasgulla started in 19th century. It started in 1860s. Clear? Urisa Rasgulla, they claim the origin from 12th century. 12th century AD. So, more antique is Urisa Rasgulla. They can give you this statement also. Second is, clear? Date of origin. Sorry. This is date of origin. This is date of origin fine then coming to second one second date after date of origin is historical background historical background what is the historical background the rasugula was first made by nobin chandra das so in bengal it was first made by nobin Chandra Das. It was first made by Nobin Chandra Das in Kolkata. Nobind Chandra Das in Kolkata. In Kolkata, which he later popularized in India. Clear? This was as Gulla in Odisha was used as offering in the temple of Lord Jagannath. Clear? So it was started as this as Gulla was started as offering in the Jagannath temple offering in the Jagannath temple in Puri, Odisha. So, this had religious significance. This was Nobin Chandra Sain. Second point, third point of difference is between color. Clear? Color of Turas Gulla. In Bengal, it is pure white in color. In Bengal, it is pure white in color. And in Odisha is light brown in color. It's light brown in color. Third one. Fourth major point of difference is, basic difference is texture. Is the texture. In Bengal, quite obviously it is spongy. In Bengali, it is spongy. And in Odisha, it is soft. This is texture coming to taste. Fifth one, the most important thing is the test. Okay. Bengali school are sweet in test. Are sweet in test. And Udisa school is not very sweet. It is less sweet. It is less sweet in test. So, controversy related to Bengal Rasgulla and Odisha Rasgulla related to GI tag. Both has been given given GI tag West Bengal Rasgulla in 2017, Odisha Rasgulla in 2020. But they had been legal battle to get 
Odisha attack just because they wanted to have patent in their own state rather than allowing the other states to go for manufacture or rather production of such rasgullas. Clear? Recently, also several items has been added in the GI attack, but this is very important from recent perspective from contemporary perspective clear now after this clear now we'll discuss about cultural policies of the government of india largely that acts related to preservation of culture clear so coming to cultural policies we'll discuss about cultural policies within this we'll discuss about the major acts or legislations cultural policies clear okay we don't have any cultural policy in india do remember clear there's no nothing called natural cultural policy do remember one thing don't get confused clear india does not have a national cultural policy what policy why we don't have we don't have natural cultural policy because of because india's culture being too diverse and too disparate too rather disparate to be accommodated since indian culture is too diverse and it is marked by huge regional variations it is not possible to integrate the entire culture in the one cultural policy that is why india does not have national national cultural policy just because of its diversity just because of its huge diversity clear but even though we don't have natural cultural policy do remember india does not have natural cultural policy the reason i discussed just because of diversity in our culture varying from region to region but even though we don't have national cultural policy we have some acts to preserve that natural cultural heritage in india the natural cultural customs in india coming to these acts clear first major act was indian treasure trove act Indian treasure first major act enacted in this direction was Indian Treasure Trove Act. Indian Treasure Trove Act in the year. 1878 and the british rule enacted by the british government to protect and preserve treasures found once british took over principalities treasures would be to declare the district collector and punishments were laid out clear so in order to protect the rich cultural treasures of india british authority enacted that and it was made clear that all these tax would be declared by district collector and punishments were to be given if the person tried to modify or rather try to misuse these treasures this was enacted in 1878 clear then next act that was enacted in this was ancient monuments ancient monuments ancient monuments preservation act ancient monuments preservation act 1904 was enacted by lord curzon clear 1904 enacted to provide effective preservation authority over monuments especially those in the custody of individual or private ownership clear so it was basically to protect monuments especially when especially when those which were under the control of private persons or individuals clear second was the antiquities third is the antiquities the antiquities export control act the antiquities export control act which was enacted in the year 1947 the antiquities export control act 1947 enacted to prevent the british living in hoards from taking important artifacts clear so first of all the government of india immediately enacted the antiquities export control act because british authority began to take large number of antiquities and treasures from india to britain in order to stop the export control of such antiquities government of india immediately after independence enacted antiquities export control act 1947 clear then we have ancient and historical the ancient the ancient and historical monuments the ancient and historical monuments the ancient and historical monuments and archaeological sites and archaeological sites 
एंड आर्कोलॉजिकल साइट्स एंड रिमेन्स आर्कोलॉजिकल साइट्स एंड रिमेन्स रिमेन्स डेक्लेरेशन ऑफ नेशनल इंपॉर्टेंस declaration of national importance declaration of national importance declaration of national importance act 1951 comprehensive one the ancient and historical monuments and archaeological sites and remains declaration of national importance act 1951 enacted to add 450 monuments and archaeological sites to be original list of 1904 1904 that is ancient monuments preservation act this was amended in 2010 to give central government the power to declare any monument or site one of the national importance purchase or at least to acquire it we have discussed about monuments of national importance we have discussed about this concept of monuments of national importance also clear and at the same time clear this was amended in the year 2010 as well clear so it was amended in 2010 so that government can take control of such historical and ancient monuments and archaeological sites clear this was in 1951 clear then we have antiquities and fifth one antiquities and art antiquities and art treasures act antiquity and art antiquities and art treasures act antiquity and art treasures act 1972 1972 enacted to control the export in indian antiquities any object that has been existence for no less than 100 years so anything that has been existing for more than 100 years cannot be exported to other countries in order to in, in order to preserve the antiquities punishment ranges from 3 months to 3 years along with a fine clear then we have public record act then we have public record act 1993 the public record act 1933 enacted on the urging of department of culture which wants to permanently preserve records in public domain clear any document film manuscript microfilm image or any other form of document clear and then only this act ancient monuments act was amended in 2010 and that result into amsar act clear ancient monuments archaeological sites remains act clear so we had discussed about amsar act clear so amsar act was this act was amended in 2008 that led to arms of ancient monuments and archaeological sites remains act clear this is known as arms are act ancient monuments and archaeological sites remains act in 2010 this was basically the amended version of ancient and historical monuments archaeological sites and remains act we have discussed arms act separately and that is other clear very important one sir is the other item which i take important see it can be more but there is a long list but recently there has been a, there was news related to controversy between west bengal and uttar related to their product known as rasgulla okay other items are maybe important but there is a long list but this is the most important that is going on in news related to west bengal and odisha so these are the legislations related to cultural policies even though these legislations are there but we all know there is no national cultural policy in india even though there is no national cultural policy in india clear okay? but preservation of culture is a duty of every person and there are some constitutional provisions also related to protection of cultural heritage clear what are those constitutional provisions will come to constitutional provisions as well related to culture so constitutional provisions coming to constitutional provisions clear first constitutional provision is uh, one of the fundamental right and this fundamental right is article 
29 of the Indian Constitution. This Article 29 states that any section of the citizens residing in the territory of India or any part thereof having a distinct language, a script or culture of its own shall have the right to conserve the same. So, any person, group of person in a country of India has the right to protect their own culture, language, script or script, which is a fundamental right under Article 29 of Indian Constitution. Then there is another provision that is Article 49 of Indian Constitution, which comes under the directive principles of state policy. Article 49 means protection of monuments and places of national importance, clear, or national value, clear. According to Article 49, the state, clear, is under obligation to protect every monument, place, or object of artistic or historic interest declared to be of national importance from spoliation, disfigurement, destruction, removal, disposal, and export. So, state also has the right to protect such monuments under Article 49 and then we have third article article 51 article 51 a fundamental duty sub clause f clear article 51 f says value and preserve the rich heritage of indian culture the first to mention the rights this is a fundamental duty that every citizen of india should note that they should preserve the culture so one is fundamental right under this directive principle one is fundamental uh, duty clear so fundamental right is protection of culture heritage and the language of every community in india 49 states should protect the culture and monuments and 51 it is the duty of every citizen basically to protect all this cultural heritage of india clear at the same time another concept that is there is corporate social responsibility this has started a new concept to preserve culture which is known as corporate social responsibility also known as csr clear so corporate social responsibility towards culture it's a very important concept going on these days corporate social responsibility or csr towards culture clear in fact india is the first country in the world to make corporate social responsibility mandatory clear so india is the first country to declare corporate social responsibility to be a mandatory duty clear and the amend the amendment in 2045 notified that companies act 2013 requires companies with a network clear so this was amendment was done in 2013 and uh, according to this companies act 2013 now look into provision Companies Act 2013, which was amended in 2014. Companies Act 2013 makes it clear, clear that uh, that makes it clear that companies with a net worth of five billion, clear companies, companies with a net worth, companies with a net worth. Companies with a net worth clear of five billion rupees clear companies with a net worth of five billion rupees rupees five billion companies with a net worth of five billion rupees five billion rupees or annual turnover of or companies with annual turnover companies with annual turnover of annual turnover of 10 billion rupees 10 billion companies with annual turnover of 10 billion our companies with or companies with net profit of 50 million companies with net profit of 50 million it's not billion here 50 million Clear? So, companies with net worth of 5 billion, companies with annual turnover of 10 billion, or companies with net worth of 50 million, clear? 50 million are supposed to spend, are supposed to spend 2% of their average net profit for 3 years, clear? So, 2% of the average net profit for 3 years, clear? On corporate social responsibility, clear? So, these companies with a net worth of 5 billion rupees, annual turnover of 10 billion rupees, or net profit of 50 million must invest 2% of their average profit for 3 years for corporate social responsibility in order to promote education, eliminate poverty, gender
gender equality or hunger clear so they need to work towards promotion of promotion of gender equality elimination of hunger elimination of poverty and promotion of education clear this has become a big development that is leading to cultural development in a big way in india and this is known as corporate social responsibility towards cultural growth and development clear so 2% of the net profit for 3 years average profit for 3 years must be invested or promoted promoted for cultural growth and development so constitution provisions and then we have corporate social responsibility india is the first country in the world to implement corporate social responsibility clear this is sir is the constitution amendment specific and modified to article modified to article 49 of the constitution yeah modified also but it is all this flows from the flows from directive principle whereby a state rather takes the responsibility of protecting the monuments in india so major developments related to cultural growth and development clear these are more than enough to be prepared for culture be prepared for culture be ready for culture these are important things to be prepared thoroughly for your culture cultural topic it's clear now meanwhile clear apart from this let us discuss about the questions also that has been given to you the test yesterday coming to these questions clear so coming to these questions let us discuss the questions as well 9 feb the test that was given coming to the first question itself okay coming to the first question with reference to sri mukhalingam temple yeah there's a very prominent one i have asked them to make some exclusive questions for you clear there's no point of repeating the questions from class notes even though we had the word class notes elaborately clear so with reference to sri makalingam temple consider for instance construction kaling style this is right it was in kaling style eastern india by kings of western ganga no it's not western ganga kaling is always meant by eastern gangas so not western ganga it can always be western ganga clear ganga ganga this is a wrong statement clear then it is located on the banks of river vamsadha yeah vamsadha is a river that's a right statement sri mukalingam temple recently this temple has been used in esco world heritage list no still this temple has not been included in the world heritage list all the major sites in the world heritage list we had discussed 42 of them clear it is not there so this temple is not included yet in the world heritage list this wrong statement so only two is right clear this one this is sri mukalingam temple question number 1 coming to next question Question number two. Consider the following statement: Stock Guru Cheshu is a Buddhist festival celebrated in Ladakh. Yeah, this is right. Very important festival celebrated. Padma Sambhava is related to here. We have discussed about Bamba Sambhava. That is Hem Gompa. We are discussing about one important development as of now only. Sometimes back I had discussed Gompa. Hem is Gompa Mela. We had discussed about Hem is Gompa Mela. Hem is Gompa Mela is celebrated in Ladakh basically to mark the birth anniversary of Guru Padma Sambhav. Guru Padma Sambhav, and this also is basically basically this is a Buddhist festival celebrated by the Buddhist monks of Ladakh who are followers of Guru Padma Sambhav. Hem is Gompa is celebrated. We have discussed about Hem is Gompa. So Guru Teshu is a Buddhist festival in Ladakh. This is right. It is celebrated in Ladakh. Hem is Gompa is also celebrated in Ladakh. It is celebrated in the first month of Tibetan lunar calendar. Yeah. It's follow lunar solar calendar, and which is the calendar we had discussed? This calendar is known. This calendar is celebrated to mark the mark the Tibetan lunar calendar. Lunar calendar, Hemis Gompa. It coincides with the birthday of Guru Padma Sambhav, one of the founding fathers of Tibetan Buddhism. Yeah, Hemis Gompa. Clear. So it is related to Hemis Gompa festival only. That is named as Guru Teshu. All the three are right statement. Right now only we had discussed this question. Great. Clear. Coming to the next one. Question number three, with reference to mewar painting, okay, mewar paintings. Consider the following statement. Statement. Yeah, coming to this painting, mewar painting. The migration of artists from Mandu to Mewar following the rulers 
defeat by the Mughals marked the true beginning. Yeah, it was because of migration also the artists moved towards Mewar. Most paintings have been drawn upon red, yellow and green surfaces. This is perfectly right, Mewar painting. The Mahabharat Mewari miniature paintings was recently and very fetching miniature painting by Allah Baksh. Allah Baksh was a major painter of Mewar school. All the three are right. These are three statements related to Mewar painting. Have this information, additional information with you. Clear? Next question number four. Now, this is related to Sahit Academy. We had been discussing. Consider the following statement regarding Sahit Academy. It was established under the Ministry of Culture by Government of India in 1954. Yeah, right now only we had discussed this. Ministry of Culture, we have written the table only we have made. This is right. First statement is absolutely right. It announces the annual awards in 22 languages. No, we had discussed right now. These languages are 24 languages. We had been emphasizing off and on. 22 languages from H schedule to Indian constitution and two languages more, moreover. These two languages additional of additionals are English and Rajasthani. So Sahit Academy gives award in 24 languages. In fact, we had discussed as of now. So not 22 but 24 languages, English and Rajasthani apart from 22. This is wrong. It is registered as a SWAT in the Indian SWAT registration in 1860. Yeah, this is right. Incorrect. Yeah, this is right statement registered in, in SWAT Act. How many of the statements are incorrect? Yeah, I have to identify it. Only one. That is second one is wrong. It is not 22 languages, but 24 languages. 22 from Sidhu languages, English and Rajasthani beyond that. That question that he had discussed today itself, question number four, coming to question number five. Consider the following statements. This craft tradition was skillfully stitching together small pieces of discarded fabric to create a beautiful fabric. It is practiced in several villages of Karnataka. Recently, this art bomb created a Guinness World Record in Delhi. Yeah, is Lambani embroidery. In fact, our Prime Minister gave this embroidery to many leaders who came from different countries to participate in G20 summit. Clear? So, this was given by our Prime Minister to many other dignitaries who came to G20 summit. So, it is basically the Lambani embroidery. Lamboini embroidery is followed in Karnataka. Clear? That is C would be the right answer. Have these informations with you. Then moving to the next one, question number six. Consider the following statement. Shanti Niketan was, today only we had discussed. Shanti Niketan was residential school established by renowned poet Sabin in 1901. Yeah, this is right, 1901. It was known as Brahmachar As. Brahmacharya. Ashram, we had discussed Brahmachar Ashram was established in 1901. In 1921, a world used to establish something known as Vishwya. 1921, we had discussed this also. And we had also discussed in 1951, it became Central University. Clear? So, 1901, it was established as Brahmachar Ashram. 1921, as Vishwavarti. 1951, as Central University. Clear? Shanti Niketan became India's 41st UNESCO World Heritage Site. Yeah, 41st. 42nd is all the temples at Halibedu, clear? That is Somnath Pura, Halibedu and Belu, Chinna Kosama Swampil, Kesava Temple and the Hoysala Ishwara Temple, clear? So, this is one thing, 1, 2 and 3. 1, 2 and 3, clear? So, all the three statements are right, we had discussed in the class itself, clear? Consider the following statement with reference to recently built Sri Ram Mandir at Ayodhya. This also we had discussed today. The temple is constructed in traditional Nagar style. Yeah, today only we discussed uh, Nagar style. The construction material used in the temple includes steel and iron. No, we had made it clear. Steel and iron has not been used. It has been pink sandstone. Clear? It has been used. Along with use of traditional construction materials. No, this is wrong. Iron steel has not been used in this temple. The construction incorporates special bricks known as Ram Shilas with inscription Ram, Rashi Ram on them. Yeah, this is right. Bricks has been, has been stabbed with Sri Ram on them. The main temple structure features Makrana marble along with colored marble from different places. No, this is wrong. Not Makrana marble. It's basically pink sandstone from Rajasthan. We had discussed the material also that has been used. So, it's pink sandstone from Rajasthan. We have discussed today itself. That's a wrong statement. How many of the statements are correct? Only two. Clear? B is right. First is right and the third one is right. Clear? No iron steel has been used and it is not Makrana marble. It's pink sandstone from Rajasthan. Clear? Only from Rajasthan, not from different places. The second and fourth are wrong. Only two. Coming to the next one, question number eight. 
concept of falling reference to pitch wire painting. We had discussed this painting also yesterday only, modern painting. It is used to embellish the walls of temples behind the idol there. Yeah, this is right statement. Characteristics which include broad eyes, fat nose and heavy body. The paintings are made of complete natural colors and brushes and the final touch is given by pure gold. Finally, all which of the symbols are incorrect? None of them are incorrect. All of them are correct. Answer would be none. We had discussed pitch wire painting yesterday only. Clear? Coming to next, even though I made the ask them to be exclusive question, but we had covered elaborately. That's why. Clear? They also cannot make questions from anywhere else. Coming to the next one, Garba. We had discussed yesterday only about Garba. Coming to Garba. Concept of Garba. This is a news that is the 15th one included in intangible cultural heritage side. Clear? So, 15th to be included in intangible cultural heritage by UNESCO. All the 15 lists we have, we have all the 15 lists with us. Garba is a ritualistic devotion that performed on the occasion of the Ratri. Yeah, fine. We had discussed directly from class notes. It has been inscribed on the responsibility of intangible culture of humanity. Yeah, 15th one, I see it in ESCO. We had discussed the criteria also, clear? And we had discussed about when it was conventions also. All elaborate informations we have with us, clear? So both one and two are right, clear? So coming to this, both one and two are right. Yeah, both one and two are right. One and two are at state quotient. Then coming to the next one, the tenth quotient. Consider the following pairs: Khichdi Uttar Pradesh, yeah, this is in Uttar Pradesh. This is right. Khichdi Uttar Pradesh, right? Then Pongal in Kerala. No, Pongal is not in Kerala. Pongal is in Tamil Nadu. Clear? This is wrong. Bogali Bihu, Assam. Ah, huh? Bihu is always in Assam. That is right one. Uttarayan in Uttarakhand. No, Uttarayan is not in Uttarakhand. Clear? Uttarayan is not in Uttarakhand. It is the other state. This right. Clear? This is wrong. Uttarayan is in Gujarat. Right? Uttarayan is in not Uttarakhand, but Uttarayan is in Gujarat. So, two and four are wrong. How many of the pair given are correctly matched? Correctly matched are two. That is one and three. So, only two. Clear? Festival and state. So, major festival and fairs we had already done. Clear? So, be clear. So, it's clear. All the questions we had already discussed. 10 questions. Clear? So, with this will come to an end to history, art and culture that we had discussed. The only thing that you have to do is, again I'll repeat. Clear? Take the class notes from someone. If you are, if you are my students, no issue with that. Supplement this with the materials of crash course. That would suffice. Don't need to go with any other material. And I can guarantee you, with the intensity of coverage that we had done and the and the area that we had done covered, clear. If there are around 17 to 18 questions which are normally there from history and culture, I can bet, clear? Leaving aside two to three questions, you will be able to answer all the questions, clear? So have this thing, keep on revising things continuously. That will really work with all of you, believe me, clear? So all these things are to be done. We had done it quite elaborately, believe me, because I have taken materials and sources and information from multiple sources, clear? To be given to you, you won't find all all these informations at one place that is for sure clear this one thing some of where we are asking about my number clear so it's clear so all the things we had already done. Now, any query, anything that you all have related to strategy and other things, just let me know. Speak Mac we had done. GI tag, we had done. Ancient monuments preservation, we had done. Clear. So, anything that you need me or you want me to complete, just let me know. Sir, in question number 10, it is festival state, but Khichdi is a dish. See, Khichdi is a dish largely, clear? They can give it a match, but it is always consumed on important occasions as well. So, it is basically a dish associated with local festivals, clear? So, Khichdi is a dish properly, but at the same time can be consumed. Like, for instance, Khichdi is largely performed in Makar Sakranti, clear? So, it can be associated with festivals also. Khichdi can be consumed in domestic life also, but they are largely celebrated. Community dance, lunch is done, and community lunch is basically of Khichdi on important occasions or 
festivals. It can be yours. Sir, thoroughly enjoyed this session along with large number of knowledge we acquired. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Clear. In fact, it's a pleasure for me and the real test for me also will be on the on the prelims day clear so i want all of you to revise it's not only your exam clear in fact i have taken it as my exam clear so in fact clear you would be representing me in the examination room clear so take care of these things don't commit any silly mistakes please keep on revising clear it is like exam for me also we have collected things from multiple sources i'm telling you newspapers also in fact clear suraj kun mela and all i'd be going through to two days back only then adi mouth sir today's newspaper only clear so all these things are there clear keep on looking all those things correctly clear look into following those issues it will serve the purpose believe me anything else that you want from my side just let me know anything else that you want from my side please let me know is it fine with all of you we make you proud sir thank you so much i just want this only clear just make me proud just i can say that with confidence that these were the students taught by me and they have really come out with flying colors clear thank you sir for humble lessons so yeah always be humble always remain down to earth always being grounded clear okay because till the time you are remain grounded you gain more and more knowledge clear so do that it's really helpful it's fine clear sir please apply your notes in group i don't have any ksg friend <laughs> see uh please write notes it's not possible it's a comprehensive notes that is the covered in the class notes it's that is a long session that i had covered it may not be possible for group but ha huh, i'll talk to the mentor don't worry i'll talk to the mentor talk you also talk to the mentor if possible we'll try to push the notes class notes on the group itself clear i covered their things very elaborately and i have taken care here also that i am covering those areas which i have not done so exclusively i am i'm talking about merging of the two things blending of the two things that will really serve the purpose clear so i'll just uh, i'll just talk to some of them the mentor also you also talk to the mentor please clear then we can work out something is it clear once you sir if i haven't read vipin chandra but gone through your class notes class is and notes should i read after prelims no yeah you can read after prelims in fact for mains you are not supposed to do that class notes will suffice and believe me clear don't do it vipin chandra will also not have so much information i've gone through vipin chandra multiple times clear so don't need to you don't you are not supposed to go through clear go through the class notes that would suffice believe me the main seat is based all about writing practice prelims stick to the class notes and the notes of the crash course clear anything else that you want me to discuss any question that you want me to discuss this is the last session that we are having as of now anything that you want me to discuss please let me know sir i have taken the class from your from du professor also for enhance my curiosity but about read about the read the history but your class is amazing and i fall in love with history so thank you sir thank you so much thank you so much clear in fact clear i may not match the level of the professors in du clear that's for sure but i can say you that for, as far as whatever whatever i know i just get, i have given you from the best of my sources clear so don't worry about clear how to remain motivated self drive have the self drive you have to you are going to become a great administrator of this country the country needs you in fact when you will become administrator you will enact some legislations for preservation of cultural sites and monuments because that has become very important these days as lee clear okay so obviously remain motivated that you are going to work for the country for the nation you are work going to work for the down trodden sections you are an asset for this country always think yourself as an asset for the country work in this way clear so be motivated make sure shots are targets but realistic targets execute them brutally clear targets should be realistic execution should be brutal clear don't make unrealistic target that may not be possible only clear so always targets should be realistic execution should be brutal clear then will that will keep you motivated and going clear it's clear all of you anything else that you want from my side just let me know if i can be handy to you thank you sir so thank you thank you all of you take care of yourself be prepared be motivated keep revising things clear i think these all things things work work with all of you clear thank you so much take care of yourself thank you